for World Endurance Championship Racing at Spa started on sale this week. Confirmation from the Belgian authorities that there will be no spectator restrictions for the Spa six hours uh, later this spring. So that's fantastic news. If you want to see these cars at first hand, there can be few finer places to go as we warm up for the morning. The other important thing about Spa is if you did have a ticket, and you've still got a ticket from the race that was cancelled because of the pandemic, they will be honoured and we will be delighted to see you there. Yeah. It's underway and delighted, Martin. We're now joined in the booth for the very first time for race coverage by 2014 FIA World Endurance Championship Drivers' Champion, and the Davidson Ants. You're so welcome. We're going to go off for a cup of coffee now. It's over to you. <laughs> Thanks, uh, yeah, thanks for that introduction. <laughs> it's uh, it's, it's an honor to be here, honestly, and um, I'm so excited to see this race, to see sports car racing as it should be, not from really a driver's perspective, sitting in the car, a bag of nerves, just insulated in your own immediate race, to be here now to, to witness it for, in all its glory, every single car, every single category. I'm really looking forward to this one. I might get a few names of teams wrong and things like that along the way, but I'm sure you'll be here to, oh, to correct me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, you won't be alone in that. Looking down through our grid, you can see the Toyota starting fourth and second, uh, fourth and seventh rather, among the LMP2 cars. Now, what they have not done is put the hypercars ahead of LMP2. They are gridded up as they qualified. And we expect, and in the race, that LMP2 and hypercar are going to be relatively close together. One of the big changes that the Toyotas have struggled with this year is that their hybrid drive, they were used to be able to employ it at any speed above 120 kilometers an hour. That has now moved up to above 190, which is effectively 120 miles an hour. So they can't deploy it exiting any corners except for turn one and turn 17. That means that they're mid to corner exit speed is no better than any of the LMP2 cars and they need a longer straight to be able to use that hybrid advantage. And it's not just a case of power, it's a case of it being four-wheel drive or yeah. not. So it used to be, you know, a double advantage boosting, as they call it, from the hybrid system, the electric energy coming in in conjunction with the combustion engine. That would give you, in essence, front-wheel drive and rear-wheel drive when, they, when it was boosting. But now, like you say, Martin, that's coming in later at 190 kilometers an hour. And the, the problem with this circuit is it's all medium speed. I don't feel like, on top of all the BOP and hypercar, I don't feel like this circuit necessarily helps. That it's not a benefit with the Toyota. It, it's, it, it seems a bit of out of its comfort zone around this track compared to uh, the likes of the, uh, the Alpha. There is quite a lot of an issue as well with a lot of this track being effectively a single lane racetrack. We're looking at it here. If you get stuck behind a GT car that's been well pedaled, you're going to struggle to get by either in LMP2 or in hypercar. You're going to have to pick and choose your moments. And being able to deal with traffic is the drivers. You know, you said it yesterday in qualifying. You know, it's one thing to be able to drive fast on your own. I'm talking about, say, Sebastian Ogier or somebody who comes in as a, as a very from a very different discipline. When all the other loonies are around you, that's where the driver's skill really comes in. I think, I think the uh, the, the categories have all kind of converged, and they're all much more at a similar pace these days than they were last year. Yeah, I was speaking to Sebastian before uh, we went live, actually, and saying how's it going to be for you in race conditions. And he feels that from the prologue and all of the running that he's done here, he feels that he's going to be OK with it. So we're going to have to wait and see. He's not going to be in the car for about two and a half hours, though. Thank you, Louise. Well, he is going to have to be OK with it because that's that, that's really what it's all about. No and turning back now. No, <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> He is in at the deep end. Safety car heads the field round as we get ready for the start of the 1,000 miles of Sebring, the first race of season 10, the FIA World Endurance Championship. The blue Alpine on pole position. Alongside is the red Glickenhaus. 
And that is the field being paced by young Frenchman Mathieu Vazivier. Safety car pulls off, we are ready to go racing. Nick Nielsen, third with the chrome and the red, white and blue. Fourth, Sebastian Buemi for Toyota. But it will be the Alpine that covers into the first corner. And the LMP2 cars going around the outside. That looked as though that was Philip Albuquerque. And he's moving up to third place, up into second place, getting a, a right good start under his belt. The AF Corsa car of Nick Nielsen between the two Toyotas. Anthony Davidson, there was a question about whether Toyota would have more race pace and whether they just played a bit of a patient game in qualifying. We're going to have to find out very quickly. Well, that was an important move for both Toyotas to get in front of the AF Course uh, LMP2 car. You could see there just breezing past on the, uh, the back straight before the hairpin. But critically, the United has got in front of both of them. So there's an LMP2 car in front of them, and it was important as well for the Alpine to stay in front of the, uh, the Toyota. You can see Toyota's prowess really comes in a straight line. He's got an overtaking move there. The Penske goes down the inside into turn, th into turn 10. Yeah, that's past the new all-in car of Robert Kubica. So Penske had some problems on the grid. We heard Felipe Nasa talking to the engineers there. Auto start is not working. Now, Ant, what does that mean in terms, if they don't get it to work, in terms of what happens in the pit stops? It's no problem, really. It doesn't actually lose you that much time. You're talking a few tenths of a second, if, if that. Uh, it means that you can be on the, uh, the start a button when the car is on the in the air on the jacks and as soon as the car hits the floor it starts to crank the engine and it starts yeah so you've just got to have a bit of uh, timing from within the cockpit to hit the button as soon as it does drop here we go the Glicken house getting past in a straight line yeah. as you would expect the LMP2 car inferior in a straight line and, and power the Glicken house has a lot of grunt there well, the LMP2 cars have been reined in a little bit this year. They've lost dive planes at the front. They've also lost a little bit of power. Coming through the field, the yellow and green car at the back. That started on the back row of the grid. Fabio Scherra for Inter Europol. The car crashed in qualifying, didn't set a time, didn't start at the back of the prototype field, started at the back of the entire field. Mathieu Vazivier with clear air in front of him. Important for Alpine to get their nose in front. The more they can run away now and dominate proceedings, the better chance they've got. Ben Keating in the pale blue car, our GTE Am pole sitter getting passed by now by the second of the Ferraris. He out-qualified both of the pro pass Ferraris. And right behind, blue, yellow and green. That's the 98 Aston. So that is the lead battle in GTE Am now. And an Aston Martin in third place. The black and green D station car. So Aston Martin, one, two, three. First and third, the cars run by TF Sport. And in the middle, the car run by AMR. Graham, it's there. one, two, four. But the treble seven is looking for a way through on that Inception Racing uh, backed uh, Team Project One car. Ah. That's been started by Brendan Areeb. It's Ben Keating, Paul Delvana, Brendan Areeb, and Tom Oliver Fuji, silver rank driver, impressed everyone so much last year at the FI World in George Championship. Right, that's my first miss spot because it looks so close to the factory Porsche livery. I didn't uh, spot it as the Inception car. By the way, the car that was in the pit lane, Team Project One's number 46 car, that has started. It had to finish, uh, start at the end of the first lap there. It's the D-Station car looking for a run down the inside. Doesn't quite get through on the Inception Porsche. Then the first of the AM-class Ferraris, you can see the bright, well, vermilion livery of the Iron Dames machine. Yeah, Sarah Bovey well in contact with this group, and it's been quick all season. Okay, yeah, it really has. I was just looking at the Toyota behind the United now, car number seven. We've seen car number eight work its way past and the car number 22, and now it's uh, the car number seven looking to find its way past as well. That's going to be a critical pass. I thought he was going to get it done on the main straight, if I'm honest but he has to sit behind him now through this uh, tighter section of the track. Well, that's two full laps, he's not managed to do it so far. Yeah. 266 to go of the lap count. Interesting though that Sebastian Wemmy is closing quite quickly on the Glickenhaus of Olivier Pla in second place. Now he's free of Felipe Albuquerque, suddenly he's closing up. Here's our GTE Pro Class lead battle, 92 out, qualified 91, and remains in the lead. Now, it doesn't matter where you qualified, 
whoever has the best race car is going to get the chance to lead this. Nobody has any championship points right now, so it's all about who gets the best out of it. Ferrari on Ferrari action here. You've got the pro-class car behind the AM-class cars. Thomas Floor, his birthday yesterday, he's in that silver 54 car. Simon Mann. American, young American driver, welcome to the World Championship for Simon Mann. His first FIA WEC He's had a good run start. there. Looking for the outside. It's, uh, it's a game of who dares break the latest into this one, but it's uh, not going to happen into this hairpin this time around. But GT Racing always super close. It's no different here today. Yeah, Simon coming to WEC after I think it's two years of title wins of the Italian GT Championship with AF Corsa. Now here with the FI World Endurance Championship in one of what's a squadron of red and white Ferraris this year. And twas ever thus, yeah, the car right behind was Spirit to Race, Frank Desoto, the uh, French uh, gentleman driver was with them. Mathieu Vazivier setting another fast race lap as he tries to creep away a little bit from compatriot Olivier Pla, and the Toyota's now up into third and fourth place overall, number eight ahead of number seven. Was another fastest lap of the race, two consecutive fastest laps of the race for Mathieu Vazivier. He's now 4.2 seconds clear. The gap between them on the last lap, just a thousandth of a second. So, uh, much as Pascal Vassal on a Toyota might whinge on about to balance a performance, they do seem to have balanced the performance, at least in the top two cars, fairly well, and Toyota are closing in on them. Yep, it's a 1 2 here for Porsche in GTE Pro. Remember, this is the final year of this magnificent class in international racing. And it's going to be the only chance uh, this uh, live audience in the United States gets to see GTE or GTLM cars this season. And yeah, Kevin S really pushing on there on the exit of turn one, just kicking up the dust. He's a phenomenal GT driver. As the teammates watch on yeah, in that battle in front. Didn't and actually, happy, did he? <laughs> well, I'd say uh, focused. <laughs> Interestingly, Nick Tandy right behind him, of course. Nick Tandy's made his name racing GT and prototype horses, of course. So he knows all the advantages and all the weak points of the Porsche. He's still learning what the advantages are in the Corvette that he is brand new to this season. So Tandy knows everything about his rivals, nothing about his own car. Exactly, but he's matching the lap times at the, at the moment. Uh, yeah. they're, they're both running in the, uh, in the high 58s, and he's right up there with them, splitting, of course, the Porsche and the Ferraris. Oh, little move here from the yellow and blue Porsche. That's the Dempsey Proton car. And this, is the through here. this is the 46 car trying to grab back that lap that they've lost uh, from the start. That's Matteo Caroli coming up on the back of this group. Uh, they're in the white car going to the inside of the number 88 car. That's a reliveried 88 Dempsey Proton racing car. Looks fantastic in that yellow and blue. Yes, good little scrap going on here, but a lot of defensive driving at a very early stage in the race, I must say, from uh, Thomas Floor in the number 54 silver Ferrari there. And uh, say he's starting it looks like he's holding up that bunch he's causing yeah. a train of cars and at some point we're going to see some action they're going to find a way past Nick Tandy reporting by the way that the Porsches seem to be taking quite a while to warm up their tires now we heard from Alexander Selig that tire wear tire life and tire strategy is going to be a little hard to judge because there was so much mixed weather in the prologue and in the free practice sessions they're not really quite sure which way they're going They've obviously started on the harder compound. 46th car, Matteo Caroli, uh, starts to hop up the order. Gets by the 88, gets by the 71. Now closing in behind 21 and 54. And he's going to make at least one of these down the front stretch. He's still he's a lap down, of he's course. Still but, yeah, he's, he's position, remember, but this is important to get by and get that clear air. Free air, yeah, exactly. And uh, clearly got much more speed than this immediate battle going on behind him. Oh, can number 21 get a run here down the inside into turn three? No, yeah. he's got it covered. Floor has it covered into three. He's just going to have to be later on the brakes, but the Ferrari does look good. Does Thomas Floor's car under the brakes, so that's actually saving him from losing that position. Well, we talked to Gabby Aubrey in the pit lane yesterday, didn't we? And yeah. your first words to him were, surprised to see you in a GT. And he said, <laughs> yeah, me too. But he said, they have got phenomenal traction there compared to a, even a P2 car. He was really surprised at how good the cars just handled. 
the uppercut, beginning to get under pressure here from Nicholas Nielsen, and that's a, another endorsement. And I know you were super impressed with young Dane's qualifying performance yesterday. And this is Felipe Albuquerque, a real benchmark in an LMP2 car, particularly uh, around pressure, here. Under pressure yeah. from a guy in his first race in an LMP2 car. Honestly, from what I'm seeing so far, Graham, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away by his performance and the team's performance as well. We know that AF Corps put together a tidy race car, but in LMP2, it's, it's a different ball game, and I've been mightily impressed so far. I know it's early stages, but Nick Nielsen, definitely a star of the future in sports cars. Well, there's the Algarve Pro livery on the number 45 machine right ahead of Fabio Scherer in the Inter-Europol car. Yep. The uh, 46 car coming up, uh, 34 car rather, coming up very close to try and make this pass. Uh, team managers for both the factory Porsches being requested to come to race control. That's a very interesting move. Well, that's Alexander Selig on his way off the Pratt perch then and heading. Is there something moving on the grass just there? No, it was obviously the other side of the barrier. Look at uh, Nick Tandy who's yeah, starting I mean, to put some pressure on the Porsche. Oh, change for the lead in GTE Am. 98 Aston goes ahead of the 33 car of Ben Keating. So Paul Dallalana, I, I was saying in qualifying, I expected Dallalana and Keating to start. Ben was telling us he's expecting the dri minimum driver time, two hours 20, will translate into a triple stint. And he is up for that. But here's how the pass was made down the front stretch and classic Sebring yep. stuff. Sold him a, a, a bit of a dummy there. Looked like he was going to go to the outside. Went down the inside. Yeah, classic, like you say, Martin, move into turn one. Keep an eye on this one, because I know we've been talking all week here, and you, there's, there's one little duel that you're really looking to see uh, with those two Aston Martin through. It's going to be a three wide here, and this is going to be interesting. Is Simon Mann, he's, he's done it. Round the he's outside. Done it on the outside. But he's on the dust. Will he run wide? He does. Was there a bit of contact? I'm not quite sure. Yes, I can see some bodywork flying off the cars. I don't know if that was just on the circuit itself, and they've kicked it up. I'm pretty sure he might have just nicked that right front of the Ferrari number 21. Those two Aston Martins at the moment, the two gentleman drivers battling, but the battle you're keen to see is the two Aston Martin factory drivers now. <laughs> they have won titles uh, uh, together and now split between those two cars. We've got Marco Sorensen in the 33, Nicky Team in the 98. That's going to be really interesting. Well, we have to see them out there at the same time. Oh, yeah. oh, it'll uh, I, I, let's see on the, uh, on the driver roster when they're driving, but I really hope those two Danes are out there. The Dane train, the formidable team they used to be when they were working as one, now they're fighting each other. Yeah. Yeah, well, there, and, and there will be all of that friendly rivalry as well, won't there? And, and of course, both of them need the cars to finish because you don't want to you don't want to get a big fat zero from anywhere. You need those points on the board. Let's just take a look at the back of that 83 car again. This one, uh, the effort put together with they, of course, in their first ever WEC programme in LMP2, by the way, under the AF Corsa brand, they've run cars for other people. Franz Barbarodo, one of our gentleman drivers, some of the real stars, I think, in terms of the enthusiasm they bring. How do we know that? Because he was standing at the same model and bookshop as we were yes. in the fan area yesterday <laughs> looking for bargains. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. He, just, he just had more to spare on his credit card. Down the inside comes the race leader, Matteo Vazivier, carving his way through this GTE AM battle. And when you first come up to the AMs in the cars, you have to proceed with caution. So Vazivier doing the right thing there. You can see he backed out of not just one move, but going in for that second move potentially on the Ferrari. Backed out of that second move, and that was the right thing to do. You use the momentum of these cars, the hypercars, much faster in a straight line, as you can see there through turn six as his teammate Lapierre watches on. And you've got to play that strategic game. When you know you're in the faster car, it's always that first challenge when you come up against the AM drivers. You know, it takes them longer, with all due respect, to get up to speed and, and, and to get into the groove, the rhythm of it, of it all. Not like the pros, you can just switch it on straight away. And, you know, their eyes are looking straight ahead most of the time in the early yeah. stages of the race. So he did the right thing not to just send it down the inside into turn one. You could see that car 21 probably would have just turned in. As the leader, not only are you the first to get to them, but it's the first time they've been lapped yes. in, in the race as well. So it's it's double jeopardy. And you're right. The rules apply here as everywhere else. Stay out of the pits, don't hit stuff. 
That's it. That's how you win endurance races. These three cars in a row here in the P2, it's a, it's a real reminder you have to reset with a new season. We've got yes. WRT here with two cars, but the two different team names. It's the 31 car leading this group, Sean Galeo, who last season was in the third car in this sequence, which is the 28 Chota. That's a switch for Sean. Real Team Racing uh, stood alone with TDS Racing last year. They're back with WET, uh, WRT this, this year, and that car is in the hands of Rui Andrade, who last year was with Algar Pro Racing elsewhere. It's all switch, different colours, different cars, different drivers in different cars, and we're going to get our heads around it over the next eight hours, and it's already fun. <laughs> yes. Well, again, this battle for supremacy. Uh, where's the, the D station car still in fourth? They're not that far back. It's only about a second and a half from the 33 to the battle for third place. The 56 Porsche, the best of the Porsches at the moment. There's your second place car overall, Olivier Pla. Now 9.2 seconds back from Matthew Vazivier. And again, Graham. The, the top speed, the, the overall lap speed of the Alpine wasn't much of an issue for them last year. What was an issue was the fact they couldn't run as far on fuel as they needed to to take the race to Toyota. And that has changed a little, hasn't it's it? It's changed a little. We think there's been a little bit of secret scroll about this one. We think they were given a break in time for them on last year to be able to complete the other lap, but otherwise they couldn't on fuel. What we don't really know, and we don't know because as always in the early races of the World Endurance Championship, there's been a little bit of game playing. People aren't showing what they've got. We're going to see how that pans out in terms of the stint lengths pretty soon. Uh, that's going to define how competitive these four cars in the hypercar class, and with Peugeot to come from that later this year, yeah. how competitive they can be over a full fuel stint. Uh, just a, in just a little wee while. Well, remember, all eyes are on Le Mans as well. Absolutely. That's the one they oh, yeah. all really want to win. Of course, they want to win the championship, but you, as a manufacturer particularly, have to win Le Mans. As uh, Kevin Estra pushing yeah. on, he's made that, uh, I wouldn't call it a mistake, but uh, the same dust being kicked up. On he's the digging one. the ditch there, isn't but, it? Yeah. <laughs> and it's getting deeper with every lap. But Tandy is putting the pressure on him, riding on board yep. with him now. He's the one putting pressure on the two Porsches in front. This is very interesting, great to see that three-way fight. Yeah, absolutely, taking the battle to Porsche. Ferrari right now not looking like they're in the game, but we see this so often. It will be a race of tyre strategy. We don't know, Porsche, Honestly said, we don't know whether we're going to do left sides or right sides, what compounds we're going to use as the race progresses. Of course, it's going to get hotter now before it then starts to lose a little bit of temperature late in the afternoon. We will race into the dusk, into near darkness, but the temperature won't come out of the tarmac or the concrete that quickly, but it might lose its high peak so they might be able to go for a slightly uh, softer compound later in the race here is the better of the ferraris that's the second one the first one oh it's, yeah it, it, they are pulling away oh double oh, contact trouble. jota and real team oh no uh, it wasn't yeah ultimate. it was ultimate yeah the, so other the ultimate car, car 38 car was in trouble i think <laughs> yeah let's see what happened here up the inside of the Ooh, 31 three into one not going it was the yes 38 just getting tagged. Uh, I don't know if the, the two cars fighting into turn one sent the trajectory of, of the other car offline slightly, and that's what caught out car yeah. 38. Well, that was Mathieu LaHaye looking to take two down the inside in the ultimate car. Didn't make the move, uh, didn't get by the Jota car, Roberto Gonzalez either. Roberto knocked around into a spin. Ten of 268 laps. Uh, we've broken the back of this thing. We're almost in the final furlong. The beginning of season 10 of the FIA World Endurance Championship here. This is the Sebring 1,000 miles. We just saw that incident involving Sean Gillel. When we saw that car the last time on the screen, it was the head of that group of three cars. They were down the road. Something's happened to Sean Gillel on that lap. He lost something like three, three and a half seconds even before that incident and it's under investigation as well. But well, I think that sure. came after something else. He's been yeah, passed right. by the other two cars and another car in between as well. So Sean's had a moment before that moment. Yeah, I almost commented at the time when, when they were on camera, Graham. I was going to say, Sean's doing exactly what he needs to be doing by being the silver driver, stopping the other cars overtaking who are either golds or platinum would expect to be faster. But it's a very hard track to overtake on this one. And um, so it's a strategic effort to put in your your 
you know, the, the, the silver or bronze driver at the beginning of the race to cause that kind of bottleneck situation. So this is the group that two laps ago, you can see the, the blue real team car just disappearing out the shot, then the 28 uh, Jota car, and then the number one car, Galeel, before that incident, was ahead of was those ahead. cars. So he's yeah. lost those three positions at some point in the previous lap. He's had an off somewhere, hasn't he? Uh, no, uh, no visit to the pits yet from the 38 car, so it looks like Roberto Gonzalez is going again, showing us 12th place at the moment. And here comes our GTE Pro lead battle. Let's hear from our race leader, Kevin Est. <laughs> So Kevin Esch, like everybody else, worrying a little bit about tyre degradation. Alexander Selig was saying that they are going to rely on the drivers telling them what they want from the tyre allocations, what they want when we get into needing to double stint tyres, whether they don't want any new tyres, whether they want left sides only, right sides only. I mean, it's not a predominantly left side or right side tyre destroying circuit, and it, it's fairly even in, in the way that it wears the tyres. Yeah, certainly concerned about the rear of the of the car there the rear end getting away from him and worried about therefore the degradation of the rear tires and yeah. like you mentioned earlier on martin it's it's important to remember always with this track you start in the daytime track temperatures high but by the end of the race or even midway through this race yeah. it's a very different kettle of fish it's uh, you, you know you you can have oversteer at the start of the race and easily have understeer once the track temperature cools down well, seeing the pictures of the start of the race, it was three wide in LMP2 into turn one. Both Jota cars and the Penske were side by side. Cinetech taking the lead and starting to build their advantage. United Autosports were in second early on. That's a phenomenal start from Felipe Albuquerque uh, in that uh, United Autosports car. Just lucky to see what, uh, any clues as to why there might have been that call to race control from Porsche. Maybe it was an infringement before the actual start yeah. of the race, like yeah. wheels to the car or something like that. The fact that it affected both cars, but it looked clean uh, at the start of the race. Yep. And uh, yeah, Tandy was, uh, try as he might to put pressure on the two Porsches into turn one, they had it covered. And the good thing, for, of course, from the Corvette racing point of view, quite apart from the fact that the uh, C8R is looking very strong indeed, is there's nobody that uh, knows that Porsche outside of Porsche better than Nick Tandy, <laughs> and he certainly knows his way around here too. So here is our race leader, 12 laps in the books, Mathieu Vazivier running away, and he is running away at a very decent rate. He is lapping at least a second quicker than Olivier Pla, pretty much on every lap since about lap two or three, once Pla got clear of the LMP2 cars. Uh, and Ant, if they continue with that, then uh, Alpine are going to be pretty tough to catch on this track. Long way to go. Yeah. It's a long way to go, and I, I still can't believe that this is Toyota's true pace in this race. I do think they're either going to have an advantage in the pit stops with the fuel, the length of time they can go, and also start winding it up, winding it up somehow as the race unfolds. But uh, you know, they're going to. This is a strategic race for Toyota. They might not have the sheer speed, but uh, you know they. they they know they have to win this race through consistency and using all of their experience and skill sets in the pit stops. Well, and through racecraft instead of just having the fastest car. Really? And, and again, you know, that's it. You know, you kind of think about Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes this year in Formula One. They don't have that half a step ahead of the field. So suddenly, everything else that they're good at has to be even better than before. Now, we've seen the number eight Toyota last year at Spa won the race over their number seven teammates because they saved once in one stint a lap. And, and again, we heard from the LMP2 drivers and some of the GT drivers that by a little bit of judicious lift and coasting in one stint, you could maybe save a lap. And it doesn't sound like an awful lot when you're looking at nearly 270 of the damn things, but it's a five kilometer distance. And that is a, if you give them a five kilometer head start, it takes you a long time to catch up with equal pace cars. So it can make a big difference. So we know that the LMP2 cars are doing around about 19 and possibly 20 laps if you do a bit of fuel saving. Yeah. 
we don't know because Toyota and, and the hypercars will never give away that information <laughs> because it's different for all of them. It's the same machinery in LMP2, of course. We don't know critically how far the Toyota can go, how many laps they can do on a tank of fuel. Now then, we're being told on our timing screens that the 92 Porsche that leads in GTE Pro is being reported to the stewards for creating a gap during the start. Now, predominantly in world endurance racing, and as you will know, the GT field is started a distance behind the prototype field for the avoidance of multiple carnage. A little bit of a change of position there. Is, the AF oh, no, is that AF Corsa ahead of Paul De Resta? Getting caught by De Resta. Yeah, getting caught by De Resta, Nick Nielsen, maybe. It's um, both Porsches, Martin. Both Porsches. Yeah, okay, so not... Is now reported to the stewards for not respecting the formation yeah. at the end of the formation lap. So they should have been side by side. Well, we might see an overtaking move here as De Resta's trying hard to get past Nielsen. Into turn seven, he's got it covered down the inside there. Keeps the car neat and tidy on the exit, so it's going to be pretty tough for Duresta to get a run towards turn 10. Could be his next overtaking opportunity, but he looks a little bit far away at this stage. It'd be a brave one. No, he thinks better of it. Slots back into position. Strange one with, with the Porsches, though. Strange that it's both of them. Yeah. Because, obviously, the car alongside the, the leader of that group has to respect the fact he can't go overtaking them to yeah. close the gap. So, well... Uh what it seems to read is that there was too large a gap between the two fields. Absolutely, which, you know, to be fair, they have done in the past. So this is a, a change of procedure mm. for, for procedure, from Eduardo Freitas. But you'll know, because you go to the driver's briefings, and particularly the, the briefing that's given with Eduardo for the top starters, clear instructions as to what the procedure's got to be. I think it's because we, we didn't segregate, separate the, the categories this time. Okay, they yeah. were all racing together. Yep. So it creates a bit of an unfair advantage, obviously, if you did find yourself, like the into Europe, or behind Correct. the so GT car, suddenly you've got even more of a disadvantage because that gap to your field that you're racing against in the P2s has disappeared further down the road. That's probably why they didn't allow the gap to happen this time around. Experience tells us that if there's a decision being made on a start procedure, that that will have been communicated what was expected before yeah. this race yeah. starts. And, yeah. and again, saying, well, that's what it was last year, doesn't apply. I mean, there are all sorts of changes to all sorts of regulations over the winter and, and the best red teams, and Porsche will be the best red teams among them, uh, should know that. Little bit of a change it of is. position here, Graham. That's the number 88 Porsche, in the hands of Fred Portad now with Thomas Fleur, the 21 car long gone now from this group of four. And uh, that uh, 88 Porsche has got ahead of the spirit of race 71, which has got Frank Deserter, another of our debutants in this year's uh, FAR World Endurance Championship. Yeah, it was only a matter of time before Simon Mann found his way past uh, the uh, Thomas Floor car that we were watching before. They had a bit of contact. Yeah, doesn't seem to have slowed him down. In fact, Thomas Mann has moved up a couple of spots because yeah. he got ahead of 77 Dempsey Proton car. That's in the traditional battleship disruptive pattern uh, that we associate with Dempsey Proton over the years. Um, and the 88 car is that bright blue and yellow a uh, very different livery. Francois Perodo already uh, keeping himself nice and cool. It is a hot day outside. I mean, it's been pretty chilly. It's been rainy. It's been quite stormy over the last week or 10 days here. But today is a proper Sebring day. I mean, it is hot, clear blue skies. Uh, the sun is breaking the flags. It's been Florida, is what it's been, <laughs> which is a marvellous thing. Michael Christensen getting ready for his return to full season action. And he's been impressive so far this weekend. Yeah. Looking at Porsche in the GT Pro field, the team saying that it will be a 29 lap stint for the first stint because of the formation lap and the run out to the grid. 31 laps for each of the previous stints. Olivier Pla ahead of Sebastian Buemi as the Toyota gets a decent run past the Porsche. Just closing in, you can see the gap coming down from 2.5 to 0.7 seconds in four laps. And that's a decent rate of closing. Looks like the Toyota has brought its tyres in or Sebastian Buemi has discovered full travel on the throttle pedal. I don't know, but look, the Glickenhaus, every time I see it when we're riding on board, it looks like a ferocious beast to yeah. control. Uh, the drivers will deteriorate slowly but surely by driving a car, wrestling that thing around like it is in this long race today, 1,000 miles of Sebring. Oh. Keating's getting uh, crossed up there on the penultimate corner. 
He sure was. A bit of the head staggers the car, fighting him at both ends, so he loses ground to Paul Dallalana, the GTE AM leader. And it's now an Aston Martin 123, so because the 777 car is now up into third place in the hands of Dominic Fuji, and that will have helped his chase just under 10 seconds between them. He said a little while ago it was about a second of lap. Uh, for Olivier Pla dropping back from Mathieu Vazavier. It's almost precisely that. It's 14 and a half seconds the gap. We've completed 15 laps. So webby has got to think about this one. How do you close the gap? Not only, but then you have to start looking at the, the strengths and weaknesses of these very different cars in the hypercars category. So Alpine leading midway through the first hour in Sebring. Race one, season 10 of the FIA World Endurance Championship. The 1,000 miles of Sebring, we're expecting this race to go for 268 laps. We're on the 17th. We've just passed 120th distance mark. Our overall leader for Alpine, Mathieu Vazivier. LMP2, Philippe Albuquerque, in the car that started in third place, the number 22 United car, is the leader from AF Corsa's Nick Nielsen, who was the pole man in LMP2, ahead uh, of Albuquerque. Albuquerque and De Resta. De Resta just there kicking up the dust in the second of the dark blue, red and white United Autosports car chasing him down. Meanwhile, battle as the 92 car, our GTE Pro leading Porsche comes around. The Iron Lynx Ferrari, we haven't talked about that and a change for second. The, the yellow car behind the yellow car, behind the lead Porsche. <gasps> that was a sentence and a half that I didn't <laughs> expect to see. Nick Tandy, basically, you spotted it in the yellow Corvette up to second. So, made a move, dived past the 91 Porsche. That was in second place, that car driven by Kevin Esch. Oh, the P2s are starting to get involved now as well. That was a risky move from Albuquerque around the outside of turn 10, but that's where you rely on the experience of the pro GT drivers. They're so good at spotting you. Yeah. That was a bit more of a risky move into turn 13 in the car number 50 with the AM driver on board. That's Claudio Schiavoni, who's one of the co-owners of Iron Lynx aboard the number 60 car. Bright, bright yellow. But you use that strategy yeah. tool from inside the cockpit. You all get to know each other and where you can or can't. Well, that's what I was going to say. You know, you're saying at the beginning of the show, right, excuse me if I make mistakes because I'm going to have trouble recognising some of these cars. Well, if you were driving, it would be the same because you're coming up to a yellow car and you go, is that the Corvette? In which case I know it's going to be well driven, or is it not? In which case I'm not sure. Even more confusing though, yeah. when you come up to the AM cars and there's a pro driver driving it, yeah. because it's a split category, of course, like some of yeah. the LMP2s are, and, and that's really hard to get head around. So do you look at who's on the grid in the AM cars? Yes. And, and then, so for your stint, you know who you're yes, up you against. Do. Let's hear from our lead team, Alpine. Nico Lapierre, you put in a great job yesterday in qualifying. Uh, it's great to see the 36 lead in the pack. It's early days, though, so what's possible? Yeah, it's still early, as you said, but it's great to see the pace uh, Matt is having right now. The car is feeling good under these hot conditions. Uh, we just catch the traffic back now, so we can see that it's a bit tough in the traffic to overtake here. You always have to take a bit of risk, so it's going to be a long one. But uh, so far, so good, I have to say. What are those key things that you're looking out for with the competitors, though? Sorry, I didn't get What's the key elements that you're looking out for with the competitors, with the Toyotas? Yeah, I mean, the key, we see the Toyota is uh, slowly uh, getting back in the rhythm now, so they are not as far as they were yesterday in qualifying. For sure, they're going to get better. Also, they're going to get more long on the stint. We are pretty sure they're going to be one or two laps longer than us, so maybe they're going to one step, uh, one stop less at the end. So for sure, we will try to open the gap to make sure we can do this last pit stop safely. Great, thank you. Interesting to hear Nico saying that they're expecting their rivals to go one or two laps longer on fuel. And, and that's, you know, I did think as they were just pulling away so fast, is this rabbit hair? They have to be fast because oh, yeah. they can't go long. Well, that's good news for us because we do get to see this thing ragged to within an inch of its life, uh, which is exactly what people want to see in the top class. Oh, that's early. That's early. 
Well, how early is that? 18 laps in, both United cars are in, so is AF Corsa. This is the lead of LMP2, all on pit road. So, it, uh, and that was Prema going by. So it will be early, but again, like Porsche told us, a couple of laps earlier than normal because of the formation lap and the pre-start procedures. And also, when you've got a two-car team, as I had last year with Jota, you have to split it, and you'll bring in, naturally, the car that's in front, so you don't block each other uh, yeah. when they come in. That's why we've a race to drive in the booth. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, it is a it is an LMP2 full field stop. United's Paul de Resta stayed out, Penske stayed out with Felipe Nasser, WRT stayed out with Sean Galeel, everybody else in. So, how much are the other cars gambling if all of these guys figure we need to come in now to be sure. What about the cars that remained out? Well, what it means is that the cars that remained out, they're, they're saving an extra lap of fuel, and that could have been their strategy. Uh, but also, yeah, the car, you know, they, we know they can do 19 laps as they start now, but like you said before, the yeah. parade lap, that formation lap, does take away effectively that lap of fuel. Both Jota cars stopping together in a bit of a mistake. The 28 car moved, but the lollipop man is trying to rein it back in. Little worry here with Ultimate as well. They had the door open, bit of a conflap going on. So now then, so, all right, not many changes in, in position there, I don't you think. You wouldn't expect to see that. Mm. They're all pretty close oh. on pit stop strategy oh. and pit timings. Oh. That's, that was closer. The Toyota into the final corner. That Inside the car with Sebastian Buemi would have looked a lot more tricky than, uh, than it was on yeah. the off-board shot we had. Because when you go in wide there, your only expectation is how close that exit wall is going to be to. In comes the Penske. So, again, great to see the captain here, Roger Penske. Uh, you know, we've said for years, people like Roger Penske, Chip Ganassi, are desperate to race at Le Mans. Uh, so too, apparently, is NASCAR team owner Rick Hendrick, because oh, yesterday it was announced amazing. that the Garage 56 entry next year will be a new generation NASCAR racing at Le Mans. Pit stop action in LMP2, Penske in the pit lane, the first three cars have all gone round, first four cars have all gone round, and now Pitt, this is the car that came in from the lead, Paul DeResta, but it was only in third place, ahead of the number five Penske car. Door is open again, now they were chatting with Felipe Nasser on the grid, the auto start system was not working, which is, as you explained, Dan, allows you to have your thumb on the starter button while the car's on the jacks without it actually starting, yeah, you're, which you're basically, illegal. Yeah, you're, you're full throttle, clutch down, start a button on with the car in the air and as soon as it drops it, it fires up and then you just dump the clutch and away you go so you do have two options to start these cars one on the main control panel yep. and on the steering wheel well, it looks as though the Penske has left the pit lane WRT Vector Sport one of our new teams with Nico Muller at the wheel and Algarve Pro making their first pit stops as well in the battle for the lead of LMP2 now Nick Tandy for Corvette first full season of world championship racing ever for Corvette. Nick Tandy reeling in Kevin Estra, and he was saying that the Porsches took a lot of time to build up to speed, and it looked like they were on a harder tire. Now, does that mean that there's a medium tire being used by the Corvette? And if that is the case, does that then mean that the Corvette is gonna struggle to run as long on its tires as the Porsche? They don't have enough tires in the allocation to go with new tyres at every stop. Change there in the pit lane, 22, 23 is now the order in LMP2. So Paul De Resta and the United Autosports team getting ahead of AF Corsa's Nick Nielsen in that pit stop. Correct, that's uh, the way they did it. Paul De Resta was the first of the bunch that stayed out the first time around. Did the overcut. In. Yeah, absolutely, the next time. The other fact to take into account, uh, Martin, in that GT Pro battle is that Corvette will know that we've seen those uh, reported to the stewards' decisions for both of the Porsches. Now, that could be critical. Could we be looking here at Corvette in their debut as a full-season team taking a win? Well, I mean, we could anyway on, on pace and ability and knowledge of this place. Absolutely. Because, of course, they've done the 12... They're doing the 12 hours tomorrow. They've done the 12 hours here probably for 50 of the 70 years it's been run. So they do know this track far better even than Porsche do. What's interesting in LMP2 as we ride on board is 
Uh, Sean Galeo chasing Charles Malay since the changes. United Autosports now 1 2 ahead of Pulse Citizen AF Corsa, who leads Pro Am, by the way, very comfortably. Prema, Robert Kubica now fourth. Penske fifth with Felipe Nasser. Real Team 6 with Rui Andrade, another debutante in the championship. So there's your top two, there's third, there's fourth behind the Alpine with the 46 Porsche still trying to unlap itself from most of the field. So it's a very tight lead group, but not some of our well-established names right at the front. 22 laps into this Sebring eight hours, thousand mile race. The battle at the front of LMP2 is as fierce as we anticipated. And Davidson, you've spent the last few years racing at LMP2. It's, it's a toying cost between whether this or GTE Am is the most closely contested, but certainly the driver lineups in these LMP2 cars are absolutely otherworldly in terms of the talent that is thrown at these cars. This is the most competitive LMP2 field there's ever been in the WEC, and I'm enjoying what I'm seeing so far. Uh, top teams in there, new teams like Penske, A of course as well, running cars for the first time in, in LMP2, and top drivers, young drivers coming up as well that we can keep an eye on, like Nick Nielsen who runs in third place, he was pole position, but the two United, so you just see there go past us, uh, the, two, the two blue cars there coming past us, DiResta slowly edging towards his teammate Philippe Albuquerque, but uh, yeah, very impressed so far with the class of this field behind them, by the way, and uh, a little bottled up in the traffic behind the two United cars is the Alpine not pulling away from the Glickenhaus anymore. Uh, remember, I called that a few, a couple of three laps ago, but it was 15 laps and 14 and a half seconds. It's now 21 laps and 13 and a half seconds. The Glickenhaus is closing. That was uh, Olivier Rasmussen. has found his way past uh, Sean Galeel in the number 28 Jota. Let me see on screen there. Yeah, Rasmussen, another debutant, another, another young Danish driver, first time ever in the World Championship. Silver grade is in that all new lineup that he is in with uh, Ed Jones and Jonathan, Jonathan Aberdeen. Uh, Aberdeen at least has done some uh, Le Mans, uh, European Le Mans series racing on board with Sean Galeo. Now we expect this car, Martin, to get much faster as the race progresses. And um, you know this this what this is the WRT team champions of last year. Yes. And they've got two cracking drivers that are going to step in later as well. So Sean is kind of holding the fort now. What have you seen here? Is that a spin? Or just someone just kicking up the dust on the exit of turn yeah. one. Yeah, a lot of dust. Yeah, a lot of dust. Joti car just in front of me is very much closer. Uh, oh, wasn't the Joti car? It was. Uh, it was probably. It was the Jota car. I think the Jota car is a lot closer to them than it was before, which is Oliver Rasmussen. And uh, maybe he was making his way past 777, the D-Station racing car. Three orange lights on the side of the D-Station car, third in GTE Am. It's still an Aston Martin 123 in GTE Am. And look how hard it is, even for a well-driven LMP2 car, to get around a GT car here. This is not Le Mans. You don't have a long straight into a chicane. You don't have another long straight. You don't have another long straight. Look at this, how frantic it yeah. is. The car's bouncing around, and you're trying to keep your toe in there on the throttle in the LMP2 cars to try and maximize the slight speed advantage you have in the straight line over the GT cars. As it bounces around, yeah. trying to bounce your foot off the throttle. Here we go then, Toyota closing in in on the clicking house in front. There's the GTE Am leader exiting the final or penultimate corner, corner 16 there. And the second Toyota comes by. Let's hear from the clicking house team. Olivier Platt at the wheel. What's he got to say to us? Oli, as it exits off, do you want to do a driver change or not? Yeah, driver change, driver change, Okay, copy that, copy that. OK, so it does sound like it's a bit of a, an alligator wrestling match in that cockpit, doesn't it? Uh, Louise Beckett in the pit lane. Oh. Getting ready for his driving stint, so that will be that driver change coming up. Excellent, thank you, Rail. Well, uh, spin there for Team Project One, the Inception racing car. Brendan Irene shares with Ollie Milroy and Ben Barnicote. 
Uh, Debbie Tonsall, clip of the curb on the he inside did, yeah. there, coming into 16, Ant, and, yeah. and that's, that then just leaves you a foot too wide on the exit, right? You, you usually can get away, particularly in the GT cars, using that curb, quite a bit of that curb on the penultimate corner, but I just think he carried a bit too much speed in, maybe distracted by the Jota car in front of him, can carry more speed, obviously, yeah. in a in a quite a fast corner like that one, and just, that's what this track does to you, you know, just uh, in a blink of an eye, you're facing backwards. He's recovered but lost a place. That place has gone to Sarabovi. We saw the Iron Davis 85 car coming through and easily avoiding the spa of Porsche. Right, this will be interesting. Sorry to butt in there, Greg. This will be interesting because the Glickenhaus is going to probably be with this gaggle of cars in front of us at the final corner, potentially giving Buemi a run on him before turn one. And Let's just, see how those, this just those four or five seconds on board, you could actually physically see the Glickenhaus getting closer. So Alpine now have done. 23 laps, so let's say it's a 24 lap stint regularly. Driver change here as well. Uh, so Nico Lapierre, I think, will be taking over. The Glickenhaus just gets in front. That's Biro Konopka in the bright yellow prototype. It was Buemi got, uh, got bulked. Yeah. Four laps. Four laps to pit. Four laps to pit. I got to get to the Wow. Four laps. Wow, that is a short run for Alpine. Boy, they had better have some pace and no trouble in this race. And you can't win a race like this with, with, with the caliber of driver and, and lineups that you've got here and, and cars without having a trouble free run. But boy, they need something very big. Well, what you really dread then, if you're playing that game, is a safety car. Yeah. You dread that gap getting eroded you know, all your speed that you're trying to build due to your shorter stints can get er eradicated by one safety car. Right, so we've got we've gone 24 laps. There are 244 to go. So they've got to make 10 more stops, yeah. not nine, 10. So they are at least one stop and conceivably two stops, although one may be a splash. And we know that the pit lane loss, just if you drove through the pit lane itself, is 32 seconds long. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, just if you just drove through. Lest we forget, Glickenhaus lead in the United States. Yes. That's uh, that's a fantastic headline. <laughs> Quite aside from anything else, and that if there's nothing else achieved today, you're playing the PR game. It's, oh, it's, it's a virtual it's, lead. It's, Come on, but it, it doesn't matter. Stop at some point. No, it doesn't no, matter. He's on top of the leaderboard. He's, on top he's of the, leaderboard. the leading <laughs> car. Hey, listen. It doesn't matter whether you win on speed and fuel, fuel or speed. If you if you are first at the line, you're first at the line, and that's the only thing that counts. So right now, Jim Glickenhaus and the team will take that. There's that little replay of Sebastian Buemi just getting held up behind Miro Konopka in the RC Bratislava car. Couldn't get through where he needed to, but the gap is still just a second. By the way, that uh, was the epitome of the difference between a journalist and a racing driver. It seems 100%. The way. <laughs> 100%. I, 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 I'm learning how you guys are playing it now. It's fine. It's fine. Hey, take it while you can. Yeah. As they as they would say in this neck of the woods, stop the count. <laughs> right. Let's see where they are after they pit. But uh, at the moment, yeah, yeah. To give you give you boys credit, he leads the race, but Buemi is hunting him down. He is. And yeah, Buemi was the one that got a, a bit damaged in that final corner with the with the traffic. He would have wished it was the other way around. Okay, three laps to go. They both got four laps on the upping. Yes. And, 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 we and we expected Toyota to have that advantage. And actually, because the rules are predominantly the same, you have the same amount of energy, you can burn the same amount of energy. In theory, whether you're hybrid or not, whether it's road car based or not, whether it's pink, blue or purple, doesn't make much difference. You should be able to go the same distance on the same amount of energy, it's whether it's a Glickenhaus or a Toyota. That's exactly what Olivier Plow was saying when they said you've got four laps remaining. He said, but I'm going to catch all the LMP2s. Yeah. And look where he is now. Not yeah. just P2s, but in amongst the GTs as well. And Buemi's right behind him. He sniffs a chance. But the team are right. You can't just keep coming in short of your fuel length because you're in traffic, because you're then going to end up costing yourself another pit stop. And that, as you said, is another 40 plus seconds by the time you put fuel in. Exactly. So you can't, I, yeah, pit me now, we're in traffic. No, it's not Formula One. Use the fuel. 
and he's using the traffic well as well. Yes. It's all about that luck, the timing, yeah. luck of the draw in the traffic. And once again, Pla gets away from it. Boemi is the one caught in the traffic. But right. also six, sorry, singular difference between Davidson A and McNish A. Alan McNish, there's no such thing as luck. And says, you've got to play with the luck of the draw in the traffic. But you're right, because the way the traffic falls, you can't influence how you react to it is where you exactly. find your yeah. luck. It's a balance of the luck. You definitely need a bit. We, we used to yeah. say, we used to joke when I was a tourist, uh, I had the golden stint. Where <laughs> every time I came across this car, it was in a Ooh. straight line. And we've seen a change of change position here. Change for Station up yeah. in front of the Ben Keating car. So Ben Keating on pole, led early on, made a mistake, lost a place to Paul Dallalana, loses a place there to Tomonobu Fuji in the D Station car. So still an Aston 123 in GTE Am. It's exciting stuff here with the two Toyotas now. Kobayashi is coming. To Kobayashi tell. is coming and coming fast. All that delay through turn 17, all that traffic, the profit has been taken with interest by Kamui Kobayashi. Player manager. Kamui look at the distance. Look, yeah. look at the look where Kobayashi yes. was in the distance back wow. there. All of this traffic meant that these guys slowed down riding on board. Let you see. Around the off the track there was Buemi. This is desperate stuff. Anything yeah. he can do to try and be within that car's length. The Trouble car in front, yeah, Vector Sport. Yeah, yellow at turn three, we're being told. Looks like that's the Vector Sport car of Nico Muller. Brand new team, brand new driver line up to the championship. So Nico Muller sharing with Ryan Cullinan, Mike Rockenfeller. Yeah, so he's had a, he's had a yeah, bit of a pirouette a down turn off. three. So Rocky, one-off drive in the car, predominantly because of his knowledge. And in come, ah, is this a lap that, early? This that is wasn't four laps. laps. Uh, this is two laps early. Two laps after the Alpine, the Glickenhaus comes down pit road. Maybe this is the car that Sebastian uh, Auger should be driving. He likes it to be all arms and elbows. I mean, uh, certainly looks like it is in on, from the onboards. It's one lap early. Yeah, so that's 26 okay. laps on that stint from Olivier Bart Blart, 23 for Mathieu Vazavia. It could have been something like a delayed radio message. I'm not sure, but yeah, either way, he, we know now the lap that he's come in on, lap 27. So Roman Dumas takes over 7.08. One of the uh, new up-and-coming young drivers in the championship. So across that stint, by the way, something like six tenths of a second quicker uh, across the stint for the Alpine per lap. So what are they doing with tyres? Left sides only? Well, left front, left rear. So, oh, they it looks like they've got available. a set of four. Yep, they're changing all four. And they're brand new, so they're not even the set that did qualify. I would imagine they may well have started the race on the set that ran in qualifying. So there's another 30 seconds there or thereabouts added to that pit stop because of the uh, the all four tyres being changed rather than just the one side. It is that brings the car back into the race. There's experience and there's experience in this field, isn't there? And he's got plenty of oh, it. And if is. anyone can wrestle a car around for an eight-hour race, <laughs> it's him. Yes. Yes. Right, look at this. So you've got Kamui Kobayashi now, team captain, yep. closing in on Buemi. They both oh. come in at the same time, and okay. they are the right way round in order. Yep. Because that makes quite a big difference. You don't want to be the one driving around the car in front to get to your pit box. No. It costs you a lot of time with the pullback. Well, and also, yeah, if you don't pull back accurately, you then get a penalty for impeding the car in the pit lane. Whether it's your teammates or not, rules is rules. So, yeah, look, there we go. They come in in order. So you get what I mean. If it yeah, was, if it was inverted, then the car that boxes in front of the other, uh, you know, has to pull around the car to, to stop, and it's at an awkward angle, and it, it costs you at least 20 seconds on top of your, your pit stop. Now, Boemi just wiping away the sweat there. You get that heat soak when you stop. It's such hot work. I spoke to him before the start of the race. He says it's going to be such a tough one, it's, especially at the start of the race. <laughs> Kobayashi. Fires it down. down. <laughs> Nothing happening here. Do you think he's still got his team shirt on sweat. underneath? What so sweat? That he, yeah, exactly. I think he's uh, got the full suit underneath. The team bosses don't sweat. Away they go. Don't forget, Buemi in the number eight car qualified third. The number seven car started seventh, not fourth, seventh. Yes, so they Alpine. have made up that ground. Alpine back into Where's the Where's the house? Well, it's not going to be second. Of course, they took tyres. Yeah, exactly. He'll be, they'll yeah. both be far yeah. ahead. He'll be but way back. And Ben Keating are way back as well in the background. Yeah. You can see the D station car and the, so the 33. 
now he will, during this stint, obviously be catching up with the Toyotas thick and fast. Yeah. Because of those and fresh boots he's got on. Well, now, the question is, they've put fresh tyres on. Normally, that would be indicating a double stint coming up. Roman Dumas, Roman Dumas you know, he's, he's a hard old guy. He'll, he'll do it, won't he? But he, he does, it, uh, I would, uh, in my head, I'm thinking, fresh boots, new driver, they're going to double stint. It's a good time to change the tyres, though, because it's that first stint, always, that's the hardest one on the tyres. Looking back at Kobayashi at work, and it's such a different beast. You can tell from riding on board there, the way he fights the steering wheel in the corners compared to a few years ago when he was in his lovely LMP1 car that soaked up all the bumps and had more downforce. Remember before we took those pit stops, the gap between the Alpine and the then chasing Glickenhaus is about 13 and a half seconds at the point at which the Alpine pitted. Now the gap is 13.3 seconds, but this time it's said Buemi. So the gap has not really come down through those pit stops. It's all about that stint length. Well, the real critical thing here is that Lapierre needs to continue to build that. They're going to need they're going to need 10 seconds per stint to be able to try and win this race, uh, and that's a very tall ask because empirically these cars should be very, very similar in performance. And, uh, you know, and the drivers are similar in performance, and the traffic is the same for everybody. One lap you'll catch some, next lap they'll catch some. So, so the pressure's on Alpine, there's that turn 17 bump. Pressure's on Alpine to continue to build that advantage lap by lap by lap. GTE Pro and Nick Tandy has been working this gap. It's four tenths of a second across the line last time around. This bear has pulled well away now, Jimmy Bruni, nearly 10 seconds ahead. I'm looking around now for the camera in the booth because Graham was just pointing to the screen, drawing Ant's attention to how close that battle was and how far back third place was. Even as they're doing that, director cuts to the battle in the lead of GTE Pro. This is looking very good indeed at the moment for Corvette. Yeah, Nick if, Tandy's Nick Tandy, if yeah. he sniffs the chance of a gap, he's going for it, isn't he? That's just the type of driver he is. Um, feisty, feisty. Just just to set the field for the rest of the season, I have asked our friends at Corvette Racing. We know, or we, we believe, that the Porsche have started on the hard tyre. Uh, has the Corvette started on a medium tyre? And uh, we are told that they have started on Michelin's. So thanks, guys. Thanks, I don't, if, OK, that's fine. That's the way it's going. I understand that. I, re I love that. Uh, that. That's fine. Candy's had to give up a bit of, a bit of uh, track position there to the uh, United. Finds its way past in turn one. He could see he had to deviate, move offline slightly. And as this race goes on, of course, more and more marbles appear on the uh, the exits of the corners. And, and moments like that hurt you more and more as the race progresses. Right. Wholesale changes in the pit lane for GTE Am. GTE Am pit stops. Our leader remains out, Paul Dallalana, ahead of Ben Keating, because the you saw the D station car is in and has fueled. And changed drivers. And changed drivers. Satoshi Shino in there, so that will be a double stint for him. The minimum drive time for the drivers in the race is two hours and 20 minutes, which is more than two stints in a GTE Am car and significantly less than three. And I talked to Ben Keating about this, I said, if you get a significant full course yellow 25 minutes into the stint, 15 is no use, but 25 minutes in, can you then come in top off and go for another full stint and that will be that will be it? Said, yeah, if that happens, we'll take it. Otherwise, they're expecting to triple. So Paul Dallalano, our GTE AM leader, we expect to do a triple stint. This should divide into a 10 stint race for the GT. So he'll do three, which leaves seven to be split between his two teammates. And that will be the same in pro as well. Although, of course, all the stints will be split between two drivers. Nick Tandy in the Corvette from second. The first to hit the pit lane. Interesting. Maybe they're just building in an extra lap. Lap looked like a driver change at the 33 car as well, which was there. The door was open on Ben Keating's Aston. First World Championship uh, season, full World Championship season for Corvette Racing, and we're expecting, of course, Cadillac to come with LMDH to the. World Endurance Championship as well uh, in 2024. I love watching the uh, the Corvette racing team guys in action in the pit stops. 
They're a class act, absolute world leading, so synchronized. It's a shame the camera's pulled off of them, but yeah. uh, when they get to work, it's, it's fantastic to watch. 51 is in, first of the two A, of course, a pro class Ferraris, 51 and 52 as ever were. 51, of course, Alessandro Pierre Greedy, James Collado, the reigning world champion. Just a, a quick way, word, by the way, if you look at close-up shots below the high-intensity light uh, on the Corvette there, it says uh, R.I.P. Phil Binks, who is Danny Binks' dad, uh, long-time team boss at Corvette Racing. Let's hear from the pit lane and Louise Beckett. I'm just at the number 98 pit stop and Dan uh, Palmer is coming in and there will be a driver change. Danny Pintar will be getting in the car. The wheels ready to change tyres. So it is going to be all changed at number 98. Excellent. OK, so uh, again, you know, uh, plans on a cooler afternoon compared to plans on a hot day like today may well have changed. But Paul Valadon has gone two laps longer than the 777 and a lap longer than the 33 as well. It's not going to help with that breaking that stint up, but it might help if we get a caution at some point there. Robert Kibitza and the Prema car behind Nick Nielsen. A little flash of the lights there to put a bit more <laughs> extra pressure on playing the psychological game. Well, here is... Kibitza. Yeah, here is our GTM leading Aston Martin, Northwest AMR, Paul Dallalana out. And in gets David Pittard. Driver change at Porsche as well. In gets Michael Christensen, takes over from starting driver Kevin Estra. 15 seconds added to both Porsche pit stops at their next stop. Now, that has just popped up on our screen, so will that happen on this pit stop? The team are notified before we are notified, rightly or wrongly, uh, but it may well be that this pit stop will, because the team will have been told, and they've been told it's at the next stop, and this is their next stop. So Christensen in. So they'll be praying for a safety car, basically, once uh, the Corvette has got in front of them and potentially well, it will be both Ferraris as well. Well, this drops them right back yeah. into the Ferrari battle. So after that time penalty comes in, in their next pit stop, that's when, ideally, at some point in the race, they're going to rely on that because they're so evenly matched on pure race pace. 15 seconds is an awful lot of time to try and catch back up. Didn't take it there, so no. it was a, a full okay. release. Uh, the one, I guess, bit of good news is it wasn't a drive-through, which would have been marginally worse again. Oh, that's the Algar Pro car, who's in the number 45 car, that is Stephen Thomas. Yeah, second time off track, he had a little bit of a grassy incident earlier, Stephen Thomas. 64 car, and uh, we, uh, we know we've got uh, viewers and listeners, if you want to listen when you're out and about, you can listen free on the WC app, and indeed for, via the timing screen on the WC website, with a little radio button at the top. But uh, amongst those that are watching, on his what bike right now, Oliver Gavin is watching us. Hello, Ollie. He says he's on his walk by. I, I reckon he's in McDonald's with another triple quarter pounder. Yeah. <laughs> he's gone to seed, really. So it's, it's uh, and of course, a name so closely associated with, were associated with the four and the 64 Corvettes over the years. He's, he's always been the four driver. So, yeah, I mean, he, he absolutely will be rooting for that car even more than if it was number 63, probably. Uh, Jota versus Ultimate. Again, Ultimate moving up into World Endurance Championship from the European Le Mans series. This ladder that brings you up from Road to Le Mans in LMP3 into European Le Mans series with P3 and then P2 and then up into the World Championship. They have made that jump. Mathieu Lay, the most experienced of their three drivers, his younger brother Jean-Baptiste joins them and Francois Herriot and he's right up behind Oliver Rasmussen. This is the battle for eighth place. I'll tell you what, car number 34 there, the yellow and yep. green car in the background, uh, that's, yeah, he's redeeming himself from yesterday's mistake, yes. as is Fabio Scherer. He's got himself in that into Europol car right up there in the middle of the mix with the LMP2s. So, well, uh, yeah, messed it up yesterday, but he's, he's driving a good race so and, far. And another who will be watching, unfortunately, rather than driving that car in place of Fabio Scherer, is Alex Brundle, who came here to race that car. He is the full season entry in that car. Uh, and unfortunately, having tested negative to fly, tested positive when he arrived here. So he is sitting in isolation. I'm sorry that you're not sitting in the car in Splendid isolation, but he will undoubtedly be back and ready to race yeah, again. Texting Alex. Yeah. texting Alex, and uh, yeah, he was feeling quite rough with it. 
um, but he's, he's now assures us that he's feeling fine and uh, absolutely gutted he can't be here racing today. Interesting, look at the graphic at the bottom of the screen. How is it that the AF Corsa car has got 35 laps on its tyres, the Prema car have got 32 laps on its tyres, and they're only on lap 32 of the race? And the answer is that the Prema car started on fresh tyres and the AF Corsa car started on tyres that he had qualified on. So that's the, that's the lap difference in that tyre. Look at this battle. Front, head of the field in LMP2. The two teammates, these two hardened pros, Paul de Resta behind Philippe Albuquerque. I, I'm really loving this battle. <laughs> Talk a bit about this, 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 this kind of thing. Well, I was going to ask you, actually, about the rival between teams at this kind of level, but what about the drivers within oh, the same it's team? epic. It's epic, the battle. I mean, there's nothing more than the drive. I mean, Albuquerque looking in his mirrors, driving his heart out, thinking, no, de Resta's catching me up. What more can I do? And de Resta's thinking, where do I seize my opportunity to get past this guy and hopefully start pulling away? And then you get out the car and you shake hands and you give each other a hug and say, yeah it's great yeah no hard feelings and you get on with it but yeah, and then you trip look at this for sweaty work that's brilliant then you trip him up down the stairs yeah, <laughs> <laughs> all, of the, all of the above especially at spa the stairs of doom you just give him a little shove philip albuquerque leads from paul de resta and nick nielsen still in third place that air of course a car on its debut again with a new driver lineup the, the last time we had the 83 car in LMP2, only Francois Perauda remains from that driver lineup. He's brought Nick Nielsen and Alessi Rivera with him from winning in GTEM last year back into LMP2. They still lie in third place. What you constantly do when you're the car behind, like the is at the moment, you're eyeing up the next cars coming up your way. So now he's thinking, oh, I've been caught behind the D station here. Do I go around the outside? Yes, he does. That's such a risky move. But like I said before, a pro driver like De it's a bit easier for him to manage as the WRT team yeah. warming up for their second round of pit stops. A bit of Hong Kong fooey going on there. Uh, Change there as the 33 Four Horsemen car is back ahead of the D Station car in GTEM. Northwest AMR still lead from TF Sport. Like Florian Latour in the 33 car. There he is, taking over from Ben Keating. And uh, Santoshi Hoshino, the gentleman driver in the D Station car. So you see how it works, just talking about the traffic. You see, Dires is now falling behind because both corners, he's had a GT car in front of him. Yeah. So you don't plan that inside the car, but it, it kind of you do need to rely on that luck of the draw where you get the traffic and then then it's up to you how you deal with that situation once you're there and to talking about your situation let's say this was you last year how much does the team say okay you've got three cars in front be careful of such and such because it's their am guy absolutely i ask the team actually proactively yeah. to warn me or let me know when there is the slowest of their driver lineup in the car. Maybe you've spotted someone in testing that's had a few spins, a few off-track moments, and, and not seen you if you've gone down the inside or whatever, like DiResta had to do in yeah. the final corner around the outside of the D-Station car. You need to know who's in that car. So you, you get guidance from your engineer. You ask for it um, when you're in the car, and they'll tell you next driver coming up is so-and-so and you're prepared for it. A bit like, you know, it's like coming up against a, or up against, it's like coming up to a learner driver on the road. Yeah. You, you have to give them more respect, yeah. and it's your responsibility as the more accomplished driver to avoid any kind of moment. Again, goes back to a very basic rule. It is the duty of the driver of the faster car to safely pass. And the driver, yeah, with, yeah. with more, more experience, yeah. uh, you know, and more capacity deep into this second stint now for the lead of the race. Remember that gap we talked about just a little bit while ago, it seems. Uh, that 13 and a half seconds is now back up to 21 and a half seconds. So the Alpine uh, is pulling away. Going to have a listen in to what's going on with Porsche and the 92 car. Let me know what, uh, one bit, uh, yeah, the situation. Yeah, copy, 91, same as us. We will have to serve a 15 second penalty before our next stop. So we'll, when you come here next time, we'll have to hold you 15 seconds. Both 91 and 92 for the start. I'll guide you when we... Well, there's Michael Christensen being appraised the situation. 
This rear view looked like they were behind a safety car. You just had these cars all just sitting there that are inches apart and with no difference in speed between them. The pro cars, the am cars, it's all the same. And we've talked about how hard it is for an LMP2 car, for a hypercar to make their way through traffic. For the GTE pros against a well-driven GTE am car, that is equally as hard. You have to consider them as being in the same class as each other. First hour of the Thousand Miles of Sebring, the season opener for season 10 of the FIA World Endurance Championship. After a, a week leading up to the race of very mixed weather, the great and the good gathering on an absolutely typical flailing Sebring uh, morning, bright sunshine, high track temperatures, high air temperatures, and a nice good start from the field. But the GT field a long way behind where they should have been, which is right up behind the LMP2 uh, cars. And that has resulted in a penalty for both Porsches that were the front row of that grid. Toyota didn't qualify strongly. Alpine making good running early on. And the Glickenhaus in second place as it got by the best placed of the LMP2 cars. Uh, United Autosports had qualified superbly. And uh, the difference in pace on this tight and twisty Sebring circuit, laden with bumps and potential trip hazards, very different. In GTE Pro, Porsche versus Corvette was the story of the early laps. In GTE Am, Aston Martin 1, 2, 3. And that is how they remained at the start of the race as well. Three wide into turn one, nothing to see here. Everybody escaped, but the first few laps were totally drama free. Glickenhaus moving up into second place as Olivier Pla started to find his feet in what looks like a pretty hard car to handle over all the Sebring bumps. And a change for the lead. Paul Dallalana getting ahead of pole man Ben Keating. Keating, one of the drivers in the field doing double duty, will race in the Sebring 12 hours on Saturday. Skating across the dirt, the number 31 WRT car in the hands of Sean Galeo. No major dramas for them. Corvette taking the lead of the GT Pro field and changes in the order as well in the GTE AM as the Aston Martins shuffled around. Alpine first to stop, followed by Glickenhaus and Toyota. Toyota coming back out ahead of the Glickenhaus as Corvette moved to the front of the field ahead of the Porsches in GTE Pro. GTE Am Northwest AMR still leading. United Autosports 1 2 in LMP2. Alpine leads from the two Toyotas in Hypercar. Sebring 1000 Miles, first race, season 10 of the FIA World Endurance Championship. Martin Haven, Graham Goodwin, and Anthony Davidson, your commentary crew. There's the lineup after 38 laps, the first hour of the race. One major fallback has been from the 71 Ferrari Spirit of Race, and Louise Beckett reporting they had problems with a fuel feed pipe. So Pierre Rag has been, as the car's lost four laps in the pits, they've now rejoined right at the tail of the field. But Andy Davidson, it's been clean so far, and maybe one little bit of contact, a couple of cars uh, with unforced errors off track. But other, th other than that, it's, as you come to expect from Sebring, like just hard, fast racing. Yeah, there have been a few moments, um, but yeah, I, I actually would have expected a few more for this brutal racetrack. Oh, and there we maybe, go. Maybe, one that, maybe we've spoken too soon. It's a car number 34, had problems yesterday, the inter Europol competition car spun and crashed yesterday in qualifying. Now we we'll back around, yeah, Shearer uh, was driving a great race. Okay, so what's what happened has here. happened? Oh, he's gone down the inside into turn 13, the car's turned in, there's not enough room. A bit of contact, but I would have expected him to slow down quite as badly as he did from that. Cool, the ultimate just about car. Yeah. Just oh, just blimey. Just the wall there, it was magnet-like. But I don't what? think that moment has caused it. Maybe he's got a puncture. He's, he's got very a low, puncture. isn't he? Around comes the uh, all-end car. So into the pits, Robert Kubica now. Not quite sure why he has come in as well for Prema. Yeah, we're, in, we're in into the, uh, the pit stop window. The of the pit stop well, let's get down to the pits. Louise Beckett had word from us, for us. Yeah, just to give you word 
from the pit stops. Uh, Francois Perodo has now got into the number 83 LMP2 AF Corsa. Uh, looking at United, both of those are coming in and have got driver changes lined up. But the big news is that Manu Collard is getting ready to get into the number five Penske any moment now. Well, great story at, with Manu Collard that uh, he thought they were on the wind-up when they phoned up and said, we want you to come and drive for us. Graham Goodwin. Is it fuel? Is, is, did they, maybe they didn't get the fuel they should have got in the last. Is he out of fuel? That's a really good shout. We'll, uh, we will send Louise down to Inter Europol to see whether that was issued. Now, not, not both United cars have come in. 23 has stopped. Tw uh, 22 has stopped again. It was the better place of the two. That has fueled. 23 remains out, so Paul Garesta cycles back to the front again. They were out of sync, weren't they, at the yep. beginning of the race? 22 had, came yeah. in first, yeah. So that will continue on pretty much through the whole race unless yes. there's a safety car. Yeah. Yep. It's uh, 23 seconds is the lead now uh, of Nicolapia ahead of the car on board with Melvin and Great Toyota. There's uh, Got to be looking at here. Here. This is the eight making its way through three wide there. Yeah, nice Brenton move Reeve the in the middle in that Porsche. No, That's no. a GTE and battle as well, isn't it? Ollie Milroy now. Uh, oh, Ollie Milroy's taken yeah. over. Okay, so his first drive in the World Championships. So the number eight car on its way, but is losing time again at this phase of the race. The Alpine clearly had a bit of trouble, a, a bit of traffic rather, lost a couple of seconds to the uh, so Here comes the, the 23 car. This yep. is going to require, it's a driver change there as well. We expect to see Sean Galeal in from second in the 31 as well. Confirmation on timing screens that the Peter Pan of endurance racing, Manu Collard, is now aboard. <laughs> uh, Philippe Albuquerque and Phil Hansen joined by Will Owen in the 22 car. Will Owen, another graduate from American, uh, from uh, from Le Mans Cup and from European Le Mans series, the American driver. So I, that the so incident bet between cars 34 and 35. That was the that's the, the, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. the incident we saw at turn 13. Is under investigation. Well, that's I standard. Believe. They, they investigate yeah, everything. But yeah. for me, I would say that was a racing incident. Yeah. It, you know, they, they yes, they clashed and the car went off wide, but you know, it's good hard racing and the car was had a legitimate reason to be there down the inside. Did the Euro, uh, the into Europe whole car yeah. and um, it was just yeah, this car was seeing coming in. Sean Galeal in from second place. Then does the door open? There will be a driver change. Running around is that's Robin Fryns, right? Fryans. It was Robin yeah. Fryns. Yeah. Uh, also, by the way, back into the race, it was 2 minutes 20 seconds on pit lane for the 34 car. Uh, not least, I think, the, the crawl down to its pit stall. Yes. And welcome to the Endurance, uh, well, the endurance Championship, Esteban Gutierrez. There is the Glickenhaus, Roman Duma at the wheel. Early in his stint in fourth place overall and in hypercar, just squeezing by the 22 United United first and second. So it's now Phil Hansen ahead of Josh Pearson. Another welcome to a brand new name, a rookie in the championship. Josh Pearson, the young American driver. Well, let's hear what the Glickenhaus team are thinking. Okay, I'm going to speak with Kevin. Hi, Francois, how are you? I have no drink. Hit them, no drink, hit them. Okay, copy that, copy that. How do they understand what they're... You know, to us, he's speaking in a goldfish bowl. We go, yeah, yeah, got that. What? Uh, no drink system. Ah, okay. And if there's ever a race and a condition or a car where you need <laughs> a drink system, <laughs> it would be this right now. Oh, if he's in for a double stint. You might have to go back on your words, Martin, yeah, from what this well. guy can, can, can definitely do a double stint round here. No drink. Obviously, he can take a drink in the pit stop. Yeah. He should be OK. He should, but that's, he's going to he's gonna feel it. Here's another uh, little bit of insight you can give us, man. The drink systems, they've taken a big leap in recent years. Tell us a little bit about that in George Racing. Have they really? <laughs> uh, <laughs> which drink system have you been uh, well, <laughs> studying? But, but I gather by the time you get to the end of a, a stint, you might as well have put a tea bag in there. Yeah, they are there. They are very hot. But um, yeah, it, it's, you know, it's these things sometimes happen in, uh, in sports cars. You just have to deal with it. And I'm sure with the experience, he, he will be able to deal with this one. Will Roman Dumas? 
Well, let's catch up with Euro Interpol's Fabio Scherer. Fabio Scherer, you've brought in the number 34. Um, we saw the ultimate driver come up to you and have a few words. Tell us what happened out there. Um, there was a gap, so uh, I went for it. I was next to it and uh, he still turned in so um, i would say it's racing accident because otherwise he would spawn or i would spawn if it would not be enough to next to it so i'm sorry for him but uh, i would call it racing accident especially on a track like this where you don't have a lot of space it's even tighter and i could see you're clearly exhausted from your stint is it hard yeah, it's, uh, exactly. It's really hot, but um, we are struggling a bit balance-wise through the whole weekend, So, especially with the bumps, so it makes it even ho uh, harder to drive, so you need to be even more concentrated, and that was my main struggle, I would say. Yeah, but uh, luckily the pace was good, I catched up a lot of cars, so I'm super happy after how the weekend started and after, uh, yeah, I got cold, uh, screwed into cold water after the COVID from Alex, so I would say it was a pretty good stint now. And what was the fuel situation? Did you have to come in because you were running out of fuel? I thought so, but it's not sure. There is an issue. We power cycle the car. Uh, it looks like it's working now, so let's see what it was. Thank you. Thank you. I've got to say, actually, Fabio Scherer not only talks a good interview, but I, I, he's absolutely right. You know, he wasn't expecting to be driving here. Boom, you're in the car. Uh, and actually, then to take the start of the race and, and to be sleeves rolled up from the back of the grid, work his way through the GT traffic with no, you know, narrow, narrow mark on the car. I think he's absolutely right. I think that was a good stint to start the race. It was a good stint. I mentioned it before. He had worked his way up from very last position on the grid to be in the mix of the LMP2 field midfield there so he was driving a beautiful stint and uh, I don't blame him entirely for that incident as he pointed out it was a racing incident and at that moment in 13 you needed the compliance this is a great little cameo that is Francois Perodo in the 83 car ahead he is Manu Collard who for many years coached uh, Francois Perodo and has co-driven him um, uh, including uh, in LMP2 in the past and those two together now the now Penske man and the AF Corps man so we're listening to what's going on with Manu. So 83 is a silver driver as well. 83, 44 pitted. So 83 is fourth position. Be patient. Excellent. He's a silver driver as well. Doesn't say, oh, by the way, it's your mate Francois Perona, yeah. but he will know if it's the silver driver in the car, it is Francois. So he knows what the deal is here. Yeah, That's he what I was talking about. Goes. You know, you, you, you get a warning from your warning, but information from your team about who you're coming up against. So he knows that if I send one down the inside, like he might do here in turn seven, oh. Perona may yield, but he doesn't. It's good rating between these two. And uh, despite uh, Manu Kola being classed as a silver, it's, kind of, it's, 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 it's kind bronze. of it's incredible to think that with his wealth of experience. Louise Beckett. Oh, sure. Care that they're classing as silver, I don't know. But um, uh, what I could say is, uh, like you're saying about their relationship, Francois Perodo is the first person that Manu called when he got the Penske call. So, what do I do? Oh my God! It's amazing. Take it, take it. <laughs> Francois Perodo is a bronze. Manu Collar is a silver rated driver. That's because he's 196. That's yeah. what I meant. I was talking about yeah. uh, Collard when I mentioned the silver. Yeah. You know, it's still, it's, it's kind of unthinkable that he's dropped down to a silver. I know it's because of age, and, yeah. and well, the, but his experience it's is... It's actually not the DFI ranking, it's actually the colour of his hair. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, you know what, I'm taking notes here. Well, that's I could be. You've been a bronze bag, for years I keep myself in, in good nick. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I could be a much uh, valued silver driver. But <laughs> but it's, it's like when Martin Brundlen and Mark Blundell raced at Daytona in the 24 hours because yep. they were both back down to silvers. Yep. You, what? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Now Change then, of talk, drivers. Talking about this, just very quickly on Manukola, Roman Dumas, around 400 race starts each in racing cars. Josh Pearson, around a dozen. There, we've got drivers here in single digits in race car starts. We've got drivers nearing the 500 race mark. I mean, there's a phenomenal range of, of, of experience, and all of them equally fast. Josh Pearson is on fire here. He yep. is catching up Phil Hansen, 
Now, this is the critical part of the race. The two very experienced hands of Diresta and Albuquerque have got out of the car, and now this is really the backbone of it. This, yeah, here is Diresta here on camera, cool, calm, collected, as you'd expect from him. His work is done for now, and now he watches on to see, right, this is the real race. This can make or break it for our car, and we're watching a, an incredible performance right now from Pearson catching up the leader. 45 laps into the 1,000 miles of Sebring, round one, season 10 of the FIA World Endurance Championship, United Autosports, 1-2 in LMP2, ahead of the brand new team, Prema, new team Penske in fourth, AF Corsa in fifth place, with Francois Perona, the reigning AM champion. Back in the GTE AM field, though, here comes the only, or oh, the car of the only driver who has started every race in the field. Uh, in, in the history of World Endurance, Christian Reed, 77, Dempsey Proton Porsche, moves ahead of the Iron Dames Ferrari, change for fourth place, and that little battle has been swinging to and fro all the way behind the lead three Aston Martins. That's the latest, and it's well, been a reasonably long history of generational uh, programs. Sebastian Prio in his first race starts here. Dad Andy, of course, a firm part of the Ford program some years ago. And Seb, uh, now a factory driver with Multimatic, together with Harry Tinkler, placed in the 77 car. That's an interesting one for what comes next. And Christian Reed, of course, started racing with his father, Gerald. Uh, who is in the garage? Uh, Gerald and Christian Reed, and uh, yeah, they were run by Proton Competition in those early days. Now they run Proton Competition. Of course, that was done with uh, the Feltmeyer father yep. and son, and we'll see. Uh, first, Felbama Jr. in the uh, European World Series this year in LMP3. Horst Felbama Jr. must be in his late 40s by now, if not 50 yeah. plus. What so, is there not a, a Horst Felbama the third? Uh, let's hope so, because uh, uh, Horst Felbama Jr. Uh, sadly lost his father a couple of years ago, came back, I think, in tribute to dad. And it's great to have him back in sports car racing, an absolute gentleman. Dirty burgers all round, excellent. I was talking to Christian Reed about three or four years ago, and, and his kids are karting. I knew they were karting. Oh, yeah. I said, are they going to be following? And he went, no, 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 no. They're going to they're gonna play tennis, you know. No. No, no he can't uh, stop them. They are just too determined. No, he's now he's had to embrace it, I think. F4, I think, now for his, uh, his eldest son. Just Robin Frines. Just watching this battle of, uh, yeah, Robin Frines. Just uh, taking the fight to Ed Jones in front in the number 28 Jota. Now we would expect some pretty uh, electric lap times from Fryens. He's a, he's a good pair of hands and very quick. Obviously uh, champion last year in the WRT team. And our pro, the 45 car, that car towards the back of the field, field now. Reddy Binder, uh, previous champion for the team in the Asian Le Mans series. This is an altogether different kind of fish in the F1 World Endurance Championship. There's the 31 car with Fines. I saw a bit of a mistake from him in turn seven. It looked like he just overcommitted to the corner. The rear getting a little bit light mid-corner. But uh, ragged on the exit. He could get a bit neater through that corner and maximise the traction. Glad that I was just think, again thinking something and immediately get a shot behind the Alpine there, the 46 car. That's the Team Project One car, remember, that started a lap down. Matteo Caroli uh, brought that car in from second place uh, on the pit, on the, uh, the kind of count back of the pit stops, but a massive amount of time picked up in that first stint from Caroli. Enough that has put Michael Pedersen now back out, seventh in class. That was a stellar stint from Matteo Caron to start that race. Yeah, well spotted. Um, we could see him making headway, not making positions because he was a lap down earlier on in the race. But uh, now, yeah, like you say, getting up there and uh, a very impressive first stint, or first two stints. Yeah, there's great. still still a lap behind the leaders in GTM, but as you say, Graham, carving their way through the field. Now, of course, they started with, with their fastest driver, and now, like some of their rivals who they have passed, they've got to put in their gentleman driver, so that pace then evens itself out. At some stage, uh, the others will have their faster drivers in when the gentleman driver is in their car, so that will come to them. 51 Ferrari.
currently lying in fourth place, James Collado, the reigning world champion. It's easily done on the exit of turn five there. It's kicking up a bit too much dust and it takes away your momentum down that next straight. Here's the battle that rages on between the two United Autosport cars, leading the field in LMP2. You've got the Bratislava car in the way through turn five where we just saw yeah. 51 go off. That yellow car, Miro Konopka started the race, is still in the car, so it does look as though ARC Bratislava basically got him in. Get your two hours, 20 out of the way, then okay, release the kids and let them have at it. And, and that car, it is running still in uh, 15th place in LMP2. It's fourth of our Pro-Am entries, but undoubtedly they will pick up the pace a little later in the race. It's a, it's a really fascinating battle, this. This is Phil Hansen, if you like, the first major young driver project uh, for United Autosports, with a hugely intensive programme, a massive success uh, for Phil, uh, and running contact is the next step on that ladder uh, with young Josh Pearson. Josh, by the way, this is his fourth uh, uh, LMP2 race. He raced at 15 years old under a waiver with uh, the Interweather's Export Scott Championship at the 24 Hours of Daytona. Two race wins in a, albeit not a very deep field in the Asian Le Mans series at Yas Marina, just days after his 16th birthday. Here's number four, then tomorrow he does the 12 Hours of Sebring yeah. as well. I'll tell you what, he's a good find for United. Yeah. They've done well to find him. And, uh, you know, of course, in that lineup in LMP2, you need one silver or a bronze. You can't have three platinums or golds in your lineup. So they depend on, like I said before, they are the backbone of your team. Yeah. They do. Your race is in their hands, really. They dictate your overall performance because the pros, like we saw with Albuquerque and, and, and um, Paul de Resta, you're talking about hundreds between them from lap to lap. But the bigger disparity comes from your silver or bronze drivers. Yep. 98 car pushing on. That was a great stint to start the race, by the way, from Paul Dallana. Uh, two minutes, 2.4 uh, is average lap uh, through that first stint against a 2.03.1 from Ben Keating, who most certainly knows his way around here. And yep. again, as a mark, we said a little earlier about this Matteo Caroli stint to start. His stint was an average of two minutes, 0.3, wow. quicker than both of the, fr the factory Ferrari drivers that started this race. Well, David Pittard with the lead in the GTE Amp class in that uh, blue, green and yellow 98 AMR, Northwest AMR car. Second and third, the two other Aston Martins run by Tom Ferrier's TF Sport team. 33 car, Ben Keating's four horseman car, that lying in second place. D Station in third, then 77, the best, the Dempsey Proton cars, ahead of the Iron Dames, 85. So, Porsche and Ferrari battling behind the Aston Martins. But the Astons, as you can see, look, there's 23 seconds first and third, only five seconds back from the D Station car to fourth. So the D Station car against Satoshi Yoshino, the weakest link in their chain, if you like, their gentleman driver. He is losing a little bit of ground to the cars that are chasing. In the GTE Pro field, Corvette leads the pair of Porsches, who have a 15-second penalty to serve between 21 and 37 seconds back. They should just come out ahead of the Ferraris, but it does hand Corvette Racing a very substantial advantage early in this race. It most certainly does, and uh, it's, oh dear me, a big, big wiggle wide there. And that's lets the Corvette go through on the number seven car. Car stepped out uh, there, the number seven car on Kamimi Kobayashi. And, and he he's doing well to, to hang on to that. Yeah, he's losing ground thick and fast to Sebastian Buemi, so he's pushing on, pushing on a bit too hard through turn five. Is Kobayashi maybe used up too much of those tyres on that Toyota? Remember, they double stinted, they committed to that double stint on these uh, on these tyres, these Michelin tyres they run on. And I'm just looking back to see where Roman Duma is. He's seven seconds he's now catching, catching, behind, catching. as expected. Yep. He's catching the two Toyotas, but there's a six second margin now between Sebastian Buemi and Kamui Kobayashi. There's going to be an unscheduled stop for one of the cars towards the tail of the field in the number 69 Lynx car that we'll see uh, Giancarlo Fisichella aboard later in the race. We'll need to come under a black and orange flag. There is that moment. Watch, watch the, uh, the back end of the, the Toyota. The oh, one. just and then again the there. Actually, it was the exit of turn four. I don't know if he hit the curb on the apex of turn four, which is a big no-no. That's the thing that's going to... Here we go. Yeah. He has it. No, he doesn't. He just loses the rear. He almost yeah. spun it. 
Well, wow, look at the way that the car skates in here as well. You know, in the, in the, in the outside shot, you could really see it just here sliding in. On onboard shot. Quite see, yeah, that's the, it was a bit earlier than that. You, you, saw, you saw it just skipped out of line, and it took him a while to just gather that up. That is not what we would usually expect to see at the Toyota. And you saw the Corvette having to really change its line. Oh, yeah. Tanner going, oh, get out of the way. Yeah, we wouldn't have expected that. Yeah. Right, well, let's hear from WRT, number 31 car, currently uh, lying in ninth place. Yeah, the car is very difficult to drive. Very difficult. Copy. Window is open. Yeah, so complaining bitterly about the balance of the car, and like we said before, in these hotter, earlier stints in this long, long race today, 1,000 miles from Sebring, it's, uh, it can be a very different car to drive at the early stages. He's saying, look, I'm hanging on here. Um, he's faster than the, than the Jota in front of me. He is edging closer. Oh, oh and a 34 okay. again. It's got to be the same problem, isn't it's, it? It's, well, here's my rule of thumb. Can you count all four tyres? Yes. Has he hit anything? No. Electronics. Could be electronics, could be a fuel pickup problem, but yeah, lights are off. Can this so be electronics. Be off course, yellow. In immediately comes the up beam. By the way, was he due? It's lap 49. I'll double check that for 24 you. and 25 is 49. Yeah, he was due. He was just due. He was due. Yes, he he was. might have come in a lap early. It's a local yellow at turn six and seven. Well, it's going to be a matter of whether or not he can recycle the power yeah. on that. Um, I'm proud to say, as he came in, it was 35 seconds at the at the pit blend lines. 33 seconds. He's taken 20 seconds out of the totas on yeah. that stint. It yeah. was 13 seconds on the first stint. But he'll lose out here because he did stop under full racing conditions. Oh, if, the yeah, if the Toyotas oh, can we stop are going full course under yellow. full course yellow, that's what they're going to do. That lead that he's been steadily building up, like I said, that's going to go against them Cancel, now. Cancel full course yellow. Cancel it. Full okay. course ah, yellow. Right, so it saved him. Not going to go against him. <laughs> Cancel full course yellow. He's going to ruin the Cancel race, right? Course right. Course he's he's back. That's yeah, why. Course, yeah. Allard Kalf at home just messaged me saying Toyota are going to need safety cars here because they can't full win Cancel full course yellow. Cancel full course yellow. Well, it's been cancelled on the timing the screens. Board. Cancel full course yellow. Uh, it, yeah, we heard you, Eduardo. We yeah, I know, but th that, that, is <laughs> to the, that is not for us. That's to the team. Yeah. Uh, and again, that's not on Discord. That's on, I mean, that's on Discord as well. But that is okay. We are not going full course yellow. Ignore what you see at the side of the track. Again, you know, the the the, the chain of command has to be so quick. Yeah. I mean, you know, we we saw that in in the end of the Formula One World Championship, the chain of command has to be so instantaneous. What's what are we seeing here? Another problem. Another problem for Kobayashi, this time in turn He's three. He's massively, isn't he? Oh. Tires have given up. That's the owner-manager problem there, the player-manager. <laughs> no, you're... Uh, I, I thought we'd seen the Toyotas taking tires, did we not, at the first stop? I thought they, but, dumped, I mean, they double stint, and that's why the uh, yeah. that's why the Lincoln no. House lost position to I them, exactly and right. why he's coming back out. Uh, yeah. Maybe maybe that was the red and white car that I've got in my head. Yeah. So anyway, uh, we are oh, told no new time. Oh, I'm just past the entrance to the pits. Oh. So they have got, that is an electronics issue, isn't well, it? He's pulling over with the headlights still on, and then he's switching the car if he's power cycling it. Yeah. Just as Scherer was saying, yeah. he power cycled it, got it going again. Yeah. I've seen this happen before with LMP2 cars. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it, it was is that it actually electronics that caused it. And, and oftentimes, it's things like the, the connector for the steering wheel is sort of throwing in a false neutral or a, or a false um, earth or something. We had this happen to us at Jota uh, at Silverstone first race with them, actually, uh, where the car stopped when Roberto Gonzalez was at the wheel. And we, it opened up this huge investigation working with Cosworth Electronics to get to the bottom of what it was, yep. and it took a long, long time to figure it out, yep. to the point where we, we weren't, still quite, weren't quite sure, and it happened to the United in Fuji as well that same year. I can remember a conversation with uh, someone from Orica actually involving one of the other suppliers when this formula came together with the Spec Gibson uh, uh, extract powertrain on the car, that to get to that cost cap, what they were having to do was to basically knit together some pretty cost cap components and for a while that took a time it, it meant that there were some issues about compatibility and the early life of these cars they, you wouldn't know it now they're phenomenal uh, but there were some issues yellow now at turn three and i bet that's the 34 again yeah it is indeed that's uh, rock yeah. 
I, I am afraid. I, and this, this, is, uh, this is not a great weekend for the team. I have a feeling that car is going to lose a lot of time in the pit lane because you just can't keep sending it out in the hope that it's fixed. Uh, and and uh, I don't know quite how you know that it's fixed. Uh, if it is that problem that I've just remembered, the problem that caused it or would make it happen were bumps yeah. in the road. Where are we? Sebring. Well, electronics... Well, got lots of bumps. Electronics so, yeah. hate heat and vibration. Yeah. The, uh, really, more than anything else. Uh, more than damp, they, heat, they hate heat and vibration. Kabibi Kobayashi, by the way, is reporting and not happy with the tyre grip and traction at this stage of the stint. No, what's it, Sherlock? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yes, I think he's possibly the, the least happy. Uh, battle for third in GTE Am here. Satoshi Hoshino in the black and green D station Aston. Closing in right behind is the Iron Dames car, Michelle Gatting. So the Dane took over from Sara Bovi, who started the race. And uh, again, you can see uh, Shino San, the car bouncing all over the uh, pavement here, but it does, it does ride the bumps well, the Aston Martin, and maybe that's the difference between it and the Porsches and the Ferraris and the GTM cars. Less BOP and more, um, yeah, sort of nice, comfortable ride. Uh, so team team yeah. manager, yeah, sorry, just butt in there, Martin. Team manager of car 34 has been asked to bring the car in to repair it. It's a no-brainer. You have to. You can't just keep having it stop out on track. Eventually, there's going to be a big shunt. Battle in the GTE Am class for fourth place. D Station Satoshi Hoshino ahead of Michelle Gatting for the Iron Dames team. Now, this is for Iron Dames, it's a step up from the European Le Mans series into the World Endurance Championship. Michelle was one of the drivers that was here as 34 gets going again on his way back to the pits. Michelle, one of the drivers that joined us in the booth in the last race of the World Endurance Championship in Bahrain last season. Really great to see her in the car and race. Really disappointed because I was actually hoping to snaffle her for our Le Mans commentary team. But I suppose, you know, you've got to let the kids race, haven't you? Rather than just joining the old ones like us talking about it. Well, 34 back on its way. Uh, and the, this battle for fourth place is an indicator that the Dempsey Proton Porsche 77 is up into third. First time there has not been an Aston Martin 1-2-3 in 90 minutes of racing. Kudos by the way in this battle to Satoshi Hoshino, has not always been the quickest of the bronze drivers. He's fended Michelle Gatting off, who's in a rich reign of form for several laps here. So well done to the Japanese gentleman driver. He's the guy behind D Station, and this is a big step forward in form for him champion in the Ferrari Challenge last year, Michelle Gatting, after a stellar season where she essentially showed up and won almost every single race. Really, really great stuff. Porsche, second and third, and so much closer now to the Corvette. Did Corvette take tyres? Did Porsche take tyres? Porsche, so at 1 minute 23, they take the tyres on the last yep. stop, the Corvette did not. Remember that 15 second uh, additional mm -hmm. uh, stop to come for both of the Porsches. It's the 92 that's the threat here. Uh, Michael Christensen knows he's got to use what he's got underneath him here. Need to call one of those Michelins right now if they're going to have any hope on pace here uh, with the time they're going to lose on pit lane. Yeah, you can see from the graphic, 50 laps on Nick Tandy's tyres, 24 on the Porsche. So that's a stint, 34 into the pit lane. And, it's well, it, hopefully it? it's not the end of the race, but hopefully, again, you know, even in the pit lane, it's, it's not playing... Uh, it's not playing fair. So I'm afraid that, you know, and I don't know, and this is my problem with electronics. If it was a water leak, you could see when the water stopped leaking out. Right, we've fixed it. If it's a fuel tank leak, you can see it's not leaking anymore. When electrics leak, you can't see, if they just throw you across the room. And your road car is? A Morris Minor. There you go. Both of my fuses work, that's fine. I've never had to change either of them. I've owned it since 1989. <laughs> When it stops, I know it's not electronics. When are you uh, making the switch then to go electric, Martin? I can't afford electric. <laughs> Barely. Oh, here we go here for we fourth go. place. Michelle Gatting on the inside, down into Sunset Bend. Now she needs to bring it out a little wider here to avoid the big bump midway through. Makes the pass. 
Michel Gatting up to fourth for the Iron Dames in the GTEM class. Satoshi Shino down to fifth. And behind him, closing in, is the next Porsche in the queue. That's the 56 car, Ollie Milroy. And out of, the, yeah, out of corner 16, the Shino sand ran a little wide, just asked a bit too much of the car. Good to see him pushing on, though. And um, yeah, it was a great little battle while it lasted. The Glickenhaus in. Roman Dumas stays in the car as well. Now, and he reported that the drink system wasn't working very early in the stint. Not that he needed it then, but he'll need it now. And that's so why the driver door was open yeah. just then. They were Changing just taking, the bottle or hitting uh, something they, with a hammer. Well, no, they just hand you a, a drinks bottle, a long straw on it, so you can get to it. And then you just throw it back to uh, your, your driver helper, and away you go. So uh, a stomach full of uh, isotonic liquid. It's lovely when you go sloshing around for the first few laps. <laughs> but what you need to is all or nothing. That was exactly my thought. A nice cold stomach of fluid, and you're bouncing around like nobody's right, business. Right, here we go. Car 92 closing in on Nick Tandy. But you've got to be smart. Where can you use the tyre advantage? And Nick Tandy's done a great job to hang on to those tyres, to keep them in good nick. Every up. lap they can good do tish. this is just desperate <laughs> stuff for Porsche. Well, the, but the deal is, if the Porsche really comes calling, the Corvette team will just say, let him go, it's not your battle. You've got older tyres, he's got newer tyres, Toyota come in, this is number seven Speaking car. Of newer tyres, uh, Kobayashi won't wait to get out of that car, hand it over and for that uh, Toyota number seven to get fresh. Okay, so, so they're stopping a lap early. Because uh, eight and seven pitted together, they're stopping a lap early. Driver totally. change, yeah. Kamui's had enough. I'm the boss. I'm getting out now. I'm coming. Yeah. I'm, I don't. Yeah, no, no, no. One more. No, I'm coming in now. Okay. Yeah, Pascal, my office now. <laughs> Should we, um, for, for the fans that might be listening, don't understand the situation now? Inside jokes. Do you want to explain the situation at Well, to it, it is a very, I, and I, I can't think, I can think actually two or three times, Nico Lapierre being another classic example of a driver who is also the team manager because although it wasn't him that retired at the end of the last year, that was, that was Kazuki Nakajima, he is the, not the sort of general, but he is the number one man in the team. He team is principal. the team manager, the team, team principal. principal. And, and so... Of not just... Kamui Kobayashi, of Toyota Gazoo Racing. Yes. Toyota of Toyota. of, of, of lock, stock and barrel, of everything they do, of, of VLN, of N24, of what they've got racing in, in all the IMSA categories, of everything. He is in direct contact these days with Toyota-san, the yeah. president of Toyota Global. He is the de facto Toyota-san. He is the right-hand man on the ground. And... and also, bizarrely driving one of the cars. I mean, it's it's a at that level, it's like Wolfgang Ulrich being in one of the cars at Le Mans. I, I mean, really it's, wound it up uh, for when yesterday when I saw him there, who comes in now for his driving chance said, uh, "Hey, said all going all right." How, what does Kamui think of your performance so far? <laughs> <laughs> he did not like me, that. Me, 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 me. <laughs> That's how you get Boemi right on the limit. I mean, because these guys are under so much pressure to perform against each other, not just against the other car as a team, but against each other individually as six items. So. Yeah. Well, Seb's just blown his chances in that stint then, surely. It's like going golfing with a boss and, and, and thrashing him. Well, now, what, <laughs> I, <laughs> what I want now from Graham is, yes. did the eight car somehow find an extra lap? Yes, 28 okay. laps on that stint uh, right. for the uh, the number eight car. Now, hang on, Liz, that's what we, we were expecting. We, to it's, I think it's where we should be. The, the, the difference, though, is across the stint, we saw Kamui Kobayashi struggling with those tyres at the end, half a second a lap on average quicker yeah. than Sebastian Buemi makes on that stint. Because, you know, Kobayashi was right behind, he picked them up one point, put them you know, nose to tail, and then slowly but surely started losing time and ended up picking the around 10 seconds behind the car number eight before they both stopped. Also significant, remember we saw new tyres go on, the uh, Roman Dumas pedalled 708 Glickenhaus uh, yes. on that stint. Uh, Roman Dumas 152.256, 
that was quicker than Camille Kobayashi, but not as quick as Sebastian Poimi. This is a great scrap here as well in LMP2. You've got the uh, Prema car of Colombo catching up with Joshua Pearson. I think he's gone by him, hasn't he? Did he go by him there? Uh, no, he didn't. Fighting no, 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 no. Off. Fighting off. They've got the ultimate car, I think, in front of yes. them, which is the other red and white car. Okay. In fact, uh, Pearson's gone by the ultimate car, which is the red and white, not the red, white and green car. That's the Prema, uh, that's the historic Prema colours, red, white, yes. green, the Italian colours, isn't it? Really interesting. I mean, you know, there, there are drivers here that we've never seen race before. We don't know anything about, really, in these two cars, Josh Pearson, Stefano Colombo. So we're going to have to learn about them every bit as much as they're going to have to learn about each other. So it's, it's really fascinating when you get these new drivers in. Another one in the number one car, Lilu Wadu, her first world championship race, only her second season of racing cars, and she's in world endurance. ARC Bratislava in, tire change there. Is there a driver change? Miro Konopka brought the car in for ARC Bratislava, and he shares with Matthias Pesch. And another new name, Team and Funderhel. Now, uh, I'm sorry, Allard, if that's not how quite how you say it in Dutch, but again, another name I have never even read anywhere before he was announced as a World Endurance Championship driver. So, so many new teams, new cars, and so many new drivers. Remember how I said earlier on in LMP2, particularly how the silver driver, or, you know, your, mm. your weakest link. Weakest link in the chain. I don't really want, like to use that. I mean, with all due respect, that's the way it is. Yep. But Prema are absolutely in this because Colombo is their silver driver. Yeah, and he is absolutely flying. Let's hear from the Porsche team. Okay, it's a penalty looping. We want to try and go long. So if you don't think you can pass him, we're in the situation we spoke about before. Dual target minus 10, please. Anything extra is a benefit. And look after your right side tyres. Oh. Interesting. Good so interest. they're thinking left sides only. All right. Well, you know, I love engineers when they give us, I, I don't care what they're telling him, when they give us that detail. Here's what we talked about. If you don't use it, you can get back harvest. Yeah. Get that regen paddle. I, I mean, not that they have one, but save. Save, save, save. Use the toe, use the slipstream. Don't hassle the car. Don't hassle those right side tyres because we're gonna, we're looking at left sides only on I the mean, next change. Option number one yeah. is to overtake the car in front. Yeah, that that definitely with their penalty incoming of 15 yeah. seconds. Next time they come to a standstill in the pit lane, that is the pro preferred option. But like he said, his engineer, if you can't get past, then we need to start saving some fuel Absolutely. to prolong our stint and and then get out of sync in strategy to to play the long game and try and beat them on, on speed later on. Well, by the way, Miro Kavatka looks like he's come back out again. Yeah, he stayed in. This yeah. is an increasingly epic stint from Nick Tandy, fending off a car with much fresher rubber. But it's what you expect of somebody who started at Mini Midgets. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really is impressive. Uh, the car has clearly got the speed. He was sitting there behind them patiently, the two Porsche at the start of the race. He knows he's got 15 seconds in hand, and he's still leading the race on an old set of tyres compared to the car behind him. Look, European fans haven't seen much of Nick Tandy in the last few years because he's been plying his trade in GT Porsches here in the Ipsa WeatherTech Sports Car Series in North America, so you haven't seen a lot of him. But he and Earl Bamba and some Formula One guy who happens to have mucked into a drive again this weekend, Mika Hulkenberg, on a boys' weekend out, won Le Mans outright in the fastest cars that have ever raced at Le Mans. Yep. So, there's no question, even if we haven't seen much of him racing in the last three or four seasons because of where he's been, he is absolutely among the very fastest drivers in any car in this field. Uh, Michael Christensen in the moment just has something about the body language of this car and that he doesn't want to play the field, yeah. does he? I think he's reverting back to option <laughs> one. Maybe he's taking it as a minor insult. Look, if you can't overtake the yeah. car in front, then you're yeah. going to have to start saving fuel. I don't want to save fuel. Now that's that's the opposite side of the... Uh, listening to those three words, you don't often hear, and I heard them from Martin Haven, which is I Love Engineers, um, but it's the other side of it, isn't it? There's body language that comes through there, too. Yeah. Definitely re reverse psychology <laughs> going on with that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. You can save some fuel yeah. if you want. 
Well, I mean, if, if and again, you, you know, you sort of assume that people will be listening to some of the radio chat. You say, OK, don't worry at all about passing. Just save fuel now, save fuel now. Oh, they're saving fuel, Nick. Don't worry, he won't come. Oh, here he is. The 22 car on pit lane from the lead yep. of the LMP2 race. Also on to pit lane, the number nine Prima car from third in the hands of Renzo Colombo. He stays in, so it was started by Robin Kubica. He did a single stint. Colombo is double stinting. Phil Hansen got a double stint as well. After the, the two. Yeah. And remember, they are out of sync, the, uh, the, the 22 and 23 now. Yeah. 22 gets going. Hansen now, he is their gold driver. So we've had uh, Albuquerque in as the, as the platinum. Hansen used to be a silver, he's now a gold. So they have still got to have their silver driver get in yeah, later Owen. on. So yeah. Will, Will Owen. Yeah. And oh, this is getting a bit tasty now. A bit yeah. of traffic's come into play. They're in with the GTE AM cars, the D Station Aston in front of Satoshi Hoshino. And he's under pressure from, of course, is Christoph Ulrich there in that red Ferrari. Can't get it done into turn one this time around. Christensen has got to get past that D Station into turn one. That shouldn't be too difficult. There he goes. Just about has enough room to sort of ease it out wide, doesn't he? Yeah. To bit of a different line round there. He went a bit, took a, a later apex to try and maximise the exit, but there's nothing you can really do with cars that are so close in performance before turn three. The corner isn't quite slow enough. This is the corner here on the exit of turn five, but you really need a great exit, but once again, Tandy's got it covered. He got a good exit too. Hugs the inside, minimise the line through that kick before turn seven hairpin. Porsche closes up once more under the brakes. Utilise the fresher rubber. Now turn 10 comes up after these few kinks. I don't think it's going to be quite close enough. It'll take a bit of a gutsy move from Christensen. In the inset no. 23, LMP2 leader is in the pit lane. That's Josh Pearson, the 16-year-old, who, if he does start at Le Mans, will be the youngest driver in history. He's going to send to it do down so. the inside in 13. Sorry to butt in there. He had a yeah. great run out of 10. No, but he's able to place the car. Is Christensen anywhere he wants now at this stage? And every lap that goes past is going to get harder and harder they're for the Corvette. The they're almost to, into the pit window. Yeah, well, they are very close, aren't they? There's maybe another three laps in it. No, but less than that. Less than that. It's, what it's, about the Algarve Pro car? Now, it's often a quicker car that offers the GT guys a chance to pass, or even LMP2, because it, 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 it eases the cars offline as it comes by. He's trying to get by in the straight. That shouldn't be detrimental to Tandy. Surprised he didn't uh, Christensen sneak into the slipstream of the LMP2. They, they create quite a big hole through the air for the P2 cars, but uh, he knows what he's doing. Yeah, leave me, a, leave me alone. <laughs> yes, he's, he's ran a bit wide there in uh, the final in. corner. Uh, WRT in, rather. That's Robin Frines in the pit lane. I think he is going to stay in the car. Pretty good lap there from Nick Tandy in that battle. Fuel only for Frines in WRT, the 31 car. World champions last year in LMP2. Le Mans winners in LMP2. Taking over from United's 22 car that won everything on the planet in LMP2 uh, two years ago. Tandy may be in on this lap. But that will obviously release the Porsche. But, but like only one lap. Yeah, just the one lap. But, yeah, clearly got the speed as well. On the out lap, don't forget, these tyres around this circuit, bizarrely, take a little bit of time to warm up, and that, I think that's why we saw uh, the overcut happen earlier on. I think it was DeResta managed to get past the car by doing just that. Yeah. Look how cool and collected he is behind the wheel of his tandy. He's checking the mirrors. Yeah, Look at it's great to see the concentration, he but he's, like a he's smooth on the wheel. Look at that for some composure. Busy Another check hands. in the mirror, he's got it covered into 13. Busy hands, though. You can see the bumps, can't you? Not from his composure, but just how busy the hands are allowing. They need nice soft hands here. Exit of 13, inch perfect, millimeter perfect. There's Christensen, a little bit of a a sheen on the skin, you can see. This is fantastic, this is fantastic racing. You know, this is why BOP works, because you get cars that are so close together. It's one more. No, I love watching these, these pros in action. It's when you come up against them as well, and to lap them as we are in the cooking house, they know exactly where to place their car. They, they, if they don't want you to overtake, they just deviate their line slightly, just change their line. You get, you read the body language of the car. You think, okay, they're the bosses out there. Yep. 
they, they are. And it took me a long time to learn that in sports cars. They're the bosses. They control the racetrack, and it's up to you to find your way past them in a safe way. So do you send Darren Turner Christmas cards now again after many years of not. Think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot we're going out on air. We're not just on <laughs> Nick Tandy still leads Michael Christensen. There's the United car looking to make, uh, make a way by. Well, let's hear what the Porsche team have got to say now. Yeah, that's the kind of input you... It's a bit frustrating when you hear that from the engineer. Yeah, they can see all the data. You can feel what's going on. He knows he's, he's in the dirty air of the car in front, and that does affect your brake bias and your, therefore your lock-ups as well. Michelle Gatting back on her way. Satoshi Yoshino in the pit lane as well there in GTE Am. Sorry to jump in, Ant. That's fine. 64-92, the Sarlene battle in GTE Pro, and half a minute clear now of anything else. And actually third place, Richard Leeds ahead of James Collado. What's that, 12 seconds, no, 42 seconds is the gap. The two Ferraris, uh, different. Uh, driver change, by the way, last time in for ARC Bratislava, as we see the 77. Uh, Dempsey Proton car come in from third in GTE Am. Yeah, uh, it is Team and Thunderhelm at the uh, wheel of the ARC Bratislava car. So that was second, third, and fourth in the pit lane. Northwest AMR continues. Let's catch up with the Iron Dames team. Michelle Gatting handed the car over to teammate Rahel Frey. She is with Louise Beckett. Michelle Gatting bringing in the 85 Iron Links. How did you find that? Yeah, it was, uh, I think it was an okay stint with, with what we have. Uh, obviously, we're missing a bit of pace on the straight. It's quite clear. Uh, but, I mean, we passed one of the Aston Martin, which was a good thing. They are, they are super fast. So, uh, I mean, I did what I could. It got a bit tricky towards the end. Uh, the front was missing. The rear was starting to slide. But, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to drive here. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the AM cars get another set and a half of tyres, more than the Pro cars for this race. So they are more often on fresh tyres. Driver change, Nick Tandy hands over. Well, um, since there's only two drivers in the car, that makes it Tommy Milner getting into for his first time in the World Endurance Championship. Yeah, that was an uh, excellent stint from Nick Tandy. Mm. He seems to lead now to Michael Christensen, but just barely as they cross the timing line. And, uh, Tommy gets comfortable in the car. That's always set up quite a battle, isn't it? It's always intimidating when you get in the car after someone that's done such a phenomenal job. You know you've got to keep that momentum going and uh, you know keep that fight up. As your driver's just got out and done a, a great job, but uh, yeah, he's back out there. Also coming out the number 77 car. So this is into a double stint from young Sebastian Rio, and a great first stint from him. Yep. Uh, down almost 201 dead on that uh, on that stint. Uh, he and David Pitt are within thousands of each other across the stint. Both very rapid young men. Ninety-two Porsche leading in GT Pro, 64 laps in and right on the two-hour mark here in Sebring. It's a thousand-mile or eight-hour race, and it will be time-dependent. 268 laps is the expected full green distance. There's Nick Tandy, who came in from the lead in GT Pro. So we should have one more, maybe two, and it'll be less side you stay in the car. OK, there you go. That's the deal for Michael Christensen. Uh, and Andy Davidson, very clear, one more lap, maybe two. And, and that will depend on when he gets the bingo fuel light on board uh, and what the, the traffic is like. And then left side's only, you'll stay in the car. So all very clear, he knows exactly what the plan is long before he comes into the pit lane. And that is how you execute pit stops without snafus. And you've got this uh, supposed 15 seconds on top before they can touch the car this time around. So when he comes into the pits, potentially this lap, but next lap maybe from this uh, engineer's guidance, depending on how much fuel is on board, we, we yet to see that car stop for 15 seconds. That's the penalty they have, but they've got the speed and they're going all at it now with strategy only changing that left-hand side.
And Graham Goodwin talking about speed versus strategy. Well, Alpine's strategy is to run away as fast as they can to try and make up for the fact they're going to have to do at least one pit stop more than the Glickenhaus and the Toyotas that chase them. Alpine, the 36 car here, still leads the race. 37 seconds. They're keeping that pressure on, aren't they? They are keeping that pace. And it seems that they may be just a little kinder on the tyre as well. I wonder if that's going to be a, a long-term benefit. For well, them. The, the key is going to be pace, no doubt about it. They've got a longer remember to make that pay here than they would in a regular WEC race. Yep. It's an eight-hour race, not a six-hour race. I'll give you an idea in terms of the, the stint pace we're talking here. Mathieu Vazavier, of course, his first stint, it was a 150.8 on average. Uh, Nicolas Lapierre, a 151.1. Compare that with Olivier Poir, a 151.4, and a 152.2 from Andumar. And then the quickest stint we've seen so far from any of the Totas is well into the 151, 151.5 on both the first two stints. So they've got the pace for about a second a lap of the opposition. At times, it seems through traffic at the moment, remarkably, bearing in mind uh, the potential advantage, although we've got that BOP change with the hybrid deployment, he's doing a better job through traffic as well. He is picking up chunks of time uh, at this stage of the race. And uh, if we're looking at, at, uh, for that Alpine, as we see the number 91 car pull to a stop, look at the uh, the Alpine to get a lap advantage, uh, sorry, a, 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 a yes, indeed, you know, about a 1 minute 30 advantage for a full fuel stop. He's on schedule for that. Yeah, well, that's what they'll be desperate for before any kind of safety car comes into play, because that will completely ruin their yes. race. This tortoise it came the so, close, so close. Well, now then, yeah. <sighs> but will it because if there is a long caution then suddenly they get free opportunity to top up with fuel and their problem is not having enough fuel on board it's a matter of when it comes isn't it yeah. how that counts back when in a stint yeah you know it's it, it, but a, a kind of generally a kind of fairly simple bear like myself i can account forwards to, to halfway and count back from the from the end and we're nowhere near that yet all he can really do is exactly what they're doing is push push and push some more nice now then, rears on 91 also 91 in for fuel 92 has yet to stop so they stop together in their first pit stop this is only the second stop for the gte pro cars richard leaks on board pretty red in the face as you might expect from a busy boy here he comes. and here comes the 92 now that's very interesting it went a lap longer than the 91 so car. it was the two laps instead of the one remember when the yeah, engineer came correct. in said not quite sure if it's two well he's one, he certainly saved one lap of fuel right, are they going to touch the car no this feel like 15 minutes when you're sitting inside the car yeah, by the time he sees anybody move, the sweat will be running into his eyes and just blinking just the, it away. You know, these drivers fight for tenths of a second, and now you're just seeing 15 seconds yeah. disappear. Hundreds of a second. So fuel goes in first, and then you can do safety items like the tear-offs and cleaning wipers and screens. And then it'll be tyres after the fuel, and it may be left sides only. Let's hear from Corvette's Nick Tandy. Nick Tandy looking intently at those Porsche stops. That was an epic stint. Just trying to see if they've taken tyres. <laughs> um, yeah, it was good fun, actually. It looks like... Like, potentially, when the tyres are fresh, the Porsche's got a bit of an advantage. But come the end of the stint, I don't know if they were running um, kind of a different tyre strategy to us, but at the end of the stint, our car was really good, and we managed to double the first set of tyres. Tommy's just gone back out on a, on a fresh set. But, yeah, it was good fun. Um, battling around cars and, and flying around sea, bringing my yellow Corvette. I saw you looking at the tyres, so how were they looking or feeling? Uh, not great. <laughs> I think um, I think Michael, you could probably ask Michael to, to, to see how it was at the end. We we had the prologue here a couple of, at the last weekend, and it kind of has given everyone a false kind of reading on stuff, but now the track's a lot hotter and the temperatures are a lot hotter and the lap times are a bit slower, so... We're, I think everyone's still kind of learning, but it's not bad if we're learning in the lead, is it? 
Uh, big question is, hard or medium? Sorry? Hard or medium? Soft. OK. <laughs> I can't tell you that, Louise, can I? Although you probably know from the RFID, I guess. I, I try. Thanks very much, Nick. It's good to see you back Black here. Ones. It's good to be back. I'm just sharing a little uh, the drown black ones. That's the way we're playing this, you're, obviously. You are love Nick Dandy. He's it, just so happy to be here. He just, he just loves being a racing driver. I'm just telling off Mike, um, uh, telling Ant a, a little story that uh, he actually got a careers chat at school from one Mr. Oliver Gavin. Did he? He did. Saying, give it up, son. There's no money in it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but actually, when when Nick was at school, Ollie was probably still struggling to find a driving F3000 year to year with, with the likes of mathematics. Oh, whatever he said to him, it, uh, he surely took note well, and put it into practice. He's and and a family business, because, of course, Nick started racing with his uh, late older brother, Joe. Joe Tandy racing, a team that Nick still runs. And so, yeah, it was, it was very much a family business. Hot rods, stock rods, mini cross. Mini sevens, yeah, all sorts of. And, and th yeah, and that's why he can jump, he can swap from a Porsche to a Corvette or an LMP1 Porsche and be quick in anything he drives. Yeah. He's one of those real versatile drivers and a great character as well. Says well. the ex Formula One driver who then drove a Porsche, then a Toyota, then an LMP2 car, who's clearly not multi 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 versatile at all, and can operate a sky pad with uh, an open gallery under pressure and put up with my old bontons for, for over two hours without needing a, a leak. Well, there's a, a very hot-looking uh, Johnny Rotten, Charmy Lacey. Uh, you know, it's, it's very hard to disguise just how hard it is driving these cars, isn't it? The body gives you away. No matter how cool you try and look, boy, your body is wrung out by this place. And by these cars, I mean, most of it is really the temperature. The, the, the steering wheel, is, the steering is not heavy. You've got electronic power steering in the LMP2 car that we, that we were seeing there with Charmin Lessi chatting. Great scenes, chatting with uh, Sebastian Ogier. What a yeah. legend <laughs> to be talking. I mean, uh, and, and, and the weird thing is that Charmin Lessi, that Ogier would be hanging off every word yeah. from it, not the other way around. Um, but yeah, Charmin Lessi, I spoke to him the other day, he's clearly enjoying having Sebastian there as his teammate. But yeah, you know, they're, they're not physically hard to drive, the P2 cars, it's, it's just the heat and it's relentless. It's more like doing, uh, it's more like doing yoga in many ways, like hot yoga where you're just holding that position, holding your breath and then it's like the corner's done and you go again and another corner comes up and you hold that position and it, and it, that starts to take its toll. Yeah. The sweat comes out and it's just... I can remember David Brabham talking about getting an exercise bike and wearing all his gear with helmet and gloves and everything and being on the exercise bike in a friend's sauna in preparation for racing here in closed cockpit and you cars do. in Sebring. Yeah, you Just can acclimatise to it. You yeah. can acclimatise, but it, it does take weeks of effort. I think that's the first bit of WC merchandise we need to go with in the Ant Davidson era. LMP2, it's like hot yoga. I think that's a cracker. <laughs> and it's like, I've I heard <laughs> it's quite hard. <laughs> this, by the way, is a battle for position between the number 46 car. And this is the car that started a lap down. It is off sequence uh, for the pit stops, but uh, this is Nicky Lertweiler, uh, late addition to the grid here, being chased down now by Rahel Fry in the very, very pink Iron Dames car. And actually, the two cars directly behind them, the D Station car and 21 from AF Corsa. Now, D Station have got Charlie Fagg at the wheel, Tony Freelander in the 21 AF Corsa Ferrari. Both of those in the last five minutes have set their fastest race laps in the car, or the car's fastest race laps. So, actually, this battle for fifth, the two cars behind are closing fast. Again, another fastest second middle sector of the lap for Tony Vlander and the previous lap Vlander setting uh, no Charlie Fagg setting his car's fastest lap of the race that's the D station car in seventh and the A of course a car in eighth place again Corvette back at the top of the pile Tommy Milner fresh tires we heard from Nick Tandy that they're using the round and black Michelin which is always good news um, so yeah <laughs> uh, but did we see when the 92 Porsche came in, did they do left sides or did they do rears? Because 91 did, did rears, which we is didn't interesting. We did see the 92 tire stop. didn't see. We no, might we have to send Louise Beckett to go and uh, beg the question. Or I might try and ask Alex Selig 
uh, on the wax on. Uh, on pace, by the way, again, the Alpine is romping away here. At the moment, two seconds a lap got. It's 1.5 seconds a lap quicker than either of the Toyotas. Uh, Roman Dumas is not making much headway into the advantage of the Toyotas ahead. Uh, this is coming down to you. If this stays full green, this is going to be very, very interesting. It will be, yeah. I'm, I'm, part of me, I'm, I'm amazed to see the Alpine just steadily pulling away more and more from the Toyota. But we're playing a strategic game here. That's what we're seeing unfold. Because, like we said, very early on, the Alpine has the pace, but the Toyota's got the longevity of fuel. I remember, you know, in the hypercar class this is a grandfathered lmp1 car it's a car that's been engineered to do le mans to do full tilt 24 hours it's one of the quickest non-hybrid cars we've ever seen at le mans has finished on the podium in its rebellion form with the basic with the same package other than aero and a bit of engine restriction there's nothing lacking in that car it should be able to do this you know, you know it's at a remarkable pace it's going to be really interesting whether or not they, they can certainly maintain this pace. What have they got in terms of tyres available? Uh, what have we got in terms of dramas to come in this race? Quick look at Alex Wurtz uh, chatting to uh, their new driver in the team, Rio Hirakawa. So team advisor is Alex Wurtz at uh, Toyota Kazoo Racing. And yeah, like you say, this is Rio Hirakawa's moment. Replaced uh, Kazuki Nakajima, big shoes to fill. That's because you uh, just on the pit wall, yeah. I mean, that wasn't it? Was in the shadows. Uh, just had a quick glimpse of that little battle with Sebastian Prio. Just said the car's fastest race lap, said Prio. Third in GTM in the 77 Dempsey Proton car. Uh, Dad Andy, I'm sure, will be watching at home. Hi, Andy. And uh, hello to the rest of the family as well, watching at home, very proudly watching the boy making his own career for himself. Andy, very... Uh, aware not to be in the back of the garage being carted down, which I think is just fantastic. Absolutely nothing like carted down. It's been quite impressive to watch the pair of them together at a variety of race meetings. Just keep your distance, yep. let him get on with it. And he's rapidly catching Ben Keating at the moment for second place at GTM. 15 seconds back, uh, about two seconds a lap quicker. Well, Keating's still in, uh, two hours and 13 minutes in. So actually, Keating has seven minutes more drive time to do but he will stay in to the end of the... Oh, they flipped Sorry on to the yeah. So, yeah. Right, let's catch up with Sean Galeel as Louise Beckett continues to patrol the pit lane. Well, Sean Galeel, you're actually just about to go out, but uh, you started the race. How was that for you, and what are you expecting from this next stint? Um, struggled a bit in the first stint. Um, I think the weather didn't really set up the way we wanted to with the, how hot it is, and uh, I think when it gets cooler, hopefully we'll, it's coming to us more. Um, now we're there thereabouts, but uh, the top three guys are around 35, 40 seconds in front, but, you know, anything can happen. It's still a six-hour race to go, so... Anyways, uh, it's still a long race. All right, I'll let you get ready. Thank you. A good point well made by Sean Galeau. So we've just, we're now 14 minutes into a regular World Endurance Championship race with only the six hours left on the, on the board. But yeah, I, you know, we talked about this at the beginning of the race, Graham Goodwin. Weather has been Floridian, to say the least. Don't like the weather, wait five minutes, is what they say in these parts. And we've had storms, we've had overnight lows of zero, overnight lows of 20. We've had daytime highs of low teens to today, probably early 30s. Oh, yeah. it's, it's been very hard to get a handle on. And all the while, as well as the temperature, the track has been rubbering in, getting less and less green. IMSA started running yesterday and the day before, so there's been lots of cars, lots of rubber going down. So, you know, it's a living, breathing thing. The track is moving all the time. And that's exactly the point I was going to make, which is we are going to see this track change and change radically through this race. Uh, the temperature's not going to be coming down terribly much uh, by the end of this race. Nick Tandy just looks like he's been for a... You know, a, a walk in the park, doesn't he? Uh, great stuff from Nick, and that's that's given us a hell of a storyline here in GT Pro. To remind again, viewers, this is the start of the very last season of GT Pro, and what absolutely fantastic entertainment it's given us over the last decade. But I would say, with that, Graham, it'd be sad to see the cars go, of course, to become GT3s, but it's, it's really the drivers that make that class. And, you know, drivers like Nick Tandy, the racing we saw there, it doesn't matter whether they're going two seconds faster, three seconds faster, or, or slower, for that matter. 
it's, it's just the caliber of driver. That's what I really enjoyed watching there. It's and they'll do the same time, thing in the GT3. The well. yeah. final point about, as we watch the number 22 car, about uh, the GTE cars is this. I was talking to one of Nick's teammates at Daytona in January, Antonio Garcia. Um, and we'll see, of course, Antonio at Le Mans, when we have the two Corvettes there about the this latest transition corvette have done this 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 before of course the transition from gt1 to gt2 and i asked him about the change well it was profound when they changed to gt2 from gt1 they immediately lost 10 seconds in terms of pace between the two classes. Since that point, they found 17 seconds. So these cars, on any given Sunday, or in this case Friday, are now quicker than the GT1 cars were back in the day. Manu Collard for Penske ahead of Ed Jones making his World Endurance Championship debut in the 28 Jota car. Ideal conditions here to compare the two because there's only one lap difference between the tyres. Fuel level will be the same. Manu Kala was saying that he was, he believed he was being wound up when he had the phone call from Penske to come and race. And of course, he's got previous with Penske and with Porsche winning American Le Mans series in LMP2 with Penske Porsches back in the uh, the LMP2 Spider days, but uh, he he thought he was generally being wound up. No, they wanted his knowledge, his experience, it's because for Penske, world endurance is a new ball game. LMP2 is a relatively new ball game. You want somebody, Ann Davidson, who knows what good feels like at Spa, at Fuji, at wherever, which Penske don't have a handle on yet. Yeah, exactly, as a, as a new team coming in, as, as Penske into this type of LMP2 car, it's good to have an experienced pair of hands, but this is a tough call <laughs> for Collard, and he's got uh, the Jota car number 28 right behind him, Ed Jones, and he is he's slower, he's losing pace to him over the last couple of laps, it's just a matter of time, it's inevitable that there'll be a change of position Coming up here into Turn 1, the Jota's in the slipstream. They've got a Ferrari to navigate their way past as well. Two cars going past into one. It's always tricky to manage, but what you really need, what you're asking for from a driver like Collard, is, yes, knowing whether a racing car feels right or not. It, it might not matter in this setup season yeah. for Penske whether you've got a driver that may be a little bit slower, half a second to seven tenths off the pace every lap. It's having that experience that counts in that in that season. And it's been able to go back to the engineers. Oh, well, when this happened with Watson, Watson, we did this. Maybe we could try that. I mean, you know, it's all of that. Yeah, and it's everything. It's pit yeah. stops, you know, the strategy. It's the fundamental setup of the team. I'm sure Penske don't need you know, much help in that regard, but every championship is different. And Collard knows the WEC yeah. and knows how it operates. As the Toyota there, just hunting around. Yeah, looking is, for a uh, gap. Brendan Harley is now taken over from but Wemmy. It's, but it's going to be tough. This is two yeah. trucks on the highway that are doing the same speed, nose to tail, and you've got to get by both of them. You're not going to. You, you're unlikely to find a gap to jump Jones without getting by Collard. He's going to have to wait for a straight. And they're in their independent fight as well, and you yeah. respect that fact when you're the car that's faster coming up. Yeah. Ed Jones, by the way, big change of gear for him as well. The only times he's previously been here at Sebring, it's been in IndyCar pre-season testing. Manu Kalar with Ed Jones battling for sixth position in LMP2. Jones, real gear shift change here from racing in Indy cars, third in the Indy 500 in 2017 right up into World Endurance Championship in LMP2. I can't imagine how different what he drove last year to what he is currently driving is. He knows Sebring to a degree, not this layout. They don't use the full layout for IndyCar pre-season testing. Knows a little bit about the place, but like the Penske team that he's chasing, he's going to be learning all about the whole World Championship yeah, all the different tracks all season long. Yes, he's had a bit of experience at Spa. Yes, he's had a bit of experience at Monza. Guarantee he never raced in Formula Renault at, uh, at Fuji or Bahrain. So, you know, like the Penske team with Manu Kala bringing the experience, Jones have the experience, and that's what Ed Jones has to draw on when he needs that information as a driver. Yeah, I mean, it's the, in the complete flip side, it's the opposite of Collard, isn't yeah. it? Collard knows the championship, whereas Ed Jones doesn't. And... Um, 
know, it, it's, it's interesting to watch this fight unfold. I know it's just a matter of time before they get through oh. and pass each other. <laughs> this, is, this is what endurance racing is all about. And Collard knows how this feels, whereas, you know, maybe uh, Ed Jones coming from a, a bit more of a, a, a purist uh, category. Yeah. Where you don't, you're not fighting your way past cars constantly. Oh, it's a bit of an eye opener <laughs> for him, whereas it's all part, part yeah. and parcel of it. It's like doing Indy 500 with the Indy Lights cars yeah. thrown in as well. Right behind is a battle for position, and actually, Rahel Frey has just got by the Porsche. She was chasing that car, Nick Leutweiler, the 46 car that started from the pit lane, don't forget. She's just got by him, so that is a change for uh, fourth place, uh, no, fifth place rather in uh, GTM. You talk a little earlier about. Uh, how Manukard is coping with uh, this opportunity. We're going to see here. This is another go through again. It's two things here. Manu is losing time on his average stint time to Ed Jones, but he's clean as a whistle. He's been clean through traffic, and he's proven to be very, very difficult to pass. As we saw with Nick Tandy, that's the key to get to the uh, the fuel stint to get the quicker guys in, yeah. and they can do the damage. His job is to let, as you've quite rightly said, as few drivers as possible pass him in that stint. Exactly, yeah, and um, you know, he's still ahead, and he's placing the car in all the right places, as you would expect from yeah. someone so experienced. As I just I say that take this curse, he goes a bit wide in three, but there's nothing you can do in terms of overtaking. That's the important corner to get right. Turn five exit, but now Jones is right behind behind him, he sniffs a chance down towards turn seven. Is he going to keep it to the inside? But there's a Porsche on the inside as well. Covering that, what do you do here, Collard? Do you go down the inside? No, but he holds position. Well, shows his nose Nicely and hopes that the Porsche runs out a little wide. Doesn't quite, yeah. Yep. I'm here, I'm here. Make sure the guy knows you're there. This time, oh, Ed Jones gets to fly around the outside. And that is great instinctive racing. He goes around the outside. Yes, thank you very much. Toyota follows through. And actually, you know, we, there we saw a slower car affecting traffic. Previous lap, we saw the two cars, the Penske and the Jota cars, zigzagging between the Porsche and the Ferrari that were battling for position. And as we said before, the faster cars there opened the door for Rahel Frey to, because they put her rival in the Porsche offline. And uh, she went through. Leader in and out of the pit lane. Very quick stop for Mathieu Bassivier. Uh, he in. stays in. Collar into the pit lane as well. Oh so, yeah, so Collar just had to back out of the throttle in trying to go around the outside of car 56. And Ed Jones plays it to the inside. Here we go. This is there we go. That's that moment. Off and on the throttle, and enough was done for Jones to sneak through. And that's how you overtake around Sebring. You have to be smart in the traffic. So, Toyota now 1-2. This is race leader Brendan Hartley. They still owe us a pit stop, but it won't be for another five, maybe six laps. Sebastian Wemmy started the race in the number eight car. They were third on the grid, uh, fourth on the grid, and the uh, second Toyota, number seven, was in seventh place. Jose Maria Lopez leading, uh, yeah. driving. Uh, talking about Lopez, when he first got in the car, the gap was 14 seconds between Hartley and himself, and he's whittled that down to seven seconds. So he's, he's, he's on a mission to catch up car number eight. So maybe that car seven is using his tires a bit harder, um, the number eight, you, know, you have different setups, of course, in these machines, and you, you, it's, it's a combination of the three drivers. It's a compromised car setup, and now one then. car crew can have a different setup to the other. Maybe their tyres just getting worked a bit harder, like we saw in the first in from Kobayashi. Alternatively, the number eight car went one lap longer on fuel on the last stint. Are they trying to beg another one out of it? Are they just taking a fraction off the overall pace to try and increase the number of laps that Alpine has to make up on them? There's two things going on here. First of all, if they've got even one lap in hand in the last half hour over their teammates, then that makes a lot of difference in terms of potential track position. And secondly, it's about maybe trying to find a different way that each car will try and counter the speed of the Alpine, because they're not as fast, but they go longer because they've got a bigger fuel Splitting allocation. the strategy. Yeah, yeah. a little. I mean, it does seem to me that 
we come into this race, and, and you were saying uh, that we heard Nick Tandy saying a little earlier that the, the things they thought they'd learned that they didn't. And I did get the impression in a couple of conversations with a couple of people in Toyota, they don't, I don't think they've really got the head around the entire puzzle here. So maybe they, you're absolutely, maybe it is, you're absolutely right there, Martin. That they're approaching this with the two cars running completely different plans. Well, again, historically, the, the trio in eight have been able to save fuel over the trio in seven. I know it's a different trio now because we don't have Kazuki Nakajima in number eight car anymore. We've got Rio Hirakawa, but predominantly, in the past, where there's been a fuel difference, it's been eight that has been more parsimonious. They've saved a lap, so that's how they won at Spa. They came from a, you know, they came with a lap advantage into the final pit stop and came back out in front and won the race. So Lapierre back down in third place in the Alpine, and every time this happens now, it's going to take them longer and longer and longer before the Toyota's pit, and eventually, at about six hours, six and a half hours in, the Toyota's will pit at the same time as the Alpine pits, but with a full pit stop still in hand. Yeah, so really well explained there, Martin. That's exactly the story that's unfolding here. So you see Alpine 12 seconds now behind the Toyotas, but the first time around this happened, they were they were still very much uh, in a threatening position. Yeah. Whereas now it's, that gap is growing every single time, and that's the deficit they hang on to throughout this entire race. And we're still talking about Toyota versus Alpine as if there is no other potential fly in the ointment in the form of the Glickenhaus. The Glickenhaus so far has been quick enough, not the quickest, but quick enough to be a potential fly in the ointment. It's not as quick as the Alpine, it's going further on fuel. They could be a podium threat as well for Alpine as well as for Toyota, because let's face it, Racing isn't perfection, it never is. Something can go wrong with a Toyota. Richard Mill Racing Team getting ready to change over from their new young driver, Lilu Wadu. Who did a great stint, actually. Yeah, I mean, she hasn't just been put into this car because she's young, French and female. She's young, French, female and fast. Double and stint. that's the key. Double she stint. doubled? She doubled. Okay, excellent. 153.9 on her first stint, 155.3, I guess, on the older rubber. And to give you an idea of where that kind of sits, her uh, first stint was about where Renny Binder was on his second, uh, the Asian and Series champion from two years ago. I, uh, as a fan, and, and, and I'm just a Billy like everybody else, I'm loving this. This is eight-time World Rally champion Sebastian Oshie going prototype racing. Valentino Rossi is racing a GT3 car for WRT. Jimmy Johnson's got to IndyCar. What next? You know, smoke turning up in Moto2? I mean, I don't know, I, but oh God, I love it. This is, this is the start of something new for Sebastian Oshie. Look at yeah. this. I'm, I'm so glad the camera's staying on him. Welcome, Sebastian, to the world of sports car racing and enjoy having cars around you. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> well, it's better than trees. Uh, yeah. well, the, 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 he the knows what he's doing around yeah, trees. The, the, the problem here is he doesn't know which side to crash because he can't put the co-driver into the forest first. <laughs> oh, so, right. so there's, there's, yeah. Well, here's his first challenge, straight into turn 17, but he's got the Toto right behind yeah. him. And of course, Sebastian, uh, Sebastian a Toto driver, uh, and it's a, bit, a bit awkward, wouldn't it? it? it wouldn't well, be. I was going to say, it's not Seb on Seb action immediately, so uh, because OJ uh, is not being challenged either by the eight car of Sebastian Buemi, but Buemi's not in it either, that, so that's through not goes the, the seven. That's that's not the worse. That was Kobe Ashley's car. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's not the uh, text message you want, is it? Can you come and see Kamu in the office in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> ah, now then, here we go. LMP2, leader in first, as we've seen before, followed by the Prema car. And so in comes Phil Hansen, single stinting. OK, that's interesting. So Josh Pearson to the lead of this World Championship race. Uh, 189 laps to go. We're two and a half hours into this eight-hour race. It's a very, very long way still to go. OK, now this tells me, again, as a punter, everything I need to know about how hard this is on the drivers. Because this team, they can double stint until they can triple, they can quad until the cows come home at Le Mans. 
they are not doing it here. They're not doing it because they don't want to really destroy their drivers and then have to spend a couple of hours waiting for them to recover while the others are broken before they put them in. So better to spend those few extra seconds and assume that everybody in LMP2 is going to have to pretty much do the same. Cycle, cycle, cycle. Keep your talent fresh. So what happens therefore to the car number 23? Do they follow that same line of thought, that same strategy? But you have to optimize the time now of the silver driver in the car, which is very different yeah. from that of Hansen. He's their gold driver, don't forget. He can get out earlier, he'll be back in later. But in saying that, Pearson's driven a fantastic stint. I, he dropped back a little bit towards the end from Hansen, but not far. The problem is a double isn't enough. A triple isn't enough in a P2 car. They've got to do more than three. Very They've old, got to do uh, two oh, good grief. Um, I, I gather there's a bump there. <laughs> <laughs> it's the new Orica Stadium truck. And that's that, why you stay to the inside <laughs> in the final corner. <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, it, you know, yeah. that's not a bump, that's a sinkhole. <laughs> so unless you're Rivera aboard that car, I'm guessing Francois Perodo has done a double stint because that car's way further. He has indeed. Yep. So Francois has completed two of the stints he'll require to complete the drive time. Push back for Glickenhaus because there was already a car on pit road. That's what I was saying before, you know, yep. if you have to come in and around the car. They can't control, obviously, the GT when they stop before uh, them. Sorry, was that a double for Duma? Uh, it was, it was. was. Okay, so, uh, and fresh tyres. Oh, he gets hit by the car. Just clipped his seat. That was really close. That's unsafe release. I'm sorry, that's really unsafe release. That could have been very, very dangerous. Ryan Briscoe getting in. I mean, and that was Duma who was looking towards oncoming traffic. Imagine, if you will, that this driver helper was in the doorway or coming into the doorway following the driver. He would have been a lot further out than Roman Duma was. I think there'll be an investigation into that. Uh, oh, not, well, not, not in terms of penalties coming up now, but for future reference. Who was that? The was that the Pistol. real team car? It was red. Let's take a look Watch again. again. So he walks Which away from the car. Back. Yeah. It's ultimate. The car's been pushed back. Well, Roman sees the danger coming and, and you know... I think it hit his seat. It did, hit, it yeah. did clip his he seat. He got his yeah. leg out of the way, but way too close for comfort. Yeah. Right, let's hear what's going on at Shea Toyota. OK, Brendan, please give feedback for Rio. Feedback for Rio. Yeah, it's the same as what's up there. Trying to get to the inside, particularly three and five. Up for the very difficult on brakes, not difficult to win. So just take margin, up for the brakes. Try and keep it relatively tight. Copy. So he's saying, yeah, look, the car is quite tricky under the brakes. We saw Kobayashi, didn't we, yeah. lock up and go wide in turn three earlier on. He's saying, you've got to brake early efficiently and don't wrestle the car too much up towards the apex of the corner. And I, I use this line all the time. You're going to get bored of this one, gentlemen, I'm afraid. But uh, an old engineer once said to me, the corner begins as soon as you hit the brake pedal. And yeah. it's so true. I never forgot it as a young driver in my general testing days of Formula One. And uh, it's so true. And corners like Turn 13 we're watching now, it's a very flowing corner that you, you stay on the brakes all the way in from Turn 12 through towards the apex. You trail brake deep into the corner. And if you go over pushing the brake too late into that, into that phase, the car doesn't like it, can easily swap ends or fight you. And he's saying that's what the car feels like today. So brake early and progressively yes. carry the speed up to the apex. Well, let's hear from double stinting Roman Dumas. Louise is down at Glickenhouse. Roman Dumas, you just seem to shrug off the fact that that car nearly clipped you coming out of the pit lane. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it was uh, not an easy stint. It was very, very hot. Unfortunately, no water on the car. So I was struggling. Also, the rear tires were by far too high, so the second stint was difficult. We made a mistake one time. They called me safety car, and it was not, so we lost 20 seconds there. <laughs> let's, uh, yeah, let's, we will restart from that, and uh, we will see. I mean, uh, for sure, it uh, was the first time we do two stints in a row with the tires, so now we will adapt a little bit, and we will see. All right, thank you. Thank you.
Doesn't do bad for an old bloke, does he, yeah. Roman Tumar? I came with you. We said it in qualifying yesterday. You know, he really is one of the great all rounders in motorsport nowadays. Yep. And, uh, you know, you put four wheels on it, he'll drive it, drive it quickly. And here's another. Uh, showing what he's got, Sebastian Ogier with the up being behind. Louise Beckett with a little addendum to the interview. Well, I, I said to him, are you OK? Um, that car nearly hit you. And he was like, what? I hit somebody. I don't know. He, he didn't even notice that that car was like fractions of a centimetre away from him. Well, it clipped his seat on the way past. So, I mean, and you know, and that's why we always tell, thank you, Louise. That's why we always tell youngsters coming into the pit lane, Watch where you are and watch what's going to move, not what's actually moving, you know, because that was, yeah, that was close. Well, just saw Sebastian Auger having a, a hashtag dab of Oppo there as he uh, rode the curbs. He was saying he really likes this track. He finds places like Spa and Monza a bit boring, really, because not much <laughs> No, genuinely, because not much happens. There's Robin Frines uh, and uh, Norman Nato uh, listening in on the left-hand side. Uh, that flat out left on the steel. Okay, well, you know, we're, we're finding more of that. LMP2, one of the changes this year, they've got an air restrictor to reduce the power a little bit more and a little bit more consistently, but they've also lost their front dive Both planes. planes. Correct. And the car was under-tired anyway, always has been. Historically, right from the beginning, LMP2 have not had wide enough tyres, not a big enough contact patch, and you're losing some of the downforce that helps the front tyre exist. That's where it's going to start losing. In the pits, number seven, again ahead of number eight. Graham, they were a lap in arrears this. in terms of fuel. Well, Are they going to be two in arrears? Well, it's 28 laps this time, 27 on the first two. It's been 28 for the last two for the number eight car. Let's see yeah. what happens this time around. Well, Alistair Moffat and Toyota confirmed that they were expected to do 28 lap stints after stint one. So, Side by side, both the Jota cars coming through on the Algar Pro cars, and both of them yeah. make it through. And so Algar Pro with Stephen Thomas, the two Jota cars, Oliver Rasmussen and Antonio Felix da Costa battle for position. It is indeed, and catching the Penske car now. Well, uh, Rasmussen in a second board. stint, isn't he? This is a double for him. Uh, Ant is fresh in. Uh, so we uh, we lose one in the booth. We get one on the screen. There's no, no, this is he's back. He, no, so Rasmussen did the Ed Jones started the race. Yeah. Rasmussen in for a single stint. Oh, and then Ed, Ed Jones was in. Okay. Double. All right. Yeah. So Rasmussen was in before that. Uh, how do we tell the Jota cars car now that apart? Now that we don't have a white nose and a gold nose. Sam Hignett, can we sort this out, please? I I'm going to go. Mirror colours on this. Well, that's ridiculous. Nobody can see mirror colours. Uh, Antonio Felix da Costa waved by by Oliver Rasmussen. He moves up a spot. So it is the green mirror car is the 38 car leading this pair. The red mirrors are on the 28. You can't tell. I, mean, you, you, I, I guarantee I'll stand in the garage doorway with Sam Hickney and go, look, look at the mirrors. It's obvious. No, not on a TV screen. Yeah. Not when the cars are moving at any speed other than walking pace and you're two feet away. Here's the number eight car on pit lane. That is another 28 uh, lap stint for yeah. uh, that car. So they still have the one lap in hand. Battle for position here. 33 Aston Martin in second. Ben Key back at the helm for his uh, run with Sebastian Prio. Is Seb in double stint mode in the Dempsey Proton Porsche? He is, and it's been a very impressive start to his WC career so far for Seb Prio. Closing in now on Ben Keating. And Ben in for his second stint. Uh, we had uh, Florian Le uh, Flo excuse me, Florian Latore in for a single stint between those. So Ben burning his time here. Yep. Speeding, speeding in pit lane for the 71 car. That's uh, one of our GTM cars. It's the one that trails the race at the moment, Gabby Aubrey. That's Gabby Aubrey. Uh, has not found the pit limiter button in the okay. car. Uh, by the way, into Europol uh, are still running, or yeah. are running again. It was seven minutes on pit road yeah, for yeah. the team with that electronics problem, and they've been running laps. pretty well since then. Yeah. So whichever plug-and-play console they've uh, dealt with, that appears to be in better shape, Esteban Gutierrez though has got a long way to come back from that. Paul Dallalana still leading in GTEM by the way, the uh, 98 AMR took the lead from 33, the 
lighter of the two turquoisey cars in your screen. Now that was the pole sitter, huge pole that from Ben Keating, 1.3 seconds. That's the second largest GTE Am first to second margin, I believe, in qualifying. Yeah, uh, if I read WEC data correctly. Interestingly, across the two teams, the TF Sport running two of these three uh, Aston Martins. Here we go, Sebrio looking for a way by. Um, started their bronze driver, then put the silver in, and then put the bronze back in. It's exactly what the 98 did. Ben Keating is defending this like his life depended on it. Here goes yeah. Seb Prio, though. Leaves the door open. Here. He could see Prio was gaining the overlap there. Left the door open. Through goes young Sebastian. And uh, I, I can remember Seb trailing around the World Touring Car paddocks when he was five or six years old, and he's still just as enthusiastic about motor racing. And, Wow, really good run from him up into second place. Now, in the first hour and a half of this race, it was Aston Martin, one, two, three, and the Porsches were nowhere. They are coming right back into it there. You saw the Alpine team boss on the world, Philippe Signot, watching Nico Lapierre leading the gap out to nearly 60 seconds. They are building that advantage and building that advantage and building that advantage, but they need two and a half minutes to undo the lap, uh, the uh, pit stop they're going to be behind by the end. Alpine going by the weaving 40, uh, 56 Porsche. Uh, looks like that's had a 46 of this. Nick Lloyd Miner looks like he's had a little off. Nico Lapierre. Oh, damn, dirty burgers everywhere. Where's old dirty burgers? Come on. Dear, dear, mate. Just a, a little bit of a chuckle here with a, 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 a wonderful tweet from TF Sports. We were looking at Ben Keating, and it's a picture of a very young lad with what looks like a significantly younger than he is now, Kamui Kobayashi in a paddock somewhere. And then you shift to a meeting on the grid between Kamui Kobayashi. Young lad is Charlie Fagg. All oh, right, OK. Absolutely Excellent. brilliant. Well done, TF Sport. Uh, the eight car here. Yeah. Um, Losing ground, I mean, losing ground with every lap to the Alpine. The Alpine is the hare, and the Toyotas are yeah. the tortai. Yeah. Don't uh, think it's losing ground at quite the rate it was, no. is the honest answer. We'll keep a, a, a look at, uh, at that in a moment. Change of ECU, by the way, was the solution to into Europol. As ever, uh, plug and play, unplug and play properly this time. Uh, Chota cars, we just saw them change formation a couple of laps back. Antonio Felix da Costa on fresher tyres, clearly getting on the blower and going, right, I'm behind him now. OK, uh, let him go, please. Yes, thank you very much. Nicely done. Two Jota cars. Just, just going, uh, referring back to that hypercar conundrum. The uh, three and a bit stints that we've had so far for the Alpine. One fifty point eight on the average uh, stint time from Mathieu Vazavier. Then two stints from Nico Lapier. Both of the one fifty one ones. And now a uh, third from Nico Lapier, which is also with the 151 one. So astonishing consistency for Nico Lapier. Compare that with the quicker of the two Toyotas at the moment 151.5, 152.0, and 151.9. Battle shaping up in LMP2. This is the car that is currently in sixth position. And behind. There are the two Jota cars that are 7th and 8th. Going by the interior of Paul Carr is the Penske entry driven by Dane Cameron. Welcome to the FIA World Endurance Championship, Dane Cameron. Behind and released from behind Oliver Rasmussen, Antonio Felix da Costa. Uh, Felix da Costa with a stint newer tyres than Oliver Rasmussen. He's a stint fresher driver as well. Can't quite squeeze past. Is that Christopher, Christoph Ulrich? No, Tony Wielander in the 21 Air Force of Ferrari who was behind. But here is the Penske car, trying to run away from 38 and 28. Penske car number five. The captain is here, watching the action. We saw him on the grid. Roger Penske has been going sports car racing since the very early 1960s uh, as a driver and then as a team owner. The Zerek Special, uh, an ex-McLaren sports car, or Brabham sports car, I forget which, that he built himself from a two-seater into a single-seater and then back. And uh, he was always a man for the big endurance races. He and particularly David Donoghue in the, in the early days, uh, really, really uh, picking and choosing the machinery to go for the big endurance races in, as well, of course, as running in IndyCars, in Champ Car, in Formula One over the years, and so many other forms of racing. 
And there is our field spread out around this 17 turn Sebring track. MP2 being led for the moment by the 23 United Autosport car and the Prema car of Louis Delatraz all over the dirt there, chasing down Will Owen. Will Owen, the new boy in the 22 lineup. He is their lowest graded driver now that Phil Hansen has been moved up from a silver to a gold. So Will Owen, first race weekend in World Endurance coming up from European Le Mans series and Michelin Le Mans Cup over the last few seasons. Yep, graduating with United. He did. He's had a couple of years out uh, for yeah. full season racing uh, in the business side of things. And that's, by the way, we looked at that new sponsor on the United car. He's brought that with him. That's his day job. It's uh, AI, AI technology that's helped with all sorts of modeling and strategy. And Delatraz fresh into the car, so fresh rubber as well in the uh, number nine machine. It's being run by Prema. From a power team as was, uh, real doyens of Formula 3 Euro Series and, and single-seater racing uh, in the feeder championships. And very interesting to see them pick up the reins in LMP2, as we saw from WRT last year, another team that were world-renowned for their prowess in GT racing coming to LMP2 racing. And Prema clearly battling here with AF Corsa to position themselves as the team of choice when Ferrari is looking for somebody to run its hypercars in the not distant future. And Ant Davidson, that's going to be a really tough battle between those two crews, between Prama and between AF Corsa, because it's unlikely that both of them will get to run cars officially. Yeah, of course, but, you know, AF Corsa are, they're running the Pro-Am class in, in LMP2 at the moment, so yeah. not directly fighting each other, um, but although they did take pole position with that brilliant lap, uh, yesterday by Nicholas Nielsen. There's, there's going to be a bit of contact here in the final corner. So, so close. Oh. Guess I don't know how they avoided each other there, but that was some pretty decent racing. And that, that, that's that was Giancarlo, for position as well. That's Giancarlo Fisichella. Yeah, that's, yeah, that is your Giancarlo on Francesco Casa. That, in fact, those are both triple word scores. Uh, indeed, but uh, that's Giancarlo Fisichella, never known for being uh, underwhelming his style. <laughs> uh, on his old car, of course. That. <laughs> that's so in the slipstream, goes to the outside and then slingshots his way down the inside wow. as he sees the car 54 run a little bit wide gives him a sniff of an opportunity and on the inside he goes risky stuff well, as that we takes, know, that corner takes us back to two or three years ago when fizzy was as you say in the silver ferrari and i'm thinking of the car guy ferrari it was kai cosolino kai wasn't cosolino it? when fizzy keller tried to elbow him out the way you what now that was great I, i'm fun. not sure quite how that translates into japanese but yeah they're, they're enjoying a bit of that <laughs> eh, of course so. <laughs> there you go. So 90 laps in the books here, 179 remain in Sebring, the season opener. Hot weather at the Sebring International Raceway. We are two hours, 50 minutes into the eight hours of Sebring, the thousand miles. Alpine, the leaders with the fastest race lap as well in that car early on in the race from Toyota Gazoo Racing, number eight. One lap saved in fuel over number seven. That could be very, very important later on. United also sports one, two ahead of Prema in LMP2. Corvette leading from the delayed Porsche GT team. A, of course, as Ferrari seemingly absolutely nowhere at the moment. They're running nose to tail about 10 seconds apart, a minute off the pace. And in the GTM class, Northwest AMR lead from Debsu Proton Porsche, TF Sports Aston, Team Project One Porsche, and the best of the Ferraris is the Iron Dames car in sixth position. So they have uh, seesawed around between fifth and sixth with D Station. D Station now back up into fifth place with Charlie Fagg taking over from Satoshi Hoshino and Rahel Frey staying in for a double stint. So 90 laps in the books, 178 remain and still we have this fascinating battle and davidson of the fastest versus a well a, 
maybe not the most economical, but a car with a bigger fuel tank capacity that could go further. And that is the case of both the Toyotas and the Glickenhaus over the Alpine. That's their advantage. Less time spent stationary, not quite as much time spent going so quickly. Absolutely, yeah, there's one of the drivers there. Negrau in talks with the engineering team. He knows the job he's got to do when he gets in the car. He's uh, you've got to keep the speed up, that's the thing. That, that is the target of today. Yeah, flat out, Yeah. start to finish. sorts of battles going on in LMP2 as well. Looking here at the battle for second place, closing down in the Prema car, Louis Delatraz, Le Mans winner, versus Will Owen. As Graham Goodwin pointed out moments ago, Will spent a couple of years away from racing, but successful in P3 and P2 machinery with United Auto Sports. He was champion in LMP3 and LMP2 a couple of years ago in his most recent season in the European Le Mans series. But again, another step up up in terms of the talent you are fighting against, if not in terms of the talent that you are being engineered by. And it's a good debut from Prema. Again, you know, their setup sheet will have been a blank piece of A4 with nothing written on it other than their name at the top, which hopefully they get points for spelling right. And the key point here in the Prema lineup is that Lorenzo Colombo has already been in the car. Yeah. And now they're back to their more accomplished well, drivers. But you wouldn't notice from the lap time. No, exactly. Because he was quick. Again, a driver we don't know. There's your leader, the 23 car, being driven by Josh Pearson, the youngest man in the field, 16 years old. You've got to be really careful of that curb on the exit of turn five. You see how it pulls the car off yeah. of the track and then onto the, onto the dirt. The GT cars can cope with that a little bit more effectively. It's still not ideal to be there, but a P2 car is such a stiff car, such a stiff platform but it responds horribly to that, and that's, he's just learned to lesson there, but... Uh, Hopefully. Oh, yeah, <laughs> he definitely, yeah. He, oh, what's this, uh, car 44, Bratislava car, crossing uh, the wide line on the well, pit lane exit, drive through penalty. That was in Miran Konopka's last stint. Let's hear from the pit lane with Louise Beckett. Sebastian Ogier has come in for his first pit stop in the WEC, staying in the car by the looks of things. From what I can see, I don't know if you're getting pictures yet, Yeah, Martin. we are. Absolutely. There he is. And remains in the car, so he will double stint. And this will be no tyres, fuel only. And a, ah! Tyres are going on. Now, one tyre. Right-hand side for okay, definite. Okay, so right-hand side. Okay, we can see the front being changed. The rear was changed as well. Thank you, Louise Beckett. Just being corrected that it was, in fact, uh, Mark Donahue, not David Donahue. I'm getting father and son mixed up, which is uh, really stupid because I've met one and not met the other, but I've, uh, I've read the book and uh, yeah, getting my Donahues mixed up. Thank you very much indeed for that reminder. Sebastian Oje remains in the car then. You right side. And Anne Davidson, we, we heard Porsche this morning in their pre-race briefing saying they're not sure whether they're going to change left sides or right sides rather than a full tyre change because they, they, they weren't really sure that, that either side was going to be the dominant worn side. You go somewhere like Spa or you go somewhere like Monza, you know which side is taking almost all of the aggro. Here it's a, a, a much more... Ooh, ugly wear pattern. That's a that's nice. a tire that has long seen better days. Yeah, that is too too worn and actually delaminated. That's where the, the actual compound of the tire Pull back. is so Whose thin. Whose garage is this? Are they the tires that have just come off Ogier's car? Come on, show us, show us. It's car yes, number one. It is. Okay, so that was the number one car. Well, he's not used to making tires last necessarily, Sebastian Ogier, but. Say it's um, come through a lockup and would yeah. explain why there was only 10 laps on that uh, set of tyres. Yeah. It was an early pit stop, so it was an undrivable set of tyres there. Probably come through a lockup, hopefully yeah. not just through a delamination of the tyre. I wouldn't expect that from Goodyear on this circuit. I would say probably more from locking up. But um, yeah, look, part and parcel of, of, of driving in an endurance race. Look after the tyres, look after the equipment, but drive as hard and as fast as possible. One, uh, he's got a mouthful of food at the moment, but one car in the pit lane, uh, Rahel Frey, the Iron Dames Ferrari. Now, we just saw her move up the order, but she's actually now lost a couple of places because she has made a pit stop, and I'm not sure that is entirely 
schedule. Graham Goodwin's going to have a little fiddle with the computer and find out as we ride with Dane Cameron. Antonio Felix da Costa, very much closer looking. Three laps he's reeled in, nearly two seconds. We saw that was happening, and that continues to be the case. And with fresher rubber than the Penske driver, and that definitely and Davidson is not harming his attack. Well, it's four laps in it, isn't it, with the tyres, so it's, it's not a huge amount of lap time in that, uh, especially around this track. But, uh, yeah, Felix da Costa got the bit between his teeth now. They took a, a bit of a hit earlier on. We saw the spun, the turnaround. Roberto Gonzalez took in turn one, and uh, da Costa had a bit of a, a, bit of a scruffy uh, qualifying session. I interviewed him on the grid earlier on. He said, yeah, you know, it didn't quite go our way in qualifying, but we know we've got the speed in the car, and uh, he's, he's showing us now just how fast he and the car can be around this track. But, yeah, getting past, well, catching was one thing, but getting past uh, Cameron would be another. As the oh, car's oh, gone oh, off, is that... Uh, oh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can take the boy out of the forest, but apparently you can't get him off the loose. Stay on the black star. Yeah, that's yeah. what it's there for, in the, in the inimitable words of the great Doc Hudson. Stay on the grey stuff, son, that's what it's there for. Nobody at all will be pulling his leg about that one. Uh, <laughs> no. um, the answer, by the way, on the Iron Danes. Uh, oh, the cost, oh, sorry, Graham. He's yeah. just trying to find yeah. his way past. He's, he's spotted an opportunity with uh, seeing the car go off in front of him at turn seven and then a, a twitch for good measure because on the exit of turn 10, still carrying that debris on his tyres, is Ogier. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he, he had to back out of it before turn 13. Well, this is actually... Uh, Backing him up as well. And the race leader away. is there as well. Next car is the Blue Alpine. That's the race leader. He needs to get by safely. This is, yeah, potential jeopardy here. De Costa is going to have to tow down the straight and try and send it deep. He goes. Alpine comes through as well. Come on, the race leader trying to find his way through. Can't get through there. Has to follow Antonio Felix De Costa and has to avoid that potential drama. Getting by the slightly wayward Sebastian Ogier. Remember, that's a team car for the Alpine. That's the other Signatech run car from Richard Mille Racing. So zero doubt that uh, Ogier would have been told the Alpine was there. Makes it through, past Antonio, Antonio Felix to cost out and away. And a pass for position because through goes the ultimate car. That has been driven by Jean-Baptiste Lahaye. He goes by Sebastian Ogier. That is for second. Oh, well, he is already second in the Pro-Am class, but that is for a top 10 position in LMP2. Now, talking of a top two position, Will Owen still holding off Louis Delachance. Delachance has got close, but no closer in the last three or four laps. No, he hasn't really. Maybe traffic hasn't quite gone his way. We haven't been watching them on screen. But this is the moment where Delatraz has to make the move stick because later on in the race you're going to get the uh, you're going to get the Duresters and the Albuquerques back in the car in the yep. United, and you want to be in front of them when that happens. Exactly. Now right. is your chance. And the gap is continuing to close. Riding on board with Dane Cameron for Team Penske. This battle in LMP2 between the American and the Portuguese, Antonio Felix da Costa. And again, the gap as yo yo's come down from 2.9 down to 0.4, back out over a second as 33 is in. First of our AM pit stoppers, this is Ben Keating. Doors not open, so Ben going for a double here. He did a single stint, handed it over his two to his teammates. Looks like he is ready for a double. And this will uh, this will break him, this will finish him in terms of the, the physical man, but also in terms of his drive time in the car. They're giving him a fresh set of rubber. Oh, and some of the tires. It's a white roof. Is Final it a corner. GT car or is it the Richard Mill Racing Team car? No, it's a, it's a Porsche. It is a Porsche 46, 46 yeah. and that is just past the pit exit for the WEC. Nick Leutweiler, that's where the car crashed in practice, and he has got going again. Loses the rear on the way in, oh, under the God. brakes. All it's the way. One, one of those corners where you are trail braking deep into the corner, and it's bumpy, and it's a fast entry, and it doesn't take much for the rear just to get away from you. Good to see him drive away. But the rear end plate, so there's damage to that car, that's going to be pitting. 46 car coming round, and that's beginning to deconstruct itself. Don't forget, the team told me at the start of the race there were steering issues that they had repaired. That's why they were starting from the pit lane. Maybe it's come back again. 
Yeah, maybe it has. Well, it's the same damage as we saw in qualifying, Graeme Goodwin, with that damage on the right-hand rear of the car. And the other thing the is sh it's result. shedding parts. They this have could to tell him to slow down. This could prompt a full-course yellow for Debris if, uh, because th that is not going to hang on. Yeah, driving at that kind of speed is, is irresponsible, really is. You know, it, it, both from the team's point of view and from the driver, they must tell him to slow down. You can't carry on driving. The, the aerodynamics at work there is just going to absolutely obliterate the rear end of that car. Yeah, it's sending shards of carbon fibre or fibreglass all over the track, and it's going to be a much bigger clear-up operation. Eduardo Freitas will not like what he's seeing right now. Well... The if we get a full course caution, it will be slow, uh, short rather, because the car is on its way back in under its own steam and has air in the tyres. Is that going to is that going to compromise Alpine or Toyota or anybody? Well, it's, 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 you dare and have a safety car if you're Alpine. They're yeah. still not that lap ahead of Toyota, so all of that gap is a safety car, not a full course yellow. Of course, that, that's where everyone just goes at the same speed. Yeah. So you know, hit the full course yellow button on the car, restrict the speed as the Penske comes into a scheduled pit stop. You, you dread the fact that the thought of a safety car if you're Alpine right now. Yeah, that would be a horror story. LMP2 pit stops underway. Team Penske's Dane Cameron stays in. He will double stint. 25 seconds stop and go. Penalty for the Spirit of Race car driven by Gabriel Aubrey as he makes his GTE AM debut. That, must that was have been for speeding really in speeding. the pit lane. Yeah. It's a graduated penalty normally for that. That's but that's significantly over the limits. Yeah. Clearly, something in the limiter was not working in that Ferrari. Northwest AMR in from the lead. Paul Dallalana stays in, same as we saw from Ben Keating in the 33 car. And that will cycle Christian Reed to the lead in the 77 Dempsey Proton Porsche uh, that he has taken over from Sebastian Prio. It may not because the gap was sufficient. I think he may get out of the lead in the 98 car. Okay, well, there's the damage at the back of 46. And because we do not have pit garages here, this is a hot pit lane, US style, that will need to go behind the wall for repairs. They cannot do that on the pit lane. It's been a torrid weekend for the Team Project One. Yep. With the write-off for the initial 56 car. And they're doing their best to write this one off as well. That's the second right rear impact in turn 17 for this car in 48 hours. And you can see the driver's door doesn't actually line up there with the rear body either. The team uh, manager, Axel Funke, was reminding me that it was three years and two days uh, from the first uh, race meeting they took part here in the FIWC, where in testing, their original car burned to the ground yes. with uh, Jörg Bergmeister in testing. I think it's since then we've had two further chassis, including the previous 46 written off. And that's not a write-off, but uh, that's going to put a wrinkle in their day. They might consider wanting to change their race number, I think. that uh, <laughs> You know, nobody's superstitious, but yeah, what they are. are. Sorry, this is Sean Galeo. I was just seeing he did a, he did a 50, 156 lap that's time it. last time. That's, that's why. I was just thinking, why was his lap time so slow? Turn 13. Catches him out under the brakes. That's his second a rally day. crossing trip, isn't yeah. it? Yes. Difficult day. Yeah, you could see the snap of the car. Yeah. So he was just feeding it in, and that's how quickly these LMP2 cars can react. Well, exactly the same for saw two or three laps ago from Sebastian Ogier. Just, uh, yeah, fit of the head staggers, and the car is off. Here's the Prema car. This is the fight I'm interested yeah. in. He's whittling that gap down, is Delatraz. Is he though? Only yeah, 0.79 I behind at the last split. Yeah, I think he's got to within that stage where the aerodynamics start to become affected. Yeah. You can run quite close in sports cars, especially the, the LMP2s, but you do still get affected. You get a lot of ground effects in these cars, so it does help to run closer, but at some point it, it does become... You do feel the lack of grip yeah. when you get too close, but yeah, the, the traffic hasn't quite worked for him this time around. Maybe later in, in the, the stint it will. Uh, quick view of Mike Conway, thoughts with him. Very sadly lost his dad in the last day. And, uh, there's an awful lot of emotion, I'm sure, going through his head. You've just got to try and clear it away and do the best you can. Yeah, thoughts definitely with the Conway family. Mike Conway Sr. Rest in peace. 
and uh, it's Mike Jr. soldiers on today. I can only begin to imagine what poor old Mike is going through. A good friend of mine, of course, from our days at Toyota. A lovely chap. Another man who, after a stint in the commentary booth with me, decided that professional racing was definitely the way to go. Well, let's catch up with the 92 Porsche that leads in GTE Pro. Give me one second. Yeah, Jesus. Next lap, all the lap after. Do you feel you've gone off a cliff? No one's waiting. Five. Yeah, copy. If you still feel comfortable, we're we'll trying to stretch it. What's the stretch mean? Two laps of maximum. Turn over. Okay, no, uh, uh, what he didn't want to hear was just one more stint. Two laps maximum, yeah, no trouble. Uh, Corvette, by the way, are planning fuel and right side tyres on there. Now. So they're, they're still learning about the car in these conditions as the 46 Project One car does go on the uh, trolley dollies to well, that's, behind that's the wall. the stop they've just had, so that will have just happened. Ah, okay, all right, that just that's came why they've in dropped now. A third. Uh, so Tommy Milner with right sides only, and fuel, obviously. Indeed. And Christensen coming in, so he'll bail out, won't he, and hand back to Kevin Erst. He, he was going, don't make me stay in for another stint, or I'm going to kill somebody when I regret <laughs> Well, they were asking him originally, look, you know, we've seen the lap times drop a bit, uh, do you want to come in now, effectively? And that yeah. was him on the radio saying, no, uh, it was a mistake, there's more pace in the car, yeah. I don't necessarily need to come in right now, so let's try and stretch it. Well, let's catch up with the Dempsey Proton team. Louise is down with Sebastian Prio. Well, the Tinknell Prio combo has been known for a while, but this time it's Seb Prio in the 77 with Harry Tinknell. That was a great stint from you. Great battle with Ben Keating. You managed to hunt him down. Yeah, I mean, that was pretty much one of the toughest races out there for sure. It's warm. Um, my first race in WEC, you know, I'm, it feels really good to be in this, you know, this this championship, and I'm, you know, I'm really happy with that stint. Proton did a great job here with the car. Um, overall, the car feels nice to drive. A little bit of oversteer, but happy with, with the balance so far. Obviously, everyone knows your dad, and we're not just talking about your dad. It's your your own career too. But um, so, what, can we expect we're going to be seeing you for the rest of the season, aren't you? We in WEC for sure. I mean, I'm here for the whole season, hopefully, and um, yeah, I'm loving it so far. My first race. It's, it's quite professional. Um, I'm looking forward to working with these guys and definitely Harry and, and Christian. I'm sure it's going to be awesome. Tell us who don't know how you've got to this point, what you've been doing before now. Um, well, Multimatic picked me up from quite a young age in Genetic Juniors and I, I did that for a while, a couple of four races. Um, and then, yeah, I, went, I came over to, to America nice and early in the GT4. And then, uh, yeah, I had a great year last year, won the Porsche Carrera Cup Championship. And, just slip me, slip me into this car nicely, and I love this this new new bit of kit. Look forward to seeing you throughout the season. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the standard answer for anybody talented from the UK in motorsports. Uh, when do you start, Junior Juniors? Yeah. 91 Porsche into Lando Norris. Um, number 91 Porsche on pit lane. And uh, Ricard leads out, Jimmy Bruni back in. Remember, two driver squads for all of these cars. And Christensen hands over to Est. So the Porsches still 1-2, but Corvette will cycle back into the lead. For the people that don't know, watching out there, new to WEC, they might be wondering, how do you, when you do a driver change, you just saw Jimmy Bruni's like fighting with the steering wheel. What's he doing there? Well, when I sat in the GT car the other day, the Gabby Aubrey's GT car, I was fascinated to, to, to feel that um, you can actually move all of the controls to you. So the seat stays in exactly the same position. You have an insert, but the control, the, the pedals and the steering wheel can, can move back towards the driver. Yeah, uh, it's a, 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 I know we, when we first got into this era, the safety seats and the roof hatch, there was all this, uh, this talk of teams trying to get to the point where they chose a driver squad that was perhaps closer in physical size. That seemed to go out the window pretty darn quick. Yeah, it's, it's all for you know the, the, the safety push from the FIA to keep the driver's position, mainly the head position, in the same same seating area. 92 now on pit lane, and yeah. that cycle will be complete. So Tommy Milner will go back to the top of the pile in the 64 Corvette. He looks fired up just before he gets in the car. Me. Well, look, you know, they had one hand on the World Championship trophy, as did Ferrari at the end of last season. And in the wrestling match, Ferrari ended up with it. So Michael Christensen, former world champion for Porsche, 
wants to win the title this year with Kevin Escher. And, you know, day one, you absolutely have to get the maximum balance you can out of the points. And so, yeah, they, Esther there. And he's always like a, a dog after a rabbit, isn't he? You know, he, he doesn't do half-hearted in any way, shape or form. Uh, Is this Pit the Premier car that's overtaken the United? Yeah, it has. Lane. Pit both. Lane empties both United cars on the same stop. Right, let's well, we've that. lost all of our timing screens, I'm afraid. There so. must be a difference in uh, tyre strategy there yes. from, from both teams. Yeah, that's the only way you can really out pit stop somebody unless they have an absolute horror. But both United cars having a horror. Interesting that both United cars pitted at the same time. Yeah, because they, they were, were a lap apart. They were a lap apart. So, um, yeah, they've come together in strategy now, maybe because there was enough of an actual gap between the two cars yeah. on track now. Who knows? But, yeah, some, someone would have lost out a lap there because, yeah, the, the 23 car was going a lap longer. How is Tommy Milner 36? <laughs> I, I first met him I, literally when he was, you know, still in short trousers running around after old Tom. Sorry, Tom Milner, I, senior. I think that means says rather more about you than well, it does about how Tommy. Is he said, well, I'm glad you, you win there, Graham. Yeah. Mind, you, mind you, when I was first starting out as, as, a, as a fan, I do remember Justin Bell being about seven or eight, and he's ah, now stall. like, he's got kids that are older than that, little stall for the ultimate car. And that, immediately you saw that, lost, lost them a place. They went from 11th to 12th, just by not getting out of the pit lane yep. as quick as they should have done. It's seconds lost. Yeah. Every, you know, when you make a mistake like that, you might be thinking, oh, it's only a stall, you start it up and go again. It's, these are, you know, like I said before, tenths of a second is what you fight for on the track. It's most often, it's the biggest time difference is made or lost in the pit lane. Absolutely. And, and you know, you, you look at Audi's wins at Le Mans and you look at how many minutes they saved in the pit lane compared to some of their rivals. And that is what Toyota are trying to do to Alpine today. Yeah, Alpine in the pits. Nicolas Lapierre after the quickest, uh, not quite the quickest stint we've seen, 150.9 on that stint. Trouble there for the 88 car. That's like puncture. Oh, yep. it is left, left rear. rear. Well, that's the first puncture we've seen. Has he found some of the debris from 46? We did see a slow-mo shot uh, going around 9 to 10 of a bit of debris being flicked up by a right rear tyre, and that's, that's going to, to do damage. a bit more. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be doing much damage to the Well, at, car, the, moment, at the moment, the tyre will disintegrate yeah. and then start flicking around and whipping all of the bodywork around the wheel arch it's, off. And it's all the carcass of the tyre as yeah. well. It's all that, you know, metal that's in there holding it together. Leader is in. Everybody is in. Looks like Ogier came in after the Alpine yeah. and had to do the pullback. Yeah. And now the Alpine is having to do a pullback and the 88 is on its way in. Oh, I love oh, oh I think he's, he's lost it spin. on the curb. He was trying to get out of the way yeah. and he's turned while the car's trying to rely on that punctured tyre. I reckon he's turned it very yes, yes. And he's well now spotted. he's going to be a bit... Yeah, you saw him beaching it on the As on he the rotated. Yeah. Yeah, it, he was trying to he was trying to get out of the way the faster cars coming out behind did the right thing trying to be nice yeah never works in motor racing <laughs> no, exactly it really doesn't no no just stay on line don't get out of the way stay on Husby line said he was just they were brand new tires oh no well, maybe oh, hang on a minute so where was did it, he get that puncture from he was on a double stint this is fred poor dad trying to get the car back mm. in his third stint by the way He's it'll done. be it'll uh, be one of those where the tire has been dropped off the inside of a well, curb on, and guys. Sorry. ragged inside edge. This has now got to tire. cross the circuit. Yeah. He's blinded well, no, he, here from he so he's trying to get to the pit lane entry, which is on the top left hand side of your screen. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and cars are t they're being kind of a bit freaked out by it, seeing a car stricken at the side of the track. This is he needs guidance to when he can go by the team. They've yeah. got the GPS tracker on well, the car. And also there. from the marshals there, the marshals at the marshals post oh. need to be waving. Oh, he's him. committed. He's, he's can't watch. Oof. Okay, go 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 go. <laughs> oh. They're horrible moments, aren't they? Yeah, you really. cannot see from the no, from the no. right-hand side of these cars. Yeah. You well, can't you see through the door. You were saying it, it a little earlier, weren't you? Let's watch this again. So it goes over the curb in avoidance, and that's where it all went wrong. It just oh. beached it, and around it goes. Yeah. Because he's not allowed for the fact that there is no ride height now. This is probably a one rear wheel. Probably yeah. would have been better off just to cut the corner off yeah. and go completely to the inside of it. Because yeah. that's where you've got to end up anyway to come into the pit lane. Yes. Well, good news for the American driver. He is in the pit lane. Bad news is they've lost two or three spots with that incident. 
Let's catch up now with the youngest man in the field, probably the youngest driver in the county right now, 16-year-old Josh Pearson. Who's back it is there? Josh Pearson, you've been cooled down, but you just look so relaxed from that stint. How was it? Yeah, you know, it was difficult. I think around the third stint there, it was really just tires were gone, struggling for grip, but we had good pace, and I think overall it was great. I think we had a good car under us for the for the first two. As the tires went away, it started to go, but I was able to manage it. And how is it for you to be here in the WEC at Sebring for the first race? Yeah, you know, it's great. The track's really bumpy, so it's a lot different than any other track we'll go to on the calendar, but that makes it unique, and it's a new challenge. Uh, what's your, what's the plan? Are we going to see you for the rest of the season? Yeah, so I'll, I'll do the entire WEC season, uh, including Le Mans. So it should be fun. All right, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm really feeling my age now. When when 16-year-olds talk like 30-year-olds and can analyse and can just deal with all this stuff at such a, a young age and are so experienced. I mean, he's just ridiculously cool, calm and collected and... Yeah, he'll go a long way. Aha! Uh -huh. Switch of positions for Toyota, and that tells me there must be a difference in strategy. We mentioned yeah. earlier on that Jose Maria Lopez was hunting down Brendan Hartley, but I feel like maybe Hartley's playing the fuel-saving game, or I hope for his sake that he is. Because now car seven finds its way in front. Yeah, and that was a... Started a at 14 runner. seconds. That was the team saying, let him go, and we'll hear a replay of that probably at some stage. The team saying, OK, make the pass after turn 10 or wherever. Um, as, yeah, the number eight car has already saved one lap of fuel uh, oh, against its sister car. That's the benchmark. And they are now clearly trying to save another lap on this stint without giving away too much speed. This is a... It's a... Uh, the Alpine is behind. Really hard balance to save fuel but not lose time. And it's it's Formula E drivers discipline. who have got you know that experience as, as much as anything else. Three hours in to the season opener here at Sebring. It's starting on a very hot and sunny mid-Florida Friday lunchtime with Jim Glickenhaus and the captain, Roger Penske, greeting each other on the grid as Jackie X, the Grand Marshal for the weekend, waved the cars away. The old glory started the race. Big gap between the LMP field and the GT field, which was not supposed to happen. Three wide turns. Turn one, the Penske yellow car going around both Jota cars that had out-qualified it. And they have been trying to get back ahead of the Penske car for the rest of the race. But Alpine and Glickenhaus, the front row of the grid, between them, the number 22 United Autosports LMP2 car, showing how quick the United cars get off the marks and heat up their tyres. Porsches ahead of the Corvette in GTE Am. The Aston Martins were the dominant force with pole and going one, two, three early in the race ahead of the Ferrari Porsche squabble behind them. As Alpine set to at the front of the field, there was a change for lead. The AMR car of Paul Dallalana get ahead here of pole man Ben Keating. First full stop of the new season for the Glickenhaus as Toyota continued to run in third and fourth place. Porsche won two, but Corvette moving through into the lead of GTE Pro. Problems for the 34 car. Interiorpol ended up having to change an electronic control unit to get the car running reliably. Jota working their way back up the order after a slightly off-form qualifying session both cars into position to challenge for the podium within the first couple of hours. Going the long way round the outside of a GT and Porsche and outwitting the uh, Penske driver Roman Duma in the, the car. Battle with Sebastian Prio moving up into the top two in the Dempsey Proton 77 Porsche. Last year's US Carrera Cup champion showing his Porsche licks as the 98 Aston Martin continued in front. Corvette leads in the GTE Pro category. 
in LMP2. It is 1-2 still for United Autosports with the Prema car having now jumped them in the pit stops. And out front, Glickenhaus fourth ahead of Alpine, the Toyota 1-2 in Hypercar. So it's been a busy race so far. We have had no full course cautions, no safety cars, and we expect the uh, pressure on the drivers to be as relentless as it is on the car. There you saw the lead battle in LMP2. There is the Prema car, 31, that leads. A big part the number nine car. There are the United Auto Sports cars, second and third. 22 back ahead of 23. Will Owen for holding now, off Paul DiResti. Yeah, I think only for a moment or two. Martin Haven in the booth with Graham Goodwin and Ant Davidson and Anthony. I mean, racing drivers don't do what you're doing now. I mean, you do at Formula One, obviously, but but in in your sport, in in sports car racing, what is now your sport. You don't watch the overview, you don't watch the whole picture, you only watch your car and what's happening to your car around it. That's right, yeah, I mean, you focus on your category mainly, and then the, the, the immediate cars around you. So it's, it's, you're very blinkered in, in your own race. It's quite different to sit here now. Well, interesting change of battle in this LMP2 race where suddenly the balance of power has swung towards the Prema team. Now, it's worth mentioning, not only is this Prema's first race in World Endurance, it's their first endurance race, it's their first sports car race. They do F3, F2. I mean, and Very boy, well. boy, do they do it. Yeah. But this is a whole different ball game. This is what United make their money at. This is how, what they do. You know, this is and this to come is to their a circuit where you need home. you need such experience as a team, not just a driver, to come to this particular track. It's so unique with the bumps, with this surface. You see, they're running down now. You hear as the cars trundle down each concrete block. The ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da yeah, yeah. stem back to when this track used to be an old American airbase. Yeah. Still the original surface. So the, so the question is now, and, and maybe the strategy lap cop can give us a clue, have Prema got in front by burning through more tyres than United? Because that, that's got to be somewhere in the equation. That's got to be somewhere in the balance of power. United haven't flubbed this yet. They haven't made no. big errors. So somehow Prem have found something. And, and my guess then is it's a tyre deal, Graham. Well, we'll come to the tyres in a moment. In terms of the pace, so that's the, the important thing for what we're watching right at this moment. That, that the pace differential has come in in the last couple of stints. While we've been enjoying that uh, that battle between Josh Pearson and, uh, and Phil Hansen, what's been gradually happening with Lorenzo Colombo, particularly in his first stint, and then Louis Delatraz uh, in his first stint, is they've been just grinding away a tenth of a lap, a two tenths of a lap, three tenths of a lap at this advantage. And what we've got here... The rest is frustrated. Yep. The uh, flash of the headlights there uh, before turn 14. Well, and he's got to find his way past. He's losing time like this. You've got the same guy on the pit wall. This shouldn't be happening. You want to win the race. Get him in front. Get the fast guy in front. I no. think they're doing that right now. I think they're yeah. going to swap positions. But Paul should not have been jammed up behind him for a lap, a lap flashing the lights. They should have. They can see what we can see. They can see the lap times are going to bring him up there. They're going to say to Will Owen, Will, on this lap, he's going to be with you. Let him go. And they didn't. They wasted a lap doing it. If they lose by two seconds, that's where that two seconds went right there. And now we're over dramatizing it. We're still, you know, 160 laps from the end. Race leader is Jose Maria Lopez for Turo Tagazu Racing over teammate Brendan Hartley and Andre Negrau for Alpine. In LMP2, the battle we're watching now is for second place. Less of an actual battle, more of a position change as the 22 United Autosport car, uh, uh, 23 rather, of Paul DiResta goes ahead of Willow in in 22. LMP2 being led by Prema and Louis Delatraz are virtual Le Mans winner and near Le Mans winner last season. And there is Mike Conway ready to take over the car with which he and his teammates have won the last two world championships, Sam Davidson. The number seven Toyota, 
ahead of the number eight car, and Pichito leads the race. Five to go after this, five. All right, so that was just before the end of the last lap. Brendan Hartley going, how much more of this can I have uh, I got to put up with? But interestingly, though, Martin, he's able to now match the pace yeah. of Pachito Lopez. Yeah. So Lopez started at 14 seconds behind when he when he came out for his first in of the car number eight. But now he's ahead. But now he, that he's found himself ahead, it's almost yeah. as if Brendan's found a, a second wind and he can he can keep the gap. But if Brendan drops more than the half to three quarters of a second behind, suddenly he loses any aerodynamic toe from the number seven car. If he sits in the slipstream, he is still, he's still doing both of the things that he's trying to do, save, save fuel, fuel and not lose time. So over the long run of the double stint, yes, he's, the number seven car is getting closer and closer, but the number eight car is trying to save a second lap on the number seven car. Because in the end, if they are ahead of the Alpine, they've got to beat the number seven car. And if they're behind the Alpine, they've got to beat the number seven well, car. Well, if the number eight car did gain a lap of fuel over the number seven car, that's a miraculous effort because they also extended the gap when it was Buemi against Kobayashi. Yeah. My feeling is Kobayashi had had enough, his tires were gone, we saw lots of mistakes from him, so they brought him in just a lap early to save any further damage. Yeah. That's, that's my guess, but no, no, I might I be agree. completely wrong. I, 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 I think that's... that's I think fuel-wise, they were the same up until when Brendan got in the car, then he started to play yeah. the, the, the fuel game. Uh, Take me a little wee while, apologies, our time in Sister One's letters down a little bit, but we're back up and running now. The answer on tyres is no. Uh, they, <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember what the question the que was. The question was whether or not they're tyres or no, tires. they're not. So it's, Ooh, it, it, with, so one it's of the, with one of the United uh, cars, as we've got uh, one of the Toyotas. Well, suddenly, look at the gap between the Toyotas. It's happening in traffic. Three GTE cars and one Pro. You've got the, uh, you've got the Corvette in front. There you've got the yellow Ferrari, uh, which remind me is, I can't remember which one's yellow. Oh, it's the Iron Lynx Ferrari. Well, that's why we saw such a desperate move from Pachito in Turn 1, because he could yeah. see this gap of the cars coming, and look what it's given him. The risk has paid off. He's yeah, extended it's that gap. Two seconds, two and a half seconds, nearly. Uh, let's hear from Fred Pordad, who we just saw coming in with that puncture in the Dempsey Proton Porsche. Fred, we've just heard that there's no further action on how you got back to the pit lane. Um, wow, you did well to get that car back here. Oh, that was dicey. I, uh... I had to drive around with that punctured left rear and um, I was trying to get uh, some information about what was happening and my mistake was I tried to make it easy for the cars coming through 15 and I thought I'd just go over the, the curb but then the car just spun around because I was obviously touching the bottom. And then that was a little tricky to get back in, I'll be honest with you, but um, glad it worked out okay and yeah, it was a good experience overall. Too bad the tire went down and uh, I still have to finish 11 minutes of my of my uh, required drive time, unfortunately. But yeah, the strategy didn't quite go our way today. I mean, we were all holding our breaths as we saw you coming in. Uh, do you know how you got the puncture? You know, I was going through uh, turn three, and I let a pro car go by, and then the second pro uh, might have tapped my left rear. I don't know exactly. He was awfully close. Um, but other than that, I'm not sure how it happened. So how are you going to make up that time that you've got left to, uh, to drive? Great question. Well, uh, we've had a pretty uh, clear race. I mean, if there's a, a yellow, a full course yellow, I'll certainly take that opportunity to jump in. Otherwise, yeah, I'm not the best for strategy. Uh, but, you know, something to learn from for the, for the whole team. And, yeah, you know, this is uh, my first race in this car in this series so full of excitement well see you for your last 12 minutes thank you Thanks. Uh, so it's got to be said that's disastrous for fred Bordad. and this is on board now with the number seven car going by trying to get past that car. oh no and he's hit him he's touched him he did number seven out i think has he got away with that there's no damage. There's no, no. there has to be damage. That was I'm, astonishing. I'm sure there'll be some damage if there is, and that is one seriously strong toy. He went around the outside and basically just pinched in too early. Either way, I think he's going to receive some kind of penalty, I'm sure, because that was completely 
it, his well, yes, there. He did. Yeah, it, just, I, I'd, I'd like to see an onboard, but it just feels like to me. He, yeah, here we go. So goes in on the outside. And at what point does he turn? The, the Porsche. No, the, the Porsche turns doesn't on turn him. left. I don't think. No, he just didn't give him enough space. He didn't. He, so he, he almost hits the front. The, the front's damaged. The front's damaged. Oh dear. Hence all the tire smoke coming out. Oh. And that's how easy it oh, is, Graham. There's the clicking house. There's the clicking house. Oh, he's oh, off no. again. Oh! Oh, a huge off. He had no steering. The front was going under the car. The front had no steering there. The tire's gone. Tried to get it back too quickly. Red flag. It's a red flag immediately. Wow, race stopped. Red flag. Hopefully, the most important thing is that Pachito's going to be OK. That was quite a high-speed incident on the way into Turn 14. Slow down, 80 kph. Full course yellow button pressed at this stage for all cars. So just to go back, what we've, Toyota. Yeah, what we've seen there, and he's, he's out of the car. That's, I, the, that's the most important thing. He's I, out of the car. The tyres have done their job. The car, the safety's done it, done its job. I was sure he would get out, but he had no steering no. on the way into the corner. As he barrels into turn 14, he turns, the car doesn't. That's a huge hit. I mean, it always looks horrific when a car goes upside down. That's not a big concern when it happens at that speed. It's it's more the impact when he turned in here. That's the frightening bit, and he would have no had his heart in his Absolutely. mouth at that point. Well, for the second time in about 10 minutes, you're completely spot on with your analysis of that. It was absolutely no steering. This is going to take some time to recover both that car and indeed to repair the uh, the barriers there. So all of that started with a conversation. Watch this again. It comes through. Turn, he does, I he, don't he, think the Porsche did anything did, wrong from did. what I can see from these different angles. That's it's where the shame, first impact. It's a shame that's... we don't have the onboard of the Porsche. And this is the bit, the moment where we saw before. But it, the, the most interesting part for me is why was there contact yeah. in the first place? This is a routine overtaking spot on the track yeah. on the exit of turn seven. I, I don't understand how it happened. And he shakes his head as well. I can't believe it was almost like he felt he cleared the Porsche. It was. Now, I mean, I'll say this. We saw a little bit of this when we first moved to the hypercar class with drivers transitioning from the LMP1 cars that all of a sudden there were mistakes being made under braking and in traffic. And it, it did seem as if he thought he was a good couple of meters further up enough, the road. Honestly, yeah. I don't have enough angles of yeah, it. No, I agree. The only angles yeah. I've seen I, it, I lean more towards the Toyota just tightening the gap too soon. Yeah, I, I, I have to say I, I absolutely agree with Alex there. It's yeah. now 3.33 local time. If we go green before 4.30, I think that the, uh, the track workers will have done an astonishing job to do that. That is a lot of repairs to do. We heard Eduardo Freitas on the radio saying, everybody bring the cars, stop at the start finish line. We saw Mike Conway there ready to take his helmet off. Well, you know, there's no question that he would have done everything he could do to try and win the race. Uh, for his dad, but that is not the way this is working. The good news is that Jose Maria Lopez is That's out and thing. walking around. Right. I mean, and you know, I watched, I commentated on your crash at Le Mans, and that was a faster and more violent and, and really horrible accident to watch. But you know, there is no good accident to see. Just trying to uh, earwig on uh, what the conversation was there yeah. at Toyota. The cameras, uh, but he's, he's happy to walk away from that one. Yes. And that's the main thing I think everybody watching on yeah. will appreciate. Um, whether or not he was at fault for the incident, it's always nice to see that, you know, you, you never want to see a driver get injured. This is how it started. This is how it started. I, I can't tell from that angle whether the Porsche moves left or not. But, P Porsche, but either moves if left. Porsche moves left, but that's the line the Porsche is taking out of Here the right hander. Here we go. Board. I'm just watching the Porsche, but it goes out of view. And I, I think he'd made a mistake before then. I, I th think into turn seven, he probably yeah. tried to go around the outside of him, uh, Graham. Whether or not, I think in the, in the hairpin, I think the, the Toyota tried to probably outbreak him, go around the outside, and it was the Porsche coming back at him. I, I wonder if we, if there's a chance of seeing the in-car before that point, that might be useful. So I wonder whether or not he just lost a bit of patience. Yes, exactly. Alex Vertz, you've seen the same pictures we have. Uh, 
tell us how you what your take hey, 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 hey. first of all uh, we seen jose getting out of the car he immediately came on the radio says i'm okay i have no pain so this is the, the good news uh then the racing scenes are what we see sometimes in the world endurance championship jose goes around on the outside uh, with the yellow porsche he clips on the on the tail if that was a misunderstanding between the two drivers we have to look in more detail but uh, bottom line it spun him around then the front end got a hit on the tire wall jose said okay the car is okay i can continue he then continued between turn uh, 15 and uh, 16 he accelerated and it seemed that then the nose just came down because of the impact before uh, and then suddenly he couldn't steer and we see him going straight into the tire wall and then you see the, the rolling unfolding. So uh, bottom line, thank God he's okay, the safety of the cars, the circuit worked all right. Of course we lost the car but we're happy that Jose is good. Yeah, completely agree, thank you. Well, perfectly as explained as much as we could see, really, uh, from Alex Verts Yeah, there. he's only going on the same shots Absolutely. that we've seen. And uh, interesting, you know, he doesn't want to blame his driver, as I don't really either. Not yet. Or the other Because I haven't seen it. Yeah. yeah, or the other driver. We haven't got enough, simply haven't got enough angles of it. The 88 car there is on pit lane. Yeah. And that was the end result. Well, he the took a tag on that down. left front. It, it, in the 88, you know, the, the, it was uh, Julian Andlauer. So he is, he's in a right, uh, in a double right-hander, yep. and from the apex of the right-hander, he comes out left. That's the that's the way the racing line works, and Pachito will have known. He'll have seen the Porsche right up by the curbs on the inside, and Lauer knew he was coming. This is already and after this, the Yeah, contact. the nose is dropped down here, hasn't it? And, and it's, I think you it's can see that that smoke is not tire; that is nose rubbing on the ground. And it goes again. And it's, and it's well, it stage. is rubbing onto the tyre as well, and I think as he built up speed, the nose has gone down further, further back. and restricted his steering. Yeah. It's not allowing the wheel to necessarily turn, and then he goes, Agreed. he realises, he brakes, and the thing doesn't stop, because it's because he's got yeah. the tyre rubbing on the, the front of the, uh, of the car. Yeah, the, 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 the under tray or something is getting under the wheels as well when exactly. he's trying to stop it, yeah. Can't steer. That's exactly what Alex just said there. Front stuck down and he can't steer. Yeah, Seb summoning it up in, in two very familiar French words there, uh, which I won't repeat on there, but anybody who's ever spent any time in France will know them both. Well, the, the, the good news and the, and the only thing to take out of that is that uh, Pachito is fine and, and that in the end it's a car. They can build another one, you can't build another person. So, Well, well we've got... So. Uh, Pretty clearly, a little bit of time on this broadcast, um, where we're going to be looking at <laughs> tie walls. We'll do what we often do, I think, at this point, which is we know people are watching and listening around the world. If you've got any questions you want to ask, particularly to Ant Davidson, do drop them to us, uh, usually on Twitter, I think, uh, is a good idea for that one. We'll see what we can do to fill this time as entertainingly as we possibly can. So, uh, if you Let's drop us to this, Graham, sorry. Three drivers are sitting down there. I, I could hear them talking in the beginning, but um, yeah, Boemi's sitting himself down alongside the sister car crew. Paul so, Dan Alana there Marcus. on the right from uh, Northwest AMR with Sarah Bovey. Yep. Well, the time keeps ticking, of course, under the red flag. So for the moment, uh, drop us a question or two. Uh, tag in uh, at FIWEC. The hashtag for this event is hashtag 1001000 Sebring with a capital S. And uh, we'll see what we can do to help you unpick the Rubicon of endurance racing for the next few minutes. I'm going to ask some Billy questions for which Ant may or may not know the answer. So here's the deal. Toyota have their number eight car ahead of the Alpine now. Suddenly, uh, and, and I assume the, uh, the race is going to be an hour shorter. Suddenly, Toyota are in trouble, yes? Yes. Because well, any laps they've car. saved... Well, no, no. But uh, th 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 just, uh, even if they still had two cars now, any laps they've saved, they have an hour less to exploit that fuel advantage over a quicker car. Th th in my little head, with this stoppage, let's say it's an hour, let's say it's 30 minutes. Toyota's whole strategy was they had to go all the way as green as possible to save as much fuel. Anytime this team, anytime Alpine 
got to put more fuel in the car without losing time at top speed was bad news for Toyota. That's why they're looking so happy, I think, down at Alpine, because well, it's, it's taken away uh, chances of doing more pit stops, yes. which is the only place where Toyota are gaining. If the, if the race is an hour shorter, Toyota's better mileage doesn't have a whole time to... to has less opportunity of giving them a full pit stop back. Exactly. So, so, yeah, I mean... And also, and this is a critical point, you can't go putting fuel into your car under the red flag. Yeah. Right? It's not like... It's, it's not like it's uh, not F1, F1 where you can make changes <laughs> to your, these cars sit lying astern now yep. untouched yeah um, no changes um, of tires no changes of bodywork no putting fuel in the car it's literally a timeout and then we'll go again from where we left off which i love about sports car racing yeah and more to the point uh, they need fuel now uh, Toyota have to pit almost as soon as we go back running and Ooh. they will then encounter the world's worst traffic jam another good point Oh, yep. good shout, yes, because there'll be a whole field behind. Yep. It will be as if they didn't set a time in qualifying and we'll have a uh, three-hour race. Correct. So, so how we'll much fuel, sorry guys, how much fuel has the Alpine three. got on board? Alpine, because they might Alpine. get caught into a similar scenario. Uh, the Alpine are, uh, are not even halfway through a stint. Well, the field should be more spread out by the no time they do that. No wonder their... they're looking happy billies. And uh, the 708, the Glickenhaus, by the way, is three laps into a stint. Here we go again. Oh, so shot. they can go. go Watch in that Porsche. Does he move left? He goes over the bump like normal. And at some point, you know, if you're the car going around the outside of that kink of turn eight before this turn is nine. Yeah. There. So yeah, I think he's made a mistake in turn seven. Yes. But now he goes around the outside. And it, there's a lot of track on the outside, Vegito. But he's not using. Yeah. He had room on the left hand side. I'm, unfortunately, I'm going to pass more blame. I, th I him. think you're right. And is this fractionally because they're not deploying hybrid that his that every fiber of him says is going to carry him past the Porsche because where the deployment comes in has changed that suddenly he hasn't got that extra 120 kilometers an hour plus shove to clear the Porsche yeah I mean of course you're getting used to new machinery you know they, they all are the LMP2s have changed uh, you know the hypercars have all had tweaks this this new 100% synthetic fuel that they're running now changes the behavior of the engine slightly but yeah i mean it's just, i don't yeah. want to make excuses for him it's it's a racing incident but i think he misjudged vicious impact from the onboard camera as jose maria lopez for toyota barreling into the tire wall that's why we're under the red flag Louise Beckett is going to be the busiest among us. Let's see if she can catch up with Mathieu Vazivier from Alpine. Mathieu Vazivier, uh, you're looking on at that incident. Um, what does that mean for you guys? What are, the t what are the team thinking about now or saying? I mean, in strategy-wise, it's not that bad because at the end, they didn't stop, so they will need to stop after the, uh, when it will be green. Um, so strategy-wise, we are not losing that much. Maybe 10 to 15 seconds is uh, the change tire. Uh, is the yeah? There are a lot to change tire in red flag. We don't know yet, but um, but if not, yeah, it's great that uh, we see uh, Jose coming out of the car. It's not a, a crash that we like to see, and it's also not like this that uh, we want to race against the Toyota. But uh, but for us, to be honest, it's looking good. So yeah, we keep uh, continue like this and keep pushing. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, sometimes in... Oh, and if we go back to... We will now uh, go back and two hours to, to the uh, difference between McNish A and Davidson A and, and where luck... You were talking about it in traffic. Alan always says luck doesn't exist. You make your own. Sometimes, no matter how good you are, luck denies you. Look at Toyota at Le Mans, last lap, and all of that. And look at WRT last lap last year. I mean, you know, the, 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 those are getting longer and longer, and more and more frequent, bizarrely. But sometimes, Lady Luck smiles on you. Alpine could not have engineered that, could not have found a way of giving themselves a break to get, to, to, to defuse Toyota's potential fuel advantage time bomb and somehow it has happened and it, okay in in a way that nobody wants or plans for or hopes for even but it has happened and if if it falls into your lap you have 
got to take it. Look, it's not a running race at the end of the day. Uh, you, you don't need luck to win a running race. When you've got technical equipment and things that happen outside of your control, like in motor racing, a bit of good luck doesn't go amiss. And that's yeah. certainly what Alpine have fallen into right now. They had the fastest car, but they needed that extra luck when they it came to the strategy today. Something. Season 10 of the FIA World Endurance Championship opening at Super Sebring. Once again, the World Endurance Championship and IMSA, the WeatherTech Sports Car Series, coming together on the same race weekend. A decade ago, it was on the same grid, but as in 2019, WEC racing alone here. Grand Marshal Jackie Hicks flagging the cars away from the grid. Oh, glory, starting what is anticipated to be an eight-hour race. And from pole position, the Alpine jumping away ahead of the hypercar field. LMP2, look at that. A great start from United Autosports, getting up into second place overall. The speed of the LMP2 cars very quickly evident. Glickenhaus third ahead of the better of the two Toyotas in fourth position. In the GT class, there would be penalties heading the way of the factory Porsches for not being close enough to the LMP field at the beginning of the race. But their interest was in keeping Ferrari and newcomers Corvette behind. Fourth at the start in the GT field overall was the TTE Am pole sitter Ben Keating. But Aston Martin rival Paul Dallalana within the first hour took the battle to him and took the lead away. Dickenhouse continuing in the hypercar class. Porsche with their 15 second pit penalty playing out to help Corvette stay in front of GTE Pro. And problems for Inter Europol with electronics. The car stopping several times out on track. And they work their way through from the tail of the field. Jota, after a middling qualifying, finding a more consistent race pace, working their way up the LMP2 field. And so too Sebastian Prio in GTE Am, the reigning North American Porsche Carrera Cup champion, using his Porsche experience to move up into second place for Dempsey Proton in GTE Am. But great pace from newcomers, Prema, putting them in the LMP2 lead and with uh, a little over three hours into the, four hours into the race, the red flags fly. Contact between race leader Jose Maria Lopez in the number seven Toyota and uh, the 88 Proton Porsche putting the Toyota into the barriers and then subsequently at much higher speed putting the car out of the race with a huge impact. The driver, Jose Maria Lopez, is A-OK, -okay, but the Toyota is out and we're under red flag at Sebring. Well, wherever you are around the globe, whether you're watching here at the circuit on the WEC app, whether you are watching in North America, in Europe or wherever, feel free to uh, send us your questions and your comments. Martin Haven, Graham Goodwin and Ant Davidson. Down in the pit lane, the hardest working woman in showbiz, well, today at least, Louise Beckett has caught up with one of our newcomers. He is currently leading, or his team are leading in LMP2. Let's welcome to the WEC, Lorenzo Colombo. Lorenzo Colombo uh, from the new team Prema, you were just about to actually get in the car. I saw you with helmet on ready to go and then obviously this incident's happened. But um, so far for you, how's this new race for you? Yeah, joining endurance racing is very different from Formula categories. And uh, yeah, you need to stay long in the car, driving it in whatever condition you find. Inside the car was very hot today, never experienced as much hot uh, as today. So yeah, new experience and everything, but I think I managed quite well overall. Did a good couple of stints uh, managing the tires and fuel. It's all new stuff that I, I need to learn and improve for the future. But yeah, I think we're looking pretty confident now. And until the red flag, we were P1. Now we're still P1, but everyone, the clubs now are closed. So yeah, we need to rethink better what to do in strategy wise. But yeah, as you said, I was ready to jump in, but then the red flag happened. And uh, hopefully that all the drivers are okay because it was a big incident to see. But yeah, and uh, hopefully we can restart soon and uh, I will go back again. So, uh, Louis was doing a great job as well, as you say, you're in P1, uh, had he double stinted? Yeah, I did, uh, strategy for me was to do double stint, 
Uh, also with silver time we need to look how much I've left but uh, you know in general I felt very confident in the car every lap I get more experience and everything so I think I get more confidence with the car every lap I do and uh, yeah we just need to keep going like this way not making mistakes traffic is very hard also it's a new challenge for me and I need to be focused all the time and uh, have a good uh, radio relationship with the team and be focused every time they ask me something. So I would assume when the car, when we do get started again, Louis is probably going to have to come in quite quickly to change tyres. Uh, we are thinking about it, but uh, yeah, so far uh, I need to discuss with the engineer again. But yeah, our strategy is uh, that I will go soon and uh, finish my driving time with Silver. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are getting a number of questions uh, popping into the booth, it's, uh, one of which is about uh, the start procedure after a red flag. It will be line of stern. Pits are closed until race goes green, as I re recall. Uh, at the moment, we've got a 10 minute board expected to be presented in about four minutes' time. So we're just under, if things go to plan with the barrier repair, just under 15 minutes from a restart here, which is remarkable work from the trackside workers at Sebring International Raceway. And we're looking here at the. What, what is that? that? That doesn't look like a steering wheel. It looks more like <laughs> well, uh, some kind of virtual racing device. It's what I was talking about before. You know, they can move the steering wheel for, for driver change, uh, but also to get it to the right position when the next driver gets in. The, the controls come to you uh, or away from you, depending on the, s the size of driver. Looking at that Corvette, though, and the fact we're in this red flag situation, it's different to that of the Alpine and Toyota that we were talking about before. They are on the same strategy, but they had that 15 second yep. of penalty that came Porsche's way. That gets eradicated in the red flag. So it's hurt them without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. Uh, we will wait to see what instruction comes the way of the grid in terms of any wave by that may take part, uh, take a play, play a part of this because we've not really had a good look at that uh, grid as it's lined up. The 88 car, by the way, did make its wide way back into pit lane. The 46 is uh, around in the paddock still. Um, and one question that's come in, it's come in for a couple of people, is whether or not, in a funny sort of way, this might help the 88 car with a change in the driver time under red flag. We're going to go down before we have a quick chat about that down to uh, Team Penske with Louise, who's with Manu Collard. Manu Collard, it's great to see you back in WEC and incredible that you're in the Penske number five racing here in Sebring. Yeah, it was not expected. I was not expecting this, uh, this thing, but uh, it happened. And I'm really pleased with that. But uh, it's true that it's not easy for me because it was a long time I didn't drive uh, P2. And um, but finally, uh, we test here one month ago and was not so bad. So it would be better and better, but any more uh, more time in the car. How demanding is this track in particular on your body? Yeah, a lot. It's uh, it's it's uh, the heat first. It's really hot in the car, and also the bumps. It's uh, it's demanding a lot physically. So you have to be prepared for for this race for sure. And obviously the um, team brought you in because of your fantastic experience so are you doing a lot of development feeding back to them how's it all working out no to be honest uh, I only did two days test so I was more uh, learning for me <laughs> than uh, but I, if I can bring yes some feedback uh, to the team I will do it but uh, at the moment it's uh, you know Felipe and Dane uh, got a huge experience also in prototypes so it's not a problem for them and I've got to say, I loved seeing you battling with Francois Perotto in the 83. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. But at the end, it was really nice with him. With me, after two laps, he, uh, he opened the door, so it was nice. I'm, I'll be intrigued to see what he says to you afterwards. Okay. <laughs> Try it. I want, I want to know. <laughs> I'll let you know. Thank you. Thank you. Bano Collard, as we say, the Peter Pan of endurance racing. For those that may be uh, latecomers to endurance racing, I know we've got a lot of new fans around the world in this new era. Why are we talking about Manu Collard so much? Manu, 23 consecutive appearances at the Le Mans 24 hours. Then missed his 24th, rather ironically, but he's been back since has now completed 24. In his career, even at Le Mans, factory driver for Porsche, factory driver for Toyota in the fabulous Toyota GT1, factory driver for Cadillac, so factory driver for Pescarello, here, right? factory driver for Chevrolet, and on and on and on.
can see the rescue vehicles moving away now from the tire barrier that Jose Maria Lopez uh, demolished, destroyed. Luckily, it looks like there were no barrier barrier repairs. 10 minute ball being shown by Cristiano Macedo at the front of the grid. Safety car driver is there as well. So Pedro Cachero will lead the field around. On the subject, we are under way, 10 minutes to resume the race behind the safety car. We are under 10 minutes to resume the race behind the safety car. Very quickly, there is the car. The good news is we saw Pachito Lopez out of the car and walking away. He has been taken to the infield care center because the G-force light was on. If you sustain heavy enough G in an accident, even if you get out and can dance the tango, they still take you to the medical center yep. because adrenaline does very strange things. I saw Mark Blundell climb out of an Indy car in Rio and walk along the banking until his two broken legs gave up on him. Adrenaline is a strange thing. You, you need to check the drivers and that's exactly what they've done. Well, oddly, the, the procedure you've just described in terms of that medical light had to be clarified after another incident that involved the same driver back mm. in the days with the LMB1 Not cars, a monster shunt at Silverstone. Yep. And he managed to drive the car back, but the light was on. And that required okay. the FIA to reaffirm what the procedure the was going to be. Some cows, stop, go, you wait. Okay. So because what we talk about here in the okay. uh, FIWC, okay. there is a G-meter in and each of these cars. Okay. Above Good a certain G-level of impact, that will again. light. Okay. So use a blue light in the, in the windscreen of the car. If that light is lit by any impact, without question, that driver is getting out of the car and is going to the medical centre. Yes, we saw that at Le Mans last year, actually. The car may not be driven. That was full Alex West. Stop. Yes, I, 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 as soon as you said that, I thought, yeah, that happened yep. at Le Mans, didn't it? And Alex completely unhurt, unfortunately, yep. because of the angle of attack with the car out of the race, driver out of the race, end of story. Drivers suiting up, helmeting up, and... So uh, the right, we can see from the back there with the inception overalls. Brian yeah. Hartley about to climb back aboard the remaining Toyota. Slightly so hesitantly, some of them handing back the umbrellas <laughs> and the shade. It's going to be very yeah. warm indeed out there. Yeah, and of course, you're, you know, you're now putting on your wet balaclava with your wet helmet in already wet overalls. And uh, there's Jackie X talking the talk. We are flirting with it, but always... Now they have, uh, no. they have at least this success. Jackie but the Torch way they are planning to go into uh, Ibaka Seri, I don't know if those are going to be. Possibly he's uh, there chatting about some in inside information about uh, other programs still to come. You were talking briefly there about Manu Kala. Yes. Actually, in, in all of his sort of uh, factory drives, Porsche yes. obviously with Penske is, I mean, that's a, a very evident link. Uh, Cadillac as well. Cadillac coming with H, uh, with uh, uh, an LMDH car, and he yep. was a factory Cadillac driver as well. So he's got an awful. I need you know, he he's kind of a bit like Gabriele Tarquini in touring cars. Never seems to have burned a bridge behind him ever. I mean, you know, lots of enemies are among the drivers, but among <laughs> the teams that he's driven for, they all still regard him very highly. Well, here's the moments that brought out the red flag. Eventually, not this incident, as Lopez made contact with the Porsche Julian Andlau trying to go around it. And again, the view here Andlau is tight on the inside in the right hander. The car will come out a little bit, but Lopez had a lot more road to use. That was three big impact, well, one small impact, one fairly substantial impact, and then we're going to see the, the huge impact. Yeah, here. this is him coming dropped. back to the pits, and uh, essentially, as he picks up the pace here... Smoke, smoke, smoke. Yeah, down towards the penultimate corner. And then no steering. Yeah, car not steering and not stopping either, and, and straight off. That was horrid. Uh, that was really horrid. Um, we are getting plenty of questions, and thank you for that uh, on Twitter. Uh, so I was saying just before we went to uh, a bit of a, a break, um, there are questions about whether, for instance, Fred Bordad, who just before that, oddly enough, in that 88 car that was involved in that same incident, um, whether or not he would have to complete the other 11 minutes with this rag flag. Yeah. The way that works is, at some point, we will get a revised drive time per car, per team, per driver, at table. So the answer at the moment is that is not a question I can answer 
at this second that will be determined by race control okay but he got out of the car because of the, the puncture yeah. 11 minutes before the end of his yeah. drive time yeah. that I, is uh, how much have we lost uh, well, I it's now four exactly Uber. and 20 <laughs> seconds yeah which uh, muscles don't want to work anymore 20 20 minutes 25 minutes maybe Drivers in their cars waiting on the grid in line astern. They have stopped where they arrived in the order in which they were circulating on the track as the number seven Toyota gets taken back to the team. We are at the point, uh, we'll be at the point in uh, a minute and 10 seconds where we've had 30 minutes. Okay. It came out so at three, th three hours, 30 minutes and 37 seconds was the okay. red flag. Okay. So. 30 minutes out of eight hours uh, is one sixteenth. So what's a sixteenth of two hours and 20 minutes? I've got too many bits of data whirling around my head. I need uh, to go hang on it, uh, 120 and 20 is 140, so it's less than 10 minutes. So he w if they do a pro rata reduction in the amount of time, he will need to do five more minutes maybe wave by is maybe underway so the wave ah, by okay. is underway so cars between the leader of the race and the safety car can rejoin so that is going to have an effect on a number of these battles we will assess that as we That's see it. the the real order um, on track of these cars emerging so the, so the, the, the race remember is the remaining Toyota the whole field moves by and the Alpine then moves right up onto the back bumper There's of the number there. 8 12. They're all moving. And so the, the Toyota will now pull up behind the Porsche. Yeah. Is it does indeed. Everybody else will now pull in. Now there's the point. Is you've got the Toyota there. Ah, okay, now Prema the and Louis Delatraz, they have made a mistake. Louis Delatraz should be part of the wave by because he was not second on the road. He was fifth on the road. No, no, the way this works is it's anybody between the overall race leader and the safety car. It's not... Uh, in that queue? In that queue. Well, he, well, he's just stopped and the Alpine hadn't got to the Toyota, so he was between the leader and second in the queue. So he should have been waved by. No, he should be ahead of the leader. He needs to be ahead of the leader in the queue. Only the people are ahead of the... You don't get a, a lap ah. back at this point, at the le very least. Uh, it is about where yeah. the safety car. Remember the okay. safety car. Between, uh, the, sorry, way between the leader Pixel, and the safety yes. car. Yes, not between Correct. the leader and the safety car. Okay. Okay. So the, the key thing there is, this has swung dramatically into the hands of Alpine. Alpine have got one car between themselves and the new race leader or the the, the, the brake car, but that number eight car is going to have to pit almost immediately. Uh, so and too Prema in yep. uh, LMP2 lead as well. So there are a number of cars slightly out of sync yep. with each other. So there could be quite a few dashes into the pits. But it's worse for the Toyota in two regards. One, because if the 36, as it looks like it will, can get quickly to the front of that field, it's going to have a completely clear track in front of it. But when the Toyota comes out, it's got the entire field between it and the 36. Interesting that the 88 car of Julian Andlauer, which carried on seemingly unperturbed by contact with Petito Lopez, is in the pit lane and now on the dollies being wheeled away. Um, yeah, so it clearly did some kind of damage to the yeah, car. Yeah, but, but you heard don't forget quite that clearly that he was like accelerating on as Lopez yeah. spun across his nose. But don't forget that was the car that just moments earlier had, had, had the puncture. puncture. Yeah. So maybe yeah. it's a, a result of that. Yeah instead a, a legacy of a puncture yeah that's there is a possible. further question they're not allowed to reposition that car in the train are they which 88 it's under red flag well, it's in the pit lane so and it's on 30 seconds it's on trolleys resume the race behind the safety and it's car. no longer in the pit lane it's gone behind the race behind the safety car we are going so 30 seconds to go before this gets back underway behind the safety car there is the 30 second board being shown by Director of competition here. <laughs> Cristiano legs it out of the way, wisely so. Never a good idea to be between a uh, racing driver and uh, the track. So I'm presuming they're going to get a whole lap behind the safety car. It's yeah. not just going to no. peel off after Race the is resumed behind the safety car. Corner. Race has been resumed okay. behind the safety car. We are racing again. 
but so the race has been resumed so we are still under safety car conditions but kind of irrelevant because the time is ticking anyway exactly. the whole red car red uh, so like let's get to louise beckett i've just spoken to julian andlauer and he said that they have pushed the car back and it's because they've got damage to the front right axle he said so they don't know at the moment he's just saying to me the front right and it would and it is from that front end. Okay, thank you very much, Louise. So that goes behind the wall. Not a phrase you often get to say as a European racing commentator, but he is behind the wall. So that joins the 46 Team Project One Porsche behind the wall. Spirit of Race uh, with their 71 car and Gabby Aubrey um, are the last running car then. So on board, not uh, the Totos, it looks like, uh, because there's only one of them and that's ahead. It is the WRT car, isn't it? That is the 41 car. No, the 31 car, my apologies. Yep. Then it's the 36. So Rene the real Rast. world battle for the overall lead is between the Tota, number eight, in the hands of Brendan Harvey, and Andre Nacral, who is three cars back in that train in the 36 Alpine, but the Toyota has to pit. And suddenly, where is the Glickenhaus? Well, the Glickenhaus is in the queue, but suddenly it's not a minute and a half behind. No. Um, it's not. Where is it in the queue? In that, unfortunately, I, I'm not sure our GPS is going to show us very much because they're all so close together. There's the number seven car back at the tent. So that will be packaged up and sent off. Always sad to see. Very sad to see. Yeah, very sad indeed. How one moment like that Absolutely. can completely ruin your race. Well, out of the race. Just for the sake of not giving extra margin on the left-hand side of the track, which from the onboard shot at least looked like it did. was available at that point. So pass around is going to be done exiting turn 16 so we're going to be under safety car for at least one more lap while pass around is executed well the click house is Five, probably about cars. 12 back uh, there's a bunch of lmp2 and uh, yeah. there you are there's a gt am car of thomas floor right in front of the click house so it is yeah it's a good dozen cars back in the queue so actually as soon as you said that question graham does the safety car pull off at the start finish line actually i suppose possibly it could have done um because the start finish line is not yeah. where they were stopped um, it's so it'll do it'll do a lap here well, this is uh, united discussing it exactly that it will do a lap and come back and now that peel will into away. which pit lane it peels i think it peels into the uh, the IMSA pit, Imsa lane, pit lane, because that's the start finish line. Sneaks through the back somehow. Correct. We've got two safety uh, cars, yeah. remember. Yeah. So into the site of the accident. And what a relief to see Jose Mira Lopez stepping away from that wreck so yeah. quickly. Well, in good news, also, I've eaten a sandwich. I mean, I left you two in the booth on your own for literally one, one minute. minute. Not to be trusted, clearly. And I come back, and all I can hear is Eduardo on the radio going, red flag, red flag. Really? It was never like this when I was in Okay, Ugh. gentlemen, we start preparing ourselves to the pass around, exiting 616. We prepare the pass around, cars illegible, move to the right. Aha. Okay. okay, exiting T16, cars which are illegible will bear right to start the pass around. Start the pass around. So that is turn 16. So this is anybody not on the lead lap goes way by. So through goes 31, 52, 777, 38, the five Penske car. 54. So uh, these all the cars. The class leaders stay in behind. Don't all they? the cars between the Glickenhaus and the Toyota oh, and oh. the Alpine. Are, I mean, not all of them, but a big bunch of them so are now being waved around. If I remember correctly, that, uh, that's what I'm looking at now, which is it is the class leader, the class leader uh, for each of these classes. If you are not on that lead lap, then you, you pass get around. Not on the leader, and this is why teams start with their silver Correct. or bronze drivers in in the yeah. gt am yeah. or p2 classes for this very moment where now you've got the rest of the race running with your pro drivers and they get their lap back
mean, it is a stroke of luck, but you get that lap back. That's why they put those uh, amateur what, drivers in earlier stuff? on. Some, what's this stuff? What's this We, we are forecast a little bit, Rain, aren't we, towards the end of the race? It because wouldn't be the first time. Not again. It may not be yeah. Yeah. Because there's not enough drama. <laughs> <laughs> but right, I'm not going to leave is, you. This is an absolute ice rink when it <laughs> rains here. It's, it's unbelievable I how should, slippery it is. I should say that Ant Davidson, when I said Rain, just started gripping both <laughs> arms of the chair. It's like some kind of trauma. <laughs> Came out of a cold sweat. <laughs> Yeah, but it's the concrete surface with the rubber that goes down onto it. Yep. It's like glass. Well, well, just we're just 10 minutes into the second half of this race, and it's a whole new deal. This is why you need to keep Sebastian Ogier dry for the last hour. Because <laughs> if, it, if it's lock stops to lock stops, Back that's getting an idea. Yeah. Back it in. Back it in, absolutely. Use the grass, use the curves, whatever you can find oh, for grit. All right, so <laughs> let's just reset. We will be underway at the end of this lap, I think, because the wave around has been completed. And Eduardo Freitas will be hurrying, eagerly hurrying cars will, up to hear get it. to the back of the and queue. And also, those cars that are coming to the back of the queue, their tyres are lovely and warm by the time yeah. they do. So it's <laughs> quite a big advantage, not just if you claim that lap back, you've also got tyres that are much more in the window. It's always the small details, isn't it, that make it really... It's it a really, massive it's, detail. It, it, but you know, it's, it's the yeah, things it all adds you, up. you don't think about in those situations. Here you have, though, the top four cars are the first four cars in the queue. Three of them are the remaining hypercars. Then you've yeah. got third and fifth is the battle for GTE Pro behind the Glickenhaus and the second place GTE Pro Porsche. Then we get into the first of the GTM cars. Then we've got, uh, nose to tail, the Prima uh, Orica and the first of the two United Autosports cars, the number yep. 23 car. Yep. We get into who needs to pit and where and when. All right, well, let's just run down our orders. We're on board with a 64 Corvette that leads in GTE Pro ahead of the two Porsches, one Ferrari, the other Ferrari, the 52 car, and I don't know quite how this happened, the Antonio Fuoco driven car, although it's fifth in GTE Pro, is a dozen cars back. It had a drama there somewhere. Race is being led, and so is Hypercar, by the number eight Toyota from the Alpine and the Glickenhaus. Prema lead in LMP2 from the two United Auto Sports car, 23 ahead of 22, with Real Team WRT and the better Jota car rounding out the top half dozen in GTE Am, Northwest AMR, the blue-nosed, yellow-tailed uh, Aston Martin 98, a Paul Dallalana ahead of the turquoise car of uh, TF Sports, Ben Keating, and Dempsey Proton's Christian Reed in third place. And just so, look how close the Porsche yeah. 92 is now to the Corvette. As we well, it's about effectively before. right behind because the Glickenhaus is going to get by the, the Corvette Straight away. down the start finish line yeah. into turn one with a bit of luck. So. Uh, yeah, so battle on suddenly, Porsche's game has been turned on its head as well. Now, question is, who has used more of their tyres to this stage? If they are even Stevens, then still, you think, is a very slight up oh, There's Pachito. said he missed yeah. the speed, it was too quick, but that was yeah. the second and the third, yeah. the third impact. Well, that's when the nose was basically lifting the wheels off the ground and also blocking them from turning. So not only could he not turn, he couldn't break either. You heard him bang it down a couple of gears. We go green this time. Right. No, we don't. Yellow flag still been waved. Uh, that's because we haven't caught up with the tail of the field yet from our wave around. So I now have to go back to... He will want to the gaps here as well. Well, I wonder what the, the fuel state is on Toyota number eight. Very close. It's got to be, isn't it? He running around at this speed. Laps. Obviously helps running around at this speed, but yeah. It, it was 30 laps, sorry, before we went back to uh, 31 laps now, including the two laps under safety car. It's vapor. Yeah. Now he would be allowed to take emergency service, I believe. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, again, so I'm not clear on the rules on that in WEC because since I've been here, we haven't had that well, situation. But this certainly way, they, they in 24-hour series, in VLN, in IMSA, They're not going to run the car up fuel on the track. No. Well, we are ready to restart at the end of this lap. So let's catch up with Louise Beckett. She is with Jose Maria Lopez at Toyota. Jose Maria Lopez, great to see you back here. How are you? 
Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, went to the medical center. They run all the tests, see if there was nothing inside. Sometimes, you know, adrenaline makes you jump out of the car. But yeah, every, everyone did a good job. So a great job. Thank you very much to the medics and everyone who checked me. Uh, yeah, thank you to Toyota for the safety. You know, it was a, a big one. But I managed to jump out of the car, uh, no problem. And yeah, I mean, just sorry for the team, honestly. Uh, uh, it's completely on me. I just missed just the speed at that point. I was trying to come back to the pits as quick as I can. And just, I think with the speed and the damage I had, the front nose went down. And uh, when I wanted to turn, I had no steering wheel and brakes. I just, and I just went off. Thank you very much. We can hear the cars going by, and it's brilliant to see you here. A real shame to see him out of his race suit, the number eight Toyota into the pit lane, Graham, but we should be going green this time round. Safety car remains it's out, but it's not about not... the lead, Martin. The clicker knows it's a lap down. OK. Well, the leader is in the pit lane. And let's go green, green, green. We are racing again here in Sebring. Louise Beckett, you've got more. Uh, I spoke to Glickenhaus, they said that they're not planning to come straight in when I last spoke to them a few moments ago. No, because they were only a half a dozen laps into their stint. The Toyota was right at the end of its stint on fumes, so had to pit behind the safety car before we went green. And that was not a strategy call, that was a not running out of fuel at the end of the race call. Battle is on between the Corvette and the Porsche 92 for the lead in GTE Pro. The Porsche under uh, the LMP2 car trying to come around, and that's the battle for the LMP2 lead as well. The Prema car, red, white, and green. United gets stuck, elbowing his way back in there in the United car is Paul de Resta. Didn't quite get a chance to get on terms with Louis Delatraz. Now he breaks free of the GT Pro cars, but the Porsche lost ground there. And so Tommy Milner in the Corvette just inches ahead of Kevin Est. And he has now got the Porsche right on his bumper again. Graham Goodwin, exactly what we expected from the start. Yes, but we did see Paul rest of delayed there through the GT traffic, but he's caught the car very quickly. Trouble for the 71, pulling off. Now, it, it, that wasn't pulling off in the pit entry, no, was it? No, that's Aubrey, and it's uh, turn 6-7. I just looked at died underneath him. Here comes the second of the United cars. That's given just a sniff of a, a, a chance to the number 92 Porsche. Yeah, Will Owen being a little bit too tentative in trying to navigate his way past the GTs there. You can tell the frustration in the, the both GT drivers, but this is the chance for Kevin S. Looks like he's got the straight line speed. They're side drafting off oh. each other, and it looks like the Porsche is going to have the upper hand surely on the way into this final corner. But the Corvette sticks it around the outside. This great respect from these two drivers, but yeah, Kevin S gets the job done. And Kevin Escher held it nice and tight in the middle of the corner there. He could have taken the, the, the Corvette way out wide, but did not. He allows the LMP2 car to go through past him. That's the Algar Pro car of James Allen on the inside coming through now. Through he goes. And so, yeah, Kevin Esch with the lead of the race. It was, in fact, the AF Corsa car of Alessio Rivera that was first past this pair. And that's the LMP2 lead battle. Paul de Resta, I've got you where I want you. You'll I see him defend to the inside. By. Yellow chase surely goes to the inside. De Resta, there's yellow flags here. We yep. probably come Ferrari. So, yeah, there's no way De Resta had seen the yellow flags. There's no way he was going to mount a challenge down the inside into there under those double yellows. But it looks like he's got the pace in the car. The eight can be twice. No, it's still in. Driver no, change. It came out. It came it? out. OK, so. Uh, driver change there, Sebastian Buemi shuts the door. Maybe they just came in for a tiny little rest. I, I don't know Hira what the Kawa. minimum is. It's Rio Hill. Oh, it is Rio Hill. Yeah. So it is, yes. Um, don't so two Red Bull drivers. Exactly yeah, exactly. Right. exactly. It, was, it was emergency service. It so had to be because it was still under the safety Three litres or something? Yeah. Here, five so, litres? So that's a further yeah. disaster, I'm afraid, for Toyota here. Wow. That's two stops for them. They came under the safety car to take emergency service in the minimum amount of fuel, and then they had to stop. So not only did Jose Maria Lopez cost himself and his immediate car crew the race, he effectively cost the other car crew. If nothing else happens in this race, He's cost big time. 
the other yeah. the whole yeah, team so yeah. yes absolutely what we've got here then in the lmp2 you can see the cars line astern still waiting to see what's uh, happened here with the number 71 car no sign that that's re rejoining with gabby aubrey it just seems to be dead stick doesn't it yeah, it absolutely. is bramer from united 23 united 24 and the 41. how many laps did it have in the race gabby aubrey's car gabby. Well, oh he's going again now okay so it may just have been an electronic glitch he's rather than running on fumes he's midway through a stint he's okay, 17 so laps into a 27 so it's electronics yeah. i mean your point about uh, about the toyota accident is absolutely valid but and they were two, investigation as but well they were two car cars on one strategy they had that's that's what they had what they had is what they had and so if it wasn't going to work because of the hold up for the number seven car it wasn't going to work for number eight either this delay has basically torpedoed their only strategy below the waterline it may not be over things happen in traffic it's going to get late it's going to get dark yeah. it's going to possibly get wet no, it's not over yet yeah. definitely not over yet i'm surprised the action came that early in this race yeah. today uh, but it, it's certainly with uh, three and a half three and a half hours still remaining there's a long way to go Tommy Milder under pressure for second now from the other Porsche this is the is. first time the 91 car has had even a sniff of being up at the top and trouble for Glickenhaus reported this year to overtake you before the line at the restart of the safety car procedure so it's yeah we not saw them getting backed up didn't we before the we final did. corner some were going some didn't know whether to go or not and I think the Glickenhaus got confused. Is, I think there was maybe a minor touch here between yeah. the Corvette and the number one number car. One thirty-one was it? Thirty-one, yeah, maybe. Yeah, the yeah. Just there. Yeah, yeah I think left rear to right front. Let's have a look. It's always tricky, you know. When you go, when you try and follow, as we're on board now, if you try and follow the other car through. That's a risky game to play. We didn't stay well, on Rene Rast yet. didn't go out wide. He stayed in as tight to his yeah, left absolutely. as he could. You know, he knew there was a tiny gap, but. There may just have been a little rub. In comes here, of course, a car. Don't forget Francois Perodo. There he is running around to jump into the car, take over from Alessio Rivera. That team were the GTE Am champions last year, their third such title, and back in LMP2. Here is the Prema car, still at the head of the LMP2 field, and it looked a lap ago like Paul DeResta was going by. He did not go by, and Delatraz has found a little bit of something. Trouble at turn 15, yellow flags are out there too. That was on schedule, by the way, for the 83 car. Their day's not going well at this point. We've still got time to burn for Francois Perodo. Remember, bronze drivers in LMP2 need to uh, need to be aboard for uh, two hours of these. Well, that hours. was him running round to get in. There's yeah. No, no uh, disguising his height in that driver team. So the question is, how long does he have to go? 71 stopping again there it is. on pit entry. Yeah. There it is. Trying to creep in. Not quite making it. No, no, it's not looking great, is it, for the number 71 car, Gabby Aubrey? They have had the best race no. so far, have they? They've had a pretty torrid time of it. So this is the car shared with Pierre Rag on front. There's a two. There's a two, sorry. Yep. But, uh, the 71 car will be dropping even further down the order. 88 back out on track, by the way, the car that was the, uh, the fulcrum around which Jose Maria Lopez spun with Pat Lindsay at the wheel, yep. the American driver. So that car has had damage repaired and uh, I guess uh, left front axle or right front axle, the stub axle broken somewhere in the incident. But I would assume left because that was where the contact was, but uh, Louise was told right, however. So it might have been uh, a little other incident. There's the 33 car just emerging, I think, from pit lane, which yeah. oddly wasn't shown on pit lane. No, it wasn't shown on pit lane, and, and uh, I'm not so sure why not either. In fact, it's yeah, Florian Latour. No, not shown as. It was definitely a 33 car. Okay. There it is. There it is. I was momentarily riding on board with Paul Deresta, trying to hunt down Louis Delachaz in front. Back on board again, exit of turn one. Bring the car to the right hand side over the bumps before turn three. Feed it in. Don't hit the curb on the right hand side of turn four. And once again, gently does it around five early on the power, as early as you dare, and use a bit of that curb on the right hand side as well, but not too much. And around the uh, long turn six corner under the braking zone now for turn seven. You see the graphic on the right hand side of your screen just. There in red, his breaking point. Now watching the battle between Kevin Est and the uh, number 64 Corvette. As you know, it's the 91 Porsche who's now caught up to the back of the Corvette. So Porsche 
showing a bit more speed at this yeah. part in the race. As uh, Nick Tandy was saying earlier on, wasn't he? Look, when we're on fresher tyres, the Porsche seems to have the yeah. advantage, but then we're better on our tyres. And don't forget they, that they were yeah, they're out alternating. Of so I think the Corvette is now probably on older tyres than either of the two Porsches. And of course, they had got a, a track position advantage that they lost. Um, they lost all of that hard-earned capital. And now the Porsche has been artificially closed in by the safety car and by the red flag. And it's got fresher tyres. Both Porsches have fresher tyres than the Corvette. So they will gain back what they lost in that 15 seconds and then some. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're back in the hunt. But again, faster cars. Faster cars so often break up the GT battles. Into the pit lane comes the Prima right car. And Luis Beckett says the 71 Ferrari, the spirit of race car, did run low on fuel. Now, whether that's electronics not pumping the fuel in, or whether somehow it has not fully fueled, remains to be seen. In come Ultimate and Jota. And uh, from the red mirrors, Graham, which of the two Jota cars is that? Come on, you know these things. I completely forgot which it's way around It's 28, <laughs> Oliver Rasmus. So I'm looking at the timing screen, which is my way of identifying which is which. Yeah, just a note to Jota. See that white bit at the front on yeah. the car? Change of one of the cars, please, yeah. to a different yeah, colour. It, it, it really helped us out. It was feeble in, in for identifying the cars last year, but at least there was somewhere doing it. Doing it on mirrors is, yeah. is yeah, yeah. beyond ridiculous. I'll go on a word. Well, you can have a word as much as you like. Sam Hignett does what Sam Hignett wants, I think, eventually. But uh, it would be nice for the fans and also for the drivers. Why for the drivers? Why does it matter? Because then I don't call the wrong driver an idiot for doing something silly. Which is why Ant's never got I, blamed for anything. It's always just someone I, I, else. I did get a, uh, a black and white flag once in Spa for, for no reason. Yeah. Uh, it was because it was for the other car. the car, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what have I done now? <laughs> I mean, if, uh, you know, of all things, the drivers <laughs> don't want to be misidentified as their teammate for doing something that they didn't well, want to have done. Particularly when they've done something wrong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Rene Rast ahead at the moment of the other Jota car of Antonio Felix da Costa. This is now the battle for fourth place in LMP2. I mean, it as was before, but again, so many of those gaps closed up by the red flag and by the ability then for race director Eduardo Freitas to slightly reset the field and get some of the um, detritus out of the way of the lead battles. Uh, what is also, I'm uh, talking detritus, what has also happened in the red flag is that um, the shopping list of bits of debris that needed picking up, they've all been picked up and swept away, so the track should be pretty clean. Riding on board there for a moment in the middle of our GTE Pro battle, the yellow Corvette ahead of the white Porsche, both United Auto Sports cars and WRT and Jota are on the pits, in the pits. But, uh, no, not WRT, WRT go by. So Rene Rast is the race two, leader. Where do these two come out now in relation to the Prema car that had stopped the lap before? Yeah, that's, that's what I want to see. Where is that Prema car? No tires. It's a long shot here as they come out of pit lane. Well, There's the real team car, still stationary. There's the Jota car, the 38 car still being fueled. Yeah, came in behind. Here's the 31 car. Yeah, so where is WRT's Rene Rast still leading. We need one more timing screen so that we can follow the tracker, don't we? That will make life a lot easier. Well, the answer is number nine has moved ahead or stays ahead of 22. So that is the Prema car. So that's effectively the lead of the race in LMP2 yes. still, uh, without a change of drivers for both teams. So there we are, that's the number nine car going across start finish line as 23 comes through turn one. So, Paul De Resta with the 31 car, I think, owing as a stop. I'll double double check that. I don't think they could not because up until the red flag, in, I mean, LMP2, same tyres, same chassis, same engine, same fueling, same air restrictors, no BOP difference yeah. between the cars. You can't find half a lap, never mind no, half no, it's, a it's, stint. It's the purest category on the grid. Any, yeah. any time now. Any time now will be this lap for the 31 car. Still that yellow flag out at turn 15 for the 71. Yeah, it's taking a long while to, re to recover itself back to the pit lane. It's, in which case, it almost certainly is completely out of fuel. 
Yeah, well, there it is at the top yeah. of the screen. That's clearly yeah, nowhere. What are they going to do with that car? Well, he so clearly doesn't the own race. a classic car because, as any fool know, you then crank it on the starter motor to get it in. I, I don't care what you burn out, just get it to the pit entry lane and then hopefully they can fix it for you. But sitting there going, guys, it won't start. No, I know, it won't start. Stick it in gear. I don't know if you can stick it gear on the paddle shift. I don't know if the gearbox is too clever for that. In the old days, you'd stick it in oh. first and crank it on the starter until either the battery died or the starter did. In theory, you should be allowed to do it. I, d I don't know whether the, the GCU will allow you to select a gear if the engine's not running. Is there enough in, hydraulic in the, uh, pressure? In the LMP2 car, it would have you would have been able to do it if you were in first gear. You could crank it along. I don't know how it would work in the GT, yeah. so... Good question. Three hours, 29 minutes in uh, remaining in this race. As we head towards the... Well, past the midpoint of the 1,000 miles, the eight-hour race here at Sebring. Season opener, season 10 of the FIA World Endurance Championship. And not only is this a historic racetrack, but in terms of the World Endurance Championship, it has its absolute grounding here because this was the first race track in which the World Endurance Championship raced back a decade ago in 2012. Let's catch up with Julian Andlauer at Dempsey Proton Porsche. Julian, you and I spoke uh, when the car was being repaired, but uh, talk us through that incident from your point of view. Well, on our side, uh, I mean, the Toyota overtook me at turn seven. He missed up a little bit the, the braking, so I took my line on the inside and I stay all the way on the inside. And I think when he overtook me, he, he maybe he thought that he over, already overtook me, so then he came back on the right side. He put he put up on the right side and uh, and hit me. So I mean, it's very sad. It's very bad for for both of us. Uh, I mean, the guys on our side repaired the car very quickly, and we're already back on track. So now we just need to finish the race and pick up some good data for the rest of the season. But yeah, I mean, I would say yeah, it was was very bad. What damage did it do? Because they've managed to fix it fairly fast and get you back out. I'm not too sure. I didn't really want to ask the, the mechanics yet, but uh, on our side was uh, something like from the front left axle that I couldn't see on the right side, but only on the left side. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rigs to be clear, uh, as we saw it, it was an initial mistake by Jose Mira Lopez. And 30 then seconds to full course yellow. This will be for the, uh, the recovery of the second Under 30 one. seconds yeah. to full course yellow. And then the second uh, issue, which was the contact. 20 seconds to full course yellow. Followed by the bigger contact with the barrier and then the final oh. contact. Oh, would you Abort full course yellow. Second Abort time. full course yellow. <laughs> I've, I've Story of today, isn't it? I, I've never, in, I don't know how many years I've been doing races where Eduardo's been race director. Abort, Abort cars full course WBC. yellow. Uh, twice in one race, I don't think I've ever heard him have to do that before. Gabby Aubrey somehow gets the damn thing to move. That looks like do it. not block the pit entry lane. Come on, car. Come on, car. A anybody who's a classic car, no car owner is now feeling exactly the, the same vibes. Oh, there. Good job. No, well done. Got through. Come on. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Slow Come on, baby. Come on, baby. 60-kilometer marker. I assume the mechanics are going there to push the car. Yeah. Once yeah. he's over the Once line, that line you can exactly. Get, yeah. That's it. He's Safe. now in the pit lane to get rescue. But I, uh, good lord, you know, ten minutes at least there, maybe nearly fifteen. Uh, but well done. Who was in the vector car? Well done. Found a way through without actually yeah, having to twang the uh, board there. Yeah, there you go. There we go then. Yeah. Experienced pair of hands. Mike Rockefeller. Ogier takes on board a lot of fluids. Yeah. It must be strange yeah, for him, yeah, having to persuade, having to persuade the uh, the pit official. No, you've got to let us through. No, 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 no. You can't. Go. You've got to let us through. We've got to push the car. The car has made it. We'll be we back. Get to the car now. We'll be back in 20 minutes, bathed in sweat. They will normally be protected by a yellow flag behind here, wouldn't they? Yeah, they need. Uh, well, you can see, you know, there's no flag tower nearby. There will be vigorously waved yellows by pit entry, but. I don't, I actually, I don't know if there will be. I think everybody's going to have to be aware. And teams will know, you know, if your guy is coming in, you'll be telling him there is a car. There are people. 
Uh, just to recap, by the way, after all this drama, my, 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 there's been a lot in the last 30 minutes. We've got just under three and a half hours left at Hunter Level. It's an eight-hour race. On the ground leads the race in the number 36 Alpine from the Glickenhaus, which is a lap down uh, on the Alpine with the Tota, the surviving Tota, after the dramas that befell the number seven, uh, 8.3 seconds back and not make an impact on that. Now, remember that double stop for Toyota just had a little clarification on the rule. Uh, under emergency service, if you have to come in when the pit lane is closed, you can have a five second fuel fill. Which obviously won't see you through a whole stint, so no, that's why we saw the two it's But it'll do again. maybe a couple of laps. Yeah. So as soon as it went green, they had to come in again. Of course, had the wave around taken longer, or had they had to come in, a lap earlier they might have had to have come in for a second emergency stop before but in the end they didn't so that's the deal it's a five second fill so the next time that happens will be in 20 years time i'll try and remember what that is uh, in gt pro meanwhile this is the fight for second place it's tommy milner fending off the second of the portions after as we went back to green the uh, 92 car kevin Estra managed to pass uh, milner on the inside of turn 17 move has dropped back now six seconds 6.5 seconds under pressure well, from the number 91 car behind in the hands of jimmy bruni i think there and that tommy milner we we think on much older tires a stint older tires in the porsches extra just went he absolutely went full send lit the stamp here we go and now they're up to speed there's not enough difference for jimmy bruni to get around the corvette we saw how hard it was to get by Nick Tandy when he was on a stint on the tyres that the Porsches had, and, and it, it, it remains exactly the same. There's Richard Leeds watching his teammate trying to get around the Corvette. The Corvette, even on older tyres, is losing nothing against these well, Porsches. Remember, it, it should have been, look, he's having a look down the inside, he's bruni into the hairpin, no, can't quite make it stick there, but... It, what should have been for the Corvette is just slowly losing time through the stint where it had about a, a 13, 14 second uh, margin yeah. over the Porsche 92 because of the penalty from the Porsche. So they they did, they did were on different strategies because of what happened with the penalty to with the Porsche. So now that red flag eradicated that time deficit that the Porsche were carrying, they've got the advantage in many ways because they, they started this stint after the red flag with better tyres. Yeah, two uh, points with the Glicken House, one of which is a question to which I don't know the answer. I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, they are getting a drive-through penalty for overtaking before the line at the start of the, uh, the restart of the safety car procedures. That will hand second place this race to the Toyota. The question I've got, and I don't know the answer to it, is why did the Glicken House, it was a lap down, why did that car not wave by? Was it a lap down? Yes. It had pitted four laps before okay. he went to red flag. Oh, that's a good question. So uh, did, he should have got his lap back. Did they make a mistake? Am I missing something in the rule book? I will check it out for you, but it's, a, it's an odd one. Um, well, it wasn't between the leader and the safety car, so it didn't get that immediate nope. push. But, okay. No, that's a good question. Well, ah, oh, now, interesting. So, Tommy Milner and Jimmy Bruni on similarly aged tyres. So, does that mean then that Kevin Estrue was on older tyres? Oh, no, hang on. Left sides only. Uh, right sides only for Tommy Milner. Yeah, so he's, he's actually, laps on yeah. his left. So, he is on a worse set than Jimmy Bruni and, I think, than Kevin Estrue. So, they did left side. Ah, oh, now then. So, 30 minutes less racing. They've got half a set of tyres more than the Porsches potentially, uh, uh, that yeah. could come back yes. to help them in the last half hour. Milner is now, albeit we had those two laps behind the safety car, 31 laps to Milner, he's due in any time now. Yep. Uh, 27 for Jimmy Bruni, a little later for him, and 26 for Kevin Estre, go a little bit longer. Yeah. Yeah, okay, it's so a tyre thing really, so yeah. Estre, I'd even go as far as say Estre has slightly better tyres than uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Bruni, Bruni. Yeah, and that's that probably yeah. that's yeah that's probably why Bruni's finding it a little bit hard to get past oh, right, here's no, the no, no. sorry 
So it, that's the moment he overtook the Corvette before the line. Oh, oh dear, oh dear. Inches, it? Got wasn't to know Brian where, Briscoe, yeah. Yeah. Got to know where the line is. Yeah, you go so through this in your pre-race briefings. And it's not like Brian doesn't know this track because he spent a lot of time racing in IMSA. It's, it's inexcusable. Uh, different yeah. regulations, of course, from IMSA and WEC. Yeah. But you've got to go through well, that. And, 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 you see, now that's the deal. When you go green in IMSA, you go green. You go you green. pass wherever you are. And so there is that. Yeah, there are all these little, little anomalies. Nuances. Yeah, absolutely. All these little anomalies. Yeah, you can be in corner 15. Green, green, green. Go. Probably what caught him out. Yeah. But he's got the experience for it not to really have called him out. And that's one of the biggest things the team should have stressed to him. Look, this is very different in WEC compared to where you've been used to driving, Ryan. Yeah. When you get the green flag, don't you don't overtake until the line. Yeah. Yeah. No matter who you're behind. And you, that has to be lodged in your brain. It's so hard when you're in the faster car as well not to utilize it. Easily caught out. Again, the question is, should they have had a wave by? Should they have not been in that position anyway? Should they be on the lead lap? And if that was an error, how do you write that wrong? You can't. You can't correct it. You can't now give them a lap. They're where they are. Anyway, here's our race leader in the Alpine. Uh, who's in the Alpine now? Oh, Andre de Grau, yeah. Uh, his first stint in the car. Head of the number eight Toyota, the remaining Toyota. United's 23 car, right there. So things go to plan for Alpine. Uh, that is 23, yeah, ahead yep. of the Prema car. So where did that happen? Where did the 23 car get the lead from the number nine Prema car? That's happened very recently. Uh, this is after their, after their pit stops, the yep. Prema car was still in front. Yeah, ahead of 23 and 22. When did 41 get ahead of 22? Who's in 22? Is that Will Owen? 22 at the moment. It is. In the hands yeah. of Will Owen. OK. But when did Paul the rest get by the Prema car? We didn't, and, and it, and it looks to be very recently. And it looks like the Prema car has the speed over De Resta right now. He's right up behind him. Yeah. So I'd go as far to say oh, that on. De Resta couldn't have done it just through uh, sheer pace. But it's not the Prema car, it was 10 seconds behind. Here's the 36 so car. Been off. Lead it Into the, the, yeah, 128 laps in the books. Well, we have that's, that's two 2013 car. World Rally champions in the field. Let's talk to the WRC champion, Sebastian Ogier. Sebastian Ogier, you finished your first stint in the WEC. How was that? Uh, not so easy. Uh, I have to say I struggled a bit. Um, didn't manage to find really the reason with the car. A lot of uh, issue with brakes and with balance. So, yeah, I had, didn't have a clean run I wanted uh, to have, but... That's the way it is, and uh, that's, I guess, some kind of learning. Well, you had everything thrown at you, everything going on in that stint as well. Yeah, uh, I'm, I, I'm glad uh, yours is, is fine because you had a big crash, so that's uh, most important in this case. Uh, but yeah, I had to actually at least practice a little bit of everything. So what are you going to take from this? What do you feel that you need to work on? Uh, I mean, obviously on my driving, but uh, try to understand a bit more, even more all the way um, the car is working, basically, because, um, like I say, I never really managed to find the reason on this, uh, on this stint. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Sebastian Ogier definitely has had a busy time, and my rallying reference in 2013, the WRC champion was Sebastian Ogier. WRC2 champion also in the field was Robert Kubica. So from the, the class of uh, 2013, the top two rally drivers on the planet were both or have both been racing here today. And in so the same class. Oh, oh, and speaking Double. of rallying, there's the Iron Dames car. Who's at the wheel? That is Sarah Bovey. Sarah Bovey. She's had a couple of excursions. She had one in uh, practice. She's had a... Uh, an, ex, uh, an excursion a little earlier, and that's uh, a bit of rally crossing going on there. Then car that car sixth at the moment in yeah. uh, GTM. I'm going to answer my own question, and uh, which was about why, as we've got the 22 car in from the what is it fourth place it was in yep. the pit two. And to get back in, it's uh, the reason the Glicken House was not given a pass by. Smoke drifting was a dust drifting somewhere. Someone's been on the. Uh, 
Yeah, somebody's been off wide out of the final corner. The rule states the following, Martin. If deemed appropriate, and it was, the race director will authorise, and he did, pass around for any car that has their category leader behind them in the order circulating behind the safety yeah. car. That was not the case for the Glickenhaus. They no. were unlucky. They were behind their leader. We were just talking about how did the number nine car get so close to the number 23, and finally, Ant's eyes being slightly younger and better than mine, picked out that it was not that. We were looking at the WRT car behind the 22 car. Okay. Uh, that battle has now evaporated as 22 is pitted, but here is 23 leading the race. Well, I know what my job is after this race, though. I'm going to trundle up and down the pit lane, telling all of these teams that run two cars that are exactly the same to make them look a bit different, at least from the front of the car. Welcome Have to you tried? World. Welcome uh, to I'm going to make it happen. <laughs> I'm going to make it happen. I'm gonna, you know, uh, and, that's, and that's when you, you walk past a garage and you see that the blue and yellow 80 or you see the bright pink livery on the Iron Dome. So you go, thank you, God. Thank you. Yes, thank yes you. indeed, there is. And, and do you know what? It's not just idiots like us, it's fans That's as well. Exactly if, right. you, if you can't, if I can't tell on the TV screen what the difference is between the cars and the camera is following, then how are the fans, as they blur past them, going to know? Especially if they've been at turn 10 on the beers since about 6 o'clock this morning. You know, it's, it, it is important. Yep. that your cars are distinguishable. But either Hello, way, we Formula do... One, we're looking at you. Yeah, we, we do apologise to you, Paul. You're driving the blinder of a race. You're <laughs> out in front by miles. You weren't under pressure in the slightest from uh, this car we're now looking at, the Prema car on the inside of car 98 in turn three. They're driving their own races. And yeah, car 98 is Nicky team behind the wheel. And still in the lead. 98 took the lead of GTE Am in the first hour from the pole sitters, 33, and remain in the lead. They've barely been headed apart from in pit stops, Graham. Yeah, indeed. There's the Silver 8 car. And coming in third. And we're going to be going down to the Glickenhaus pits with Louise Beckett. Talk about progress for the number 708. It's going to be good. with Jim Glickenhaus. Louise is in the SCG pit right now. Jim Glickenhaus, an unfortunate uh, penalty and infringement for you. Tell us, tell us what happened there with, with the team. Yeah, it seems that on the restart after the red flag, uh, Ryan saw the green and assumed he could go, but he wasn't allowed to pass until the start-finish line. So it was our mistake. It was unfortunate. But the car's running really well. Um, we have good pace, and uh, there's still a couple hours to go. But it, it looks like we might get our first podium, which would be pretty interesting, you know. And your first Sebring as well. Yeah, exactly. You know, the, the car is um, much different than Sebring. It's very bouncy. It's The bumps are very severe. It's not really much aero. So it's a whole learning curve. It's, um, the dynamic damping with the third element, but it's working well. Uh, we're actually running faster now than we had. So, you know, if the race went on for 24 hours, we'd feel pretty good. But we'll see. We'll do our best. You know, we never stop, and uh, our goal is to get the WEC as much data as they can for the BOP, uh, so we can be a little bit adjusted for SPA, and then Le Mans, which we look forward to. I think there are a lot of interesting data points that we get from seeing how we ran and how we ran and Great, thank you. Thank you so much. James Cook in the house there, the uh, team owner of Scuderia Cameron Lincoln House, and uh, spent a little bit of time yesterday with Jim in the competitors car park just across the way uh, from the wet pits where he's got the road going version of the the Baja boot car the off-road car that uh, it's an homage to Steve McQueen's car from back in the day and also the new road going SCG 004 which he has hopes dreams that that will be the next model comes to the FI World Endurance Championship is a GT3 car. That's uh, the uh, GT3 category coming in, well, two years' time. Let's hope he can get there with the numbers that are going to be required. And change. Is it? Yes, it is. Up to second place now in. Oh, sorry, that's a test sport. It's La Torre catching, sorry, Christian Reed. Christian's been plowing on 
in pursuit of his required two hours of driving time. We'll take a look at that shortly as to who still needs to do what in the two ground categories. For clarity here, an eight hour race, the drive times are slightly different. We've not had any adjustment table yet for uh, under red flag ratings. We'll call it as we say it against the rule book. They need two hours each uh, if you're a silver or a bronze in LMP2 and two hours, 20 minutes if you're in GTM. So silvers and bronzes will, will all need to do two hours and 20 minutes in these at GTM cars and the, the LMP2 car, two hours. Up the inside goes the Vector Sport car, that's number 10 car. Bit of a dodgy place to try and overtake. Yeah. Uh, he slotted in nicely between the two GTs before uh, turn 15. And that was nicely done, but um, yeah, very risky to go into that penultimate corner on the inside. That's uh, the overtake coming, the TF Sport car up the inside of Christian Reed. And uh, Latore goes through and needed to do that because right behind, there's the next car in the order. That's the fourth place car, also no closing. And who's aboard the 56 car now? That is Ollie Milroy, silver rank driver against the bronze. You see that again. Oh, that was, was contact. Yeah, contact there, quite substantial contact there. And that won't have helped Christian Reed's defence. That's what triggered the overtaking move as well. And again, loses another place. So, Ollie Milroy, in a rich vein of form at the moment, the Inception Racing crew, taking the title in GT, in their GT3 McLaren in the Asia Le Mans series. Had a fantastic run at Rolex 24 hours, again in the GT3 car. They're racing again here tomorrow in the 12 hours. Brendan Reeb and Ollie Milroy. And here making their debut. Oh, oh Christian Reed, a rare error. Well, was there just How the long tiniest long bit of contact well, from, from Perrault? Perrault and, yeah, and, yeah, I, yeah, I wondered just before turning in. Because that yellow will be cleared as yeah. the car gets going again. But I just, I'd like to see another shot of that because I'm pretty sure there's Perodo tried to get maximize the width of the corner. Uh, I think he might have just chopped him off slightly and caught him out on the braking. Full service for the Corvette at the last stop and Nick Tandy back in the car and actually down to fourth if behind the 51 car of course yeah. the ferrari will have recovered a lot of ground with that uh, safety car red flag period yeah for ferrari losing ground for three hours ceased to exist yes it? because the safety car they basically lost no ground at all and suddenly it come back into it um, so corvette has got better pace though and fresher tires even though it's fuller of fuel Three goes the 44 ARC Bratislava car. That's just set its fastest race lap uh, with Kuba Smikowski at the wheel. Nick Tandy all over the back of world champion James Collado for third in GT Pro. Driver change in the pit lane for the 91 GT Pro Porsche. Jimmy Bruni out, Richard Leeds in that car in second place in GT Pro. Porsche with a 1-2 advantage here. Kevin Estra leading in the 92 car. Should be in next time round. Martin David and Anthony Davidson watching the action. And Nick Tandy all over the back of James Collado here. Yeah, he tried to uh, follow the Jota through the prototype in towards turn seven, but he's all over the back of Collado's car now. As they come up towards turn 10, goes to the outside. Can he outbreak him? That's a tough one if he could go around the outside. I think he might do it there. Amazing overtake. Wait, by Nick Tandy. I know he had better tyres, but yeah. still, I did not expect that. You've got to have the cojones and the grip, have you? But outside, inside, it does work. And the precision. I, yeah. I mean, yeah. that was proper precise driving to go around the outside. On the marbles, really great drive. He's he's flying today. He's he loving every moment, and it's showing. Isn't he? Back in the World Championship, or racing as a World Championship. In fact, this will be his first ever WC campaign, Nick Tandy, I think because uh, in his GT career before, before winning Le Mans, that is, uh, he wasn't a regular in the World Endurance Championship. Coming up behind the yellow and blue Penske LMP2 car, followed by Algarve Pro, and here comes the race leader, the number, I uh, beg your pardon, second place car, number eight, Toyota, and here is the pass. I would say this is move of the race so far. Brilliant. I know, like I said, he's on better tyres, but to have that awareness that spatial awareness from both drivers there yeah. not to make contact utilize the fresher tires around the outside into turn 10 i know he was on the on the correct braking point on the racing line but usually the car on the inside into that one would have the upper hand
And you've got to give kudos to James Collado. It would have been very easy to open up the steering mid-corner and just run out towards the curb and leave, and leave Tandy on the grass and then the barriers. Could easily have done it. Well, but that's the risk you take from being yeah. the driver around the outside. You, you need the awareness uh, and compliance of the driver on the inside as well. So well done to both of them. Yeah. Great racing. Absolutely. And uh, good to see, you know, you can, you can go around the outside of, of cars wheel to wheel and, uh, and not have contact. I was trying to work out why it is the 91 car managed to get in and out with such a gap to Nick Tandy. It was a long pit stop for Corvette. One minute and 42 seconds oh. for Nick. Uh, so it might well have been a little bit wound up as he came out of there. We'll have a quick word and see what we can find out. Yeah, well, oh, we were told my. it was going to be full service. So it was yeah, fuel tyres and driver It's change. at least 10 seconds longer than it should have been. Yeah, OK. Well, there might have been something else going on. I think that sounds like a job for Louise Beckett. Here is our GTE Pro leader. Yeah. These hypermotion shots are just gorgeous. You see, especially the tire deflection, the way the suspension just absorbs all of this nonsense. You try doing that in a road car, and you'll get a thick ear from your missus for the for, for vibrations. And yet the racing cars just uh, don't just soak it up once or twice. They soak it up relentlessly for hour after hour. And you know, we always talk about tires as being, you know, black magic. And for me, suspension damper technology is one of the great unsung winners in in any form of motorsport two-wheeled four-wheeled on-road off-road dampers in competition cars are just breathtaking devices they really are um, you know you rely especially on a circuit like this for the ride of the car you'll hear most debriefs from most drivers here complaining or, or, or constructive criticism about the ride of the car and it's up to the engineers and drivers to work together to find a better balance. And, uh, you know, teams like Penske, for example, masters of the dampers in their own field. Yeah. And can they bring some of this experience and technology to uh, LMP or understanding to LMP2? Because, of course, in this class, you're all on the same, they're the same spec car, but it's up to you how you tune the, uh, the dampers in the spring setup. Yeah. And there's so much lap time in it. Anybody who's ever been in any kind of competitive rally car, well, the, the, and once you get beyond the fact, obviously, that the driver is definitely trying to kill you, the, the way that enormous potholes that you would fall into, that your road car would have its wheel ripped off by, yeah. they just float over like they didn't exist. It's, it's the biggest eye-opener. And in racing terms, you know, they, they are a bit, they all look they all look the damn same. It's funny, but you know, and yet they're so different. Not that I want to talk about Formula One, but it's relevant to sports cars this year. So we've seen some damage at the front of that Vector yeah. Sport car. I don't know what's happened. Was that there. that little nudge with the with Christian Reed's car? Could well be. No, yeah. He's been he's straddled the curb, hasn't yeah, he? He's ripped. That's a lot of that needs changing. Yeah. That, that nose needs changing, which is a fairly quick change in one of these cars. Yeah. A whole front segment comes off, but porpoising and bouncing has always been an issue yep. in sports cars um, and I, I've had to deal with that over the last 10 or so years of sports car racing and to, to hear it now being talked about <laughs> in Formula One with their new cars is, uh, is, is, is quite funny I reckon this has happened all by himself you know he's yep. gone off turn five oh, oh a bit of a half spin there taking him across the grass well, you talked about that from on board when we were on board with uh, one of the Porsches or whatever, going running out wide in turn five. And uh, well, in fact, it was an LMP2 gun, how it drags the car yes. out and then spits you back off again. Here and it comes into the pit, so yeah. that nose change will happen. Can, yeah, 15 seconds or so, they can get it done with a. And you can see why. Look at, look at the oh. splitter on yeah. the right hand side dragging. On the left hand side, non existent. So bits so have been ripped clear off the underside of the car. You've lost so much downforce. Yeah, by, by that happening. Um, so they've taken off the dive planes anyway for this season in LMP2. Uh, on, the, on the left, see that black horizontal stripe yeah. on the left-hand side? That's that's where the dive planes used to be. Flick-ups that came out from the, the nose gave you a lot more downforce. They're gone. The, the energy it takes that's to smash that. Yeah, well, that's... Boom, digging into a hole, yeah, digging into a hole in the grass, and it's, like, broken the light. Uh, that light cover, that was probably a Christian Reed uh, touch, but, yeah. There'll be four little quick turn fasteners, nose off, nose on, be one dry brake connector for the electrics. So let's see this whole front segment come off after the tyre change, surely is when it's going to happen. Driver's quite late to the car there, yep. Ryan Cullen. But luckily, for his sake, look, here comes the yep. nose change. So two quick release bolts, uh, either so side of the nose. Well, Ryan Cullen wasn't ready. No. 
Because it's only they weren't long expecting long. Yeah. exactly. So it, he was not expecting to be in the car for 25 minutes. Now, in in most if if we're in Europe, if we're in Spa and it was like you know eight degrees, he'd be there with only waiting to put his helmet on. Well, he'd have his helmet on, his jacket on, his everything yeah, on. Exactly. In these ready conditions, you're you're you know stripped to your shreddies because anything else you're just bathed in sweat before you even get into the sweat box. So understandable that that took so a little see, while. Let's see this moment again. Over the kerb on the exit of five, sends the car into a bit of a half spin and then over the grass. Yeah, and that's the, yes, we're going to change the nose. Yeah. Uh, that's actually uh, seven to three on, I yeah. think. Uh, I, I watched a lot of Channel 4 racing. That's, uh, that's Pookie's Tic Tac. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in comes the glue house <laughs> and that uh, car pits from second position. This is early. Oh, they were in the race, weren't they? This Lickenhouse is early, today. Yeah. Because of that mistake of Ryan Briscoe so easily done, he's out of the car now. But they were, they were, they were in the race. And yeah, then but what, what's the other issue then? Why are they in early? And, you know, once starts, things start to come a little bit unstitched at the seams, it always seems that once you're on the slippery slope, it's so how very early hard. are they, Graham? Um, well, that was 11 laps. Uh, that's very early. That's half a stint early. Oh, I know. Hang on. I know what's happened here. It's because they took a drive through, isn't it? It's, it's not. Ah, okay. it's, it's 18 plus one. It's on time. My apologies. So it's Olivia that. gets back in. He started the race for Glickenhouse. OK, so. They may not be out of the equation. They're on a very different pit cycle, though, aren't they? How soon until we see the Alpine in our race leader? Uh, they, uh, the Alpine is about a third of the way through its stint. OK. And the number eight car has got around six or seven laps on the stint. Because when we had the red flag, Toyota was due imminently. They were about a lap away, maybe two from a fuel stop, whereas the Glickenhaus had three quarters of a tank. And coming down the straight behind is... the Toyota. The Toyota. So Toyota was coming out of turn 16 as the Glickenhaus was emerging from pit lane. Look at the top speed, 300 k's, 190 miles an hour. In this place, are you mental? Bye, 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 bye. Bye, bye, bye. Yes, Martin, yes, they are. <laughs> Clearly are. It's, this is the 71 under repair? Yeah. Well, that's brake fluid brake, or brake, clutch brake fluid going cylinder. in. Brake, yeah, yeah, brake or clutch. Although those are all the master cylinders on the left, so it's steering. Yes, are they topping yes, up the power steering? Yeah, that's why they're... Because all the master cylinders are, are there on the left in front of the driver's pedals, well dual, dual brake, dual clutch. I was so waiting for the signal from the, from the mechanic to pump. let the driver know to pump the brake, but no, the other mechanic's in turning the steering wheel. So from De Soto... I've never seen that before. ...is the man at the helm. His debut in the FIA World Endurance Championship. There we go. Crank the engine, get going. You might not have any steering, but good luck. It'll be fine. Oh, yeah. there you go. <laughs> Welcome to the World Endurance Championship. So sharing that spirit of race, Ferrari with Pierre Rag and Gabriel Aubry, and they have had a proper rough haven't they, time, just. haven't they? That car will be the final car running when it gets back on track. The Team Project One still behind the wall, I'm afraid, after that damage earlier. And yeah, probably don't see that coming back, no. I don't think. Meanwhile, good little battle for position. Is this a lapperage or is this a positionage? That is for WRT. position. I thought it was behind real team. Norman Nato, uh, Rene Rast. There's a good battle. Oh, yes. You know, there is a cracking battle. And real team, again, you know, one of those names that has steadily risen up the ladder through uh, Le Mans Cup and the European Le Mans Series into World Championship racing. Yeah, great stuff. It was in the LMP2 Am class with Esteban Garcia. He's taken that team name. He is the uh, de facto team principal for real team racing with WRT. There is a commercial reality here, which is that does allow WRT to trade in one more of its automatic entries earned last year in a stellar year for them mm. you're only allowed two entries at the month per license See, for new viewers this is a this is a complex really complex uh, part of endurance racing the fact that we've got two teams ran by wrt yes that is the team that's prepping the car but then the actual team that we're seeing the yeah. entry is called Real Team. Correct. So it's Real Team by WRT. Both of these cars, they're run by Von Zonvoss's squad from Belgium. Won everything last year. But uh, for anybody who follows single-seater racing, it's hardly unusual, is it? Think of British Formula 3, you know, half a dozen cars run by Trevor Carlin. Or 
you know, any other championship. Again, we talked about Prema running different cars with different liveries for different drivers as entirely independent entities, even though they all come out of the same truck and they've got basically the same yeah, we've had know, mechanics on the same to, payroll. We're used to seeing different liveried uh, cars run by <laughs> under the same umbrella. You say yeah. you, you mentioned yeah. Carlin, for example, and is a, is a good reference. But here we've got a different name. Well, of WRT yeah. are running cars for two different people. I mean, it, it's it, it's like uh, Braun Williams Grand Prix becomes Either way, something they're fighting Williams Grand Prix. Yeah, yeah, they are. They're they're great looking for the outside here. This is a bit brave. Who's got the so tyre advantage back. here, Graham? Uh, 31 or 41. Oh, Rene Rass oh. sends it outside, inside. That's a proper GT move, isn't it? Down well, the inside is, the final corner. This is part of overtaking people out, isn't it? It's making the guy in front defend and put his car where you want it to be so that you can then make the actual move yeah, in a different this is direction. Great. This is great. So he tried to set him up for the exit of this corner of one. Not going to work there because you immediately get into the dirty air of that higher speed corner. It almost worked for him in the final corner. So now you've got to think again, right, where have I got the advantage? Is it the exit of turn five here? There's not. It looks like he's not quite close enough well, before the, breaking into turn seven. That's the your next opportunity. Is, the other thing is, people are going to look at it and go, well, why didn't he go down the inside? Because if you go down the inside there, that bump fires you off the road, and there's that to be taken into account as well. What looks like usable racetrack isn't always usable racetrack. Uh, nine Prema are in the pit, so to Jota, so that's a battle for position. Norman Nato should be in, I think, at the end of either this lap or the next one, right. with Rene Rast able to stay out for another couple of laps. Well, that's why Nato is past. not giving this away. Yeah. Two more laps, Norman Wright. He but shall not pass. It, it is two, uh, two ships, if you like, in the same fleet here, but they need to sort this out because Paul de Resta is getting away here. In fact, he's on pit lane now. Well, so our LMP2 leader is in. We just saw some drama for one of our new team's Vector Sport as Norman Nato hits the pit lane. Louise Beckett stands by with Rocky. Mike Rockefeller, you're here with Vector Sport uh, this weekend, and it was all hands on deck, wasn't it? All systems go just then. Tell us what happened. Well, first of all, uh, yeah, I think I think you can see that we are really lacking pace. Uh, the car is, is almost undrivable for us uh, since we are here. We are like two seconds off the pace. I was fighting with everybody, or actually with nobody, because I had had to let go of everybody. So anyway, I was uh, trying, you know, to keep it on track. Uh, Nico had an off already, and as soon as you try to push a bit harder, this guy, it's, it's easy to make a mistake. So I went off my mistake. I overdid it a bit out of five. I was frustrated, you know, and I, I tried. I had a few more laps before I should have pitted, and we lost the nose of the car. So not ideal, but didn't really change our race. And you've got a full weekend anyway, because you've got IMSA tomorrow as well. Yeah, of course. So, uh, I mean, here, results-wise, we cannot do much, but the team Vector Sport, it's a new team, it's the first race, and I think there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to be gained from this, and uh, for sure they come back much stronger for the next event. So, uh, thanks to everybody in the team, even though we had a really tough time. Um, and tomorrow I'm very much looking forward to drive the Cadillac, the number 48 in the IMSA race. Uh, I think we have a great chance there to fight for victory. My teammates, Kamui and Rosé, uh, unfortunately are out of the race, so they didn't have a good day today either. Uh, I hope Rosé is okay, that's the most important, and then tomorrow, hopefully, we can uh, go back home with a smile on our face. You can turn it around, thank you. Thank you. Well, there's all sorts of... Uh, we're going to unpack a, a little can of worms here, and then great time to do it. Mike Rockefeller racing tomorrow in the IMSA WeatherTech Series in the Sebring 12 Hours. His teammates, Kamui Kobayashi, and Jose Maria Lopez. Toyota refused to allow them to drive the car in any IMSA session until after this race was over. So, in morning warm-up tomorrow, a 15-minute session, both Kobayashi and Lopez have to do enough laps to satisfy IMSA that they are qualified to start the race. Rocky's the only one. He's driven every minute of every IMSA session, as well as doing his laps here for Vector Sport. So, uh, the, and of course, the next question is, and he said, I hope the Jose is fit uh, indeed, because there's only three of them, and with two of them in a 12 hour race, that's going to be really, really hard. 
yeah, I mean, two, two drivers for 12. It, I mean, it, it is possible, but you're not going to be at optimum performance. That is for sure. Uh, I'm sure Jose will be okay. Yeah. Um, you know, he, they're strong cars. He looked fine. He's, he's been to the medical center. Only he can make that decision now, uh, whether he'll be fit enough to uh, mentally strong enough to take part in that race. Uh, tomorrow, but it is a brutal race and on a, yeah. on a very tough track. It's uh, it's on everyone's minds. I'm sure it's on Jose's mind as well. But like I say, only he will know whether he's fit to do the job or not. Well, let's hope he is. Medically, uh, he is. Well, yeah, medically he yeah. is. I mean, you yeah, and an awful lot of physio to try and loosen all those knots that will be in his body overnight. But uh, yeah, you know, he and and he can maybe let the other guys do, uh, you know, first three or four hours or something. There's still a lot of heavy lifting left to be done once you're four hours into the 12 hours of Sebring. But less than ideal conditions. In fact, three of the six Toyota drivers are down to do the 12 hours tomorrow. So. So they have not had a, even even a metre in the cars in which they're due to take on one of the world's toughest races. What it doesn't allow the uh, Cadillac team to do is to hedge their bets. There's not enough time to have three drivers check out in that no, car. No. That's the big problem here, is that if uh, Jose starts that race, he's got to stick with it. Yeah, let's get more from Louise Beckett. Keep an eye out for Glickenhaus. I've just seen the team running down the pit lane here to get back to their pit box. So I don't know what's happening there, but clearly there's some urgency with the team. Okay, all right. Well, in the pit lane is our LMP2 leader. This is WRT's Rene Rast back in. Be interesting actually by the end of the race to see how many different cars have led in LMP2 because these guys have the number nine Prema car has 23 and 22 from United have. Uh, would that be the total count? I think so, probably. But uh, but four cars from three different teams. Uh, the the question came up just a few minutes ago about how it is that uh, the United Autosports car has pulled such a gap away, or rather how the Prema car has fallen back. The answer is. Very simply, it's pace. It's as simple as that. The sum, so for some reason, in the last couple of stints, the pace has, has gone out of that car. Yeah, as I said, you know, balance and grip can change through this race. Uh, one minute you, you feel happy or, or disappointed with the balance of the car. As we were hearing from Mike Rockefeller just then with Louise saying, look, it's, the car's been very challenging to drive all day, but at some point in this race, the conditions do change and it either goes in your favor or against you. Well, uh, you know, anybody who watches NASCAR, particularly NASCAR on ovals, right, they're chasing a lot of push now because the cloud cover has come over. What's happened? The cloud cover has come over. So you don't have that fierce sun baking the track. So the, the track temperature has stopped climbing and is now possibly plateauing or possibly sagging. And so that will change the, the car's balance. And so basic things like the pressures of the tires as they Absolutely. go on, you've got to know which direction you're going with that. And without any experience, your best guessing, I mean, engineering best guessing is way beyond my experience, but still, you're not always right when you don't have the information you need. So track conditions are changing, air conditions are changing, the track is rubbering in, it's evolving, it's all moving. Good uh, fight here between, yep. uh, sorry, okay. Graham, good fight here between Roberto Gonzalez in the car 38, Jota, and uh, the Prema car of Lorenzo Colombo. Now, Colombo was very quick earlier on yeah. in his stint. He's now got to try and find his way past Roberto Gonzalez, but yeah, Roberto's a, a clean racer. He knows where to place the car, very experienced. He is a silver driver. Um, but so is Colombo, of course, yep. but uh, of, of different uh, different stages of their career, I should say. Yeah, you can see that maybe even based on this one race alone, Lorenzo Colombo is unlikely to be a silver next season. He exactly. definitely, I mean, yeah, he has arrived with a bang and Roberto Gonzalez is, yeah, he's pretty much going to be a silver. Plus, they're on about the same tire. Lorenzo Colombo, never knew anything about him before this weekend. I think he's uh, definitely arrived. And, and again, Prema, yes, they may have lo lost pace in the car, but that doesn't, oh, it doesn't mean it's not gonna come back to them. It doesn't mean they can't make adjustments that will work. They just don't necessarily have the information to, 
know they're going in the right direction. Time after time after time, we see them through turn 17. You can almost see the decision being made. Is the room up the inside? Is no, 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 no. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a good idea, but it's never a good idea. But it might be an idea that you can stick. But there, Colombo made the right decision because there was not going to be room on the exit of turn 17. It's a strange corner, that one. It's sometimes you feel like the car's being bounced off line, but if you stay committed, and be brave you can keep your foot down on the exit of the core and the car's moving all over the place but at some point in a car like this that the jota you know, the lmp2 sees things are going down the inside of the corvette oh, oh, it's a bit, of a, here. a bit of a clumsy oh. moment for everyone involved there and is that going to give colombo a chance an opportunity to make an attack and then the flash of the lights <laughs> from the corvette as well say Come on, let's behave better than that next time around, guys. Nick Tandy going, I let you survive that one, but give us a chance. Colombo goes the long way around the outside, outside, inside, doesn't Nick, make it. Nick Gonzalez had it covered. Yeah. He's got to stay on the inside for this corner as well. He does, so that opportunity for Colombo disappears uh, until, well, at least another lap, because uh, you get into this higher speed range of the track and the downforce effect starts to uh, dwindle in the, uh, in the turbulent air. Playing with a really straight bat there, Roberto Gonzalez, just <laughs> choosing his line and sticking to it. No variation, no weaving, none of that, no just nonsense. Minimizing mistakes, that's yeah. what it's all about. But right, there's a good run here for Colombo. You'll see Roberto maybe go to the inside. Is he going to bother? No, he's going to allow it. Yeah. Well, if you can get by me there, son, well done. Yeah. Matthias Besch right behind in the number 44 ARC Bratislava car. Not in this battle. But it is uh, a Pro-Am car, so uh, the Pro-Am battle continues behind these guys. Lorenzo Colombo now up to fifth place ahead of the first of the two Jota cars, or the second of the two Jota cars. And that's Matthias Besch catching up now to the back of Gonzalez. Algarve Pro under pressure. This is a lapping situation. Oh, it's real team yep, yep. again. Sorry, yep, wrong yep. blue car. Real team's Norman Nato. Fresh out, relatively fresh out of the pits. We saw him battling uh, a couple of laps ago. Phil uh, Hansen. Position. Yep. And Phil Hansen getting a bit of giddy up here and yep. getting onto terms with Norman Nato. This LMP2 battle has been fantastic through this race and it's not showing any signs of letting up whatsoever. Two hours, 45 minutes. That's an American Le Mans series race in old parlance as we have just, we'd just be a lap into an ALMS race by this stage at Sebring. Although, of course, ALMS at Sebring was always 12 hours, but Norman Nato was battling with teammate Rene Rast, pulled into the pits a couple of laps before Rast, and uh, Rene is now currently running in second place in LMP2, but the race leader is the 23 United Auto Sports car with Ollie Jarvis at the wheel, Ollie being added to the driver lineup this season. Now, in terms of 22's driving strength, has Will Owen completed his 2 hour 20 minimum? I'll be checking that right now for you. And while you're there, in terms of 23, what about Josh Pearson, who is the uh, lowest ranked driver in the 23 crew? I, I sort of sense that they've both done about the same, but that's just a, a, a feeling, and my feelings are about as good as my mental arithmetic. It does seem like both of them had a fair share of time behind yeah. the wheel, whether or not they've reached their target of minimum drive time, which is one Two hour, hours. 40 minutes Two for hours. silver. Two hours, Two hours, 20. Two hours in, uh, no, two hours in LMP2 ah, okay. in an uh, eight hour race. It's different for a six hour race. So the regulations say two hours, checking now. Wait one, caller. So 22 United Auto Sport, the leader early on. In fact, very nearly the overall race leader yes. early on. Got himself up to second place ahead of the Toyota and the Glickenhaus. Really good strong start. Then in the pit stops only initially, did 23 ever get ahead for a lap or two before 22 got back in front? And they really dominated the first three hours of the race. United Auto Sports looked to have their foot on the throat of everybody else, but Prema fought their way in and so too WRT have. Yeah, WRT have really pulled themselves back into this race. I expected them to do just that. 
after a bit of a shaky start in this in this race, they're they're right there now in, now, uh, in second place. That graphic says that the number nine car has never at any stage led this race. I think that's absolutely wrong. It has been in front, so we will argue the toss with that as work continues at Vector Sport. Ground up restoration here at Vector Sport. The nose is off. It looked like they were doing a lot of damper work. We talked a little bit at Davidson about dampers and, and the fact that they all look the damn same, they don't work the same, and they are absolutely fundamental. If you can't keep the tire on the road, if it's bouncing up and down, which is what the damper stops, because damper is not suspension, it stops the suspension moving so much, controls the oscillations of the suspension. Dampers if the damper the suspension. damping yeah, the vibration exactly. <laughs> if the damper doesn't work, then your tire is not on the ground, which oh, the means... the whole aero platform of the car doesn't work. Well, I mean, that's 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 almost secondary because it doesn't matter how much aero platform you've got, if you've got no mechanical grip because you're spinning the fronts and locking... or spinning the backs and locking the fronts. But these these cars, the, the Orica LMP2 cars, are so pitch sensitive yeah. to the downforce. So as soon as you start moving around that mechanical balance, that relationship between mechanical balance and the oscillation combined with the uh, powerful aerodynamics of these cars, yeah. never underestimate that. Yeah. It can make your life behind the wheel a living nightmare. And they are clearly having a tough time at Vector Sport. Five hours into the eight of the season opener, season 10 of the FIA World Endurance Championship at Sunny Sebring, at least it was before the start of the race. A gathering of the great and good, the captain, Roger Penske, embarking in the World Endurance Championship for a full season entry with his car in LMP2. Jackie Hicks, the Grand Marshal. Old Dory waving the field away. A big gap between the LMP field and Hypercar at the front and GTs. Toyota getting dive bomb by United Autosport. Philippe Albuquerque diving through up to second place ahead of the Toyota and the Glickenhaus and putting in the moves to try and challenge the Alpine. But the Alpine sprinting away early on at the head of the field. The battle in GT between Corvette and Porsche started early and with a vengeance, but the Porsches would end up with a 15 second penalty for slowing the field down and creating too much of a gap to the LMP field. The 33 Aston Martin led GTE Am from pole, but was passed within the first hour by the 98 AMR car. And they have held the lead almost ever since. Toyota struggling for pace against their hypercar rivals still with a fuel advantage as corvette took the lead in gte pro problems for into europe or into europe with an electronic issue stopping the car out on circuit it did manage to return and after electronic changes rejoined the race in lmp2 united autosports 22 and 23 were the leaders and then the big drama Jose Maria Lopez tangling with the 88 Dempsey Proton Porsche of Julian Andlauer into the barriers and then trying to get back to the pit lane. Wheels locked up straight off at high speed into the barriers. Car wrecked, race stopped. Lopez and the number seven car out of the race. Driver OK, car very much not. Red flag flew, a 30 minute stoppage. Pachito hoping to race in the 12 hours of Sebring the following day. Looks to be OK. Back under green, an emergency stop, and then a full fuel stop for the number eight Toyota, dropping them out of the race. Corvette being dive-bombed by the 92 Porsche for the lead in GTE Pro, away from the green flag. But it is Alpine that currently leads the race with two and a half hours to go. Two hours, 37 remaining of the eight hours of Sebring. Season opener, season 10 of the FIA World Endurance Championship. And returning to where it all began in 2012, Super Sebring, a joint race weekend between the World Endurance Championship and the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Series. 
the Sebring 12 hours, the 70th running of America's great endurance classic happens after the World Endurance Race on its traditional Saturday day. So we're racing here in Sebring on Friday and Ann Davidson, lots of action going on. Jota's number 38 car getting ahead of Lorenzo Colombo well, back or ahead. staying back, back ahead, ahead of yep. Lorenzo Colombo in the number nine Prema car, which has been quick but losing a little bit of pace as the race has progressed. So something has clearly happened in those laps where we're watching the highlights with the Prema car. Colombo's clearly had a moment and uh, now finds himself back behind Roberto Gonzalez, who put up a, a pretty uh, feisty defensive drive, yep. I must say, and he's going to have to do that work all over again. Both these drivers, by the way, need about another half an hour or so in the car, so a little longer, just four or five minutes longer for uh, Gonzalez. How long have they got on fuel? Uh, we'll check that one for you. But, OK, uh, meanwhile... I'll say, by the way, Josh Pearson still needs time in the car. Yeah. And Will Owen is done with his driver's time uh -huh. if they choose. OK, so Will Owen in 23, which is the car that leads the race, Ollie Jarvis has just set that car's fastest sector one of the entire race. So the number 23 United car leading the field and destined to remain speedy. So as we watch this battle between our LMP2 rivals, Roberto Gonzalez ahead of his young rival, Lorenzo Colombo. Graham Goodwin has the answer to who needs fuel and when. This is the battle for fourth, remember? They both need fuel in about 10 laps. It's within a lap of each other uh, as they cross the line this time. So 10 it will laps be... at 1 minute 50 a lap, that's 15 minutes. Yep. Uh, so that it will be about 10 laps for Colombo, it will be 11 laps for Gonzalez. And that's not enough time to complete their driving time. No. So they fun. will need to do a bit more and stay in. Correct. And there's no point in taking them out and having to do a bit later in the race. We've seen how that goes really badly wrong. I will add that I've not yet seen the adjustments for driving time for the red flag. Yes. All of this, by the way, this battle here between Gonzalez and Colombo is helping the sister car of Gonzalez, car number 28, John Aberdeen, to catch this fight. And, uh, and he's doing that quickly. Yeah, he's doing that quickly because they're battling it out. Um, still want to know what happened to the Prema car. Clearly he made a mistake somewhere. Was it traffic? Did he have a spin? It's, uh, he, he lost a, an awful lot of time. You're right, viewers. Alan McNish is sounding different today, isn't he? That's because Alan McNish is now Anthony Davidson. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. No, not at all. Delighted to have you with us. You lose one world champion, you gain another. I think that is definitely swings and roundabouts. Well, I'm looking now, talk amongst yourselves, and do not bring out any more red flags. I'm looking down in the steward's <laughs> coat. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm blaming there. you. You, yeah. you, you. You were the curse of the red yeah. flag, right? I went him. for the weed. Now it's Here we go. Oh, okay. this Here is we go. The... Can he do it again? So this is where Colombo lined up. Look, look how wide they're going off the track. You talk about track limits. I think that's the only place you can potentially gain an advantage on this circuit. Right. Is Gonzalez going to go to the inside and defend this one? He's not this time around. And surely this is going to be Colombo. A carbon copy of what he did fir first time around to get past in this very corner. And Colombo makes it through, picks up the spot. Having delved, I have found dated uh, 16, oh, timed at 1606 local, a message from the stewards. Document 53 says minimum drive time is as follows. Write this down, Graham Goodwin. Got it. LMP2 silver, one hour, 32 minutes and 53 seconds. They'll be fine. Both of these drivers should be fine within the stint they're now on. And bronze, 132.53 in GTE AM, two hours, 10.02. Yep and two hours 10.02 for silvers and bronzes. So the minimum drive time in GTE AM is two hours 10 and two seconds, one hour 32 and 53, one hour so 33 minutes. So effectively what they've done is they've removed the red flag time yes. from the max, the, the minimum. Oh, that was so risky. They've, they've taken the missing half hour Correct. out and, and given that to the, the uh, lowest ranked driver, Correct. Holly Jarvis. Well, you know, you don't win by not being bold in traffic. You get used to the fact that you go around the outside of the GT cars on the exit of turn 14. It's where you have to place the car. It's where you can keep the most momentum. So he was committed to that move. Um, he had enough. 
yeah, experience in hand to make sure he wasn't going to crash, but it's still, it just looks <laughs> risky from the outside. It looks up. See, Look, I would have done exactly the same thing if I was him. I know why he did it, but... Uh, yeah, but and he's got to keep pushing because yeah. Well, yeah. he's got. Uh, has he got it? Has we agreed he's got to put the silver got back in? Uh, After no, this not or not? Not, no, not, not in 23. 22 does. Does. No, they don't. Uh, oh, no, not, not now, now because of the time. Okay, no. so Willow in is done. But the right. reason he's, he's pushing hard on a Jarvis is it's a bit like when you were little and in the neighbourhood, someone down the road had a big angry dog that sometimes got out. That's Reddy Rast. <laughs> so he's chasing hard. The neighbour with the dog or the actual dog. So are we saying with that as well then, Graham, that Sean Galeo doesn't have to no. get back in the car as well? Okay, so no. there's I'll game on then towards the end I'll with double, double WRT and, uh, uh, and United. Well, we don't need to double check because the team bosses will be triple, quadruple, quintuple checking. Let's be absolutely certain. And you don't want to get out, be caught out by the zero two seconds either. You no, really, Galele's really fine. have to be. Galele's right. absolutely so fine. So that's seven point six seconds we see between WRT and the lead car of Ollie Jarvis at the moment. United. That's genuine. Seven point yep. six yep. seconds. Game on. Yep. Two and a half hours to go. And with and real team in third, number 41 car. I mean, real team, that's going to be a major scout for them. Now, look at this 28 38, 38 28. Let's put that back round the right way. Remember when 38 got waved by earlier on because they had better tyres than a 28 car? There we go. Looks like it's happening the other way round. Jonathan Aberdyne goes by without drama. That makes sense when you are running two cars to run two cars, not to have two cars running each other. There's the Toyota Garage. This is our Cedric Cam. Uh, is that oh, is that 21 or 71 going down? That's 71, the Spirit of Race car. So that is driving down from... The deal here is you've got the back straight, which has got the hot pit lane, which has an awning and some tyres and some fuel but no garage attached. In American racing, garages do not open out onto the pit lane. You work from an awning, and that's the row behind the row behind the pit lane, as you see. So here you go, this is a great view. There's the Iron Dames car in the hot pit lane, over the wall, but behind the white line. Four men, plus the fueler. Notice where the fueler's legs are, behind the white line also. And one man, the lollipop man, or a safety man could be across there, and a driver helper to help the drivers change place. But behind that, there's the fuel tank and the, the Easy Up, which has got all their equipment and a few spare tyres. Everything else in the awning. I'm going to correct you in one way and one way only, or woman. Because I was going to say exactly the same thing. More. Yeah. So I've noticed that this, this year in particular, significantly more female prick crew members, mm -hmm. engineers, mechanics. Uh, and we've seen some of the, 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 the girls going over the wall here yep. too. And that's absolutely part of the philosophy for Iron Dames is trying to find ways to advance that skill set with the fabulous program that Deborah May has established. Deborah, by the way, we should celebrate the fact that through endurance racing, now at the head of the FI Women in Motorsport Commission, is Deborah May replacing the fable, the legendary Michelle Mouton. And Deborah, uh, absolutely the, uh, the prime mover behind the Iron Dames effort. On pit lane now is the overall race leader. It's the 36 Alpine. Andre Negrau brought the car in. I did see one of the teams earlier on, actually, Graham. Had the, there was a female mechanic taking, I think, the front left tyre off, one of the front wheels off the car. Um, I think it was the Inter Europol team. Yeah, it could well be. It was one of those LMP2 teams. One of the yellow cars, yeah. <laughs> Well, ARC yeah. have also got a female uh, team, team boss, manager. So, team yeah. manager. Okay, yeah. Yeah. A, um, a NASCAR, a Euro NASCAR driver in their spare time. Nick Tandy and James Collada, by the way, battling for third in GT Pro, have both just turned their cars fast this race lap. So I think the the overcast, which we've had for about two hours now, is really starting to have an effect. Also, it's 5:30, so the heat is coming out of the day a little bit. Lots Finally, of get a bit of respite now in the cars. It's yeah. just that intense midday sun has gone. And uh, this is where the race starts to cool down slightly as the sun start, starts to set. Uh, and by the way, as you talk about Nick Tandy, with thanks to Ryan Smith and Corvette, and it's great to have Corvette with us this season. We noted, if you recall, a little while ago, slow, uh, slow uh, pit stop for Corvette. 
and exploit that. So that slow pit stop for Corvette some little while ago, there was some 10 seconds or more longer than it should have been, explained by the fact the door was hanging low after contact with a P2 car. They had to manually pull the latch open to, uh, or to get it to lock after Nick got in, and that cost them the time. So yeah. it's damage from contact with a P2 car. And that was in the turn seven hairpin. I That's believe. right. Yeah. yeah. Rio Hirokawa racing for the first time at world championship level for toyota multiple race winner and champion in super nippon and super gt in his homeland and very much the lauded rising star at toyota and his first ever world endurance championship outing the car currently in second place overall the clicking house 708 in third but it is the alpine that leads by over a minute and graham goodwin toyota's way of countering the top speed or the the faster lap times that the alpine is capable of setting was the alpine can't run fast for so long because it's got a fall a smaller fuel tank and the toyota needed well they needed every minute of the eight hours to try and parlay their fuel economy into less time in the pits and that has actually flag, gone the opposite yeah. way around them. the red flag has hurt them badly but let's talk a little about rio hirakawa to see the the glickenhaus piling on through third position at the moment for the 708 this is the scg 007 hypercar but rio hirakawa is now in the midst of his second stint give you an idea first stint an average of 152.2 152.0 at this point in the middle of the second stint. Uh, that compares to 152.0 in the second stint for Seb Buemi. That is not bad at all. He's right there on pace at the moment. Just little... let's have a listen in to what's going on aboard the 708 with Oli Pla. 11 laps to go after this. 11 laps to go. Your pace is good. Your pace is good. So his pace is good, 51-0 last time round, yep. comparing that to the Alpine that leads this race at 52-5 and 51-5 for Rio Hirakawa, the driver we were just talking about Correct. in the Toyota. So yeah, Rio, well at the moment, yeah, the Alpine is uh, the slower of the three, but has that luxury of a one minute lead. Indeed, and that's something they're going to be guarding jealously and hoping that we can go green for the remaining two hours and 24 minutes of this race. It's not lack for drama. Uh, some type of the unwelcome type, but uh, we've had great battling in, well, frankly, all four classes at various points in this race. Yep, good battle shaping up again, or continuing for third place in LMP2, or for second place in LMP2. Rene Rass second for WRT, third place, real team by WRT's Norman Nato, just setting fastest first sector of that car's race, taking three tenths out of Rast in one sector alone. There is the Dickon House. Behind them, you can see 31, fifth overall, 41. That's the real team car, Norman Nato, in fifth place overall. In GC Pro, the 92 Porsche, 91 Porsche train continue, first and second ahead of the Corvette. So, with that delay in the pit lane, it looks as though Corvette are out of it, but when the red flag came out, we think that Corvette had, uh, had used fewer new tires than Porsche. So what we need then is a graphic with what 92 has used and not what 91 has used, but what 64 has used. Right. However, all we get is what's actually on the car, Correct. not which tires have been used. And teams aren't going to tell me when I ask. Well, let's, let's, let's put it this way. What I can tell you is how long those cars spend on pit lane. We know the 142 was a full service stop for the Chevrolet that was their fourth stop of this race they've had one other stop that looks to me to be a full service stop that was their second stop um, after 59 laps for the Porsches again four stops each uh, but it looks to me as if they've taken tires of some description at every stop yeah they did on their first stop they took a pair of tires whereas yep. Nick Tandy double stinted from the start, Correct. so that gives them a two. That gives Corvette a two-tire advantage. Well, so then we saw. It, I think yeah. it's better than that. Yeah. So let's start again. First stop for the for the uh, Corvette was one minute and eleven seconds. That is a little more than a fuel stop. 
Uh, so we know they're quick in the pits. Second one was a 126, that's a full service stop. Then 116, not a full service stop. Then 142, we know about that one. That was the damage. Porsche number, let's check which Porsche I'm looking at here. Uh, 126, 140, 126, 124. They've taken tyres at each stop on that car. And right. 123, 137, 122, 123. They've taken at least two tyres. At uh, least two tyres. So the Corvette has has new tyres. By our reckoning, between four and maybe six fresher tyres. Uh, definitely four. Definitely a full set. That could make a big difference if there's only 20 seconds between them. Correct. Last lap was good for P1 for the race. Last lap will give us P1 for the race. Last lap was good enough. For oh, P1. good enough for P1 I think for the race. Good enough. But, um, is that I the fastest? Oh, well, hang on. So basically, if he can carry on that speed. Well, Kevin Esther has just set the Porsche's fastest race lap, a 58.09. Nick Tandy, a 57.73, the fastest lap round. that car has done. So let me work out exactly what he was being told there. 58.3 that time around, must have had a bit of traffic. Yep. Got the nice slow-mo shot. But if you can do 57 sevens, boy, you're going to win Be it. Back in this, yeah. Even if they've got the same tyres. I mean, look, nothing's changed, right? He's in the same car that was quick at the beginning of the race, and and it's the same driver, so surely... He's, he's in the same car that was quick at the beginning of the race without tyre assistance. Exactly, yeah. And they have got at least a set in hand. I still feel like in that fight, the yeah. faster car driver combo is behind on track. Yes. And the reason they're behind on track is because of the red flag situation yes. still. And the contact. Because of all yeah. of their advantage that they built up disappeared. It all disappeared. And, the, and they had that advantage whilst they were kind of out of sync with tyres. Yep. They had inferior sets of tyres on the car, but a nice healthy margin yeah. to allow that to happen, now, that got taken away. Yeah. And then, like you say, Graham, with the, yep. the part of stop. that margin was the 15 second penalty that both Porsches had, but they were in front anyway on, on pace. Merit. On merit. So yeah. it, it would have been tight. They wouldn't. They shouldn't necessarily have been 30 seconds or 40 seconds ahead. So we've got two hours, 19 minutes, and change, and the Corvette with. More tyres in the locker. And the and Porsche was pace. worse on its tire, older yes. tyres than the Corvette, was, relatively yes. speaking. Well, let's look at that. Game uh, on, I reckon. I could, it should be closing down this you. gap towards the end of the race. Well, mm. well the, the other good news for Corvettes, it was bad news, good news. The bad news was, of course, they lost that gap. The good news was, at the point at which the car was at its weakest, they had the red flag. So whilst they did, yes, they most certainly did lose time there, they lost at the time when it was least damaging to the effort. Exactly. It's a shame that Ferrari aren't in this fight as well today. Yep. Um, you know, we, had, we only had the two teams last year with Porsche and Ferrari. It's great that Corvette are there, but we've lost Ferrari in this race. They haven't really been in the mix, and, and that's a shame. Maybe this track just doesn't suit their car, maybe it was a BOP thing, but... And still, I don't know if I missed it or I forgot it. Really not quite sure where 52 dropped three laps back. Uh, they, they had a stop quite a while ago. They did, but I, I, I'm not sure we really documented we what didn't or really. why. Now that might be one. Oh, we went very Whoa, wide there. That was a close little one. fighter. That was a close one. Out on the marbles, like I said, as this race continues on, mistakes like that get punished more and more. And you saw him there weaving to try and scrub some of that muck off the car. Uh, you know, you can, that you can spend you 20 time. minutes with a heat gun and still not get it off. Oh, absolutely. It, you know, the marbles stay on the tyres for a good couple of laps around here. Yeah. So that, what seems like one innocent mistake, is very detrimental. Look, another shot here. So that's the line where the P2, that's where he should be. Mate, he, he's in a different zip code. He's in a different county there. That's not the racing line. <laughs> That's not even a ways approximation of the ways of the racing line. That was the racing line round there <laughs> between, between uh, turns 15 and 16. Beautifully done there, but all went wrong in 17. Penske yeah. are going to get pinged. 10 seconds added to the next pit stop of the Penske Orica for a pit stop infringement. Do we know why? We don't. It just uh, just uh, appeared yeah. at the bottom of our screens. Well, that. That will be things like not having an earth wire connected or a visor. I mean, or a foot over the white it'll line. It'll be a foot over yeah. the white line, something like that. Yeah. 
four, uh, 35 cars, uh, 36 cars started our race. We have one official retirement, the number seven Toyota Gazoo Racing, uh, GR01 of uh, GR010 of uh, Jose Maria Lopez. Two cars also not running, 46 Team Project One, Porsche and the 71 Spirit to race Ferrari. We did see the 71 car in the pit lane. Meanwhile, into the pits comes another of the A, of course, a Phalanx. That's the 51 car. Yeah. That is Far the... too many of A, of course's cars look exactly like the factory cars. So always have to wait and identify a little bit. It's predominantly the breadth of the Tricolore up the nose. 28 is in. Driver change goes on there as well as out gets Jonathan Aberdyne, and it will be fuel only for United's Oli Jarvis, the race leader in LMP2. Lorenzo Colombo staying in. Okay. Taking a well earned drink as well. He is game for this, isn't he? Well, he's got the speed. You know, he might oh, be the silver no. driver in that lineup, but he's clearly got the speed, so uh, why not stay in? Real team it off is... the jacks and ready to go, and they're moving. Is Lorenzo Colombo this year's Thomas Laurent? Well, last year, Charles Malesi. Yeah. yeah. Young Hot Shoe comes in with very little racing behind him and as a result has a, a low grade, but is clearly on a... Uh, he's on the sort of trajectory that you get out of Cape Canaveral, isn't he? He's going straight up. Yeah. A super silver, as yeah. they're known in the trade. Well, yeah. we've, we've seen it before. We, we talked about Nick Nielsen early in the race, uh, Antonio yeah. Fuoco, Alessio Rivera, all of these guys coming in effectively through academy type uh, efforts and being given real huge responsibility in a world championship level event. Well, this is Kimi Raikkonen, Formula Renault to F1, isn't it? You know, some of these guys have been in, uh, not club racing, but national level racing or, you know, moderate level European racing. And they come onto the world stage and they're just as quick among their peers here as they were among maybe less starry peers yep. at, at a lower level. And, and it's not what you're driving, it's who the driver is. There's Oli Jarvis, we were told by Louise, fuel only. Yep, and that is bang on time in. for the United Auto Sports car. What you need in a race like this, just zero mistakes. Yep. Nothing to go wrong, and that, I mean, it, I know it sounds like, well, yeah, obviously, you know, professionals, they know what they're doing, some well-oiled machine there at United. But, I mean, to get through a race of this length without one thing, one tiny thing going wrong, is extremely hard. Yeah. And we always said when we went racing in this category, if you can get through unscathed, nothing goes wrong, that's a guaranteed podium, without even thinking about anything else. Yeah. At least a guaranteed podium. Well, we, we because saw... something always happens. Well, speaking of which, Roberto, you just saw Roberto Gonzalez yeah. coming in the 38 Jota car into the pit lane, third, Exactly. Still third, and he is their lowest rated driver. He is their gentleman driver. I mean, they have He's had the one that wrong. loses time. Where he, and he had but the spin in turn one. Third. Yeah. Now, without that spin in turn yeah. one, they'd, they'd, they'd probably up. still be third, but yeah, even closer. Now, you know, I mean, that's. Yeah, things need to go well, don't you? Look at the mileage that Ferdy Habsburg has got on the tyres of the real team car, and Lorenzo Colombo staying in. 84 laps! So the left sides, the right sides rather, did qualifying. The left sides didn't do qualifying, but holy cow, that's a lot of laps on the set of tyre. He'll be in this Good lap. luck. He'll be in this lap. Yeah, the Goodyear men will be very pleased. Is that a triple? 81 laps is... It's a triple stint. No, it's not. It's on, it not? The, on the tyres. Two and a half. It, no, on the tyres, it's a quadruple. Quad? Yeah, they do 19 laps per stint. Uh, they have been doing 19 laps per stint. So that's more than a quad. Yes. That's uh, the, the, the uh, 70... Uh, 70 well, uh, it's, yeah, a, it's, uh, it's a quad plus qualifying. Yeah. Was that graphic right? If it's correct, that's extraordinary. Well, the RFID breaking. does have anomalies, but normally only when it's raining. 1990, 38, 38, 38 is 76. Uh, it sounds like they've done all of FP3, FP2, and FP1 on them as well. I know. I mean, that's that's remarkable. Are they, can you cash them back in? Right. Uh, you gave us 10 <laughs> sets. We only used one, so we'd like the money back for nine. Play. What? Absolutely. Well, if the graphic is right, then uh, first of all, full marks, and actually. If the graphic is right, and they've done 80 laps on those tyres, you know you said, how come the number nine car is gradually drifted back a bit? That's how come. Well, it was ahead of Gonzalez. We saw that original move, he overtook yeah. Gonzalez, then somehow fell back. 
but and then had to redo the move to, to overtake. But to do that on the... I'm sure I saw a graphic come up earlier on when the two were fighting wheel yeah. to wheel. They were on similar and, and mileage. Then, yeah, and they were on Maybe. similar mileage. It was 60 something. But or, I mean, but if, if, it, if they've done 90, 90 laps on the, or 80 laps on those tyres, no wonder they dropped out of the top three. <laughs> however. You can't it, do a quadruple stint down here it, tyres. It means they've now got six tyres per stop left for the rest of the race. It, How it are they going to use them? It must have. We see uh, the yeah. number 31 WRT come in, Rast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. I'm the more it goes on, I'm doubting that graphic yeah, more and more. The, the you more can't more do you a quadruple stint around this circuit. The more you say it, the less you believe it. However, Rene Rast is in from the lead of LMP2. So does this cycle back? 58.8 seconds back was Ollie Jarvis, who only stopped a lap or two ago. Driver change. Robin Fryan's getting in. Yeah. Is he clocking good? I think he is, isn't he? He's going to be pushing what for I did all there. his worth. Yeah. Shall I stop? Yes. yes. Ollie Jarvis had fuel only. Well, the tyres ready for this car. I suspect the answer is not. Uh, there is an air, gu there's a, uh, air hammer ready. Well, with driver change, I, I would go the other way. I would say, yes, they, he's probably double stint to them, and I would say that Robin will probably have a, a set to double stint, or at least stint and a half, I but... Mean, should, yeah, yeah, yep. so here, here we come with the tyre change. So this is going to be a nice change. Usually on change, you do the tyres as well. <laughs> It's normally the most sensible way of doing it in LMP2 because then you don't have to have any tires that Ant has just ragged to death, knowing that he'll only have to do one stint on them. Ollie Plop, otherwise we watch this, is going towards the end of his stint and is going quickly. The second lap of the 150s and is closing the gap again to the Toyota. And look how much darker it is in the pit lane. Look how much less available light there is. I mean, the sun hasn't sunk yet. It's sunset isn't sunset yet, but you know, with two hours and ten to go, the light is dropping. Great Britain's Ollie Jarvis leading an LMP2 for United Autosports USA. Another way of skinning the cat and getting lots of entries potentially for Le Mans. United Autosports have been fairly much in command of this race. WRT have been in there in the fray. Prema have been in there in the fray. But 22 and 23 have predominantly shared the laps between them. There was a lap there between 37 and 38 where nine led. So there have been laps in amongst the uh, pit stops where the Prema car has been the leader and WRT has also led. But you look at the dominance that United showed, the speed they showed in qualifying at Davidson has been reflected by the speed they're showing in the race. They've been fast all week so far. It seems strange not to say weekend, because yeah. it's, uh, it's, we're not racing on the weekend. Um, but look, they, they have been fast. They've got a great driver lineup. Like I said before, a, a well-oiled machine at United Autosports. Two-car entry. Um, the two cars were very quick at the start of the race. They've maintained that speed throughout. The car 23s, really, as far as I'm concerned, very little of any problems at all and they're 25 seconds ahead of this point in the race but now on a different strategy the 31 car of now robin Frin frines at the wheel has the new tires and should start to erode that gap to ollie jarvis but frines only two and a bit seconds ahead of phil hansen in 22 the car that was the best lmp2 car in qualifying for United and nearly runs into the back of is that Satoshi Hoshino in the D station car? Yes. It is in uh, what I think will probably Close be button. his final stick, but again, we saw him run out wide there earlier in the race. Does so again, and the car just basically I mean, you saw how the car basically stops as the wheels spin up there on the dust. Uh, so that graphic again, 85 on the 30, laps. Yeah, it was on the 31 car. We've just seen them change tires. Oh, right, okay, yeah, all right, well, that's uh, a little out of date. <laughs> Well, the number nine Prema car still very much in the hunt here. Lorenzo Colombo apparently super glued to the seat, which gives Robert Kubica a chance to talk to Louise Beckett. Robert, the team have been doing a fantastic job so far. You're now going to get in the car. What can you do to make your way back up that field? Well, yeah, uh, until now, uh, actually, until the uh, red flag, it has been a very good race for, for us, uh, very smooth. Uh, we lost a lot of... Uh, with a red flag, uh, some cars came back into the battle. Uh, additionally, 
we are still a bit offset in strategy with different tyres and uh, unfortunately we lost a lot of time with Lorenzo in the beginning of his stint. Uh, stuck uh, behind Gonzalez, then he overtook him and I think he did mistake and uh, we went back behind uh, Gonzalez again and we lost uh, a lot of time there. It will not be an easy one, uh, but uh, yeah, we will try our best and uh, it's still a long way to go. Uh, what is the situation with your tyres? Is it the tyres or the traffic that has created you to drop back? No, it's just that we were having uh, over one minute gap over with, in front of some cars and uh, with red flag everything got uh, compacted and uh, we, we were, when the red flag appeared we were on very used tyres uh, so then we had to we had to stay in front of the other cars but of course with, uh, with the tyre strategy it just didn't turn out our way uh, but that's racing uh, we, will, we will have to make some ground uh, up and uh, it will not be easy because uh, there is at least three four cars uh, doing very very fast pace but we'll see but for Prema, for your first time into WEC this is a fantastic so far performance but it's still uh, two, over two hours to go so uh, you know uh, well, for sure, until the red flag, it has been uh, the race going our way. But uh, since red flag, we lost, uh, we lost, I think, uh, a chance of, of uh, finishing quite easy podium. Now we have to fight for it, and uh, we will we'll try our best. The guys are doing a very good job on pit stops. So, uh, as I say, it's still a long way. Le Mans uh, teach us that uh, nothing is over until last lap after the check and flag. So, yeah, we will try our best. Yeah, Le Mans does teach you that, so thank you. Yeah, there's, oh, and there's the Vector Sport car off the road, yeah. See, Robert Kubica. Right on cue, anything can happen still. Wise head Yeah, from Robert Kubica. He's been around, he knows. Had the heartache at Le Mans, of course. Yeah. Got, been there, got the T-shirt. Standing, watching as your car grinds to a halt, and that's... Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, and, 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 if and, anyone and, in that paddock could empathise that day, it was uh, me. I know, <laughs> and, and the guys were talking about the fact that the ACO guys were in the garage with them saying, OK, this is what happens, uh, the car will come in, you'll go down to there. No, because it was the last lap of the race, five minutes to go, you've got to pre-warn people what's going on, especially when it's, you know, not Audi have done it, done it ten times in a row or whatever, so... I mean, a first yeah. Team. He knows it's not over yet. So yeah. it's interesting to hear from him, though. He knew they were on. We, we called it very early on in this race, yeah. didn't we? We said that the Prema team looked brilliant. They had a strong driver lineup. Yeah. They were pushing United. It looked like it was going their way. And then I couldn't work out why it sort of fell away from it. It was around the red flag. Yeah. They were out of sync with their tyres. They lost that one minute gap to cars behind them. And then when it restarted, the cars behind them had new tyres, they've got old tyres and they keep and going they back to and pit. back. And, and, they had to pit. and they had to pit. And does that mean then that they have more fresh tyres left than the rivals are in front of them? I sort of thought that that was sort of what he was hinting towards. I think they have, yeah. yes, in a similar way to Ooh. Corvette versus Porsche. I think they have the better tyres compared to a lot of the other LMP2 teams around them towards the end but of this race. The problem being that a lot of damage has been done in terms of pure time in that battle. And whilst at the moment there's prospects on pace, they might get towards a podium, they're going to have some help, I think, if they look for a win. That's a long uh, Yeah, one in the pit stop. lane. Yeah, this is Richard Leeds. He will stay in. This is a double stint for him. And, and, and actually, as the temperature not so much starts to drop, but doesn't grow any higher, it, it becomes less difficult for the drivers, perhaps, to hang on for a second stint. Let's so say one final word on Robert. It just does strike me he's beginning to love this more. I mean, he, he, he enjoys his racing, he loves racing whatever he's in, but it does strike me that all of a sudden this is just chiming as something he can really get something out of. It takes a while after, yeah, absolutely. after losing that, and, that dream yeah. of Formula One, and, and it, it, it takes a while to adapt and, and accept as well. Yeah. Um, speaking from personal experience, it, it, it is a, a mind shift to come from that, that blinkered effect of Formula One where you, you're reaching for the stars, and then it all comes crashing down and you've got to find yourself again and i think robert now he's found his love for racing and found his category that he loves yep. and it's lmp2 it's sports cars and it's great to have drivers like that on the grid you just saw the captain roger penske on the pit wall that's something that i can't get enough of seeing in world endurance racing 
Uh, it's our first time with a full factory Penske team. I was about to point out, actually, a couple of minutes ago, this problem for the 91 Porsche, the left rear uh, gunman not getting the wheel nut undone. This is a really long stop, and this really opens the door wide for the Corvette team. We can see the sparks coming off there. Uh, that was battle. at least, what, 20 seconds? Yeah. I was counting him ahead, just said 25 seconds loss. Felipe Nasser for Penske just said he won the fastest yep. race laps of that car as he battles to hang on ahead of Will Stevens in the Jota car. Here's a 92 car on yeah. pit lane. It race was indeed speaker. 24 seconds lost with that, uh, that problem at the left rear against the most recent equivalent stop. And Christensen taking over from his teammate in the race leading 92. Fire ants! <laughs> or something. Uh, he was definitely not focused on the race, that fan. However, once he's got the ants out of his pants, he will be back with us. Jota's Ed Jones chasing Lorenzo Colombo. This is Jota's Will Stevens, though, chasing Felipe Nasser. Felipe Nasa, British F3 champion in his time. This should be a good fight. And uh, both ex Grand Prix drivers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, two top class teams. I'm not sure they've ever raced against each other before in anything, have they? Have Jota done Daytona? Uh, uh, John, uh, Jota and Penske. Yeah. Yes, they did. They did a Jackie Chan DC race. I'm trying to remember that whether or not we had the Penske accurate by then. No, okay. they didn't. They were late to the okay. party. There you go. However, any field that's got Penske entry, any field that's got Ganassi entry, any field that's got, you know, a Hendrick or a whatever, these are, these are in American motorsport, Goliaths in the same way that Williams, McLaren, Ferrari are yeah, for, for European single season races. You know, they are oh, they're one of the most successful, stellar yeah, teams. Successful teams of all time. I mean, whatever they turn their attention to, they usually end up dominating. Yeah. And, uh, and then you've got these two great drivers as well, Will Stevens watching on screen now, yeah. and Felipe Nasser. I uh, just, they're going to be fighting tooth and nail, and they're, I mean, the traffic is going to be the thing that determines who catches who, like, who catches each other out in this scenario. So little to choose between the two cars, so little to choose between the two drivers. And again, you know, for, for the Penske guys coming in here, nice to be able to measure themselves against names that they know, but but maybe not drivers that they actually personally know. Some of them will have raced against each other in junior categories or in different race tracks, maybe even been teammates in different cars before now. But, you know, you, you get, get to gauge yourself against a whole list of stellar names in this championship. And that's part of the attraction. You know, for Roger as well, you know, Le Mans is the big one. He always wanted to win Le Mans, he never did. And, and, you know, he would love to come back and do it. 88 with a bit of damage to the door there. And of course, that was uh, as a legacy of that little bl glancing blow from Jose Maria Lopez. Yeah, it's going to be a WeatherTech door on this car. Well, well, well. Look at this for a change of doors. You wish you could go to your local garage and get a door changed as quick as that. Well, if you had well, a you really need smile, your, you could, mate. You need your, uh, your mirrors, of course, in those cars. And, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, quite, it's dangerous to drive without them. Of course, WeatherTech Racing... Uh, both in the um, IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship uh, until last year and in the European Le Mans series have raced with WeatherTech branding, so there you go. Yeah. It was a late change for the livery on that car, so not necessarily a surprise that not every spare part has <laughs> been uh, re-liveried. Exactly so. It looks like Stevens has been a little bit luckier in the traffic that time around, navigating their way past the, uh, the Corvette. And now up behind the 33, Aston Martin, Felipe Nasser goes through on the inside. Will Stevens will follow him through. And squeezes by, no major dramas there for Felipe Nasser. Will Stevens stays locked on. He's, <laughs> he's got the homing radar attached, hasn't he? You were saying a little earlier about this dream of Formula One and how tough it is to readjust. Two men here in that battle both did more or less the same and uh sort of a long chat with will stevens good year last year with palace racing in europe uh, a first breakthrough win for them in lmp2 and a podium at the Le Mans 24 hours and a breakthrough year this year with the the, uh, the deal with 
uh, with Jotun and of course DPI with Wing Teller Racing. And all of a sudden it's coming right for him at a very interesting time for the sport. And again, that's a young man who's had his head turned, loves it, wants to do more of it, wants to be part of what's coming. And, you know, in a situation in his career where he's got the opportunity to just show the world what he's got. Yeah, Will is coming into that um, kind of golden age of, of, of a driver where you get the experience, but you're still definitely hungry enough and fast enough. Yeah, um, and it's, feisty it's enough. Definitely feisty enough. Um, he wants it. It's great that he's there uh, in that car crew with Gonzalez and, and Felix da Costa. And uh, this, like you say, Graham, this is opportunity with things to come. You know, this is a growing category. Hypercar, the running on board with one of the now Car 8 Toyota Gazoo Racing. That category is going to grow. That's where the top drivers in all of the LMP2s want to be in the future. And uh, it makes sense that we're seeing so many uh, cracking drivers in, in the P2 category. Um, this Toyota, by the way, lapping about two seconds quicker per lap than 708, the Glickenhaus that's in front of him on the road, not, is not, about to put a lap on the Glickenhaus. No, so it's, it's, it's not. Uh, it's, it's Glickenhaus has lost time, be, lost time to the Toyota because they're out of sequence. So in terms of the last complete stint, um, in fact, Oli Pilar was quicker than the eight. He's six laps in, therefore heavy on fuel, has lost time at this phase, but the Toto is a stop any time now. Yeah. So well, it's it's you know in traffic, you're right, the Glick announcer's lost out a little here. Rio Hirakawa has got his dander up here, but I'm not sure he's gonna get by the Glickenhaus before he has to pit. No, the previous lap the Glickenhaus lost two seconds. This lap he actually gained two tenths. So yes, that's very much the ebb and flow of traffic. So over the whole stint, which is what the the uh, strategy laptop shows us, looks like the Glickenhaus is still matching the Toyota for pace. Now of course you know, over the rolling uh, course of the season, all these race results, all the speeds of the cars will be taken into consideration. Um, for Toyota, it's very much easier to control the pace of one car than two, is all I'm saying. But Penske, right now, Felipe Nasser needs to make the moves in traffic. Will desperate. Stevens right behind him. He's definitely getting desperate. You can see when you start making moves like that on the inside of turn 13, you're throwing a bit of caution to the wind, and he's going to get a bit bulked here, I think, coming into turn 15. Yeah, this is going to close the gap right up between the two P2 cars, surely. Right behind Michelle yep. Gatting in the bright pink Iron Dames Ferrari. And here comes Will Stevens, he picks a up run. a double toe, and he will get a little side draft as well. Not going to have enough to come down the inside into sunset, so it's going to have to be into turn one. I'm sure he's going to be, be quite dark. close enough there either. Yeah, the, performance is too, the performance is yeah. too evenly matched between the two of them for them to overtake without the help of any traffic. Yeah. But you can see there how I could read it, um, you know, how yes. it was unfolding real time, yeah. because that's what you're thinking from inside the car. And, and that's why NASA was making those more desperate moves, like into turn 13. You're trying to block yourself and create a buffer between the GT car you've just overtaken and the car behind you. In a situation like that, with the information you're getting from the crew, and they're reading that from strategy and from timing, with what you're seeing, how far ahead are you actually physically planning? Uh, it's every car as it comes. Yeah. Yeah, and, and at that kind of moment, you don't get any help from the team. It, it, it's impossible, and you want a 100% focus on the task in hand. So, Traffic right here. Now, yeah, so they're looking, they know there's a car coming up, and you're probably going to meet that GT might even be on the exit of turn 13 on the run-up towards 14. There's a wing mirror on the track. Well, that is not the colour of the WeatherTech mirror, no. but that is a Porsche mirror. So which other Porsche's got a white mirror? So that here's Ryan back uh, on board inception. with a paint scale. He's not going to do him into 13. So, yeah, that I can see it unfolding. You know, the next opportunity is the run-up towards turn 14. Now, Will is thinking, do I get through as well? Not, Not yet. Doesn't. Do I then go around the outside? Look for the green joke. Does he go around the outside? Oh, no, the Ferrari's got it covered. So yeah. now you lose out. Last yeah. time round, you gained. This time, you lose out. The Ferrari knew where to place the car, defended slightly. That's what the GT drivers tend to do when they don't want to be overtaken. They can all read the situation. It's a high-speed game of chess going on. Well, listen, every GT driver knows that more GT cars retire after contact from an LMP2 car than from a GT car. So you've got to preserve your race car. You've got to preserve your race. 
Where the three now. They're chatting as they... The uh, there was a driver change in the eighth car. Seb Buemi took over from Rio Hirakawa. That car remains in second in hypercar and overall. And Massa, well, look at the way the gap has seesawed. Barely anything in pace. It is brakes in traffic, Anton. However frustrating they are, they will be frustrating for both drivers. So I think you can start to read it now that you, you, you can't orchestrate that. That just, it happens. It's an organic part of yeah. racing. In, in, going in, to full course yellow Ooh. for the mirror. Yeah, as for that door mirror. Now, it's not a factory Porsche mirror, it's a Glickenhaus mirror. So this is where a lot of time can be gained or lost for the drivers. You need to be right on that countdown Eight. on the full course yellow. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Full course yellow, full course yellow. We so are under full course yellow. I'm going to send a vehicle on track to collect the mirror, which is at T6. This will be a two-lap full course yellow, as promised during the drivers and team managers briefing. So, so NASA actually is pretty close to the end of his fuel stint here. Uh, is there an advantage? If there, well, they'll know on count back whether or not there's an advantage to be drawn here if he's on track in a position where he can take advantage. Well, like this, this car. If you yep. stop under a full course yellow, that's a win-win. Well, they are halfway through a fuel stint, so they've chosen to do it. So, And they were obviously right by Pitek. It's an LMP yep. mirror, isn't it? So that is uh, Ogier just stopping. Also in Ultimate Jean-Baptiste Lahaye, also in Ed Jones in the other Jota car that we were not watching into Europol are in Northwest AMR. David Pittard pits from the lead of GTE Am. Uh, so to, uh, the Vect Sport car is still in the garage. There are a slew. Ed Jones is in. NASA's in for Penske. He needed go. fuel anyway. Take it now. So that's a great shout. And again, you know, from Penske, decades, lifetimes of experience in that team. Absolutely, and there's another lesson for Jota Sports, uh, Sam Hignot. If you just make the, the mirrors a different color, it gets knocked off, we can't tell the difference. Yeah. Other than the fact it's the car without the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> so it is an LMP2 mirror. I'm sh I, I thought it was a Porsche one. Uh, having looked at the uh, door mirrors on the Porsche, so it's not. It looks like it's a P2. What P2 car has got white mirrors? Trying to, I, I'm, I'm only thinking that it's the Vector car. Maybe it is the Vector Sport car after that last grassy Maybe. off. Maybe I dislodged it slightly. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's definitely not a, it's well, not a Ferrari it's not mirror. A GT I'm sorry to, well, to look at, I'm obsessed yeah. by looking at Carl's mirrors now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> See, the things, the things I make you do yeah. <laughs> without you even realizing. And, it, and it's not an Alpine, no. Oh, hang on. Where's that Porsche's mirror? It's, it is the Inception it's car. I think it's it. Oh, yeah, it is. there we go. It's it's well done. Yeah, it Found the culprit. There you go. Yeah. He's, uh, See, I told you. So it's I'm quickly been, obsessed. It's, <laughs> it's, been, it's, 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 it's so fast. So fast. I don't it's know so what the car's called or who's driving it, but it's I can a, tell the mirror's gone. It's the 56 <laughs> Team Project One car missing its left hand mirror. Uh, that car at the moment, by the way, is lapping in the lead of uh, GTM with Ben Barnicoats. Uh, right under the rear wing uh, of the Porsche is the second place car, yes. David Pittard. And their limiters are not working at exactly the same speed because the Aston Martin was creeping under the back of the Porsche and yet they're both on the litters. You know when you're on the highway and the trucks are on their limit and yep. one is going quicker than the other by 0.001 miles an hour? Yes, Martin, we all know that feeling. Well, <laughs> that's what happens here. But the problem then is you have to keep trying to bring it off the limiter so you don't actually bump draft the guy in front and of you. And then one of the things that really, really used to frustrate me is that drivers that don't drive round the inside of the corners yeah. when, they're, when there aren't any marbles, of course. Yeah. Oh, that's an awkward pit stop there. Oh, that the wasn't United. bad. That wasn't bad. A little pushback for 23, but not bad. Still wasted time. It's valuable yeah. seconds ticking away. Driver change. By the way, as we're watching this driver change somewhere in Switzerland, and I hope you are looking in Mike Wainwright, Mike Wainwright is writing a note to say, that's my mirror. <laughs> that's, a, that's a replacement car, of course. Was that Josh think? Pearson taking over in 23? I think it... Oh, look, they had to hold the car, so 23 yeah, went to go. they both lost. Oh, sorry, 22 went to go. They both lost Definitely time. Definitely both lost out. Yeah. Double hit, double whammy. 77 back out into the running. That is the fourth place car. 
So is this the, yeah, okay. this is uh, Robin Fryens. Yep. So effectively, when they were all things corrected, he was around seven seconds, wasn't he, away from the United. Yeah. Then he, they had the tyre change, United didn't. That put them to 25 seconds behind. So then that pit stop uh, anomaly for United just then probably cost them five seconds. It's 20 seconds or so, isn't it? Yeah, so when it comes down, when they get going again and all things are corrected in terms of tyre strategies, could that five seconds from United just lost there in the pits yeah. really come into play? Tell about, those, as well tell about those, those speed limiters. Look at the gap. Yeah. He was literally right there. Someone's having a good time. Yeah, turn 10. Yes, absolutely. Someone doesn't care about full course yellows. I'm suspecting at the very least an adult <laughs> beverage has been taken this afternoon. <laughs> I, I'm saying hard seltzer time. Yeah. Yeah. Either that or there is definitely something in the coffee. Dancing to the music of life. Uh, Toyota Gazoo Racing, car number eight, lying in second place. Sebastian Wemi just taking over from Rio Hirakawa. Have we seen a stop from the Alpine? Uh, no. Toyota have made seven stops. Alpine, Alpine have not stopped under this stopped. full course. And don't yet. forget, one of Toyota's seven stops was the emergency uh, pit lane close five second it? fuel. There is the turn 10 grandstand, uh, Farago. There come, this is uh, Roman Dumas, the Porsche factory driver, hilariously mispronounced on numerous occasions here at Sebring. Yeah, work it out for yourselves. Don't expect us to paint everything in, in foot-high letters. <laughs> Olivier Platt vault, vaults, over, vaults, vaults over the wall. And uh, Roman Dumas is at the wheel of the clicking house. Yeah, so number nine car. Ah, and he comes out right behind on the road is the ultimate car of Jean-Baptiste Lahaye, who Nick. stopped the previous lap. Comes by Barnacote. There is going to be a door ready for this. Winner of the uh, Asian Le Mans series, yeah, Ben awesome. Barnacote. Where we're going, we don't need no frickin' mirrors. Uh, how are they going to have to change that, aren't they? Or they get the black and orange flag? Is it, is it mandatory? It's not a light panel. I don't know if it is mandatory. It might not be, but it should be, really, shouldn't it, in terms of safety? Well, I, I don't know. If you espouse Jacques Villeneuve's theory, he said it would be a lot harder for drivers to weave and chop people up in Formula 1 if they didn't have any mirrors because they wouldn't know where their rivals were. And I have to say, really hard to argue with that. I, I, Not sure it would have stopped Schumacher, but, you know, there you go. I'm very surprised that the RP hasn't stopped here. Well, it depends where they were and how long it takes to come round at 50 k's. Well, they've completed a lap. Oh, they're about to complete a lap. Aha, uh -huh. so are they coming in now? Might be a bit late. I suppose on the GT cars you do have uh, cameras, don't you, yep. as well? I forgot about that fact. So that maybe not as radar. reliant on, uh, on the actual mirrors as they would have been a few, uh, a few years ago. Louise brings us up to speed in. with the fact that 2013's WRC and WRC2 champions are both on track together. You've so been waiting for this. Sebastian Auger and Robert Kubica. And the Alpine has issued stopping in the pits. How many laps do they still have in their stint? Not many. That's the ironic, uh, the, the rather strange thing. It's only got four more laps on their stint, I reckon. Alpine needs fuel more than Toyota does. Toyota stopped. Yeah, uh, Toyota yes. stopped. And yet Toyota have stopped. No, they didn't. Sorry, they didn't, did they? Oh, no, they have. Yeah, sorry, is it? Car 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 yes. Webby, they have. Let's hear from Toyota, see what's going on there. Okay, Clickenhouse has boxed now. Clickenhouse has it. Yeah, let me know if it's going to be a big fight with them or not. Yeah, we will get rid of the splash at the end, so we'll just uh, we'll be able to do distance and one more stint. So uh, it should be okay. It is. They did a splash. They need a splash. Now that will be likely why Alpina staying out to it's save a splash. To save a splash. Yeah. Well, that was the message to Buemi saying we, we should be able to save the splash. Note, note that Buemi is not interested in what's happening with the Alpine. In front, yeah. Only about whether or not he's going to come under attack from Rick Lickenhaus. So they're not fighting yet. I mean, the Alpine is so far down the road, the advantage will be called under the red flag. Yeah. Well, that completely Ten, ruined nine, Toyota's race eight, today. Seven, six, five, four, 
three, two, one. Full course yellow removed. Thank you. The voice of Eduardo Freitas, our race director. We are back running under green with an hour and 42 minutes of the eight hours of Sebring, the thousand miles of Sebring, race one of the 2022 FIA World Endurance Championship. Martin Haven and Davidson and Graham Goodwin with thoughts. Uh, my latest thought was about the 22 United car, which stopped twice under that, uh, looks to be twice under the. Um Full course yellow as we've got the RP closing in to put a lap on the Glicken House. And that again, by the way, may have been part of their strategy in staying out. Yeah, well, the 22 United car has gone from being in contention to not in the top 10 almost. Well, it's down to eighth place in LMP2. It did a short stop, 48 seconds, which is fuel or something. But that wasn't the stop we saw them delayed in. There was another one after that. Well, that's only 12 seconds stationary. 32 seconds to come down pit lane. That's the pit lane delta. So that was a airy fairy wave of a of half a fuel can at something. That might is, be getting uh, rid of a splash later on by doing what they did. Well, the, but they, they'd only gained one lap. They only they only did another lap and came back in again. So it was only two laps of a full course yellow. So yeah, that Graham's on the phone to Lummers, who is uh, in her. Penultimate race. Final race. Final race. Yeah, oh. yeah Charlotte Lumley, the uh, long standing um, and excellent PR at United Autosports after nine years with the team, all the way through the uh, the GT and into the uh, the LMP years. And Charlotte will be leaving United Autosports with some regrets. Uh, but uh, I know she's got uh, a highly impressive berth to go to. That's B E R T H. Just yes, in case yeah, no. <laughs> partner starts to panic. The other yes, <laughs> there's, there's something I've been meaning to tell you. Uh, meanwhile, battle for second in GTE Pro. Richard Leeds now suddenly right on the heels of Tommy Milner. The 92 Porsche leads. Now, this is if you watch the beginning of the race, you got maybe an hour or two in and got dragged away by, I don't know, some trifling, piffling thing like work or dinner or, you know, kids or whatever, and have returned to us. Hang on a minute, what happened to Corvette? They were running away, Porsche were nowhere for. Ferrari were barely even in the same uh, day, never mind same race. Uh, well, uh, the red flag basically wiped out all of Corvette's hard-earned track advantage and their time advantage. They got jumped by the 92 car at the restart, courtesy of the Corvette being on old tyres and the Porsches both being on relatively newer tyres. The 91 car was not able to repeat that feat, and Ann Davidson, in an hour and nearly a half since the stoppage, has still not got by the Corvette. And we believe the Corvette has more new tyres than probably Michelin expected to bring to this race. I'm not sure, I think, I think, think apologies, not? no, I think, I think you're wrong there. Both the Porsches were ahead of the Corvette. What happened, if you remember, the 91 car had trouble with that, that the left rear in the last pit stop, that's dropped oh, that back behind back them. Yeah. down behind. So, so do we still think the Corvette is, do we know, that, do we think Corvette know how many, oh, hello, it's raining. It's raining a few miles away from the track. That is rain. Where clouds go from being horizontal to vertical, that's rain, and that is not far away. Now, uh, let's take a look at which way the flags are blowing. Where is the wind blowing? The wind is blowing across the straight from drivers left to right, which means that shower should pass. However, not, as George Harrison says, all things must pass, necessarily so. We were forecast a potential for rain towards the closing stages of the race. That could liven things up a little bit. And of all the drivers in this GTE Pro field, Nick Tandy and Tommy Milner will know this track in the wet perhaps better than any other. And they're racing yeah. the Corvette for those who, yeah. uh, who are new to the to the Corvette lineup this season, like everybody else. Could be a, a carbon copy of what happened uh, a few years ago. Well, last time at Weck were. We're racing on this very circuit. Yeah, rain at the end. Yeah. And you're trying to hang it on in, with the slick tyres. Hang out there without uh, changing to the wets, but uh, it got very, very sketchy on this concrete, or one third of this racetrack being concrete surface. Yeah. It is like ice when it rains around this track. Let's hear from Louise Beckett down in the pit lane. Uh, news 
notice from GTM is that the leading 98 Aston Martin doesn't have any radio. And of course, the difficulty here, they can't even put a board out to communicate with the driver. So pittard has been given lots of instructions on if this happens, that happens. And we've already had one full course yellow during his drive. So be interesting to see how he progresses. Thank you, Lou. Well, that's really dramatic because the full course yellow, he won't hear Eduardo count. He might hear Eduardo counting down, but he won't hear his team repeating it. He might not hear Eduardo counting down. And so suddenly, he'll suddenly he'll see FCY bounce up on his Oh, my giddy yep. aunt. Yes, uh, Nick Tandy. Um, that rain looks like it's coming. Does look like it's coming. Uh, th th we saw this earlier uh, earlier this weekend with the number 88 car with Julian Antlauer. No... Um, radio there and crossed the finish line three times yeah. in the session uh, because there's other they eventually had to throw the red flag because that was the only way they could put a flag out all the way around the circuit yeah i don't know what's going on uh, tire strategy wise between these two cars but i would say that every time i've seen nick tandy behind the wheel of that uh, that corvette he's been making headway milner just seems like he's a little bit under attack Hey, Tommy, just to give you a heads up on the strategy here. We're uh, looking to double these tires. Uh, at 91, we'll be able to overcut us. Uh, so they could, get a, they could get a two lap overcut. So we think just not changing tires is probably gonna be our best uh, way to hold the gap. So they are on different tire strategies. Um, do they go, do they try and keep the 91 behind them and go to prolong this double stint on this set of tires, but they're worried that the 91 will overcut them well, by staying the out there yeah. when they pit, when the Corvette pits. They'll be, they've got the, seems like the fresher rubber at the moment by that radio message. I, and it would make sense in that the 91's attacking Milner quite heavily. It looks like they're the ones that got the speed at the moment. Did the engineer actually, did he get his terminology wrong and meant, he, he meant to say undercut rather than overcut? Because that would make more sense if the 91 did come in. Because they were saying, look, all we could, the only way to really combat this is to bring the car in when they oh. come in so we protect our position. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I think he got the, I think he meant undercut. Yeah, I think that's I th yeah. possibly right. Instead of, yeah, instead of doing the double stint and prolonging the tyres, it meant that the 91 would come in <laughs> get a, a fresher set on, if that's their plan, and then it would work out in a way that he undercuts them by driving quicker on a, on a free, with free air, yeah. on a fresher set of tyres, yeah. and when you both do your fuel stops, that would hand him the lead. So they might just want to cover off exactly what 91 are doing, exactly. to keep them bottled up, even on fresher exactly. tyres. Okay, so there will be no rain in the next 30 minutes, no rain in the next 30 minutes. I immediately anticipate Louise Beckett coming on the blower and saying, uh, spot some rain in the pit lane. However, we will wait and see. We'll wait and see how accurate Meteo France can be uh, a long way from home. Uh, we saw the weather radar earlier, uh, right at the beginning of the race, pre-race, in fact, and there were a few little showery clouds out to our west, but quite a distance out to our west and not moving in our direction. Keep the pressure on, mate. Pressure on. Yeah. Because he wasn't going to do that anyway. Yeah, he yeah, was yeah. going to let him <laughs> wander off into the distance. The Porsche engineers are really good at encouraging their drivers. And we hear it so often when the driver's getting frustrated. You're doing a great job, Michael. You're doing a great job. Save the fuel, save the tyres. You're doing exactly what we need. This is absolutely perfect. You know, because it can be dispiriting when you're having to drive to preserve tyre life and you can just see the car in front creeping away. In that moment, yes, yeah. I agree. But in yeah. this moment where you're the attacker and you see the prey in front, I tell you what, that yellow car in front of him is all the motivation he needs. He doesn't need an engineer telling him to step things up. He has got Michael Caine sitting alongside him going, come on, we can't be going around here all night. <laughs> it's, uh, they're about to come to lap the 52 wow. uh, GT Pro Ferrari here. And remember, this is after we've had a red flag. And don't forget, this is the, uh, yeah, it's coming back up the order, but the much delayed 52 car. Uh, checking wet weather tyres at Iron Links. And by the way, that is the young lady that I thought was Iron Dames uh, 
technician, actually with the Iron Link side on the on the uh, yellow Ferrari side. Yeah, the Iron Dames have got a, a couple. In fact, Porsche, the 91 and 92 Porsche team, have got a couple of female engineers yeah, working on the cars as well. And not not data engineers, but actually spannering the cars, putting together as well. Proper proper uh, race car mechanics. You might be wondering why has car number 23 just wedged itself in between the two GT cars? It's because there's only a seven-second gap wow. between himself and the car behind. Yeah, 35 seconds to Corvette. They are battling with 91. Next 25 minutes, no rain, then chance after. Yeah, so Paul Diresta really fighting on because he knows that he's got strong competition from Robin Frines behind. Now the gap is 6.8 seconds down from seven. Yeah, uh, just uh, popping up on Twitter. Uh, something from the FIWC. Look, if we've got a fun engagement here, let's keep pushing. You enjoying the race so far? They say with two hours to go. First reply: Kamui Kobayashi. No for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a no from me. <laughs> yeah. And there will be consequences now that I'm the boss. Uh, uh, a uh, <laughs> regulation, st <laughs> regulation stop there from uh, yep. Mathieu Vazivier. He's removing the, the coffee team. and biscuits from the boardroom right now. <laughs> it's a no from me. <laughs> well, do you know this? This is my absolute benchmark of when somebody really speaks a foreign language. It's when they can make convincing jokes in a foreign language, oh, and absolutely on the money. Absolutely on the money. Uh, let's hear from Louise Beckett. Can you make convincing jokes in a foreign language, Louise Beckett? I, was ju I can't hear you, I'm afraid, but um, I was just talking to some of the drivers about if it's going to rain in their final st stint, and Antonio Felix de Costa is going to get back in the car, and he said, I really hope it does rain. And I thought you me a big favour. Yeah, but he's a certified lunatic, so there is always that. Thank you, Louise Beckett. Yeah, I can't hear your stupid question, Martin. She says very I convenient. Can't very conveniently. Alpine continue to lead from Toyota and Glickenhaus. Behind United Autosports 23, 31 from WRT. And in third place in LMP2, the number 41 machine, which is real team also run by WRT. So WRT having a not so shoddy race of it so far. Prema, the number nine car, that's their car in fifth place. Then the 28 car, the better of the two Jota cars ahead of the 38 sister car. And rounding out the top 10, Penske's number five. Well, is this gonna be a race win for Alpine overall? That would be a famous result, wouldn't it? It'd be a famous result too for Glickenhaus. They have appeared on a WC podium, but they've not finished third because they finished fourth in Monza behind a P2 car. So uh -huh. it would be their first overall podium finish here, and that would be one heck of a result. What uh, a place to do it at. Absolutely. Well, home soil. We've seen plenty of wins from a 22 United Auto Sports car in WEC. Have we seen from 23? Ooh, that's good. No, that's another one. Um, well, they've won in the European Le Mans series, uh, but I'm not lots. sure if they have... Let's see what Porsche have to say. There's an awful lot of thinking going on in GTE Pro. Uh, the moment we have one full set left, I would say we will probably change the left side. So you can work with the left side. We want to run along in this stint, chance of rain later. <laughs> Now, so one interesting. full set left. It doesn't mean yeah. you have to use four tyres in one go. You can use two pairs. It's just the total number of tyres that you use. But it's interesting that they want to hang on to that, that track advantage yes. and sacrifice a little bit of speed potential from putting a brand new set, all four wheels on the car. They're going for the left-hand side once again. Well, what might happen if rain arrives in the last hour? Well, you need a buffer. You, know, you, you can't be the one to be taking the majority of the risk if it starts to rain. Correct. It, it, so you have to have, that, I think that's what they're calculating for, is yeah. the fact if it does rain, we want to have a healthy lead, thank you very much. We plus, don't want to throw that away now in the dry. By plus the other the thing is, even if your car stays on the island in a, in a deluge, there's no guarantee that everybody's does. There's no guarantee that we might not get a red flag. So if you're in front and the race is stopped, you're in front. If you're behind and the race is stopped, you don't get back in front. So there's all of that as well. Louise Beckett from the pit lane. 
Can I just remind you, the last time we were here, it was the final hour and the rain came down then as well. It's a carbon copy. Maybe, maybe. One thing you can rely on Louise is to remind you of the time she got wet in the pit lane. But she's absolutely right, it could happen again. 98 AMR Aston Martin, the Northwest AMR car leading and has, le I don't know how many of the 170 laps it has led, but it will be well over 100 and probably more like 150. 56 Porsche in second place, and that is a really good run for the Team Project One car. That is the Inception Racing car. There's Antonio Felix da Costa. That apparently is a Portuguese rain dance just lying back and waking, waiting for it all to come to you. Never far from his mobile phone is uh, <laughs> Antonio Felix da Costa. That or from his cool Straight zone. to the pocket, yeah. God, they, he probably drives with the damn thing as well. They wouldn't be, wouldn't be the it, only <laughs> one. Tom Coronel definitely does. We've seen him uh, have the phone out and, and be doing live social media during red flags. Well, the Storks are off to nest for the evening. They know the weather is on the change. They don't want to get caught out away from their nesting grounds. I often confuse them with butter, but it's a completely different era. <laughs> and I can't believe. <laughs> um, David Pittard, just uh, in the lead of the race, just put in the fastest lap of that car's race. Just look at the kind of lap times of seeing a GTM to report again the number 91 Porsche. Matteo Caroli quickest in that class with a 159.1. It was 159.5 for Pittard. Florian Latore has been slightly quicker. Julian Andlauer, factory driver. Seb Prio is the third quickest man in uh, GTEM uh, at the moment. Have we yet seen, just looking up and down that, yeah, Harry Tinknell's now aboard that car, but uh, that's one hell of a combination, isn't it, that Multimatic are going to put their shoulders to the, uh, the load there with uh, Christian Reed, Harry Tinknell and Seb Prio. Yeah, Prio, Tinknell, you know, as a combination, I don't know, would ever, anybody ever put them together? <laughs> well, you know, apart from Larry Holt, obviously, father and son, so... For, for Harry, if and when he becomes a dad, you know, 20 years from now, there might be a birth for his son as well. There you go. With, with, uh, with the third generation of Prios. Okay, what kind of an internal kind of relay race. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, Christ, Christian Reed will still be driving it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. So, Michael Christian leads Tommy Milner and Richard Leeds, Alessandro Pierre Guidi and Miguel Molly. Now, well, Alessandro Pierre Guidi and James Collado, the reigning world champions, are just going to take whatever they can out of this. Whatever a little is given to them and uh, Corvette racing they did look before the red flag as though they pretty much had this race under control the red flag took away their advantage the question is how come they can't wrestle it back they were able to match Porsche in terms of performance on new tires on used tires now they're not and I, I don't really know where 92 has found a bit more than they had before as I say, I, I think it might have been when Nick Tandy was in the car, he, it just looked like he was making more headway. He was the he's, one. He's I, I think he's been the faster of the two drivers uh, he's today. By, by far, in terms of the fastest lap. And I yeah. think that the 92 Porsche have had more even spread between the two drivers' performance. Yeah. Well, if, if you look at just, just the uh, fastest laps, we'll get into in just a uh, little wee moment. So GT Pro, fastest lap of the race, has gone to Nick Tandy, you're quite right, 157.734, and uh, then Kevin Est with 157.9. Looking at their two teammates, uh, it is Michael Christensen is a 158.3, so that's seven tenths per second slower than Tandy, and what is that, four tenths slower than Kevin Estra. And looking at Tommy Milner, it's a further one and a half tenths down the road. So it's it's... I guess it's it's about the same mix, but with different extremes. Yeah, I mean, look, the red flag didn't go their way. No, it and didn't. I, I can't help but feeling this race today, I, I do feel like it affected the race, uh, that red flag. Uh, yeah, very much uh, so. It didn't, it didn't benefit uh, the viewing, you know. It, 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 it went against the competition that we... That it was boiling up, really, wasn't it? It was looking like a, a great fight. We had the Toyota versus the Alpine, how it was going to unfold at the end. We didn't know. It looked like it was going to be close. The Corvette was just in front of the Porsche. And I, I, I just can't help but feeling like the red flag 
diluted a lot of the racing oh, today. It, it certainly, in terms of the battles we, we could see beginning to develop, develop, but it's given us some other battles back without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, we had some remarkably fast lappery, 56, uh, as we said, ah, will need to repair. What it, what it does do is give them the opportunity to actually prepare that door for the next stop. Hour and 20 minutes remaining in the season opener, season 10 of the FI World Endurance Championship. The eight hours of Sebring, Alpine leading overall, Glickenhaus in third place and in the hypercar class. Let's hear from the team. Stint and a half on these tyres. Lordy, lordy, well, that's going to take them pretty much to the end of the race. Not far off it. If anyone's praying for rain, it's him. Absolutely. You can and change those tyres, there's some wet. And a pit stop under investigation as well for Glickenhaus, so it's not coming unravelled, but it's not great news for them. They are comfortably in third position at the moment. And it's all those things, Graham, that you need to iron out, all those problems, like I was saying before, you need nothing to go wrong for yep. you in an endurance race. And we're seeing just, you know, the, the infringement from Ryan Briscoe, the overtake after the restart, when we had the red flag before the, before the line. And that was a big one. Um, obviously, we've got another one, pit stop under investigation. It's just all those small things add up. Yeah, and, that uh, could be another stop and go. Yeah, and, and you're looking there, fight today. looking there at the 23 United Autosport car that leads LMP2, Paul DeResta. He is a lap behind. What are we seeing here with the pit stop? Here's the driver change. Roman Dumas taking over from Olivier Pla. Driver helper, that's perfectly fine. Ah, 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 ah. Oh, there we go. Wheelman was over there while the fuel hose was still on, and that is absolutely verboten. And there you go, that's what it is. And so it will be a, a drive through or a stop and go drive through, I drive suspect. Through, yeah. 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 These things just shouldn't be happening. No. Nope. In a world championship level. And again, you know, that that's. A, a little bit an indication of the fact that the team are not quite as well rehearsed with their pit stops as maybe some of the others. Um, so uh, that's and unfortunate. You, but you, you can know. see, can't you, on the faces that there's no denying it. Yeah. There's no denying it that that's what's happened. I think he was putting his hand up. It was me. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. It was me. I'm really sorry. Uh, but it's this. This race hasn't lacked for speed and competition. I'm just taking a look as we're watching the inter Europol car come cruising down pit lane just who's been pacey and there's one big surprise here which is the fastest man both in a pure lap time and on his best 10 laps average in lmp2 alessio rivera uh, is uh, 150.870 and has been quicker in pure terms than both ryan uh, uh, than both rio Hurakawa and brendan hartley today uh, to this point in the race and across the the best 10 laps quicker than uh, Ryan Briscoe as well. Uh, well, that Air Force shoot. car, I mean, it had the speed. Didn't yes, it, it did. It qualified in pole position and split the hypercars in the process uh, yesterday in qualifying. And, you know, it's, it's no surprise to see them setting fast lap times in the race, but it just hasn't gone their way today and with their lowest grade driver as well. Antonio Felix da Costa suiting up and ready to go. And with 78 minutes on the clock, looks like he might be uh, ready to take the car through to the end of the race for Jota. But does look a little bit like the end of the race for Inter Europol. Esteban Gutierrez brought the car in. I thought it was going slowly, even maybe for being in the pit lane. But it is now up on the dollies and on its way. Leading in GTEM, the 98 Northwest AMR, GT Pro, the 92 Porsche. The uh, Aston Martins still the dominant force in the AMP class, but Porsche with one hand on the winner's trophy here in the GT Pro class, ahead of the Corvette that looked like it might win on its full World Championship debut. Might yet do. The race has got just over an hour and a quarter to run, and there could be all sorts of dramas yet to come. One hour, 17 minutes and 45 seconds, 44, 43, but you know, you get the point. Uh, here is our GTE Pro leader, the 92 Porsche, 
in GTEM. Little moment here for the Iron Lynx Ferrari. No major damage. Let's catch up with the Toyota team boss, player manager Kamui Kobayashi. for the number seven obviously but for you now in your new role the job doesn't end there so tell us about your new role well be in front of tv <laughs> do you want to be a presenter you can do that too if you want maybe, yeah maybe yeah but you know uh, to be honest uh, to driving and to do team principal is actually a lot of job but still you know i have quite experience in this team I've been the TGRE for a while since from Formula One time, so I know the guys well. So I think, uh, you know, my new role actually is quite tough, but uh, I enjoy the sense because now it's a competition in the beginning, and this competition is going to be it's the biggest challenging for us. So to success, I think uh, it would be nice to use knowledge as uh, the Mr. Toyota Kiyosan say that uh, uh, the more uh, we had to connect to driver from the engineering, and we had to, to make the car, develop the car, as more the request as a driver. So I, I think as driver request, and we had to make the, the car easier drive. I think this is key for our new roles. So now it's time is changing, but obviously I think this is my new role. And for the Toyotas, it's been a tough Sebring first rate round of the WEC. Yeah, it is, it is, but obviously I think this is how it is. I mean, when BOP came into the rules, we knew that we can win every race. So I think just we prepare any situation, any country, we push hard. Uh, you know, I think still we finish in the podium, which is good. I mean, we were very tough in the prologue, but now we, we recover a little bit of pace. Still not enough, but I think this is how it is. And at the end of the day, I think we are doing a great job, apart from our car, but uh, I think uh, this is how it is in the season. But, uh, you know, I think uh, it's going to be tough. Many times it's going to be happen. I mean, like this. So we try to work hard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it's a tough job, you know, mixing being the, the overall team supremo and guiding the team and, and trying to motivate and inspire and, the, you know, to be the, the Wolfgang Ulrich, to be the Roger Penske, to be the, the, the Danny Binks or, or whatever. And also then to take yourself out of that and separate all of that and still be 100% the race driver that you were last season. That's, that's a really, really difficult job. And David said, I've, not necessarily one I think many drivers would fancy doing. Well, I was going to ask him, I mean, you've, been, you've worked with him, I mean, did you think he was marked down for greater things on an administrative scale? when you first met him? Well, is, it, is it greater things? I don't that's, know. I mean, that's the most loaded question yes. you'll hear all day. <laughs> driving a, a world endurance top line race car is, uh, you know, that, that, that's oh, yeah. surely right up there as greatest things you can do in your life. But um, I was surprised to say the least when i heard the news that he became team principal and still carried on as a, as a driver himself as well i think when the visor goes down which it does in a, in a sports car for kamui kobayashi not being able the drivers do it physically put the visor down but he tends to he becomes a racing driver and that's his passion that's what he's ever known his whole life pretty much so i think that job of still driving is is second nature to him as he said, you know, it's very tough being a team principal, but I mean, I just don't know how that dynamic works between the driver crews now. And, you know, it's bad enough making a mistake like Jose Lopez did today, let alone when the teammate you share the car with is your boss as well. Yeah. I mean, that is, talk about pressure. Yeah. And a, and a, and a mixed scenario. Yeah, this, it's very odd for all the drivers in that team. In Great view there of the of the battle for second place yeah. in GTE AM. And this is AM versus Real Pro. World champion Marco Sorensen in the turquoise Aston Martin. World champion, can't Marco get, World Sorensen. champion, I said. Can't get by Brendan Areep, the gentleman driver here in the Team Project One car. Oh, has to throw it on the inside. Boy, oh boy, he really really didn't give Areeb any breathing space there at all. 
And right behind now I mean, take them, is... Uh, I mean, take those, that's the Iron Dame's yeah. a lap down. Yeah, that's a lap down. But look a little further back, and you'll see there... Just the uh, centre lights behind the pink car. That's Harry Tinknell for position. Doesn't and that's a podium position. Doesn't the number 56 car have to come in to repair that yes, it door does. anyway? It has to repair but it at the next stop, right, so they will lose time. So Sorensen dives down the inside. It was a late call. I don't know if was he was he pushed off. I didn't know if they made contact or not, but definitely a late move. Yeah, another well, note on the notepad from Mike Wayne right there. Sorensen, by the way, had all of the racing line and left nothing for Brendan Arib. He was not taking prisoners. Yeah, that's welcome to the World Endurance Championship, Brendan. Yeah, now get out of the way. By the way, that car, of course, the 33 car, looking at the, the spare panels there and the team at TF Sport, that was the car that qualified not just slenderly, not just narrowly, by 1.3 seconds on pole position. That's the car that led early on. They still want to win this race, and they still think they can. They still the race very far. Don't you think it's going to rain? Yeah, yeah, there is risk, there is risk. Yep, there is rain, there is rain. Uh, Louise Beckett from the pit lane. I don't know if you're up to date on Euro Interpol, the 34. Uh, they have actually gone back to the garage. They've got a clutch issue, so it's just not been their day at all. No, it really hasn't. We saw the car being uh, put up on dollies and wheeled away, so thank you for that update. No, that's... Uh, a tough break for them. Alex Brundle, of course, was due to be driving, tested positive a few days ago, so he didn't get to drive, and the team are not going to complete the race either. Still rain in the air, and Ant, yeah, it's buckle like, up, baby. Well, yeah, a bit of weather chat going on between Buemi and, uh, and his team. Seems, uh, you know, they're, they're clutching at straws, I think, for, for something to come their way from this race today. Let's hear a bit more on into your poll from Louise. Well, just as I was saying that to you, the, they have now decided that they are out of the race. They have retired. That's it for them. David Chang in the pit lane has just announced that uh, DCR will return. Jackie Chan, David Chang Racing will return to the tracks. And uh, that will be in the Inter WeatherTech Sports Car Series, LMP, Graham Goodwin. It will be uh, in LMP2 for next season. Sad news there for the racing bakers. 34 car into Europol. Yeah. What a weekend to forget. Well, not a I weekend know. technically, but a, yeah. a week of racing to forget for them. Keep your eyes with what you've got safety oh. car. Now, what's that all about? Wow. That came out of the blue. Pit entry is closed. What is that about? Uh, well, that will be debris. I do not know safety who's gone car? off. We're not showing anybody stopped. It's got to be a crash somewhere, surely, no? Unless there is car. absolutely to slow down. Rain. Let's hear from the 64 Corvette. Radio check. Copy. Guy up. Yeah, it's like my radio plug. Rattle, please, sometime. Definitely check the radar. This is definitely raining. Now by 17. Raining. Copy. It's raining. Stand by Louise Beckett to get very wet. If if it so was throwing incident? a safety car for rain, it must be absolutely biblical at turn 17. Oh. Louise, uh, you are in our pit lane. You're on the back straight, back stretch, front stretch. You know, they're only separated by the paddock. Are you dry? Is it raining there also? It's completely dry here. I mean, it's a bit dark overhead, but no, completely dry. Nothing at all going on. Well, if you look to your right down to the end of the, the pit lane towards sunset, towards the sunset, you can clearly see lots of rain red and flag. a red flag. I think that. Uh, the I'm race is being been stopped a, again. I'm and worried there might have been a crash somewhere. I think there is something more than we are seeing. Now, there's nothing on the radar that there is, is immediately red flag material. There is one other possibility. Car 23 we stopped on the, on the track map that we've got up on our screen. No. Uh, the only other possibility is we might have a real weather warning for electrical storm or worse. Yeah. That is the only other possibility. If they can see the wind is getting up, See the yeah, it is definitely blustery. I mean, there's that no, is a cloud burst. That's a shadow tornadoes, but that is that is definitely survivable. No, we we did have red flag during the prologue for lightning. Yeah, 
And remember, there's a lot of people in open campgrounds here, and there may well be instructions for people to head for cover. If there's serious weather coming in, that could be that. And when I say we had uh, a biblical rainstorm in the... Um, and these guys are going to get pretty wet, if that's the case, uh, during the prologue, I mean it. It was absolutely torrential. Yeah, I think it's lightning. And there's a lot of electrical kit out there. There's a lot of people out in the open. And, yeah, I'm sure that'll be it. I, I tend to agree, and, and you know, that happens, no, it doesn't happen infrequently here, but it, it uh, certainly in Daytona as well, you ha you see that. So, I mean, there's there's nothing that our cameras have picked up, there's nothing we're hearing from the TV Ma truck. So. Martin, Martin, I will add, by the way, because I've just remembered it, that we did have in the weather warning for the prologue uh, a specific mention of a potential isolated tornado here. Okay. Very specifically. Didn't happen. But it was extreme weather. For uh, information, in the pit lane, this red flag is not because of an accident. It's due to the law. We have a thunderstorm which is approaching the circuit. We need to bring the marshals into protection. That's why we have this red flag. Well, there you go. It's something wow. we do not often have in European racing, do not often have anywhere else in the world, but, uh, and I said, what are we saying? That, was, that is not an FIA regulation, it's not an IMSA it's regulation, statute. it is a local statute, it is a Florida statute. So, bring everybody in, get them undercover, do not touch anything metallic. Hello, let go of your easy up. No, genuinely. Uh, so, well, an hour and five minutes, and the clock continues running. So we will wait and see what the weather gods bring us. The red flag is due to lightning uh, in the area. So by law, we have to red flag. So park in line, stay off the radio, and I'll take you. Check over, should I switch off the engine? Kill the engine, keep the main off, I'll speak to you. And then the click in the house is meandering off of its own volition. And they're just closing up to where they're expecting yeah. the restart to be. Correct. Well, this is going to make life very interesting, isn't it? I've never seen this before. Uh, is, is David Addison commentating elsewhere <laughs> at the circuit and just <laughs> leaving me with endless hours to fill? Because uh, this is uh, this is very, very well, deja vu. It's not endless, is it? Because it's the time carries on ticking under the red flag, so... Yeah, but we, we're still talking and cars aren't moving. There's <laughs> Michelle Gatting standing there, hands on hips, going, what the Dickens is going on here? So it looks like, yeah, it's coming up from turn 17. The well, we're seeing rain. Us. What we're not seeing is any electrical... Uh, do hickory. Jack Carfax, Jack Carfax is a killer suit to yellow, doesn't he? But mind you, it's not the first time he's raced yellow and black cars. No, maybe it? that's why you think he suits it. No, but, but it does. It brings out the, the uh, mahogany in his, in his skin. <laughs> Rahel Frey there, a little uh, illustrious teammate chat. Yeah, of course, raced in black and yellow for Jordan Grand Prix. That's a while ago now, isn't it? Once upon a time when Jordan Grand Prix was there, was Jordan Grand Prix. Roman mm -hmm. Dumas, been there, done that, seen it all. His loft must be full of the t-shirts that he's bought. <laughs> but you can see there is a pretty dark sky. There. Lots of blue on the left-hand side of the horizon. It's really where this little isolated shower pocket is ahead that will be uh, electrical epicenter but again you know when you get a weather warning like that um, you know there are local statutes and, and that is why uh, the cars have been stopped so yeah. one hour three minutes remaining yeah. I, mean, I don't know if the thunderstorm is going to come and go in that time uh, well, we've got to see it hit because that is, uh, that's pretty dramatic, isn't it? There's going to be some astonishing photographs taken this evening uh, before they all head for cover. And uh, remind of you guys that uh, one of my colleagues, my photographic colleagues, on uh, the uh, first day of the prologue spent uh, 40 minutes in a port -a So uh, uh, the, only, the only possible... Because of the weather. Yeah. Um, we're just pointing this out. Not the only thing you can say with this weather coming and, and potentially the race ending like this is that if it just ran normally through to the end without any further safety cars or any other drama happening 
like we saw earlier on in the race, I do think it would have ended like in the results that were on screen Not at the moment. Miles I think away it would have from ended it. like mm. there. Mm. I think the Alpine would have won. Yep. They deserved it today. They had the fastest car. No, oh, there's the unhappiest man. That's in the, place. the unhappiest. <laughs> Phone back out, surely. Yeah, prayed for weather, got it. Uh, but we're not allowed to race in it. Do selfies taken in the moody background of the rain coming down and lightning. You mentioned her before, that is Michaela from the yeah. anti Europol team and very zen here. So no, it's a shame it's a shame for the drivers. It is of course a know? shame for the drivers. You know, you want to race. You um, want yeah. to race. Let's talk about Alessia Rivera since we were looking there at the AF Corsa car. Uh, how many prototype races has he done? Uh, I think this I've double checked. Right? Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm thinking it's a big fat zero. A GT racer, uh, uh, Alessio Rivera, basically. Is well, we what talked we're about Nick Nielsen, didn't we? Nick Nielsen's done a princely total before today of zero. Yeah. Uh, there are one. some new stars arriving on this horizon. Oh, they're very Oh, it's great. Rapidly, it's it's great. I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know, con consistently, you and I, over the last few years, Anthony, this weekend, you know, when you've got talent like and there's Brendan Reeb. Brendan Reeb going, you didn't give me much. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, um, I'd, 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 I, knew, I knew you had it. I knew you had it. I, I, I didn't think I'd run as wide as that. <laughs> but Sorry, Sorry, so oh, thanks for giving me room. Hey, he was, was really looking kind a of little room. bashful there, wasn't he? He was just looking a little. Uh, and Marco's just, you know, just lovely. And, and there's not a bad bone in his body, but, you know, you, you put a, a bad dame behind the wheel. Brackets until he's in a race car. Yeah, well, brackets. there you go, yeah. No, there's no malice. He just didn't even think that anybody else needed the space that he was taking. Uh, Harry Tignall there looked like he'd been in a bit of a war, didn't he? Did Harry looked like it had been a warm afternoon. Uh, the answer, by the way, to your question about Alessio Rivera is the full total of the number of LMP uh, races he's done is zero. Yeah, I, d I did think that. And, I, and I, he was I, the I fastest man on track against the talent pool we've got here. Yeah. That's astonishing. Yeah, that's 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 uh, that's the arrival of, of some new talent. For information in the pit lane, this red flag is not because of an accident. It's due to the law. We have a thunderstorm which is approaching the circuit. We need to bring the marshals into protection. That's why we have this red flag. And to give you an idea of just how bad it could get, uh, we well, we'll we'll do that just in a short yeah. short while. Well, an hour to go in the eight hours of Sebring here, the season opener for season 10 of the FIA World Endurance Championship. And the cars for a second time in this race are at a standstill because this time not of a big accident as it was in the first occasion uh, for Toyota's Jose Maria Lopez, but because of a weather warning. Well, it was a beautiful, cloudless sky at lunchtime when we were ready to get underway in Season 10 of the FIA World Endurance Championship. Back to Super Sebring, back to where it all began, because here in 2012, in a joint race with the IMSA WeatherTech Series, the World Endurance Championship was launched. Last time the cars were here was 2019. Jackie Ickes waved them away from the grid. Old Glory waved at the start of the race with the Alpine from pole ahead of the Glickenhaus but Buffalo Girls around the outside, Felipe Albuquerque in the LMT2, LMP2 pole sitting. Uh, United Auto Sport car first going by the Toyota and then the Glickenhaus to run in second place to make it a blue car 1-2 as the Alpine checked out. Alpine strategy to run very fast and stop more frequently. They didn't have much option in that. In GTE Pro, Porsche qualified 1-2 ahead of Corvette. Ferrari looked off the pace in qualifying. That didn't really change in the race. But the Aston Martins were the strong cars at the head of the GTE Pro field, battling as they ran 1-2-3. Northwest AMR's Paul Dallalana getting the better of Pulsar to Ben Keating. 
15 second hold in the pits for the two factory Porsches for building too big a gap behind the prototype field at the start. Let the Corvette back in front. United Autosports dominating the early running in LMP2, 22 and 23 swapping around. And then the first major drama, Jose Maria Lopez not judging his way around Julian Andlauer's Porsche, clattering the barriers, and then on his way back to the pit lane, the nose dropping under the car, and he went off at speed into the turn 15 barriers. Red flag flew, the race was over for the seven car, and Jose Maria Lopez okay, but will he be okay to race in tomorrow's Sebring 12 hours, as he had hoped? Back underway after a 30-minute delay. Toyota had to make two stops. One, because they were running out of fuel while the pit lane was closed. They dropped out of the lead battle. Porsche taking the battle at the restart to Corvette and getting in front. But the 91 car with a 20-second delay in the pits as the rear wheel failed to come off. Corvettes that had been the early leader looked as though they were going to be stuck in second place. A brief full course yellow from mirror retrieval and then the red flags flew with a little over an hour to go. Electrical storms in the vicinity, not safe to continue for the moment. So we are under red flag, we are inside the final hour, the clock continues to run. What this is going to do is put a real kibosh on the bikini contest in Green Park. Information to the pit lane. Information to the pit lane. Race will be resumed behind the safety car at 19.15. At 19.15, we're resuming the race behind the safety car. All right, so we will go back in one minute in the cars, because it's now oh, in, uh, 11 minutes behind the car. So there is a bikini contest and a band. Bikini contest, 7.30 in Green Park, the band. Uh, will be kicking off just after that as well, including one of the band, I think the band playing tonight, fronted by a certain Tristan Nunes. Yes, that IndyCar driver, Tristan Nunes, yes. It, it's not just superbike riders who have uh, musical abilities. Tristan Nunes gigging here. Uh, although not racing. So it looks as though the electrical worries are on their way out and we are getting ready to go. And that's good news in Green Park because the bands will play and the bikini contest can get on. There's Brendan Irib, here just uh, confronting in a gentle manner. Still uh, hasn't fixed the door, remember, that car. Well, they still there. haven't stopped yet. So yeah. on their next stop, they will, have a, they will have a door change. Here's our running order into the final hour. Alpine from Toyota and Glickenhaus, United from Dublin, WRT and real team in LMP2. In GTE Pro, it is Porsche, Corvette, Porsche, and that gap this time that the Porsche had built up, which was a minute, will be greatly reduced. And so suddenly, swings, roundabout snakes, ladders. What Corvette lost the last time out, and Davidson, they're going to get back at least some of this time. And so suddenly, it looks as though that GT Pro battle might be alive again. And Corvette believe they've got more fresh tyres left. What goes around comes around. So, uh, yeah, it was easily lost in the first place on the first red flag. So they've that now behind the Porsche this time. That gap will come right down and the race is back on. It will indeed. Showers are expected. Level two. So that's not heavy rain. Okay. But it's a, it's a, it's a Raceable. Rain. Yeah, yep. you, can, you can race with that. It um, will be full wet tyres, of course. Uh, not quite to the end of the race, so that could be doubly interesting. We could get to the stage where we're getting a drying track in the last 10 or 15 minutes, and it's got a, a wry grin on his face. It's, it's just suddenly, uh, suddenly just, just <laughs> lines up just again. happy I'm in the commentary box yep. instead of behind the wheel of the car, because no, uh, you never know which way it's going to go when the weather's uh, against you. I'm looking at some of the comments we're getting on social media about this, uh, this, this stoppage for the risk of lightning. I'm going to say two things. One is, as Eduardo Freitas has made clear, it's a local statute. There is no choice here. Um, and it is for safety, and uh, there are, have been occasions where that's been needed. I'll give you my experience of this, not here from here in Florida, but in Malaysia, where we were hit by another flash storm, literally. And uh, we had three direct cameras, uh, direct lightning strikes on camera positions, one of which almost literally blew the camera operator off a six foot platform. Uh, we lost, I think, 10 of our 14 cameras with those strikes, including, by the way, the central computer um, uh, control unit for the TV broadcast. And 
luckily in that instance we did not have 100,000 plus people in campgrounds. It's the right thing to do. Let's go down to Louise, who's with André Negrau from the leading car, the 36 Alpine, before we go back and racing. André Negrau has been a strong performance from the Alpine, but uh, this race hasn't made it easy for you, has it? No, no, they don't. Um, now they're for the red flag for the lightning. Um, we expect some shower level two, as they say on the computer, uh, on the TV, in a few minutes. So yeah, should be really tough. Uh, definitely now with the, a lot of rubber in the in the track. So we have to keep calm and and see what it, what's going on. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So yeah, I, I do feel for them. You know, they've built up this healthy lead. Yeah. They were As we've said, all race long, that's what they were relying on yeah. because of the fuel strategy differences, that, well, how long the Toyota go, could go per stint compared to the Alpine. And suddenly, you know, that gap under the red flag. They were the big winners last time. Oh, now, they were. Alpine. Without a doubt. And this time seems like, by his reaction, uh, it's all up in the air again. Literally, it's all up in the air. We don't know what's going to come down and how much of it. Yep. Well, I've just, just been outside and I'm not sure the rain is actually going to come. I think it might blow past us. We'll wait and see. Yeah, the, the, the weather normally comes from pretty much the southeast here, but the wind, uh, certainly looking out, we're on the outside of turn 17. The wind is pretty much going across past the end of the circuit and the showers aren't yet close enough to rain on us so i'm not sure as we get the line moving we are going to think of doing the pass around i need to make this safety car procedure as short as possible as we are expecting rain yeah what we don't want to be doing is still waffling around behind the safety car when people are also then trying to dive into the pit lane as wave arounds and catch-ups and all the other stuff go on so the forecast does say uh, level two which is a light shower level one is you can barely notice it level two is louise barely mentions it level three is a, is a reasonable whinge well let's catch up with united auto sports and the youngest man in the place 16-year-old Josh Pearson. Josh Pearson on standby just in case somebody has to jump back into the car. But this has really been a roller coaster. Just when everybody's making those gaps, they're just closed back up again. Yeah, I mean, for us, it's not really going to change our strategy much. Uh, we, were, we were pretty close to boxing, but I think grid. everyone was. Five minutes to uh, so we're just going to kind of see what it throws at us, and hopefully, uh, hopefully it won't be long. Have you enjoyed this? I mean, it's an emotional roller coaster, like I say. Yeah, you know, I have enjoyed it very much, actually. You know, for a first wet race, it's not bad. We've been through all the procedures. I think when I was in the car, nothing was really going on. So Paul and Oliver have had the hard time with the full course yellows and the red flags. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cool as a cucumber, isn't he? I mean, d d disgustingly self-composed for 16. Got well, no let's worries about age of you. Let's hear what the Porsche G team have to say for themselves. This is the 91 car lying in third. So what's going on? Okay, they were on restart again at 19.15 in about seven minutes time. And the rain looks like it will come very soon after, a few minutes after. It will be low level rain to start and then higher level rain. If we do go on wet, it'll be drying wet. See uh, a great view in the door there of the uh, ID system, the safety system that is in every car. There's a screen there that uh, illuminates to reflect all the flag signals. Uh, yellow, blue, uh, black and white, whatever, are being shown to the drivers. And uh, a real big step forward in safety, that, and, and absolutely uh, you know, one of the huge innovations that World Endurance Championship has been able to bring to racing, and hopefully we'll see that continue to filter down through lots more categories of racing. It's been a pretty entertaining race so far, lots of incident, accident, and uh, plenty of racing drama. And essentially we're getting set for a little over a 30-minute dash for the cash here in Sebring.
Well, here is the 56 Team Project One Inception Racing Porsche. Louise Beckett is hovering with intent, or rather within their pit awning. Let's hear from Ben Barnicote. Well, Ben, we can see the, the door here. We know you still need to change it. And as you were saying to me before, this is closing your window of opportunity to change that door. Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate. I'm not sure what happened with the ring mirror, to be honest. I got in the car, it's hanging off, and then it unfortunately fell off whilst I was driving. But um, yeah, just the way now that it's panning out, you know, if it had been a full service, a, a regular pit stop with an hour to go, we would have been able to change the door pretty quickly. You know, the, the design of this door is, is good so that you can do it in a normal stop. But um, yeah, now with this uh, red flag and that window is obviously going to be short because the fuel fill time is not going to be as long. We're going to be pretty tight, which is a bit of a shame. But hey, if it rains, everything's up for grabs, really. So um, yeah, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. I mean, racing, it's racing. These things happen, you know, little bangs here and there. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, we got a bit of a bruise and a scratch today. All right, thank you. You're welcome. And Davidson smiling and, and uh, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's a lot, isn't it? You know, 45 minutes, not even. It will be half an hour dash for the cash and maybe yeah. splash for the cash. What a great attitude he's great. to racing with Ben Barnicote. Um, he's he's going to be a star. Yeah, he is, yeah. Already a star. Oh, in my absolutely. Eyes. He's, he's, he's blindingly fast. He's got a great outlook uh, on, on racing. I mean, how... Plus, also, classic racing driver. I didn't touch it, Gov. It came off yeah. the axe. <laughs> I, I wasn't, I I wasn't, wasn't phased by that. I was oh, nowhere near it. it. <laughs> not phased by that at all. Wing mirror hanging off on a corner. Oh, well. Oh, it's fallen off. Oh, well. well oh, do you know now what? we've got to change the door. Actually, that's that's so familiar an attitude to anybody who watches US racing. That, that's, that's the brakes. Pragmatic. People don't bitch, you know. That's the, that's the word I was looking yeah, for. He's yeah. very pragmatic in the way he goes racing. That's racing. And when he's in the car, he is incredibly fast. He knows where to place the car. The race Seen is now resumed behind the safety car. A green flag, the race is okay. now be resumed behind the safety car. Great time, looking forward to this. All right, so all sorts of wave aroundery going on. Yeah. Well, just as I thought the race was getting yeah. a bit, not stale, but I it just settled. thought it was going to end how it was. It settled. Yeah, it, it, was, it, it settled. Was, was like that cup of coffee you left for a little bit too long. I'm looking I'm at your team, man. What are you I'm talking about? Your, I'm looking at your body language, and you're now excited. Rain is forecast. I know, I know what's coming. In seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Been there, done that. Seven minutes till we're the, the shower is forecast. Don't go right. anywhere, basically. No, That's no, what no, I'm saying. No. Don't go anywhere. It, we, we always, we, we've said it, we <laughs> keep saying it. This is the first time I've said it with you in the booth. Something dramatic always <laughs> happens in the last 25 minutes of any major endurance race. Yeah. And we're 44 minutes from the end of this one. Well, you, you're preaching to the converted there, aren't you? Uh, and knows all about that. <laughs> my brain is going crazy. It's, it's, it's rolling back all those races. Thinking, did, yeah. it, did easy, right? It's middle you're probably name, right. His middle name is Drama. Yeah. <laughs> we, we try to blank those moments out, really. So it, <laughs> It's your job to remember. Oh, no, no, believe me, there's just been too yeah. many. It's the, the number of times where you've been in that, that... You're sort of almost planning for the end of the race on how we're going to sum this up. Oh, hang on a minute. Meanwhile, look how stretched out the field is. I mean, the Penske car there, there's a big gap back. It did not get away quickly behind the 98 AMR Aston. See the weather coming in from e almost east-southeast, but the wind is blowing pretty much easterly, so... It's, it's going to come past fairly soon and fairly quickly, and there's nothing behind the shower curtain that we're yep. seeing coming towards us. So uh, it's forecast to be a sort of seven or eight minute shower, relatively light. It's it's not uh, yeah, it's not building either, so it should be gone quickly, but just enough to make a third of the track like absolute polished marble. The Italian job minis around that shopping piazza. That's what it's going to look like for a third of the lap. And the other two thirds, suddenly, oh, I have got grip. I haven't forgotten how to drive. You know, you, you go from being zero back to hero and then back to zero again. What you want to try and do is the rain stars coming down. If it's anything like it was a few years ago when we were last here, you see the drop starting. You don't lose that much grip initially. It's more of a psychological impact watching the, the rain hit the windscreen in front. And then you start to notice you're losing a bit of grip. And then what you need to do is try and stay out there. 
hang it out, stay out there, yep. keep the tire temperature up, and then wait for the first person to make the mistake. Yep. And it's not you. Yep. That's your, the game you play. You don't want to be the first one to come in and change tires just in case the rain goes away by any chance and you're left there on, on full wet tires with the blocks of rubber overheating and, and everyone starts overtaking you again. Uh, you want to sort of hang out there until there's a full course yellow or a red flag or you don't want to be the first one to come in basically. Well, there's two things going on here. First of all, look at the time. Yep. 40 minutes to go. We haven't even started the wave around. Again, I'm saying it's going to be a half hour race. The only thing that matters is track position. The only thing that matters is staying out. Everyone is gambling. No one is coming in for wets. No one is coming in for wets. That, and that, that's that's the end of it. It's a it, it's a it's a Formula Ford race, give or take. You know, 20 but minutes, 30 minutes doesn't make a difference. If you're on wets, you're committed. You're staying out. Yeah, but it only takes one or two laps. We've all seen it before. I know. One or two laps of the track suddenly becoming sodden, full of rain, and it, it changes everything. I know, but and every driver it. knows that they're better than the weather, knows that they can hang on. I can, don't worry, I, I've got it, I've got, got it, it, I've got, got it, I've got, got it. it. And you're right, and you have got it right until the second you have them. There's the captain, Roger Penske. He's seen it never, before. Never more than a foot away from his phone. Go. That's it. He's learned the everything around. he knows from Antonio Felix <laughs> de Costa. <laughs> this is the pass around. Yes. And that includes, by the way, the second place car in GTM. Wow. So that's going to be... So that's going to put him, the whole field, behind the 98. 90. So who are our leaders? Oh, who are coming into the pit lane? So are these cars that are were Must out be of fuel? Must be emergency service. Yeah. WRT are in. Not good for ARC them. That's not good for them. Are in. That's not good for them. Wow. Because they'll need to come in again. Let's see how long that car is stationary for. Fuel nozzle's in. It can only be five yeah, seconds. Yeah, that's a splash, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so they were on bingo fuel. ARC Bratislava, same deal. Five second splash. They were on zero fuel. And the as light... we learned from the last red flag we had, that really hurts you. Yep, because you have to stop again. Because you still need fuel. 22 does need to stop, but clearly they may just get away with just the one stop, whereas the, the 31 is going to have to stop again. Wow. All right, so let's just recap our field leaders. 36 Alpine leading hypercar. 23 United Autosports leading LMP2 and 22 nowhere leading gte pro the 92 porsche but corvette is right back in it with that 64 car and leading in gte am 98 northwest amr so those are our four class leaders let's hear from the corvette team and tommy milner basically whatever happens with the weather and the red flags and anything else we could be in a situation where we'd be tight on fuel uh right now it's looking like we probably still have to stop once if everything uh continues from here copy all right so porsche or corvette were they saying we'll have to stop that once? Corvette. we'll, we'll, we'll have to stop, stop once or they'll have to stop all once. three all have to stop once. they've, they've got about uh, nine, ten laps on fuel. All right. So again, it's going to come. Uh, it's track position, Completely. and you know this is what this is what Corvette racing is bred into them from the first day. Track position. Louise Beckett. I was just speaking to Porsche and saying, what are you going to? Are you going to take that gamble or go to Wetz? And they said, we don't know, because you just don't know when you can switch over. It could be too soon and do two laps on Wetz, and then you drop back. So they're really, they're still undecided. Yeah, and, and everybody is going to have to play it by ear. And Ann Davidson, this is where plan A, plan B, plan, plan C, forget it. But it, it is now live planning. And remember, in LMP2 at least, no intermediate tyres anymore. No. Yeah. It's slicks no. or wets. <laughs> so it's a bigger difference then, therefore, between the tyres that you choose. Yeah, it's uh, what's it all past, isn't it? Exactly. Win it or bin it. And, 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 and that is it. You know, you are either going to stick it out and know that the track is hot enough that it will dry fast enough that you'll survive, or you are going to be forced into the pit lane for a full wet tyre. All I know is from this situation, there will be winners and losers. 23, <laughs> 23 has not stopped yet. No. 
Yeah, it's got very Louise dark. Beckett. It is extremely dark in this pit lane. There are big black clouds ahead of us, uh, overhead of us. Yeah, no clippy ploppy raindrops yet, though. We are two minutes away from when it is forecast to arrive, although they're now pushing it back to 7.22. Uh, we are at 7.22, so shout us up when you start getting wet, and uh, we'll just ignore you and tell you it's your job. <laughs> um first car behind the safety car is of course the race leader the 36 car then it's the 708 some red flag again oh okay so another electrical storm warning i'm 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 starting to think we may not get this race back underway yeah. well louise it's not just the marshals it's not just the drivers in the cars is it no absolutely i've um, just watched a cameraman on a cherry picker just being brought back down and out of it so and i can see some lightning all right okay. so i actually thought it was a photographer before but now that's just confirmed it. i can definitely see some lightning all right in which case stay away from easy ups and that by the way if you're watching and wondering what's got the morning it's a statute number two there will be local officials in race control advising on this yeah no absolutely right absolutely right and, you know and we are visitors here we are Completely. you know guests in the country but that doesn't mean that the rules don't apply to us it's the same as when you want to fly or you want to you know drive the fact that you're foreign doesn't mean you don't have to obey the oh, speed Deke. limits and, right. and, and every safety regulation will be the same so the, it's uh, yes yeah. it's disappointing well we but, may uh, yet we've get still got half an hour or more we may yet get an Abu Dhabi out of this oh, okay. green white check went there wow <laughs> <laughs> well everybody in the place was thinking it weren't they I, d I don't mean oh. that we're gonna have a shuffling around to make the outcome unfair but we may end up I mean you know green white checker is a is a very American way of solving things we don't have a green white checker rule but we may be down to We've got 10 minutes. The weather has passed. Here we go. Giddy up. Now, if there's still time remaining, yep. and you've got a racetrack full of racing cars, oh, let's yeah. get out of there. Philippe Sinu, Kevin Est, all watching, all waiting, all seeing how this might actually emerge. Well, the universal here between us, them, the fans, and the officials, and everybody else is we don't want it to finish like this. We, we want them to be able to have some more racing, because Let's face it, it's been a, a, a there's there we some we, it's been a fun day of racing so far, you know. At least we've had the pass around now. Yes. So yeah. you've eradicated yeah. a whole load of time that, that is necessary to get all the pass around. Trying to work out. We did no. see the 31 on pit lane, didn't we? We did. Uh, we did. To do the splash. H how is that car, having done a splash, still a second behind the United car? Uh, I don't know. Because maybe they came back out into the queue somewhere. But it was right behind in the first place. Yeah. And they've, all, they've all stopped nose to tail on the uh, the back straight now anyway. It must be that the... Yeah. Well, I, d I don't know. And actually, they shouldn't have been able to come out into the queue because the pit lane exit and, and entry should have been both red. Uh, however, drive is now out of the cars. And, uh, yeah, step away from the vehicle, sir, would be my advice to you there. Our friend Alex Harrison, by the way, uh, otherwise known as WEC Data, uh, amongst other things, on uh, Twitter, says the last WEC race to end under a red flag was Spa in 2019, where a certain Hello. Anthony Davidson, never, I uh, don't know what happened to him, uh, won an LMP2 for the very first time. Do you, I remember, remember, race? Do you remember when it snowed? <laughs> oh, that yeah, was spot, the, yeah. yeah, 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 that was the snow weekend. That, that Davidson, he was quite good. <laughs> never happened to him. Yeah. You know? <laughs> That, see, that was a, a moment where, <laughs> as a team, Dragon Speed took the risk yep. to leave the car out there. We were out of fuel. Okay. And almost could see what was coming in terms of the red flag with all the snow that was around. Mm. Took the risk to stay out there just in case there was a red flag. There was a red flag. Uh, bingo. We won the race with nothing left in the tank. And yeah. that was the same year that I think I'm right, Dragon Speed won races in IMSA. Weck and Elamess in LMP2 in the same year, which has not been done. 
had a lot of bases covered, didn't they? We don't have a Dragon well. Speed car in the World Endurance Championship. They are racing tomorrow in the Sebring 12 hours, so yeah. Dragon Speed haven't gone away. No, they've not. And they if you're are listening to the broadcast, racing. you are out there on the camping grounds, do take cover and stay yeah. away from anything metallic. It's This is not done for no reason. No, absolutely right. And, and you know, it's, it's not a common occurrence in uh, in European racing, but Look at that. you know, very high humidity here. I was just outside thinking actually it's no less hot than it no. was a couple of hours ago, but it is definitely feeling a lot closer. That was like a scene for the Wizard of Oz, wasn't it really? Well, you know, sunset, clouds dry, I mean, yeah, all the photographers are going to be in little paroxysms of ecstasy because there is going to be some real beauty here. Whether or not you had a racing car in front of it, sort of almost neither here nor there. But this could be maybe a 10 or 15 minute element for it to pass through. I mean, it does look like it's moving pretty slowly, not raining heavily. There's not an awful lot left of that shower, is there? That's fairly thin pickings. But it needs to, well, we need to get rid of the electrical component. It needs to pass over us and head off to the northwest. And then we will have potentially a chance to finish racing for the day. Well, Marshall's taking cover. I think in turn 10, they'll just be cracking open another one the ignoring the weather information. the pit lane cars may be covered cars may be covered there is a shower coming in cars may be covered in the background there you can see somebody hanging onto their awning well there you can see the weather radar it is moving very slowly unfortunately yeah, the wind speed, zero miles an hour. Yeah, that's the irritating thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's not one of those ones that's going to sweep through. It's going to gradually just sit yeah, there. Um, reasonable question about electrical safety for a hybrid car. We just heard the background there from, from Lou. And mm. a variety of safety procedures that need to be followed with the hybrid cars. Well, that Toyota will be very well versed in that, having run the car for, for a number of years. But you're absolutely right, you know, uh, oh, high wattage electrical components plus H2O uh, doesn't sound like my idea of a fun time. It's Kevin Astor. He'll be, that'll be on his Instagram page yeah. very soon. Moody. Yeah, and the weather. A, we were always assured at Toyota that uh, it was a completely safe system. Well, um, well, do, do you know, I mean... You know, you're, if you if you if you spoke 150 years ago about driving around in a wagon full of highly explosive liquid, exactly, you'd never uh, do no, it. No, would we you? we don't think twice. There is a wagon full of highly explosive liquid. We don't think twice about we it. We should so ask him. He knows a lot about electric cars. He doesn't think twice about anything. No, he doesn't. <laughs> at he all. He does. He <laughs> thinks. But actually, the great thing about Ant is he really gives the impression that nothing ever disturbs him. But he thinks a lot about a lot. Yeah. He's just. He's got, he's got lots of debts. He really does. He's just waking, waiting for the perfect moment when he can get his face yeah. with a bolt of lightning <laughs> behind it and Instagram it. <laughs> I know what he's thinking. Look at that. Oh, Cedric, so Cam Cam needs, Cedric Cam needs floodlighting. Look, there's the, uh, the uh, World Endurance Championship crew out there with the cameras. Yeah, th that's the camera, by the way, we've been using all weekend to tell when someone's coming up to the organization office to tell us off for something. Yeah. But or bringing us cake. Uh, by the way, but the we haven't seen any of that. By the so way, the really good news for these fans is well, we might well get racing again. And two is they've got another huge race tomorrow. This is one hell of a race meeting. Yeah. Race, we, we've had cars on track for, what, three solid days uh, with the WC, the Inter Weather Tech Sports Car Championship, and a full range of mm. sport races. Mm -hmm. The TF Sport guys. Yeah. Carrera Cup North America, the Michelin Pilot Cup. I mean, it's just it's it's absolutely great. non stop. I, I, I don't even want to guess how many race cars are actually in the paddock areas here. Well, lights are on everywhere, and lots and lots of motor coaches and motorhomes, lots of campground activity as we get inside the final half hour of time here for the season opener in the world endurance championship well, that was a very different looking weather to start the day
A little misty at dawn, but a clear blue sky overhead. Sebring ready for the first race of the championship. Jim Blickenhaus and Roger Penske among the great and the good on the grid. Grand Marshal Jackie X waving the field away. Old Glory signifying the start of the eight hours and a big gap behind the prototypes to the GTs, but a big gap opened up early on by the LMP2 United Autosports pole sitter, Felipe Albuquerque going past the number eight Toyota. Oh goodness, said Brendan Hartley, we're in for a long day. And then past the Glickenhaus up to second place. Oh, look at that, says Andre Negrau, but he needn't have worried. His teammate in the uh, Alpine pulling away out front. In the GTE Pro field, Porsche qualified one, two, but Corvette was right behind them at the start. And in fourth place of all the GTs was the AM pole sitting Aston Martin of Ben Keating. He was soon caught by rival Paul Dallalana, the Northwest AMR car moving in front. And since then has led most of the race. Porsche had a penalty for pay for holding up the field at the beginning. And that allowed the uh, ever present Corvette to move through into the race lead. In LMP2, it was all about United Autosport early on, 22 and 23 battling for supremacy. Trouble for Jose Maria Lopez, the world champions in the number seven Toyota, out of the race after a seemingly fairly innocuous incident in traffic, a little tap on the barriers, but then coming back to the pits, carrying by his own admission too much speed, speared off into the barriers at the end of the lap. And that was all she wrote. Red flags flew, the race was stopped for 30 minutes for barrier repairs. Lopez was okay. Alpine pulled away again at the start with Toyota now with one car in the hunt, but two pit stops forced on them because of a lack of fuel under the safety car took them a little further out of the equation. Porsche's 92 car jumped the leader from Corvette in GTE Pro, the 91 car losing ground because of a rear wheel issue in their first pit stop. Then another safety car and full course yellow for debris recovery. A red flag flew for electrical storms. And as we were getting ready to get back underway, flew again after a brief running. The wave around has been completed. A couple of cars have had to take emergency top up with fuel. We are currently under red flag, waiting for the electrical storm to pass. 25 minutes remain on the clock here in Sebring. Martin Haven, Graham Goodwin, and Ant Davidson in the booth, Louise Beckett in the pit lane, and Ant, still electrical storm overhead. This is gonna take a while to pass. We may not get very much more running today. I'm not I sure think. we will, because uh, although it looked like the drivers were getting ready to get back in the car, they are, but that's only to come back into the pit lane. Right. To clear the track. It, it is, yeah. however, saying start behind the I safety think. car at 7.36 But that's local. to come into the pit lane. Yeah. Well, that doesn't say start. Well, maybe that will be the only way to go. Maybe it is the end of it. Maybe. I think that might be it. You know. Is that what we're anticipating? There's Nikki team, the Northwest AMR crew. Have they won with this new driver lineup? This is why Paul Dallalana has shaken up the lineup, adding David Pittard and Nikki team, a former world champion in GTE Pro. And the electrical storms overhead, I'm afraid, are moving rather too slowly. And darkness arriving a little earlier than we'd expected because of the solid lead and grey skies overhead. We'll have a race here one day where we don't uh get a, some kind of rain shower or thunderstorm towards the end of the race. The sad thing is, it's when it gets this dramatic that it needs the intervention. Rain, not a problem. Yeah, really. Exactly. It's when you do get to this, this kind of stage and there is precedent for people being hurt in these circumstances. Yeah. That's why there's a law. Well, nobody, uh, let's face it, you know, we've all seen Le Mans more than once. Nobody is counting chickens until it is officially not a race any longer. Right now, it is still a race. Yeah. We may have marshals and intervention cars on track, is the message from race control as the cars head off. And don't forget, of course, they're gonna have to do the entire lap because they were gridded up there outside the pit lane past pit entry. So they will have to go all the way around. Well, for Nicolas Lapierre there with the headset on and Philippe Signo on the right-hand side, the team boss. 
at Senior Tech, the team that run these Alpine cars and, and have run cars under the Alpine brand for the better part of the last decade. Yeah, not celebrating yet, but certainly I think they are feeling that it's unlikely that even if we go racing, much is going to change. Well, but part of the problem is uh, they are clearly withdrawing marshals from trackside. Yeah. And they will need to go back to trackside. Agreed. And that in itself is going to take time. That's going to be at least 10 minutes, isn't yeah. it? To Agreed. get all marshals deployed into their positions. But still, it's very hard mentally for the drivers to, to know what to do, how to play it at these times you know do you give up do you start celebrating like yeah. we saw with Nicky team he said ah it's all over yeah. what if you're you are called back into the car what if miraculously the storm does clear and with 10 minutes to go Eduardo Freitas says we're back on yeah, yeah. He, I always found it's better to just stay focused tell yourself no there's still 21 minutes remaining in this race anything can happen stay focused prepare for getting back in the car with your game face on and you know, be prepared for action. Yeah, we can celebrate when we're on the podium. Exactly. Right yeah. now, I mean, right now, 21 minutes to go, we might get an eight minute race. We might get five minutes of green flag running. We'll have to wait and see exactly where we end up. Cars heading back towards the pit lane behind the safety car, still uh, returning. Our marshals to places of safety, all our corner workers. And as ever, without the boys and girls in orange or here in white, without the marshals, without the corner workers, without the volunteer officials, if without the volunteer stewards, there would be no racing. So first of all, thanks so much to them and to all the other organizers for making this race meeting run smoothly. And Graham Goodwin, does sort of look as though there's going to be far too little time remaining but as Ann Davidson said you just can't accept that it's over until somebody says it is done and Eduardo's not calling it yet. Well, I've not seen it yet I've seen a few teams call it on social media I've seen a few teams saying there's not an official call we'll call it when it's called yep and we've not heard from race control I'm looking at the race control message board and it certainly looks like the teams know something we don't at this stage well they very rarely know something that we don't because normally if it's communicated to the teams it's communicated to us so we will see but um, it's had plenty, hasn't it, to throw us this this, uh, this yeah. race? Well, listen, you, you can you hear know, overhead the thunderstorm is closing in now. You always come to Sebring expecting fireworks because it is such a tough track to race. It is so hard. It's hard on the drivers. It's hard on the cars. It's hard on the strategy because things happen in racing. But it is, it's just, a, it's a brutalizing place to come and race, and it produces great racing as a result. It's a fantastic track. You know, you, you have to be on top of your game to be successful here, uh, to survive this place. And, uh, you know, and that's before the weather gets involved. But yeah, you know, you, you got to keep your nose clean on this track. And uh, like they say, you're going to this place and respect the bumps at all yeah. times. But I feel like that first red flag today robbed us of what could have been. It was shaping up to be a great fight between the, the length of stints that Toyota could do against the Alpine's speed, but shorter stints, and the Corvette versus the Porsche. They've split them. A great job, nevertheless, for, for Corvette racing today. Yeah. Well, look, I think what it has done is really set out the storylines for Spa. Because now we oh, yeah. sort of have a feeling maybe for how this is going to go. And again, at Spa, Alpine are going to have to go hell for leather because they're going to stop more frequently than Toyota. And time stationary has to be outweighed by time moving. And if you can't, you've got to move further in that in that slightly limited time. I do time. think this circuit suited the Alpine better than the Toyota as well, though. Yes. I think every yep. time I watched on board, as we are uh, riding with the United, the onboard shots that we had, the car looked better than the Toyota. And by the way, we are only getting paddock shots and onboard shots because all the circuit cameramen have been we'll pulled be back in, along with all correct. the corner workers. So uh, 
we will wave goodbye to Ant. He has work to do down among our uh, winners I'll and say, podium finishers. I'll say thanks very much. What a start from Ant Davidson. Yeah. I know that's been appreciated all around the world. We've been getting some lovely comments through across social media. Um, the, the other thing I'd say, for me, to this point, this has been the best hypercar race so far. I'm sure Toyota wouldn't agree with that. But what we've seen is a field across the four cars that has sort of flipped, but it's been closer than it's been before. I know Toyota will have things to say about balance performance. Of course they will. Yep. They've had some bad luck and bad judgment in amongst that, uh, that result. Yep. Um, but uh, for me, this is what balance of performance is supposed to be about. You learn the lessons of the races that came before, you respond to those lessons, and you make that adjustment. It's about keeping the racing as close as possible. And of course, there's going to have to be fine tuning, as we've had in every other class that BOP has been a part of. And that, by the way, it's what's coming from a much, much deeper field the longer we get in. What? It'll get deeper this year with Peugeot coming on stream later. Correct. It'll get much deeper, much, much deeper uh, as we get into the next hypercar era with LMDH, with Ferrari coming in 2023. Yeah. And then beyond that, when we get a further year on the line, when the GT3 class arrives, we expect much greater variety uh, in the GT class. Absolutely right. And the key word in BOP is balance. It is checks and balances to try and make the cars as relatively equal in perfor overall performance terms as possible. Not in terms of top speed, not in terms of mid corner speed, but in terms of race long pace. And, you know, you're mixing apples, oranges, pears, bananas and kiwi fruit and all sorts of different ways of slicing this particular category, the top category, hypercar, which is Le Mans hypercars and the uh, IMSA's uh, LMDH cars. Cars that are production based, can be production based, can be pure racing cars, can be normally aspirated, can be turbocharged, can be hybrid powered, can be not hybrid powered. Y you want it to have... Uh, 20 windows, it can have 20 windows. You, you, whatever you've got, you can try and make it work within the formula, and, and that's what's going on. And it's not about, balance of performance is not about keeping one car out front no. where it has been no. historically. It's about allowing other cars to race it with an even chance of winning. It won't be the same in every track, and Spa is going to be different because because of the medium speed corners here, Toyota have very little, little opportunity on corner exit to deploy the four wheel drive, the hybrid power at Spa. There will be many more opportunities to use that. They will lack less in pace to Alpine. They will still have that fuel tank size advantage. And so it will be a different ball game, but every race will be different. Checkered flag has been shown with 14 minutes and 38 seconds remaining. The race is officially over. We officially have our winners here in Seabrick. Nico Lapierre, Andre Negrel of the 36 Alpine. The rain's coming down finally, but <laughs> what a race that was for you. Opening the season like that, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it was, um, was a tough race. We were expecting this for all last season. And uh, we started with the um, right fit here in, in Sebring. It was, um, was a tough race for, for everyone with red flag and then green and then, and then red again. So yeah, yeah, congratulations to these boys. Amazing job from the team as well. So it's crazy. I mean, every time you just had to keep, you just had to keep working throughout, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, this, this red flag, especially in the end, was not really great for us, but uh, we were fortunate that the race didn't restart. But I want to say thank you to the boys. You know, they were working really hard this winter to make this car. Last year was the first year in this category for the team, but this year we really feel that we made a huge step forward and we are ready to fight. And this first win is, is really great for us. Matthew, you've got to be happy. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, to be honest, I'm happy because it was a bit stressful at the end yeah. for me in the car. So now I'm really happy and yeah, they, uh, they did uh, an amazing job all the week. So, and yeah, we deserve it since, uh, since last year where we struggled a bit to, to win the race. So yeah, makes happy and it's good for, for motivating everyone as well. So really happy. I'll let you go and celebrate and get in the drive. <laughs> From the rain.
So the track of light comes out absolutely dark now. Uh, by the way, a weather warning locally now for wind at 30 miles an hour and marble-sized hail uh, in the Sebring oh, right, okay. area. So that's coming too. Um, that's it. I mean, that's that's an Alpine win. We'll see them in the hypercar class in 2024 with an MDH designed yep. by the chassis by Orica and a bespoke engine. It is Toyota Kazoo Racing salvaging, I think it's fair to say, a second place there and a first time on the overall podium for Glickenhouse Racing as well with the 708 car. Uh, LMP2, it's going to be United Autosports at the end. Uh, yeah. What a result for that young man. Um, 31 WRT car second, and in their debut in the World Endurance Championship, it's going to be Prima Orland team uh, on the uh, the LMP2 podium. Pro Am, it's going to be the 83 AF Corsa, um, Orica from the Ultimate team, the 35 car, and Alcar Pro Racing. What a story they've got to tell yeah. over the last few weeks. The 45 car will make a podium. Astonishing stuff. All right, well, let's catch up with our LMP2 winners. It is the team of the number 23 United Auto Sports car. Let's hear from them now. Oli Jarvis, welcome Hello. back to WEC, <laughs> and what a way to start. Yeah, nice to be back, definitely. And uh, I mean, what an incredible result. I think, you know, we came here with the anticipation, Josh's first race in the series, youngest driver ever. You know, a podium would have been great, but to come away with a victory and, you know, what a job he did. And, you know, Paul as well. Um, you know, Paul did a lot of the heavy lifting. I've got a busy day tomorrow, so big thanks to them. And yeah, absolutely ecstatic. Uh, Josh, you've just been so cool and calm throughout. Whenever I've spoken to you, you've just seemed so relaxed. I wasn't relaxed for the last 20 minutes of this race, but <laughs> overall, you know, unbelievable, I think, to come away with a win. My first WEC race and the first race of the year, it's unbelievable. Paul and Ollie did a fantastic job for the entire race. It's just unbelievable. And for you, Paul, there was a lot of heavy lifting, as Oli says, uh, not just with the rest of the field, but also the other United car. Yeah, it was. Uh, we were unfortunate in qualifying yesterday because of a very good run in Q at the first set. We were six tenths clear, missed the second set, so we are out of position. And we are kind of playing cat and mouse trying to get the track position, but when we got the track position, uh, we were, I think, the quickest car. But you're just managing it all the way, and the red flags made it quite difficult because it brought some people back into contention. But these guys did a good job. He did a very good job. You know, he did a triple, which nobody else achieved during the race. Uh, and that was key to unleashing what we had at the end that we were going very aggressive. But nice way to start the year. Um, obviously, I'm, you know, put my kind of helmet down for this job and back with Fusio later in the year. But um, for these boys to start with a win, it's pretty incredible. And they'll go on to Spa, hopefully, in good spirits. And the car's been good, and it, it just helps the team, I think, get motivated for the year ahead. Well, it's good to see you here, and thank you. Well done, guys. Thanks very much. Well, and def I, we've seen several young men really lay down markers. Lorenzo Colombo was one of them. Okay. Josh Pearson, 16 years old. I don't care if he can't drive a soapbox cart. He absolutely performs on camera. The fact that he's lightning fast, and as Paul said, the only driver to do a triple stint. Well, you know, he's young. Put the young kid in. He's fit enough. He can do it. Just remind viewers. He's 16. But he turned 16 on Valentine's Day this year. And since then, he has won three LMP2 races on the international stage. It's insane. Completely remarkable. Um, he can't even rent a car. <laughs> Not, he can't rent a car in he the can't, US. He can't drink the champagne. Nine years. He can't drink the champagne for another five well, years. Yeah, he can't rent a car in the US. I think I'm right. He can't rent a car for five, nine years till he can rent a car. Yeah. Um, GT Pro as the rain really does come pouring down now. I can, f I can actually feel the pressure. Uh, I'm actually getting a headache from the change in the in the, uh, the atmospheric pressure genuinely uh, within this booth. Uh, Porsche GT team take that win. The 92 car brings that home from uh, the Corvette racing team. What a great race for them today. Uh, and also, well done, the Northwest AMR team. Remarkably, that is Paul Delalana's first win in the WC since the very first race of the 2018-19 se season. Wow, is it? He's not won since then. We just saw Mathieu, Jean-Baptiste Lay and Francois Herriot. They take the uh, second place in Pro-Am. That is the hail, is it not? Yeah, uh, it's, it's pretty heavy rain, whatever. Philippe Senior with his back to us. Got a lot of work coming up in the next 18 months, Philippe Senior, to prepare for for the uh, hypercar and arrival of Alpine. I mean, that's a, that's a big, big manufacturer. Renault and Alpine have got 
big boots to fill. A, a, a moment, actually, for Philippe Signo here. His vision, his contacts, his networking that brought Alpine into LMP2 with huge success. Championship mm. winning success, multiple wins at Le Mans. Yep. And then spotting the opportunity. I've had multiple conversations with Philippe over many years about the top class of sports car racing. He saw this, he saw this early. And with a lot of help, from a lot of people, not all of whom are in his team, that bring this effort together and to come back with a win. And a win on a stage as big as this, that is beginning to make this all worthwhile, I'm sure. And there's much, much, much bigger days to come. Well, he's, a, he's a hard grafter, he but he, boy, he has got ambition. And, and, and you know, and it's not a big team, it's never been a big team, but it is. It's a little bit like Tech One, or Tech One is a little bit like, like Cinetech in a lot of ways. It's it's a, it's a real family atmosphere, real families, a regional team. And it really does punch above its weight in terms of, you know, the size of the operation compared to the might of somebody like Toyota Gazoo Racing. Well, the race finished early because we couldn't get our marshals back out in time, even had the weather passed. But it was a very different looking Sebring when it all got underway. We knew it was going to be hot and hard. Bumpy McBump face absolutely was always going to be the order of the day. Great to have so many new names, some we knew well. Roger Penske, some we didn't know at all. Some of our drivers joining in the field. Jackie Ix, the Grand Marshal this weekend, a man who's got stellar sports car racing licks. And pretty good licks early on in the race as well from Philippe Albuquerque from United Autosports. Going around the Toyota for third. Up inside the uh, Glickenhaus for second in the opening couple of corners of the race. But Alpine cleared off. They knew they had one chance and one chance only to win this race, and that was to be fast all the way through. Well, that was going to be the course the uh, story of Corvette versus Porsche as well. The Porsche's leading from the front in GTE Pro. Fourth fastest qualifier in GTE was Ben Keating in the 33 Aston Martin. It wasn't long though before he was caught and passed for the lead of GTE Am by Paul Dallalama in the Northwest AMR car. A delay for the Porsches in the pits for holding the field back at the start of the race allowed Corvette to build its early advantage. It's United Autosports with 22 and 23 battled for supremacy in LMP2. And then the first major shock of the race. Jose Maria Lopez tangling around the outside of the GT Am car of Julian Andlauer. A brief brush with the barriers and then coming back to the pits by his own admission, maybe a little too quickly. The car lifted the front off the ground. He had no control, no steering, no braking. Slammed into the barriers. Red flags. Pachito was OK. Hopefully OK enough to race tomorrow in the Sebring 12 hours. Back underway after a 30-minute delay. And the number eight Toyota, the remaining car, with pit stop problems, having to stop a second time for fuel. Porsche getting back in control of GT Pro, the 92 car jumping the Corvette. 91, though, dropping out of the frame with a pit stop drama. Corvette continuing with the pace. Six. Brief full this course yellow it. and a vehicle to pick up a lost mirror. And then a weather warning bringing out the red flags for an electrical storm in the area. As that was deemed to be less of an issue, the field restarted, wave rounds happened, emergency pit stops happened for fuel, and then the red flags flew again with just over 30 minutes to run, leaving us with no further racing time. Northwest AMR, the 98 Aston Martin taking victory in GTE Am. The 92 Porsche hanging on in terms of the lead in GTE Pro. 91 was third, the Corvette was second, and it was the 92 car that won in GTE Pro. In LMP2, it was all about United Autosports. Once the 23 car got its nose in front and 22 had issues, it was up to United to stay ahead of WRT and Real Team also run by WRT, and the youngest man in the field claims victory on his debut. Glickenhaus, third overall, and for the first...
first time on an overall hypercar podium. Second place going to the surviving Toyota, the number eight. And that means that victory went to Alpine as they led from start to finish. So night has fallen. It is just before 8 p.m. local time. And Graham Goodwin, the weather only just clearing us. Yeah. And the reason the race was called, because Eduardo Freitas tells me it would have taken at least a minimum of 20 minutes to get the marshals yeah. back on station. And the electrical, electrical storm, I mean, the heart of it is still overhead it's now. So overhead. Uh, unfortunately, what looked like it might have blown past has actually slowed to a, an almost total halt right above us. That's the, uh, the result. It is a first win, overall win in the FIWC from the Alpine Elf team, the number 36 Alpine A4 94 laps and 37.4 seconds ahead. Those gaps are not going to matter uh, in these circumstances. But Toyota Gazoo Racing have to put up with second with the one finisher they got after that drama for the number seven mm. car and completing the podium, the 708 Glickenhaus. That's a famous result for Jim Glickenhaus and the team. It is the first win for the 23 United Autosports USA squad and a first win in the WC on his a championship debut for Josh Pearson. Yeah. WRT, after their glories last year, have to put up with second and they complete the podium with the real team by WRT uh, squad. That, I think, has been adjusted post-race. That's a change uh, post-race. Uh, 92 Porsche wins in GTE Pro with the Corvette Racing Squad on their full season debut uh, on the uh, on the uh, on the podium with the 91 Porsche third. Uh, LMP2 and we shouldn't forget and two more extraordinary uh, results from uh, from drivers there Alessio Rivera uh, and uh, of course Nicholas Nielsen winning LMP2 Am on their LMP2 racing debut alongside already double WC champion GTM Francois Perodo the ultimate team another debuting car um, in the uh, in the championship finishing second with the Algarve Pro Racing team. Another full season debut, by the way, yep. uh, for Algarve Pro Racing. They come in first. Yeah, all sorts of new names to conjure with. I mean, uh, the names at the front of the field we sort of expected in Hypercar, but uh, yeah, some some real new star turns. Josh Pearson, 16 years old, a winner on his debut, and the man who did an awful lot of the heavy lifting in the 23 United car. Uh, also very impressed by uh, rookie Lorenzo Colombo. He had a really, really good set of uh, laps in the car. Uh, so uh, some, some very entertaining new names to come to with, adding themselves to the star names that we already have. And, you know, we've got cars here that are just jam-packed with talent. Here's one. You know, you've got Robert Kubica, Louis Delatraz in the car with you, and still the name that we spoke about most was Lorenzo Colombo. I think that tells you pretty much everything you need to know about the young man's pace in that car. Absolutely. And uh, we've, it's great to be able to say, isn't it, Martin, we've got so much young talent coming through yep. LMP2 the fourth place uh, overall car this is the winner Paul Resta, Oliver Jarvis Josh Pearson what glories await that trio and what was great about LMP2 this weekend was we saw uh, uh, multiple cars in multiple teams and sometimes multiple cars in the same team yep. uh, out there uh, battling with each, with each other. The Jota cars faded towards the end, but even there, fifth and sixth, United Autosports 22 cars still don't quite understand that. The team tell me it didn't pit. The computer says no, that it did. Uh, and they lost uh, ground in the, the latter part of that race. We'll unpick that one um, as we kind of uh, trudge through the puddles later. GT Pro. That didn't Corvette give this one a good go? Yep. Uh, and I have to say, I think they'll come away from this feeling unlucky that they didn't come away with the win. Yeah, uh, definitely. They were really torpedoed below the waterline with the first red flag, and it was just signed, sealed, and delivered with the second one. You know, they had no time left to fight back. I, I think, had we gone green to the end, they might have made it a very, very close red. They had, they had tyres left in the locker. The 92 Porsche had track position. I think it could have been really close edge of the seat stuff in GT Pro yeah. as it is Porsche 
Michael Christensen bringing the car to the line, the 92 car that he shares with Kevin Esch. So the former world champion, Michael Christensen, back for the full-time drive. He was only uh, the long race co-driver with them last year. What about this debut team as well? We're supposed to make their debut in Monza last year. The car got wrecked. They didn't start. Despite a wrecked car in the prologue, they did actually manage to start. And they finish a very strong and creditable best Porsche in third place in GTEM. The pole sitters, the 33 uh, uh, um, uh, TF Sport car in second place. But victory. And out of the sort of 150 odd laps that they covered, I think they probably must have led for a, a good 120, maybe 130 laps. Northwest AMR were the class of the field. With yet another WC debutant in David Pittard. And yeah. At the start of uh, this little sequence, uh, it is a first win for Paul Delana and his 98 Aston Martin effort since the very first race of the Super Season in 2018-19. It's been that long. Yeah. And didn't they look as if they've got some form? Some great Le Mans history there in that little clip from <laughs> Brendan Areep, Ollie Milroy, and they've been together for a long time. And uh, it shows, yeah, Ben Barnico just ahead of them, heading towards the podium. Um, this time, three years ago, uh, very unusually, for only the second time in WC, I actually did the podium ceremony and it tipped it down. It absolutely <laughs> threw it down. And it does feel a little bit deja vu being back here in these circumstances. Well, Super Sub and Davidson will be able to do that for you. Uh, Louise Beckett will be there on the mic as well. And is busy working for our uh, audience at Eurosport across Europe. Ferdy Habsburg there. Uh, again with former WRT teammates, well, still WRT teammates, as you can see from the logo between his shoulder blades, but he is real team by WRT, and uh, WRT also running their own car under their own banner. So it uh, wasn't quite a 1,000 miles, didn't quite get to eight hours. Time has now ticked down to zero. We're now four minutes past the end of what would have been our scheduled race finish. And, uh, Rui Andrade, well, Again, podium finish for the real team car, an overall podium finish. And this is a, it's a new lineup as well, isn't it? Oh, with, yeah. uh, Completely different. With Rui Andrade in that car and with uh, Ferdy, Ferdy Habsburg. And uh, with uh, Norman Nato, of course, as well. Yeah. I think for me, across this whole field, look, the, the five car GT Pro uh, field will again light up, and I'm sure we'll be hearing. Uh, all sorts of uh, post-race shenanigans to do with balance performance. At this point, I don't care. That was a great race between the three cars were in it. There will yep. be a change, without a shadow of a doubt. Well, it's going to be first, before we talk about uh, GTE Pro, let's talk about GTE Am. We're going to go down with Louise Beckett, and she's got the winning drivers from the 98 Northwest AMR Aston Martin. They're with Louise right now. Paul Dallalana, the look of relief on your face that that one is done. <laughs> My gosh, I feel like we uh, we did it twice or three times today. So, uh, yeah, it's a great feeling. It's been a couple of years since I've enjoyed this feeling. So long overdue and, and really great to open the account with these two characters. So uh, feeling awesome about it all. I've hardly spoken to you or haven't spoken to you during this race, but it wasn't that easy going, was it? There were technical issues that we weren't aware of. Yeah, we've been a bit on the radar, radar Lewis, so uh, all good. We here we had a good car for the whole race, and obviously we had the interference with uh, some of the red flags, and then we had some issues with the radio, but that's uh, that's it. The right pedal still works, so that's uh, that's all we needed. <laughs> that is all you needed. David Pittard, you're joining the team as well, joining Aston Martin. Uh, how's this first race been for you? Oh, a dream. <laughs> Debut in the WC w with uh, Northwest AMR. Yeah, what, what's not to, not to like with a, a win and to open the account? Um, with maximum championship points for the for the race, so yeah, I think it's a good omen for the rest of the year. I hope we can continue this pace and uh, yeah, really fight for the championship uh, and the big one at Le Mans. Well done, enjoy it. Thank you. That's one very happy Canadian. And uh, yeah. by the way, he's a bit wrong. Uh, it wasn't a couple of years; uh, nearly four. Uh, which is just, I, I find it astonishing even to say that out loud. It's been yeah, yeah, long. absolutely. That, I you think you don't think it can possibly have been that long since the 98 car was a winner. I think that's his 17th win, and that's yeah. putting him right up there. Um, it's, in, he's back there with the because uh, it was it was him, Pedro Lamy were and Matthias were, Lauda yeah, for kept a long winning time. Together, yeah. They did. So he must be right back up close there. 
Well, that was our GTE Am winning team. The 92 Porsche team won in GTE Pro. Michael Christensen and Kevin Est. Michael Christensen, Kevin Estra, uh, for us, it was great that Corvette brought the fight to you, but uh, how was it for you? It was uh, quite intense, but on the other hand, also a bit uh, different than usual. So, um, of course, knowing on and seeing the rain coming, I was yeah preparing for, for a wet end to the race, but of course, a little bit of a different uh, story in the end of the day. And when those red flags kept coming, the safety cars, the, the full course yellows, were you just thinking, here we go, we've got to do it again? Yeah, it was it was really a weird feeling because we knew we are not going to finish it on fuel, you know, from the first red flag and uh, and the rain was going to come. You know, if somebody would have gambled on a on red flag, not pit it for wet and we pit for wet, so we could lose the race in, uh, you know, very quickly. So this was our, our thoughts. So we were a bit scared of that, but uh, in the end, yeah. It, we stayed where we were, but uh, before the red flag, we had 35 second gap. So I, I believe we we, we deserve this uh, this victory. Well deserved. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's before the second red flag. Before the first red flag, they were 35 seconds behind yeah, yeah, the Corvette. So uh, yeah, swings and roundabouts. But you, I'm afraid, don't always win from cautions, and absolutely, uh, that's very much the case here. Well, it has affected the, you know, both the stoppages affected the race, um, and in the end, weather determined. You know, had it remained non-electrical and just been wet to the end. I think we could have had a very entertaining half hour. However, hopefully those of you who've been with us from the start have enjoyed the racing. It's been uh, possibly not the world's most epic ever Sebring, but it has been very entertaining and has really shown that the battle lines have changed. Alpine, Glickenhaus, yep. and the LMP2 cars much closer to Toyota, at least on this medium speed circuit. I think once we get to Spa, Toyota will be able to stretch its legs more, and at Le Mans, more so again. However, in GT Pro, don't expect Ferrari to be behind the eight ball for too long. They rarely are, and I think Porsche, Ferrari, Corvette is going to be a very entertaining one. In GTE Am, I don't know what the form book <laughs> is, and we've already had one race. Frankly, any of them could have won it today. Any of them could win it in any of our races. 33 cars officially classified as finishers uh, out of our 36 starters. So there is one really exciting part of the storyline that uh, we've not we barely mentioned, which is balance of performance applies here. If, yep. if it's deemed that one of these cars is slightly out of that, uh, that fight, then adjustments will be made. Take a look at what the leading Ferrari is in GTM. It is the Iron Dames. Yep. And if that, that, that swings back in the other direction, then there could be some glorious days to come for the ladies in pink. Absolutely. And, and they were not only in qualifying, but also throughout the race comprehensively quicker than any of the other cars um, run by AF Corsa or the Iron Lynx cars. So they were, yeah, they were the best Ferrari team. In, in fact, in terms of performance against their peers, I'd say oh, they, yeah. they did a better job against their rivals than the, the factory uh, cars uh, seemed to be able to do. So we'll have to wait and see what the next month or so brings us in the lead into round two of the FI World Endurance Championship at Spa. And by the way, as we said right at the beginning, when we were saying how happy we were to see so many fans here in Sebring, we will see fans, we will see full grandstands in Spa Francorchamps because ticket sales have now officially been opened for this year's race. And again, as Graham mentioned right at the very beginning, if you have tickets, if you bought tickets that you were unable to use because of COVID for the previous races, then those will also be honored. So get to Spa. It is one of the world's great racetracks. It is always epic racing. Rain, snow, sun, hail, plagues of frogs, lice, uh, and four horsemen, whatever else. Spa brings it all in spades, and it could be a very entertaining race weekend. It is such a great place to come to, such an easy place to get to, such a great racing track, and very different look this year. Those of you that have seen pictures online, 
Lots and lots of tarmac areas have been replaced by gravel traps. It is now even more of a challenge for the drivers. So that is going to be just another little extra layer of uh, fr a free sort of excitement in the field as they get back to well, pretty much every racing driver's favorite track everywhere, which is Spa. Yep, so we've had storylines galore. We've had storylines from some of the established order coming back and picking up the baton where they left it. We've got others that are brand new to this championship. We've got others still, uh, like Paul Delana coming back with a comeback uh, king drive to victory in GTE Am. And then look a little bit further down and look where, they, where the, the light is beginning to dawn. Cracking stuff, I thought, from Satoshi Ishino in GTM. Uh, yep. By far his most convincing uh, uh, re result so far. That's a very happy Jim Glickenhouse. Yes, and it is. Absolutely quite correct right. that he should be uh, this happy with his podium cap on uh, before they even got to the podium for uh, the overall hypercar class. Just to remind you, if you're a bit confused by that, you've, you've seen them on a podium before. They have been on a podium before, but it was a hypercar podium, not the overall podium, because uh, an LMP2 car finished third at Monza, they finished fourth. But it was a class, a class podium. This is the first time that they will get to stand uh, on the overall podium. Great stuff from the number eight crew, the Toyota Kazoo racing team. It's fair to say they didn't have the run they were hoping for or expecting, but they plugged away at it and it could easily have been third today. Yep. It wasn't. Uh, they've made it home second, and it looks to me like Alpine intend to make a fight of this championship. Oh, well, they always had. They intended to make a fight of it as much as they could possibly last year as well, but they've just got a little less of one hand tied behind their back this season as they've been able to just eke out their fuel mileage a little further. Not enough yet to be able to go absolutely toe-to-toe -to -toe in every scenario with Toyota Gazoo Racing, but enough to give them the opportunity to make life difficult for that man there on the right, Sebastian Buemi and his teammates. He's chatting with uh, Richard Mill, with the uh, president of the ACO as well. So All sorts of little tableau uh, around here, just spotted. Obviously, we've got uh, Pascal Vasselon talking to Thierry Bouvet, who looks after the technical sides of things. Mm -hmm. I'd be amazed if Getting his winch in early. <laughs> What's a spot in the background, actually? Well, Back Gerard Laveau. Yeah, I did. Uh, uh, part, part time based in Miami, just down the road from here, of course, now with his new life, but uh, we're about to get the podium ceremony underway, and it looks like the rain has lifted in time for well, that to happen. The, the, the rain well. has, but there's a few more flashes of lightning in the sky, so uh, we might want to get a little bit of a shake on with this, a little bit of a hurry up. There's Ollie Jarvis back at United Autosport for the weekend and on the top step of the podium. That's He's hard to argue with that, isn't it? One of close to a couple of dozen of the drivers from this race that will be racing again tomorrow, yeah. including Josh Pearson. And if you were going to choose someone to just guide a young fellow like that uh, into and through the challenges of international motorsport, you could do far worse, couldn't you, than Ollie Jarvis? Yeah. He has been there and he has done that. Getting ready to see our hypercar podium. A uh, little mention as well for the Prema team finishing fourth. They definitely had podium potential written all the way through them. I can't imagine any scenario where they're not on an LMP2 podium this year. Jota were close as well. 22 United probably feel that they should have won this race. I don't know quite yet why they didn't. Great to see Penske here as well, racing with Corvette joining the field as well. Well, third place for Glickenhaus, second place for Toyota Gazoo Racing, the number 18, but our winners from Alpine Elf, Andre Negrau, there's Mathieu Vazelier, and with the full beard, Nico Lapierre. So third for Olivier Pla, the tallest of the figures, Roman Dumas and Ryan Briscoe. Second, Sebastian Buemi, Brendan Hartley, and Ryo Hirokawa. And here's our winners.
everybody for our winning podium. Good thought there and from Mr. Goodwin. Is that the first outright win in World Endurance Championship racing for a French team? I think he is probably absolutely right. In third place is Glickenhaus Racing. Olivia Platt, the dulcet tones of Bob Cossington and Joe Bradley. <laughs> it is a Joe Bradley. Joseph. Excellent to hear him here. Uh, second place, the number eight Toyota Kazoo There's racing. There's an enthusiast of the sport, Ray. Richard Beale, chair of the Fly Drugs Commission. Um, corporate and personal sponsor to innumerable teams and drivers. And of course, supports the number one team here, the Richard Mill Racing Team. Absolutely. Well done, boys. That is well deserved. Yeah, a long time coming. And the man on the right on that top step, Philip Sino, richly deserved. Such a, a rich racing heritage through many years of single-seater racing. Remember, he's, he's, he's the team owner for, uh, the team operator for Richard Beale Racing as well. Yep. So, close relationship between the man handling the trophy and the team boss there. Absolutely right. One of the unsung heroes, I think, in this paddock, Philippe Signor. Absolutely. Charming gentleman, always has time to chat. And by the way, one of the uh, team owners that was here for the very first WEC race, uh, in LMP2 back then, senior technician. And of course, two team bosses on that top step because Nico Lapierre is also cool a racing. team boss. Cool racing, yep. yeah. They race in the European Le Mans series. And I, I bet they have ambition to come World Endurance oh, Championship don't racing don't. as well. They've been here before under the previous management, but uh, it's a brave new world at Cool Racing. And yep. I've had some dealings with him in business terms and he's impressive in that role well he's just again you know and you can see why he gravitates to a man like philip senior they may they're cut from the same cloth they're absolutely lovely gents so andre negrao Mathieu vazivier and nico lapierre are our points leaders from brendan hartley rio hirokawa and sebastian buemi dnf i'm afraid for the reigning champions uh, mike conway Kamui Kobayashi and Jose Maria Lopez. Not the result that Mike would have been hoping for. I absolutely am certain of that. Um, uh, the race that he was hoping to be able to, well, potentially maybe even win and dedicate to the memory of Mike Conway Senior. Our, our deepest sympathies to absolutely. Mike and to, uh, to his mum, to his family, and to the rest of the Conway clan on uh, the sad loss of uh, Mike Conway Senior. And uh, yeah, just heartfelt sympathies, you know. It's, it's, it's tough at any time, and it's tough to then try and actually put your head together for a race um, with, with that sad news. So no, no, our very best thoughts to all. He was ready to get in the car at that yeah. point at which all that was happening to Mike. Yeah. yeah. Well, an emo emotional roller coaster for a, a lot of reasons. But in our GT Pro field, big thumbs up there, big smiles from Nick Tandy, joined on the second step of the podium by Tommy Milner, and then Michael Christensen and Kevin Escher to the top step. Porsche won three, so they will lead the uh, team's manufacturer standings in uh, GTE Pro. So our winner's Podium anthem for Porsche GT team, Kevin Estra and Michael Please Christensen. Uh, the team also claiming third place, Jimmy Bruni and Richard Leeds. Never really 
quite, quite, quite there after the first hour, and that long pit stop just really sealed their fate in third place. But still, both of them, both Porsches and the Corvette team outscoring Ferrari comprehensively here. Well, remarkably, Richard Leeds, that's uh, a podium podium in, here in 2022 to follow up a podium he scored in 2012 <laughs> right. in the same class uh, in the very first WC race, uh, finished second for Team Felton Mark Proton. There year. we go. And Tommy Milner, one of just two tracks, I think, in this year's, this year's campaign that he actually knows, because, of course, he has raced for Corvette Racing at Le Mans a number of times. But for Tommy, and the rest of them, the I'm sure what his knowledge is of Spa. Uh, Monza, possibly pretty sketchy as well. There'll be uh, a few laps done on uh, on R Factor 2 or on iRacing or whatever, on the simulator. And uh, then when we head off to the likes of Fuji and Bahrain, he will be properly heading into unknown territory in all sorts of ways. But a great adventure and really fantastic for the championship that Corvette Racing are coming with a full season world championship campaign for the first time in their starry history. Kevin Escher and Michael Christensen starts their championship campaign with victory. They lead the points table in second place. Tommy Milner, Nick Tandy, third Jimmy Bruni and Richard Leitz. And of course, the other names there are in the GTE AM category, but they all score GT points. For LMGT manufacturers, that's a different story. It's only the pro class that counts, and that means Porsche leads from Ferrari because they have two cars scoring points and Corvette have just the one. Corvette racing running one car in the World Endurance Championship, one car in IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Series. It's the first time, I think, in that uh, must be a quarter of a century. There's only been one Corvette racing in the North American series from the beginning of the American Le Mans series. And uh, they've divided to try and conquer both. They're not going to win the title for manufacturers, but they could end up being very strong contenders for the driver's crown. Well, in our LMP2 Pro-Am category, third place going to Algarve Pro. Second place going to Ultimate. And the victory going to AF Corsa. But overall, real team ahead of WRT and our LMP2 winners, United Autosports. So Star Spangled Banner plays for United Autosports USA, the team that takes victory in LMP2. So Josh Pearson becomes not only the youngest starter, but the youngest winner in WC history. <laughs> yes, on the same day. And there's John Doonan, the president of IMSA, whose big day comes tomorrow. That's IMSA, not John. Uh, and another huge enthusiast oh, for the sport just, just absolutely exudes it from every pore, doesn't he? So for just for many, many years, the doyen of Mazda's motorsport efforts, and yeah. what a great hire he was for the North American sports car organisation. Looked after our friends and colleagues here on the other side of the paddock. So victory here for Paul DeResta, Oli Jarvis and Josh Pearson. Second place for Team WRT, Sean Galeo, Robin Frines and Rene Rast in the red and white. And in the blue and white, third place real team by WRT. They claim the final podium spot, Rui Andrade 
Ferdi Habsburg and Norman Nato. They lie third in the points ahead of the 30, uh, the 83 team. A, of course, is Francois Perodo, Nick, uh, beg your pardon, uh, Lorenzo Colombo, uh, Louis Delachas and Robert Kubica for Prema finished in fourth place ahead I, of them. I remember it's an eight hour race, more points. Yes. Uh, so that is going to take something to reverse. It uh, certainly won't happen. Uh, for the most part until we get to Le Mans at this stage with a six hour race to come at Spa. Yes, it'll be double points at Le Mans, standard points at Spa. United also sports USA ahead of WRT Real Team and Prema. And Prema giving notice here that they are a force to be reckoned with. And this is in a track that Prema don't know. Correct. Prema don't know LMP2, but boy, they know Spa-Francorchamps. Oh, so yeah. don't expect them to be any less competitive there. And it's a track where normal engineering rules are much more likely to work and apply. Well, our Pro-Am winners were AF Corsa, the uh, 83 car with uh, Francois Perodo, Nick Nielsen and Alessio Rivera. Third place going to the... Uh, oh, here we are, this is our uh, GG Am podium. I was expecting the Pro podium, but it is Team Project One in third place, the Inception Racing Crew. TF Sport in second spot after a stunning pole from Ben Keating, who races tomorrow as well. And Paul Dallalana and Northwest AMR are race winners. Water started to get into the gubbins, isn't it? The, the screen's not liking it. Well, uh, Aston Martin Academy driver David Pittard there on the right-hand side of that top step joining uh, Nicky Team, a real veteran of the Aston Martin racing campaign. And Paul Delalana, actually no less a veteran of racing Aston Martin, so successfully for so many years in the World Endurance Championship. Victory for the first time out for them as a crew ahead of TF Sports number 33 machine. Again, Ben Keating the linchpin in that 33 car. He's the man who set a stunning pole uh, with Marco Sorensen joining him, the other half of the Dane train. There he is in the centre. And Florian Latour, closest to the camera there, just going out a shot. His first time out in an Aston Martin. He's on the podium in second place. And third place for Inception Racing. A really strong start to the campaign in the second Team Project One entry for Brendan Irib, Oli Milroy and Ben Barnicote. A fine ending, Paul, to a week in Florida that looked like it had disaster written all over it right from the start. Yeah, Paul Delano, absolutely delighted. Uh, the Inception Racing crew, I don't think they can believe their luck after the week that they've yeah. actually had. They're gonna go down to go and talk to Louise, who has got Francois Perodo, the LMP2 Pro-Am winner, and he's going to be a very happy man indeed. Francois Perodo back in LMP2 in the Pro-Am category and getting the win on your first race. I mean, it was just fantastic for you guys. Yeah, really tough race for me. Um, it was hot out there. So I wasn't particularly well trained over the winter, so it was uh, complicated to say the least. A bit better on my second outing, but uh, no, excellent. Couldn't be happier. You know, it's like if you had seen the state of our team, like even 10 days ago, I mean, we were nowhere near uh, ready as we were for this race. So, you know, it's rookie team, rookie drivers, Niklas and Alessio, really fast, pole position from Niklas you know, in like the whole category, so a great start. Yeah, we've got to mention the other two drivers because yeah. they, they seem like they're going to be superstars. No, 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 definitely. I mean, yeah, like I said, you know, they're discovering the car and already they're super quick. Niklas was on pole yesterday and Alessio, I think, is like the absolute fastest lap or maybe second. I mean, in any case, he's, he's right up there with the top, so it's, it's great. Well done. We're looking forward to the rest of the season for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Well done. Thank you. And you've absolutely got to, to agree with him. You know, as hires, in the Ferrari, in GTEM, 
they were spot on. You know, Nick Nielsen with, with championship wins under his belt in Ferrari GT cars in European Le Mans series. Absolutely. Alessio Rivera right there as well. Absolutely. Yep. Chuck him into LMP2 field with a team that's never run an LMP2 car. That, 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 as you heard from Francois, there was barely ready a fortnight ago, barely ready a week ago. I mean, they have just absolutely outperformed any expectation they might have there had. They, 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 they needed the spare car that came with their spare package. It was late. We had a number of cars that had late freight here. Um, he wasn't quite right. There's a few late race uh, improvements, but uh, Alessio Rivera, the third quickest LMP2 yeah, lap of go. the race. In but his first race in an LMP2 car, let's just underline. But more impressive for that crew. Bearing in mind it's an LMP2M. Both of the two professional drivers in the top seven in terms of fastest laps. And the other team there, Ultimate, Jean-Baptiste and Mathieu Lahaye with Francois Herio. They take second spot in GTEM and Algar Pro Racing. They take the third place with Stephen Thomas, James Allen and Rene Binder. And that is it from a dark Sebring in Florida. Nine hours after we started our broadcast, we have our race winners and we have a whole load of new storylines to explore again in Spa-Francorchamps. Join us then, please. We would love your company for some of the best racing on the planet. Six hours at the glorious Spa-Francorchamps. Whatever the weather brings in the Ardennes, one thing is always certain, the racing will be absolutely first class. Our thanks to everybody here in Sebring who has welcomed us back with open arms three years after our last visit. On behalf of all the crew here, from our director and TV crew to everybody on site, I'm Martin Haven saying thank you for joining us. For Graham Goodwin, for Louise Beckett and for Ant Davidson, we'll see you next time out in Spa. Be there in person if you can. If not, you know where to find us. Thanks for being with us from Sebring for now. It's goodbye. Can't wait already to do it all again in Spark.